Odyssey station. Check out the BetQL network. Wagertainment for every fan. Get sports betting tips from the best in the game. Available on the Odyssey app and our sister station, 650 The Bet. Sports Radio 610 presents Seth Payne and Sean Pendergast. We come to eighth time. Let's get the work in, man. Let's go. Great day. Great day. Oh, give me some juice, baby. Oh, yeah. Ground ball. Dubon throws the first. Go header. Run off one go. It is eighth career start. The 30-year-old makes magic on April Fool's Day. Impressive performance. Uh, we needed that, and and Blanco step up and and give us a, an incredible start performance. Uh, his change up, changing speed. It's a pretty good lineup over there. So what a week he has, he's had, and um, happy for him and his family. That was Joe Espada, Astros manager. Todd Callis on the call. Great call on the last out of what was the Astros' seventeenth no hitter in team history, the earliest no hitter in the history of baseball yeah. in a single yeah. season. And, uh, man, we got a lot to get to today. Renel Blanco straightening things out. He's your stopper now, people. Uh, Renel Blanco, no hitter last night for the Astros. They beat the Blue Jays 10 to nothing. So the offense got on track as well. Uh, good to be with you on a Tuesday morning. Uh, I'm Sean Pendergast. He is Seth Payne. Welcome into Payne and Pendergast. Hello, my that, friend. What a not day. Not to mention, it's weird because, obviously, with a no hitter, that's a huge story. And somehow lost in the shuffle of all of this is that the Astros did – they did score 10 runs, you know. He had five um, bombs, was, dude. Yeah. They had five Jeremy, bombs. Jeremy Pena showed up big time. Like, this was uh, th- this was a, an, an, an awesome team effort. And, uh, like, not to make too much of one game out of 162. But, uh, as you pointed out, this is the earliest no-hitter in the history of Major League Baseball. No Major League manager has ever had his first win with a no-hitter. I didn't even think about that. And I do think that Blanco, Blanco in so many ways is emblematic of the things that have worked for the Astros through the years, especially with the Latin players. The guy didn't start pitching until he was 18 years old. Didn't get signed to the Astros until he was 22. Dude, Uh, he was working in a car wash when they found him. Yeah, (laughs) and... Like that's and that's one of the things that set the Astros apart compared to other teams. It's they've been they've been willing to sign these Latin players when when the rest of baseball thinks eighteen. Yeah. Well, twenty two. Twenty two by the time you're discovered. Blanc- twenty two. He, my God. No. Yeah. He's <laughs> the oldest out of all of them, Seth. Like yeah. He, it was, Fromber was the graybeard out of all these guys. He was older. He was than signed Fromber. when he was nineteen, I think. Right. From yeah. twenty one. I was reading oh, an article. Jay Kaplan. Yeah. Yeah. Jay Kaplan had a great article from a couple years ago when. Blanco made the opening day roster that Chandler Rome posted last night. And, yeah, Bl- Blanco was... No, t- no, was, uh, was Framber 21? 21 when they yeah, signed okay, him. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the, but, but the whole thing about it is the, it, the, the biggest thing for me, honestly, I, I mean, aside from everything yeah. with the actual pitcher himself, was the fact that, hey, Yiner Diaz, you know, um, the guy that you're all worried about, just goes out and just, as he's catching, is also hitting bombs and catching no hitters. He's going out to calm down the pitcher uh, on the mound as, he, as he's approaching this milestone. Like everything about Yiner last night was exactly what you'd want to, including in the pregame where he realized that, okay, uh, Blanco is hitting his slider really well and he ends up mixing in his change up to a vast degree. It was, it was a really great combo between pitcher and catcher. So for anybody, if, if Dusty was sitting at home just waiting for Yiner Diaz to fall apart emotionally or uh, with his lack of experience, he's doing just fine last night. It is his first week as the full-time guy, a no-hitter with the fifth starter. And, and Brunel Blanco, if we're being honest, isn't the, isn't the fifth starter on paper. He is now, but like he, you know, he's, he, on this roster, if everybody were healthy, he would be a long reliever. And, and Yiner Diaz is out there you know, helping direct him to a no-hitter, hitting a couple bombs. So that was that was really good to see. Kyle Tucker, a couple of home runs. Uh, Jeremy Pena, we can't just uh, – you mentioned Pena. We can't gloss over the the amount of time it's been since he's hit a home run. July 5th, 2023. Here's what it sounded like. We got to play this. Here's what it sounded like. Here's Jeremy Pena. Oh, it. That is well. All right, so third home run. That was the Astros' third home run of the game, obviously. Here was Pena last night on finally getting that elusive home run. And I've just been trying to 
keep putting together good at bats. You know, we put a lot of work in this off season, a lot of work in the spring training. And I'm just glad we got that one out of the way. Been nice. You mentioned this yesterday. Even in the wake of the 0 4 start, Pena was swinging the bat pretty well in that yeah. Yankees series. Like, this is a nice development for the Astros uh, that. It- Jeremy Pena seems to have his groove back a little bit. I think with Pena, it's probably really nice to have that monkey off your back where he's made so many changes to his swing, and they've been paying dividends. He's been making really, really hard contact. But there's always that tendency. When you got the longest active streak of at-bats with no homers in major league in the major leagues to where you might be pressing a little bit. I didn't you know it was that. Yeah, it was the longest was active long. streak of at-bats with no home runs oh without a God. home run. Wow. So it was bad. And, and he'd made so many substantial improvements with his swing, all of which, all of which relied upon or were centered on calmness you know reducing the amount of motion before the uh before the pitch before the swing Mm -hmm. even with that hover kick step whatever the hell it is of his like just reducing everything while at the same time also remembering not to press for a home run yeah get that monkey off your back and then hopefully it's even better for uh hopefully it's even better for him moving forward but it was it i mean it was just i kyle tucker hits two home runs diaz two home runs just yiner um it's funny. I heard. I was watching the replay this morning, and you know they've got the Toronto blue, the the Toronto call mixed in, mm-hmm. and they were doing the old thing. It was kind of, it's kind of like the offensive version of Christian Javier for a couple years ago. Remember when the visiting announcers would always have to explain, "Hey, Javier is actually really good. I know nobody knows who he is. Uh, he's right. got a 2.0 ERA. He's probably one of the best pitchers in the major league right now. He's just had too few innings to like show up on all the stats. Likewise, they had to point out like, like yeah, by the way, he had 27 home runs. Last year. <laughs> I know, yeah. yeah. I know, I, I he know he actually was. Uh, yeah, I, I, apparently, this kid can hit. I guess. Yeah. I don't. I, I don't know why he never played, but he can really hit. I know he was their backup catcher, but he had 27 bombs last year. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, uh, that's funny. Um, so 10 nothing, the Astros win. Uh, they're back at it tonight. I was so mad, Seth. We almost went, Amy and I almost went to the game. I was telling you yesterday the prices on yeah. tickets were so low. And you know from doing this show with me that one of my stated goals, it's really nothing that I can impact with any effort of my own other than just to go to as many Astro games as I can go to. But yeah. one of my goals is to be there for a no-hitter. Yeah. And as I'm watching this play out, was I rooting for Toronto to get maybe like a squibber infield hit in the eighth and ninth inning so I didn't miss out on a no-hitter? Perhaps. Wow, what a jerk. Yeah, I know. Big time. I'm, 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 uh, yeah. Uh, I, I'm George very selfish. Springer, Springer, that bastard, he tried to blow it up. He, he tried. Uh, he ended up getting a walk, though, but it wasn't. It was never going to be a perfect no, game. No, no, no. I walks in this game. But, yeah, uh, but, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, he, there was like a sandwich. Like, Springer gets a walk to open the game. Then he yeah. gets a jillion straight outs. Springer gets yeah. a walk again, and then he gets out of it. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm being somewhat tongue in cheek. I'm super happy for Anel Blanco. That's an incredible story. It really I, is an incredible story. But I was, I was bummed I wasn't there last night. I, I know that what you really were bummed at was the Abreu redemption story, because Abreu, Abreu had an awful, awful non-catch at first base, uh, which would have been a double play uh, in the first inning. That was in the first inning, correct? Yes. And uh, but, but at the very end of the game, ends up backhanding a hit um, and, uh, and tossing it to Blanco and uh, being a hero. So there you go. Yeah, so oh, the, that's, uh, that's the redemption. That's, that's what he yeah, did that's to redeem redemption. himself. Making okay. a play that he should have made. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Would it have been an error if he hadn't made it? Yes. But uh, that was the that was the that, that, that was his redemption story. The double okay? play wasn't even a scoop in the dirt. It was like it was a low throw that got to him on, in the air, and he just dropped it. I felt like I felt like Todd and Blum were being a little generous to. Of course they were. They're the hometown that. announce team. They're not. They were like, I, yeah, but I, I mean, tweeted Todd Abreu. They didn't have to. They, they were trying to make it act. They were trying to paint it like it was actually a pretty Dude, hard catch to make. Yeah. It was so funny. I was watching. I, I had so many videos bookmarked from over the last week that I've been able to watch because we've been, Amy and I have been out and about. And I finally got to go through them yesterday. And one of them I had bookmarked was an archive of Harry Carey doing play by play for the Cubs in a Greg Maddox start for the Braves. Like back, it was Maddox versus the Cubs. Yeah. So Maddox, a former Cub, going against the Cubs. Yeah, and, and he's just dominating them. It's like a three-minute snippet, and he's just dominating them. And Harry Carey is just 
trashing the Cubs. Like <laughs> it, like it was Jose Vizcaino, I think, had like a three ball, like a three two, like like a three zero count, and he swung at three bad pitches and ended up grounding out. And after each pitch, each successive pitch, Harry Carey was getting more and more angry with Vizcaino. And when he finally swings at one and he grounds out on what would have been ball four, he's like, that would have been ball four. You did that three straight times. What are you thinking? And I'm like, oh, man, the 80s and 90s were the best. Like, no hometown announced team would ever do that. Yeah. Um, I Look, I, the, the other thing, too, I'm going to do this, Sean, because yeah. I could almost – I can almost hear people's counter arguments for why this was so impressive by Blanco. Because, yeah. you know, with two, with two pitchers in that game that uh, nobody had seen yet this season and very few people had seen before, like in person, uh, it, there was talk of, well, you know, you haven't seen this, you haven't seen that. Um, and, I, and I can almost hear people trying to discredit this, this no-hitter by saying, well, nobody realized that Blanco had this change-up, and that's the issue. I'll remind everybody. I'll remind everybody that in the, the vast centuries-old history of Major League Baseball, many, 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 many pitchers have showed up in their first appearance and, uh, versus a team and uh, unveiled a new pitch early in the season. Yeah. This is the earliest no-hitter in the history of baseball. So, yeah, it's kind of uh, – uh, yeah, there, there's no discrediting this by saying, wow, they hadn't seen his change Yeah, before. how do you like discredit that? a no-hitter? Like, I know there's people doing it. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, it's a, a no-hitter. I don't know if there are. Hit. I just assume there are because of the internet. Yeah. Because there, oh, there there's are so many bastards out there. They're out they there. used to have to hide away in their little shells. That's right. But now they, now they go online and they say things like, well – you know, you know if, yeah, once they get a look at that change up, they'll probably be no big deal. This kid's a bum. It's a bum, I tell you. They've got a voice. They've got a voice. All right. So, congrats to uh, Renel Blanco. Congrats to the I'm gonna, Astros. Joe I'm going to run on a platform of taking away free speech. Everybody's always bragging about, oh, free speech this, free speech that. I'll be the one that, that promises to restrict free speech yes. finally. Free speech was a great thing when it was harder to have your voice heard. Good call. Not anymore, my friends. Good call, Way Seth. too easy. You Way z- too easy. You zig. Everybody else is zagging. Yes. Good job. Good job. All right. Off and running on a Tuesday, a victorious Tuesday for the Astros. There was one thing that Joe Espada did last night that I was, as this whole thing was unfolding, I wasn't sure he was going to do. He did it. Also, um, we talked about the Texans and all this cap space. Um, One name that really wants to get paid that D'Amico's got history with, would this be a good use of the cap space that the Texans just opened up about a week ago? We will discuss that next as well. Did you get on prize picks last night? Did you download the prize picks app? I was on...
Center.com. Sports Radio 6 and presents Payne and Pendergast. Yes, yes, I did. And um, he was really close to the end there, <laughs> you know. But he wasn't very far from, from the number, the limit that we had on him. So um, he has um, an extra, we have an extra off day, so he'll, he'll get the rest necessary for his next start. That was Joe Espada. He that he's referring to there is Renel Blanco, who threw the 17th no-hitter in Astros history last night against the Toronto Blue Jays. The question he was asked was, was Renel Blanco on a pitch count? Which it would, I think, you know, kind of everybody is um, to some degree. Uh, but he was able to uh, he he was able to buckle this thing down in 105 pitches last night. So. They were uh, they were going to try to keep him to 90 pitches, and uh, the the thing was he was pitching a no-hitter. And he showed zero signs of fatigue. Yeah. Uh, afterwards, the, he said he wasn't tired at all. When Yiner made that mound visit, it was just to kind of slow him down a little bit, be sure he was hit in the right headspace after he had watched Springer. And, uh, but that was, that was the last batter he was going to face. Mashinsky was warming up in the dugout. And uh, I, don't, I don't think Mashinsky uh, and the rest of the relievers would have blown a 10 nothing lead. I don't know, but at man. At this point, I'm not so it's certain. It's been a rough yeah, early season so for those right. pitchers. Yeah. There's, a, there's a possibility. There's a first time for everything, as yeah. we saw last night. Earliest, uh, earliest no-hitter in Major League Baseball That's right. history. That's right. Yeah. Um, I love that Espada kept Renel Blanco out there. I love that he didn't pull him after six innings, pull him after seven innings. This isn't even a dusty thing. A lot of people on the text page are trying to make – the the keeping Renell Blanco in Dusty would Dusty have taken him out maybe probably I don't know I a spot that did an old school thing last night and I love seeing it man let this kid go get his moment let him throw a dozen extra pitches and you thought he would I don't think uh, I don't think Dusty would have pulled him in this situation this was uh, you know usually when we've had the committee no hitters you get a guy going into the sixth inning with already approaching 100 pitches or what have you. Yeah. Um, I think this was close enough that Dusty would have kept him. Would have kept if him. <laughs> I'm, trying as, I'm trying like hell not to be petty about Dusty and Yiner Diaz, but it was so frustrating. And honestly, my first thought when Yiner hit his first of two home runs was, ah, oh, crap, they could have won the World Series last year. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Ah, oh, crap. What? Yeah. What the? What in the sweet hell is going on here? You had an absolute drain in your lineup, which could have been an absolute uh, monster in your lineup last year, and you just you just chose not to use it for something that's all gut feel. You know what I mean? Like it wasn't yeah. even anything. Like we left this guy in because I've got these numbers here that tell me no. It's like nope. He's just really better at handling these pitchers, and Yiner can't really do it. You know, like he can't, like old Maldi can't. Imagine how many no hitters Blanco would have hit last night if Maldonado had been catching. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if they got one out of if they got one with Yiner, yeah. you probably could have had two no hitters. Like what? What better could he do? What? What? What more can Yiner do? To show that he's a capable major league catcher than to successfully navigate a no hitter. A no hitter with, his, with a dude in his eighth start. With his incredibly, I almost said young, his incredibly inexperienced yet remarkably old uh, pitcher in Ronald Blanco. Yep, yep, yep. So that was, uh, so that was good. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know if, if Dusty would have pulled him or not. I just Joe Spot is the manager, and as I kept seeing Ronald Blanco go out there for the seventh inning, the eighth inning, the ninth inning. I'm an old school fan. I like seeing that, man. I like seeing. I have yeah. these combined no hitters, although. Javier still does get credit for the two combined no hitters in the World Series year, as if he threw a no hitter. I notice that a lot. Like Javier does get, even though he only pitched, that's I think true. six you innings know, that's a, in each yeah, of those. They do. <laughs> I'll take it. Yeah, I'll allow it. Yeah, that's a very good point. It's always he was the uh, he was the main pitcher in a combined no no hitter. He, not and, just they uh, don't even say that. I hear people going Javier threw those no hitters. Back in yeah, 2022. Oh, oh. I never know? picked up on that. <laughs> like, yeah. there's some people that do that. Like, he threw the, and I don't have a big issue with it. I just think it's funny. Like, yeah, he really only put in two thirds of the work on those no hitters, but we'll give it to him. That's yeah, yeah, and I think, honestly, Jeremy Pena, not that Jeremy Pena would be upset about this or anything, but I, I feel like, in a way, Jeremy Pena is jilted a little bit in just uh, it, it, a breakout night for him in snapping his longest active streak of. Uh, homerless baseball um, or at bats without a home run. Uh, it was a just. It was a breakout night in a lot of respects. We had one listener who I, I, I feel is a little bit of a prisoner of the moment mm -hmm. because he says, uh, "No hitter was really awesome, but I'm still worried because we can't beat the Yankees." Uh, tells me we can't beat the premier teams. This is a, this is the important thing to remember. 
The Blue Jays were better than the Yankees last year. Like now, the Yankees games, have made yeah. improvements in their, in their lineup. But the, the Blue Jays are still projected to be one of the – they're one of the favorites to compete for the World Series. It's not a bad team whatsoever. Nope. nope. So, uh, and the, to say you can't beat the Yankees – look, look I'm, I'm, I have abandoned – long-term thinking with baseball i am uh, as much i'm going to ride the waves of confidence and despair as much as possible but the city here and after watching those four games because you went 0 and four to say we can't beat the yankees yeah. i cannot accept that no, I, I cannot agree. accept that one bit come on I let's agree. get let's let's be realistic about this you had let down you had the 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 performance the offense was just fine wasn't great wasn't awful um you're starting pitching other than Framber's issues, was just fine against the Yankees. It was several specific miserable performances by relievers. That's where you should be concerned. But to act like you've got no chance versus the Yankees, I'm as distraught over those losses as anybody. And you gotta, you got to get improved play. But let's not, let's not act like they're going to get swept by the Yankees on this season. No. Especially after, after Stanton gets injured, after, after Anthony Volpe comes back down to earth, yep. not to, after Rizzo gets uh, – Rizzo's going to be just fine. He just gets up there and gets plunked. Um, yeah, the, the, I, will not, I will not stand for people bowing down at the feet of the Yankees all of a sudden because they won four games yeah, in, in, in March. Don't, don't say things that turn Seth and I into it's a 162-game season guy. We don't want to be oh, that person. We want to live no. in the moment too. But like the can't, I'm not gonna. I will. Yeah, it's can't. There, you're right, Seth. It's the word can't. I'm pointing at it right here. Can't, can't beat the Yankees. Get out of here. The Yankees won their World Series over the weekend. We'll go win ours in October. You know the other thing I'll say too about Yiner mm. is the. Uh, I used to get so frustrated with people talking about Maldonado's pitch framing. And I, and I could never figure out why anybody kept saying it was so good because all the data was actually, yeah. and all like the eyeball test was he was actually horrible at it. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like Yiner's actually good at it. I don't, there was like one article written once where somebody said something about um, Maldonado's pitch framing and people just ran with it like it was a thing. And it was, it was like a lot, it was one of the biggest lies ever told, Sean. Dude. One of the biggest lies ever told. That's... In an era, in an era in which there are many lies out there. Right, right, right. That, Some um, people might say I'm lying right now, but no, no. this was the biggest lie ever told you're was on Maldonado's pitch framing. You're telling the truth. Uh, that um, retroactive credit to James Click, <laughs> the trade of Miles Straw for Philip Maton and Yiner Diaz might wind up being one of the most lopsided trades in, in Astros. I, I, this, I'm, this is going to be pure hyperbole right now. But Yiner Diaz, early on in his young career, has a 20-plus home run season where he was the backup catcher. And now here early on in year two has caught a no-hitter and hit two home runs in said no-hitter. Like I, If Yiner turns into an everyday near all-star caliber catcher, yeah. Um, trading Miles Straw for him and Philip Maton. Philip Maton, who, by the way, you know what, I, Ben? Get the acknowledge key ready. <laughs> I just saw this video during the break. Uh, Philip Maton, acknowledge we acknowledge him for beating Adolis Garcia with the bases loaded yesterday. And Tampa Bay trailing by like four or five runs. Clearly, Maton feeling like, eh, <laughs> it's, what's 8-3 to three instead of 7-3? to three. Right, right. I, I, got, I got old family business from my previous family. I got to settle. And this is how Abreu I know. sucked in his debut, and it was because of you. Yeah, Adolis Garcia. <laughs> um, so, yeah, Maytime beamed Adolis Garcia last night with the bases loaded. This is how I knew he did it intentionally. He showed emotion afterwards as if he didn't do it intentionally. Maytime doesn't oh. show emotion for anything. Ever. Like you've been watching YouTube videos on how to show emotion. Right, after, right, uh, yes. How, I, if I <laughs> how need do to, I make it look like I made a mistake? Make it look good. Yeah, make it look good. All right. Can I punch a locker? <laughs> oh, no, not out there on the mound. Nope. i got to do something else. No, nope. you got to look like a sociopath out on the mound. <laughs> um, here was uh, shifting gears. So, Ronel Blanco, no hitter. We'll get, to, we'll get back to the Astros and headlines. Over to the Texans for a minute. Seth and I talked for... Uh, a while yesterday about the cap space they've opened up. Still nothing yet from the Texans. They did announce the signings of Derek Barnett and Neville Hewitt yesterday. I don't think that's what they were opening the cap space for when they restructured Titus Howard last week. I think this name came up as we were workshopping some names that they could trade for Seth and use that cap space on, but Brandon Ayuk sure sounds like somebody who wants to get paid. This is Brandon Ayuk on Shannon Sharp and Chad Ocho Cinco Johnson's podcast. I'm trying to get what I what I deserve. I feel like this season, um, this season playing football, 
I figured out who I was as a person, as a player, what I bring to the table, what I bring to the locker room, what I bring uh, to the organization, um, and just the value I hold when I walk in that building because uh, people are going to follow me because I've done it the right way since I've been in that building. From the, from, from, from the, from the first day I walked in there to when I was in there earlier this morning, done it the right way. So, um, and if, 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 if they don't see it worth in that, that's all that's all it is. That's all yeah. it is. It ain't nothing else. It ain't nothing else besides that. But I can't, like I said, I can't get into it. Um, we got professionals working on both sides. So hopefully we can come to a professional agreement and, uh, continue to play professional football. I love that. I love when someone says can't get into it after you just got into it for 45 seconds. <laughs> He's got, he got into it a couple times on that interview as well. <laughs> he did. Um, there was a, at one point, this is the funny thing about it, man. This is where I wonder about Brandon Ayuk, and this is where I'm glad that I'm glad that D'Amico has firsthand experience with Brandon yes, Ayuk. Yes. When you're on the outside looking in, you never know whether a guy who's speaking out publicly is – Maybe he got a bit of a pain in the butt, or maybe this is just something that he's doing regarding his contract, but otherwise is the salt of the earth and everybody loves him. We have no way of knowing that. Obviously, uh, obviously, multiple people in the Texans organization have ways of knowing that. They've worked with him. So, yeah, and I probably shouldn't even talk about D'Amico as much as Bobby Slowick. Right. You know, Bobby Slowick's relationship with Brandon Ayuk as having been the passing game coordinator for the 49ers. Ayuk... <laughs> Ayuk said that the reason he started speaking out, he decided because uh, it was his birthday. Um, and then he figured out on his birthday he might start, he might just start saying some stuff publicly about it. I'm like, all right, I guess that's as good a reason as any. Yeah. I, if, I, if, if your birthday had been in December, would you have started publicly <laughs> agitating about it then? Plus, remember, his girlfriend and he himself afterwards had already kind of expressed disgruntlement about it. So I'm not 100% buying that, that he was waiting until his birthday to, to, to spout off about it. I think that, first off, I think he gets a contract with the 49ers. Remember, it got really ugly and dicey with Debo Samuel, and it was just yeah. John Lynch taking his time and, and making it difficult. Like, they don't want to just dole this money out like it's nothing. I think ultimately Ayuk does re-sign with the 49ers. Should the Texans go after him? Yes, but not with a first-round pick. I'm, uh, I'm with you. I think in, in the trend in the league right now is, hey, if you're going to be giving new money to dudes, yeah. like if you're giving a brand-new contract, don't double down on it and trade away a first-rounder. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't need to see next year's first-rounder or anything like that. I'd rather see like, like the Brian Burns trade or uh, something like that. Yeah. Um, if they – I'm with you. I, I, I don't want to trade high draft capital for anybody for just to then turn around and have to pay them a contract. Um, as wide receivers go, like if the Texans were to do that with a wide receiver, uh, it makes sense if you're of the mind of like, let's just get C.J. Stroud as many weapons as we can. Look, we do know that the team is open to adding elite veteran wide receiver play. They were in on the Keenan Allen market, which is different than the Brandon Ayuk market. He's an, an older player who's yeah. in the last year of his deal. The price would have been a little lower, a third rounder next year in 2025. I'll say this as far as guys who are in similar situations – T. Higgins on the franchise tag. I think Ayuk is heading into like the fifth year of his his fifth year option or whatever it is. Um, he's at a juncture where guys like him normally do get paid. He's right. Ayuk is to me a way better fit than T. Higgins is. Uh, yeah, for, and, for this team. And I think with Ayuk, player wise, too, I mean everything. Yeah, everything that you like um, or want in a receiver in this offense, the ability to run after the catch. I'll tell you too, man. Watching Ayuk some more yesterday, the thing that had never really jumped out to me as much is he makes a quarterback accurate, and his ability to pluck the ball out of the air yeah. in, without losing stride, without breaking stride. There's times like where with CJ, his ball placement, when it's really on point, is right there at the face mask and out in front of Nico Collins or whoever else, and they get great, great run after the catch because of it. There's times with Brock Purdy where – it's above, it's a little to the side, it's behind, yeah. but Ayuk just never breaks stride. Yeah. And he just he just catches it with his hands. He got to, the, the old drill where you write just a, a number on the ball and call it out, you know, like keeps his eyes on it and turns up field and goes. He does all that remarkably well. And then I think what you would have with Ayuk that's different than, say, a Keenan Allen is at that point, you've got three different guys who are all – scary as hell in the slot with Keenan Allen I think it would be more you'd sign him and think okay this can be our slot guy predominantly slot 
especially as an older guy. But, you know, that, that can lend you to some predictability. Now you'd have Ayuk, you'd have Tank Dell, you'd have Nico Collins and whoever else in development that could all play the slot. That, that gets kind of scary from a defensive perspective. Yeah, I think, I think what it boils down they were working on a trade. Look, it's the best the Texans can do this year as of right now is the 42nd pick in the draft or the 59th pick in the draft, both second-round picks. And I think it's safe to say that the Texans are probably looking at wide receiver with one of those two picks. So let's say it's a second. That's the price. And, and there may be someone out there willing to trade a first for Ayuk, maybe multiple firsts. But as, Seth, as you said, the trend in the league is going the other way with trades like this. The teams just aren't willing to give up the elite draft capital. If it, Let's say it were the 42nd pick. What you're giving up is, I guess, the certainty of Ayuk and the salary. Because you could use the 42nd pick on a wide receiver that may be good. We know is going to be cheap. So you're, you're basically giving up the 42nd overall pick. If that were the price, and probably like a day three pick also, like a second and a fifth yeah. or something like yeah. that, for the certainty that comes with Brandon Ayuk in this offense with a good quarterback. It's yeah, pricey. I like it. I like it. I don't think that the 49ers are going to let. Like the reason Eric Armstead isn't there is because, I, in my opinion, is the reason Eric Armstead isn't there is because they've identified Brandon Ayuk as one of the guys that they got to pay and keep around. That's a good Whereas theory. I, you know, Eric Armstead's an aging guy who's been banged up the last couple yeah. of years, and they just don't have the cap space for it right yep. now. All right, Payne and Pendergast with you on a uh, Tuesday. Victorious Tuesday for you Astro fans, us Astro fans, we Astro fans out there, because uh, Renel Blanco, a no-hitter. You'll hear the final call from last night's Renel Blanco no-hitter. We'll dig into some updates, some pitching updates for the Astros as well on some guys that are on the IL right now. Rockets have a big one tonight. We'll get into a whole bunch of stuff coming up next in headlines. Right now, are you waiting for the right time to get the LASIK procedure? I know that
Live from the Twin Peaks studios, Sports Radio 610 presents Payne and Pendergast with today's headlines. Ground ball, Dubon throws the first, go header! Run off Wacho, in his eighth career start, the 30 year old makes magic on April Fool's Day. Impressive performance. Um, we needed that, and and Blanco step up and and give us a, an incredible start performance. Uh, his change up, changing speed. It's a pretty good lineup over there. So what a week he has, he's had, and um, happy for him and his family. They needed it, man. They needed it. They got injuries in the rotation right now. The Astros. They needed a win first and foremost. But man, for them to get that performance last night out of, out of Renel Blanco, 30 years old, eighth start of his career, 17th. No hitter in Astros history, and Seth, as you've pointed out, the earliest no hitter in a season in the history of baseball, April the first. Earliest in uh, in the history of baseball, and also the first time a major league manager has gotten his first victory with a no hitter. And Blanco, Blanco, to his credit, did make it easy it, it, to keep him in there. I mean, he just he never looked tired. His pitch count before the game was set at 90. It was a soft target. And uh, and he, he likely would have been pulled after the last uh, Vlad Guerrero Jr. at bat um, if, if Guerrero Jr. had gotten on base. So, uh, but a, a relatively smooth, just like entirely in command the entire way. He's got Yiner Diaz, the, the catcher who some people might have thought would never be capable of guiding a, an inexperienced starting pitcher through a, through a no-hitter. But Yiner, uh, Lo and behold. Yiner did that as well as hitting two home runs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and Pena. Like, honestly, there is, there's a part of me that's like, God, yeah, but, I, 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 okay, take away, the, take away the no-hitter. Let's just say this was a shutout. Mm-hmm. What's the bigger story? What's the biggest story in this game outside of the pitching? Is it Pena hitting the home run and going two for three? I- and, like, on the, on the heels of – Getting a lot of hard contact in those first four games versus the Yankees. It's that's definitely a story. I would say Aspada getting his first win is probably up there, yeah. kind of overshadowed by a no hitter. In fact, we have Aspada here. Aspada, his reaction to getting his first win, he makes it all about Renel Blanco. It was special because obviously, you know, for me personally, uh, you know, getting that first win as a manager, it means a lot. But just getting in that fashion for a guy that has grind through the minor leagues and seeing him how hard he's worked to perform against a really good lineup it's it just brings everything to a level of you know emotional uh, even a day for everyone so uh, you know it's about blanco blanco should get the lineup card is it's it's about him you know couldn't be any happier that the way t- today turned out those would be the two big things i think seth espada's first win as a manager and pena continuing to make good contact and finally <laughs> ending the home run drought that I didn't realize was the longest drought of any big league everyday player uh, going right now. Yeah, it was uh, not it was, anymore. It, I mean, sometimes things feel like it, but you don't know for sure. And uh, it was in terms of total at bats, it was okay. Um, Cause obviously there's other people that haven't, you know, right. whatever uh, it was in, in terms of total at bats, but the, uh, you know, and I guess Yiner Diaz is two home runs, Kyle Tucker's two home runs. Yeah. Uh, just a whole lot of offense. Not, not that offense had been a problem versus the Yankees, but you're also looking at Pena, like as it stands after five games, he's hitting 444 with an 1167 OPS. Very, very early, obviously, but for a guy that made substantive changes to his swing in the offseason, that's paying off. And then Blanco, man, a guy who's 30 years old, didn't start pitching till he was 18 years old, got signed by the Astros when he was 22, was thought of primarily as a reliever until, re- uh, until not too long ago. Um, like, it's just... If it weren't the Astros, it would be even more remarkable. It's just the Astros have so many stories like this about their Latin players. Like their 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 willingness to take on older Latin play Latin players and work with them and stick with them uh, has been is it's, it's rewarded them multiple times over. It's oh, just yeah. really cool to see it every each successive time. For sure, they don't they certainly don't win that second World Series if they hadn't taken that approach. Through the yeah. years, for sure. So, um, no, it's a great point. Um, updates on a couple of the guys. Luis Garcia, speaking of pitchers they've signed from Latin America. Um, the uh, He threw 15 pitches yesterday. He is ahead of schedule coming back from Tommy John surgery right now. So that's good. Justin Verlander threw 52 pitches in a live three-inning 
BP yesterday. Here is Verlander with an update on his status. Uh, good. Three innings, 52 pitches. Um, threw a couple extra. Like, basically extra batting. The first inning was like seven or eight pitches. So, like, faced like two more batters just to get pitch count because I, I didn't want to throw. I didn't want the up and down. I didn't want to, I wanted to do three innings so and get to 50 pitches. So, that was the benefit of being able to do this live BP one more time so that we could kind of control the setting quite a bit. Okay. So, there's your Verlander update. So, updates on two of the pitchers. Uh, Rockets, Timberwolves tonight in Minnesota. Golden State plays Dallas tonight. So, we are Maverick fans for a night. You're going to have to shower afterwards. I get it. But we want the Mavericks to win against Golden State and the Rockets, obviously, to win in Minnesota. Tough task for both teams. Um, but if we get that, then we set up a Thursday matchup at Toyota Center with the Warriors, where if the Rockets are able to win that game, they will be tied in the standings with the Golden State Warriors. The, the Rockets winning tonight and Golden State losing tonight would set up a really fun regular season game on Thursday. That's the bottom line. Yes, that's the bottom line. Yep. And then also just the, this entire week, are just two two games versus two uh, very, very, very quality opponents. Very quality. And after having, you know, taken some hard lessons in your last go at it uh, for the Rockets, yeah, I'd, I'd love to see them come out and rebound tonight. Did you watch any of Caitlin Clark last yes. night? Yes. Yes. I did, too. I had the whole game. I had the Astros game on one screen. I had them on the other. I was flipping the sound back and forth. That was entertaining. That was some entertaining women's college basketball last night. That was uh, that was an absurdly clutch performance by Caitlin Clark, who is just like Steph Curry can hit any shot from anywhere. She's amazing. And make it look yeah. like no big deal. Yep. Yeah. It's not like it has to be wide open or anything. She doesn't just want – she's got that James Harden – threat of that you've got to guard her no matter how far out she goes um she can hit the step back she can do all that. but but honestly my biggest regret about this game is that uh her and angel reese uh, worked so hard to tamp down the hatred between yeah, the two of them yeah they kind of, I, yeah they kind of laid their weapons down a little bit <laughs> <laughs> they played their asses off they did. angel reese like had that scare with her turned ankle early on yeah. and i thought I think everybody at that point was like, oh, no, not like this. You want this to be a battle royale. And it really, really was. Um, I, uh, I, yeah, I got to the point towards the end that I couldn't even, I couldn't even talk smack about Mulkey. You just have to, you have to tip your cap to two teams that, that battled their asses off and that Caitlin Clark is uh, just, uh, she's on a different level than everybody else. Apparently the Mulkey article was kind of a popcorn fart. I don't subscribe to the Washington Post, so I didn't get to read it. I've read yeah. aggregated summaries of it, and apparently yeah. it wasn't nearly as explosive as everybody was expecting. Yeah, I guess, or, or yeah, she was which, expecting. Which she kind of set wonder, us up for it, you know. Either did she scare the Washington Post out of printing some things, or was it just like, what is? This was a boring article. What is she so concerned about reaching the light of day? Yeah. Perhaps I don't know. Well, she because she had referred to the piece that that writer did about Brian Kelly, like it was a hit piece. Yeah. I went and read that piece. And it was like nothing. It was hardly about Brian Kelly at all. So she might just be super sensitive to any any kind of criticism whatsoever. Oh, I, don't I know. think that's highly likely. I mean, she's she's wagged her finger many times through the years yeah. at LSU and Baylor both. Yes. Yeah, Caitlin Clark. I'm just sitting there. I'm trying to figure out when I watch her, like at what level, like where is she on the cream meter when it comes to almost just an expectation that the ball is going to go in. And, and and she's right there with Pretty it. Pretty high up you know? there, man. Yeah. Pretty high up there. All right, Payne and Pendergast with you. Those are your headlines uh, for uh, for today. Let's circle back to the Astros. Renel Blanco, the 17th no-hitter in Astros history. Where does this stack up on the randomness scale among recent no-hitters for the Houston Astros? And there have been a ton of them, as my research indicated to me this morning. We'll get to that coming up next. But first... So do weight loss. Uh, I've done the research for you on that already, and I can tell you my research included me dropping
contact. Sports Radio 610. The Texans play here. And Odyssey Station. Sports Radio 610 presents Payne and Pendergast. Ground ball. Dubon throws the first. Go header. Run off Blanco. It is eighth career start. The 30 year old. It's Mexico on April Fool's Day. Todd Callis on the call. Really good call at the end of the no hitter last night. Renel Blanco. 17th no hitter in Astros history. Um, I went and looked. There's a Wikipedia page that lists all of the Astros. Yeah. No hitters, which always impresses me. You know, like that somebody went to that page last night and put in Renel Blanco's no hitter in that Wikipedia page. It's there. It's in I there. just assume it's all done by AI these days. Yeah, well, no, true. Wikipedia. A no hitter is not that big of a deal. Uh, or I, I, obviously, it's a big deal, but like that somebody would go in and update it. Yeah, that's yeah. Uh, good job. Whoever ended up updating that. Good job. Uh, the fact that so many of them have come relatively recently is why it's a it's a it's a surprise and a shock when you hear that so there's still only been 17 no hitters in Astros history because they've had what was it you had the stat earlier the, the, they've they've had this is the sixth one they've had since August 3rd 2019 wow so since late in the 2019 season they've had six they've had six no hitters let's just use those six for purposes of what we teased into the segment here the randomness of a Ronel Blanco no hitter August 3rd, 2019. So the Astros are in the in in the on the you know the back nine of a season where they would go on to win I think 107 games. Really good Astros team. They had a combined no hitter against Seattle. Aaron Sanchez gave you six innings with the game then closed nine nothing win by Will Harris, Joe Biagini, and Chris Davinsky. That's random right there. <laughs> that's, that's way more random than a Ronel Blanco out of nowhere no-hitter to me. That it involved Aaron, Aaron Sanchez. That Joe Biagini is involved in anything like this makes it extremely random to me. Blanco is the 10th different Dominican-born player to throw a no-hitter. Okay. The Astros have the most hitters of any team since 1962. Um, there, there is reason to, there's reason to, to make it, there's reasons that it feels like the Astros have, uh, more, no hitters more frequently than, than other teams. Well, do. I, I can't imagine a team having more than six since the late in the 2019 season. Yeah. So, yeah. so the combined, let's not one, forget our buddy, Mike fires either. Well, it was that earlier was, than 2019. Yeah, it was but, 2015. Yeah. Yeah, that was yeah. the last one before this stretch of no hit dominance. They've had the last. Four plus seasons. So August third, twenty nineteen, combined one. Then September first, twenty nineteen, Verlander gave you a complete game no hitter. That's the least random one out of all of them. Verlander throwing a no hitter late in the season in which he wins the Cy Young Award. <laughs> no randomness yeah. with that one. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then we got the two Javier led no hitters. One against the Yankees in late June of twenty twenty two, and then the one in the playoffs in the World Series against the Phillies. Then we had Framber last year on the day they traded for Justin Verlander. Remember that? The day after they trade for Verlander, Framber goes out and no-hits the Cleveland Guardians last season. Yeah. That was the one good start he had in the second half of the season last year. Framber Valdez was terrible, except for the day he no-hit Cleveland. And then you have Renel Blanco last night. So those are the six right there. The big uh, six. So I, I wouldn't say this is one of the more random ones. I think it's, uh, you know, if you go back several years, it's one of the most the ones that, the one that you certainly wouldn't predict, given that Blanco has been primarily a relief pitcher. If we go back to if we go back a few years, eight years, to when Blanco was 22 years old, first off, when the Astros decided to sign a 22 year old who had only started pitching when he was 18, uh, and they discovered him because he was pitching to uh, a prospect for an Astro scout. Um, but then it was Dana Brown. Like Dana Brown deserves credit for suggesting last year that Blanco could be a starter. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and here we are with him looking every bit the part of a starter and barely fatigued whatsoever as he pitches a, a no-hitter, complete game no-hitter last night. It was really, really cool to see. It's really cool to see him do it with Yiner Diaz, too. Um, and yeah. Yiner, Diaz, <laughs> Yiner Diaz just goes ahead and hits a couple of home runs along the way as well. They've had as many no-hitters, the Astros have, since August of 2019 as they had from 1979 through 2019. Yeah. So they've had as many no-hit, and, and as, as you pointed out, Seth, they've had more no-hitters than 
than, than, than any team in baseball. They had a ton, they've had really good pitching through the years. I mean, even back in the 70s and 60s, obviously through the 80s, Daryl Kyle's no-hitter in the 90s, early 90s, very memorable. Um, Mike Scott, no-hitter to, to clinch the division in 1986, very memorable. They had as many no-hitters for a 40-year period as they've had in the last – Four plus seasons. I guess part of that's a trend of just more no hitters in general. No, in Major no League question. I, yeah. No question. But that is an, that's a remarkable stat, independent of how the game has changed through the years. He's doing it. You know what though? Too, he's doing it with the different. Right, right. With uh, made it more difficult for pitchers. Yeah. Uh, and obviously, in the last couple of years, so yeah. he's maybe it's easier for him to adjust to it because he never. <laughs> He, just, he hasn't been pitching as long. as Some of, the, some of these guys who are starting as 22-year-olds have still been pitching longer in their lifetimes than, than Blanco has been pitching in his lifetime. True, true. I do think, and you're referring to the pitch clock, I think, when you're talking about making it more difficult on pitchers. Well, no, but not to mention the stealing rules, the, the, yeah. the, the differences with um, the first and second base and all that. For sure. Specifically the pitch clock, though, I do think we, we hear very little about any of the guys who have come up through the minor leagues the last few years. Yeah. Having issues with the pitch clock because they were dealing with the pitch clock in the minor leagues the last few years, you know. Well, and he pitches really fast too, so that's he does. Like, he's one of the guys where you figure like, okay, well, no big deal. He'll this is fine. what he does. It kind of like Urquidy, right? Or he just gets up, pitches, mows him down, boom. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, um, so really good to see last night. Look, the Astros needed it. One and four on the season now, and they hit five home runs in the game last night. Tucker with two, Yiner Diaz with two. Um, Jeremy Pena finally gets off the schneid and hits a home run for the first time since July 5th of last, of last season, July 5th, 2023. Um, let's hope that it's not one of these things where when the Astros score 10 runs or more, the next night is anemic. Let's hope that that's oh, yeah. that little trend. Remember no. that the last couple no, of yeah. years? I, I don't worry about that. Let's, uh, let's exercise the demons. Let's yeah. just go ahead and have at it, okay? Let's really explore, explore the ballpark. Not to mention just you need to do two things. You need to stop doing that thing where you act like you act like you've just. Uh, I was made a bad analogy there. Let's not act like you can't get up again for the next night, okay? Um, let's not act like you wasted all of your energy on that huge performance with ten runs, yeah. and then you you can't hit your way out of a paper bag the next night. So let's not do that. Um, and uh, and let's keep winning at home, okay? Yes. Let's 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 Dude. maybe just get rid of this notion that somehow uh, the, you're hexed at, at Minute Maid somehow. I I mean, look, I I remember how bad it was because they went one and five in the playoffs last year, and obviously you get swept by the Yankees, and and the, they finished sub 500 at home last year, but a lot of that was fueled by them being really bad at home down the stretch. Like they were like okay at home for most of the year, and then down the stretch they stunk. Last night's win. Gets them to eight and twenty-five since August third of last season at home. Eight oh and twenty-five, including the playoffs. <laughs> eight and twenty-five. Oh my gosh, that's awful. That's that's, that's less than the twenty-five. Per, like that's that's much worse than the A's are as a baseball team. Like winning oh percentage-wise, like they are at home since early August of last season, including the postseason. They are worse than what the Oakland A's are as a baseball team. What have, we, uh, what have we blamed through the years when the Astros have struggled at home? The batter's eye has been most recent. The batter's eye. The, uh, the LED lights, remember, when they first yeah. installed those a few years back? And it's always these things where it's whatever excuse you want to make for it, the problem is that the, the visiting team that doesn't spend nearly as much time in your ballpark is also dealing with those same <laughs> yeah. things. Like, oh, this ba yeah, sure, this batter's eye is prejudiced against the home ball club. All right, fine. Um, I don't know. I, it's a, I, I don't know who the current culprit is uh, or what the theories are, but let's just let's make it a non-story by the end of April. Yes, okay? yes, I agree with that. Um, I guess this is a game set that's set up for this just because this type of reaction, the main reaction today should be Renel Blanco, incredible story. Astros get a win. Joe Spada gets his first win. Jeremy Pena gets a home run. And yet, I, I kind of get this here in that Yiner Diaz hitting a couple of bombs. Yiner Diaz catching a no-hitter with an inexperienced starting pitcher has led to a lot of this. 7-2-0-0. Can you all get someone to interview Dusty and ask him what he thought about the no-hitter last night and Yiner calling the game? He already told us. He already told us how he feels about it last year. He said the city of Houston is going to thank him for the way that he handled Yiner Diaz. 7 3, three zero. All credit to Maldonado for teaching Yiner how to manage the game like that and how to support Blanco between innings. 
Dusty yes. Baker is what yeah, it says. That, that dusty texting in. <laughs> yeah, Dusty texting in. <laughs> Dusty's texting in. Yep. Like in the midst of working with his roses out in his in his rose garden. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, you know what, Dusty? That was masterful spin by Dusty, though, because what happens in that situation? Um, he can say, hey, the city of Houston will thank me for the way I handled Yiner. One of two things is going to happen. Either Yiner, if Yiner flames out, then Dusty's still correct in the way he handled Yiner Diaz in his mind. Um, but if Yiner does well, then this was all just part of the master plan. Thank me yeah. later. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. Thank me later. Um, my overall feelings on Dusty as a manager are really good. He won a World Series. He won a bunch of games. The the Yiner Maldi thing is something I, I can never let go. And last night's game is a game where it's it's never going to get accentuated more than it will yeah. last night. Yiner hitting two bombs and an inexperienced starting pitcher throwing a complete game no-hitter with Yiner behind the plate. This is the part, too, though, that would drive you insane about all of that. It's just whatever you feel about all the arguments for, all the arguments that Dusty had for keeping Maldonado in, they're all valid. You know, you can agree with them, or disagree, but at the very least, they're valid arguments. The problem was that it was so clear that Maldonado, as an old catcher, was suffering from fatigue. It almost, you can make it independent of Yiner and how well he was doing. Maldonado was letting, letting balls pass him. Like, he just, he wasn't actually performing well as a catcher himself, not to mention what a drain he was at the plate. So all of that, you don't have to, you don't have to demote him out of the starting catcher spot or what have you. Just give him a little bit of rest. Allow him to be better than what he is. I think it, it's impossible to look at the way he handled Yiner and kind of the way he handled McCormick, which is that, no matter what he says, the actions show that he didn't really think much of McCormick and he didn't really think much of Yiner. Like, it doesn't mean he hated them as people or anything like that. It's just he didn't really think much of them. And it's, it, it's, it's hard to think otherwise, especially now that Yiner is doing so well. Yeah, that's, and you're right, and that's the big thing. It's, it's both ends of the spectrum, right? It's Maldonado, T, you point out, or, you know, certainly aging has something to do with that. And statistically especially offensively, just not good. Like, he's a gigantic grenade that you drop at the bottom of your lineup. The whole thing is accentuated by the fact that you might be sitting right now on a, a, a kid who could be a top-five catcher. You really could. Yeah. Like, uh, like he is oh, an outlier. offensively, yeah. for sure. I mean, yeah, it, this is crazy. Yeah, and, and, and the, we haven't seen – I haven't seen anything defensively or handling the pitchers thus far this year. That, that makes me nervous. He was really good at throwing out runners last year as well, you know? I mean, if you look at so far the performance of him as a catcher and how it may have affected the pitchers, uh, no issues whatsoever with the starting pitchers. I don't think there's anybody, it, 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 you know, uh, let's remember, hey, Framber had to have Maldonado last year, yeah. including in the second half when he was awful, you know? Yep. Had to have Maldonado. So I'm not going to blame, I'm not going to blame Yiner for Framber Frambering on, in game one. Um, the starting pitchers have been just fine. It's been the relievers that have been the issue. So, uh, yeah, I, I, so far there's absolutely zero that, in my mind, justifies the way the catchers were handled last year. Yeah, yeah, it was, uh, it was fun. Um, okay, uh, 1194, Sean just said a complete game, no hitter. A no hitter is and must be a complete game. Would be interested to hear Seth's thoughts. I, mean, I think I said a complete game no header at one point. I, I, and I, but I, I just said it in talking about Yiner. I, I, the only way we're, we're saying an individual hits individual it because, the, because the Astros have had so many committees. So just right. they're, they're like, set down your nerdy baseball almanac and yeah. just shut the hell up for a minute, yeah, okay? Yeah, yeah, you yeah. know what we're saying. The com- my God. The complete- I, are, you, are you really trying to ruin sad. Yeah, Are you trying to ruin my morning? Yeah. I am trying to enjoy this damn. I'm trying to enjoy this no hitter. I shouldn't have read and it. You're, and you're bringing up grammar Nazi BS. My <laughs> God. Not even grammar. A complete game's an actual stat. And that's what he's pointing out. Like, oh, okay. Gotcha. Um, We're trying, yes. We're, tomorrow we will bring to you our effort. We're going to try to do a four hour radio show in three minutes by being as precise and as, 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 as parsimonious yeah. with our. Phrasing as possible. I, shouldn't have I apologize I shouldn't have for speaking. <laughs> um, Stop ruining my joy. Stop stealing my joy, damn it. Yeah. You're joy thieves. <laughs> Energy vampire. Uh, how is Maldonado doing this season? Is he hitting at all? According to at least a couple people who've weighed in on the show this morning, he's not gotten a hit yet this season. I'll double check it. He's on the White Sox, for those who want to know. Um, Jeremy Pena is hitting 444. Oh, 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 go ahead. He's, uh, Maldi's 0 for 8 to start the season. There you go. 
Pena is hitting 444 with an 1167 OP. I know that's not our catcher that we're talking about. Right. But I'm just thinking, like, the various offensive projects that we were concerned about, um, Jeremy is looking absolutely just fine. I wasn't worried about Yiner offensively. I'm, um, I'm, I'm kind of <laughs> – I mean, he's hitting 444. And Yiner's hitting 444 with a 1278. Pena is – Something different. I was reading uh, the wrong one. Anyways, okay. they're, they're both doing just fine. Yeah, good, good, good. Uh, Payne and Pendergast with you on a um, on a Tuesday. All right, um, let's what circle back. Hell no, Payne is hitting the exact same thing as Yiner. 444, 1167 OPS. That's what okay. I thought. Yeah, that's what I thought. I, was, I, I, thought, I, was, uh, I thought I was going crazy Payton here because crazy of that damn, that damn grammar Nazi had screwed me up. Don't but so far, Payne and Yiner Diaz basically the same human being at the plate. Yep. Uh, all right, Payne and Pendergast with you. Um, all right, the, uh, we're down to the final four in both men's and women's basketball, specifically with the men. Does the NFL have an eye on the men, the NFL, not the NBA? have an eye on the men's final four this weekend. If you were the Texans, would you take a chance on this final four participant? That is coming up next. Pain and Pendergast. The big-
once a day. Sports Radio 610 presents Payne and Pendergast. All right, Payne and Pendergast with you. Final Four this weekend. Men's Final Four. UConn, Purdue, NC State, and Alabama. UConn plays Alabama. Uh, Purdue plays NC State. And one of the bigger storylines in this tournament has been North, the North Carolina State Wolfpack. They, they yeah. probably wouldn't have made the tournament at all had they not won the ACC championship. And they've just been on this magical run, a whole lot like 1983 back in the day with Jim Valvano. And we all know about that one here in Houston. NC State, on a, the, for their first Final Four that they've been to since that Final Four in 1983. And DJ Burns, their very hefty big man in the middle, is getting a lot of attention, Seth, not just from basketball people, but evidently, according to Peter Schrager of the NFL Network, he has the attention of some football people as well. Yeah, he's. Uh, d- uh, d- d- do we have the audio? Uh, no, there is no audio. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, all right, yeah, okay, yeah, sorry. Um, I, yeah, I think that I, I I see him mentioned as an offensive lineman. Uh, I I don't know. I he seems to have the attitude more of a defensive lineman. Yeah, you know, they're talking smack to Duke. Uh, the Duke fans, which is, that's, which is always a people pleaser since Duke fans aren't actual people. So I think that uh, I, I, I do wonder why they're talking about him as an offensive lineman. He's kind of he's spindly legged for a bigger guy. He does not look like a guy who enjoys his leg day. And uh, that's the one thing that makes me wonder where a lot of the other guys that have gone from basketball to the NFL, almost exclusively, they end up being like tight ends or wide receivers. Yeah, um, he is. He's. Very obviously skilled hand-eye coordination. I wonder if he got a little bit, I was just about to say, if he got a little bit svelte or if he couldn't be a tight end. But obviously he's playing a sport that rewards sveltness already. So I don't think that's in the cards for him. If anything, it's gonna, they would reward his ability to bulk on even more. He's, I just, but he's going to have to get in the gym. Because he doesn't, he's not actually, like by football player standards, he doesn't move as quickly or as explosively as most even offensive linemen. Mm -hmm. Um, So I don't know. It's just impossible to visualize these guys sometimes until they train a little bit more like a football player. Yeah, look, his heft is what's putting him on. His heft combined with his his feet. You know, they like his feet. You know, he's for a guy guy that's got a a boiler, he's got very nimble nimble feet. He's listed at 6'9", 275. Mm -hmm. And... I think both of those are a little off. I don't know that he's six nine. People that are around him tend to think he's more he's closer to six seven. Which yeah. actually makes me feel a little better about him being a football player, that he's not just this huge tall guy like six nine, six ten, like six seven. Yeah, a little six more nine's compact. tough. There's not a lot of there's a, the, it's very rare for somebody taller than six seven to make it at yeah. any position. Yeah. Two seventy five feels I feel like we're a few biscuits short of what he actually is. At two seventy five. I don't know. It's hard to it's hard to judge body weight on big guys like that. I think well, and his again, legs are say, skinny too, as you point leg, out. He doesn't yeah. have as much muscle as most uh, as most as, as, as most football players. That's where I think the transition to tight end it's easier to visualize. Like he honestly, <laughs> I don't. I'm not trying to bash him at all. It's just hard for me to visualize him moving like an offensive or a defensive lineman. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it, it, so yeah, but I would say I'd go for it for sure. I don't know if he's uh, you know if I'm him. And if I'm his parents and his dad, his dad looks like he might be six nine himself. Okay. You know, you gotta wonder. All right, the kid. You know, follow your bliss and all that. But if if you had to do it all over again, this kid should have been an offensive lineman. If you're trying to maximize his earnings, so what? At what point did they make the decision to go with basketball over football? Because maybe he just didn't. Maybe he doesn't have the attitude for it. But he looks like he's got a football attitude. I do, don't know. Do we know? I couldn't find anywhere where it said if he played football or not. Do we know if he played? Do Do we know? Do, I don't know. That's yeah. what I'm asking. I don't. I don't have an idea. I have. A, I have no clue. I've yeah. done zero background research into DJ Burns. Text I just him. want to enjoy him for what he is right now, which is a a gap tooth bundle of <laughs> fun and frivolity <laughs> with a little bit of anger mixed. A little in. bit of trash talk mixed in. Yeah. 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 You're right. I'm looking at the names: Tony Gonzalez, Antonio Gates, Jimmy Graham, all tight ends. Julius Peppers. Julius Peppers probably the closest thing to an outlier as far as what position they went on to play. Um, Connor, but Barlin, Julius Peppers, but he also played football in college. Too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The guys that the guys that the guys that played basketball and didn't play football, I, I think tend to be tight ends more so than uh, like almost always. Tony Gonzalez, um, Antonio Gates, Jimmy Graham. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then guys who wrestled and didn't play football, but then go on to the NFL are almost always offensive linemen. Yeah. Usually centers or guards. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There have been mm-hmm. a few of those guys in the year, through the years. Yep. Um, 
I guess Hard Knocks now, the in-season Hard Knocks, is moving to a format where they're doing full divisions. They're not doing single teams anymore. Um, so, well, who knows? If the, if the producers of Hard Knocks find the AFC South compelling enough, maybe we get some more Texans content during the season. Here's Jason McCourty of uh, Good Morning Football making a case for the AFC South on the in-season hard knocks. AFC South as my division. This is a division that nobody <laughs> wants to Let's talk go. about. The one that they're always saying, all right, we got this new team, that new team, this new quarterback, all of that, this, that, and all that. And I, what I love about them, this is a team with quarterbacks. You look at Anthony Richardson, you look at Will Levis, you're looking at Shane Steichen leading this team, and you're looking at C.J. Stroud, and you're looking at Trevor Lawrence. All of these young guys that are developing and are going to be exciting. I want to follow these divisions. I want to see what they're saying about each other the week of those games, and I want to unturn new stones. There's teams that have never won the Super Bowl in this division. Yeah, we can look at all the Andy Reeds and the Harbaugh's and the Tomlins and all of those guys that we know everything about them let's talk about a division that's not often talked about and i'm rolling with the ac south was that was that a false flag operation that was he made a perfect argument for why it shouldn't be the afc south he was like i'm going to tell you exactly why it shouldn't be the afc south because people are way more interested in andy reed or mike tomlin or all of these other teams or teams that have won super bowls uh let's let's put it in the division that nobody actually cares about right I mean, you're not helping us out at all there devin mccourty uh, go, go into a little bit, bit of specificity about either the excitement of Anthony Richardson, C.J. Stroud uh, taking the league by storm, uh, Trevor Lawrence, will he cut his hair, all the stuff that people care about. Right. Not all this nonsense about how you, it should be the AFC South because nobody cares about the AFC South. Are Will Levis' teammates going to murder him by the end of the season? Things like that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think that, for one, as he was saying all of that stuff, it, I, I realized, I, I, I don't know, I don't think the Colts being the in-season team helped out at all because that was one of those things I didn't even realize until the end of the season when I watched a highlight from the in-season hard knocks that they were following the Colts around. I, I'm guessing, I'm guessing that HBO has looked at who's watching and who isn't and that the in-season hard knocks has been probably way more about like just one little city and that, that watches like it was a car i never know that there's even one going on i have to be reminded when it, it gets referenced in an article or something so i i'm guessing that since they're going to a strategy of four teams instead of just one that they're also going to go big like the nfc east or something yeah like that. yeah yeah i think nfc east um just be right because of the blue-blooded nature of that division yeah. it's got the cowboys and the eagles in it and they draw eyeballs they draw yeah. eyeballs i think if if, if we're just taking compelling personalities in the and the AFC East is that I mean you, you've got the Cowboys and the Eagles I think the AFC West would be my choice um Andy Reid Jim Harbaugh and Sean Payton all in the same division week to yeah. week watching that that would be really interesting to me that would be uh like Harbaugh alone just for the sound bites and everything yeah. and I think I think Harbaugh having done the college thing now for as long as he did is probably as open as ever to just a media presence. Like college coaches just, they've learned about the value of social media in recruiting. And Harbaugh goes along with a lot of goofy little stuff on social media. So I bet he's, and especially he's at that age too, you know, where guys just start letting it all hang out and don't worry too much about a lot of the stupid stuff. I bet, I bet that's going to be an interesting follow this year. If they oh, actually yeah. win games. If they don't get destroyed by the curse that is the... The Los Angeles Chargers. Chargers curse. Man, I, I don't know. If Harbaugh can't break it, then I don't know who they're down to now. To, like Harbaugh turned that. I, I know the 49ers had had success a few decades before Harbaugh got there, but they were they were really bad for like a decade, and he came in, they were 13-3 and three his first year with Alex Smith at quarterback. Harbaugh's a yeah. really good coach. Yeah. He's a really good coach. Um, Payne and Pendergast with you um, on, a, uh, on a Tuesday. Big story today, Renel Blanco, perfect game. Astros get their first win of the season, so that's good. We'll hit that more at the top of the hour. Um, top of the hour in our in our headlines. Uh, Toronto. They got Toronto the next couple games. Schedule. They, I mean, they need to this this sweep at the hands of the Yankees. Like, yeah, I know, I know it's 162 game season and all that. The Astros' schedule is not very forgiving early in the season. Here, they've got two more with Toronto. <clears throat> They're at Texas for four. At Kansas City, that won't be too bad. But then they play Texas again for three, and then Atlanta for three here. So 
Um, it's it's not a it's not an easy early schedule. This Adolis Garcia uh, from last night, Philip Maton. If you did, if you missed it, beaned Adolis Garcia with the bases loaded. <laughs> Garcia was pissed. I'm glad there's people on social media seeing the same thing I am. Adolis Garcia looks like he's put on about 30 pounds of muscle this off season. Oh really? His is that the scandal? His well, it is now. Like people are noticing it because of this play last night. I, I, somebody had tweeted that. Um, I guess when uh, the, the, when when you take PEDs, the first sign in the gym that people are juicing is that their traps get really big. Okay. <laughs> His traps are gigantic because the shoulder, the, the shoulder and neck area have a ton of androgen receptors. I'm oh, reading okay. on social media. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, the yeah. shoulder and the neck area have a bunch of androgen receptors. And he looks, okay. Seth, have you seen this highlight? Like, he looks, he's, he is, yeah. His tra- he looks different. No, I'm not going to go. I'm not allowed to be on the computer. Doing okay, that's that. fine. Every that's time fine. I try to get on the computer, you say my name 29 times. No, no, times. no. That's... Hey, Seth, 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 Seth. All Seth, I asked was, Seth. have you seen it? I didn't say I have not seen it. it, no. Okay, yeah, yeah. Like, and... uh, I've never heard about, like, the traps being the first place that the steroids hit. Uh, if, 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 he's been a, if he's a guy that's never lifted before and he started lifting, then you can put on a lot of weight. He's 31 years old. Okay. Um... And, uh, but I'm all for, yeah, I'm all for a steroid scandal with Arlington. Yes. It wouldn't surprise me, not in the slightest. Yes. I mean, it seems exactly what they'd be up to, right? <laughs> um, I don't know if, they, if we start a campaign to overturn the results of the ALCS of last year or not. Did I say Blanco threw a perfect game? I meant a no hitter if I said perfect game. Sorry. Uh, if I said perfect game, I meant no hitter. George Springer got two walks. George Springer was, he spoiled it for all of us. It would have been a perfect game. George Springer got two. Well, though in the um, do, do you have to be can if somebody gets on base because of an error that you can still get the perfect game? You cannot. Nope. Okay, perfect so games, that would have ruined it too. That would have ruined it the, too. Uh, yep. The hit, yep. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. The fielder's choice would have ruined it. Uh, text message: Go Phil Maton doing the Lord's work. That's what I said. Yeah, like he's he's still taking care of family business, even though he's at the different family now. We love that about Philip Maton. Yeah, that's um, Adolis Garcia, who you know by begging to get hit by Brian Abreu ended up uh, making Brian Abreu not so sharp when he had to come in in game mm-hmm. three versus the Yankees. And basically is the reason that the we, we can still blame Adolis Garcia for the Astros starting off 0-4. That's right. That's right. The Yankees, by the way, are 5-0 and if you wanted to be annoyed about they it. They won again last night? Crap. Yeah. Um, all right. A Payne Pendergast with you uh, on, a, uh, on a Tuesday. Hope you're having a good day. Hope you're having a nice, safe drive-in. Um, Kevin Garnett and Paul Pierce got into it on – their podcast yesterday about the Rockets of all things. But I think they do kind of frame what's going to be a huge storyline here in Houston sports in the upcoming months surrounding the Rockets. You'll hear from both of them coming up next. Men's Tea Clinic.
SportsCenter.com. Live from the Twin Peaks studios, Sports Radio 610 presents Payne and Pendergast. All right, Rockets get to start a new winning streak tonight, hopefully. They're in Minnesota to take on the very formidable Timberwolves. The Dallas Mavericks are in San Francisco to take on the Golden State Warriors. If the Mavericks win against Golden State and the Rockets pull off the upset tonight, Minnesota sets up a fun Thursday night at Toyota Center with the Warriors coming to town. And the Rockets being a game back of them with what will be seven games to go in the season. Rockets currently two games back with eight games to go, two games back of the 10 seed, which would get them into the play in. They need to pick up three games because Golden State has the tiebreaker. So that's the situation right now. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, you know what, honestly, in a weird place where I'll look for inspiration for making the playoffs at the end of the season, even if you haven't handled everything perfectly, is the Houston Astros, which, um, Managed to win the division last year, um, despite doing very little to to actually. Still doesn't feel like it. <laughs> despite trying, trying like hell not to win the division, yeah. they they ended up winning the division. So likewise, you got to remember, they, yeah, like in your mind when they've got ten games, when they had ten games remaining, you thought, okay, well, all you have to do is win out, and then the Warriors can just lose a couple. But we know it's uh, it's not typically like that. No. It gets sloppy and messy. The Warriors are obviously an imperfect team. Uh, just the, by virtue of the fact that they're in the scenario they're in, uh, you don't. I, I would advise everybody not to just sit back and lay down and die just because they've got the name Warriors attached to their jerseys. Right. It's not the same team. Not the same team. Um, the Rockets, whether they make the play-in, and even win in the play-in, but if make the play-in or not, um, I think the season, unless things really unravel these last eight games, I think the season's been a success. Um, they've They've uh, gotten better since kind of dipping in the middle of the season. Some of the young pieces are starting to look like pieces that could be good pieces on a good basketball team, um, including Jalen Green, who is, you know, by, by virtue of where he was taken in the draft and the fact that he's been here nearly three seasons now, maybe your most important piece. Him and Alperin Shengun taken in the same draft a few years ago. So they've seen some things since they got here. Um, the Shengun Jalen Green storyline will be an interesting one this summer. It's fueled certainly by the fact that Shengun had been playing at an all star level in the first half of the season while Jalen Green was getting benched on a far too frequent basis in games. And then there was a period where they were both playing pretty well, and then Shengun goes out for a period of time. We don't know if he's coming back or not, but he's been out for a while now with an ankle injury and Jalen Green has ascended to be to where he's playing at an all-star level. That's not hyperbole. He was player of the week a couple weeks ago. He's been playing really, really well. So the narrative will certainly be, okay, can these two guys function together in a winning basketball environment against good teams? Paul Pierce and Kevin Garnett got into it about the future of the Rockets. Here is uh, here are the two Hall of Famers, former Celtics, arguing about moving Shengun. Because you heard of addition by subtraction. What I'm saying is, like he's playing. a great young player. Yeah, right. Bro. Numbers. I mean, he the way he did win Benyama, he's an asset. Bro, he so now, if they make the right. playoffs, they on an eight nine game winning streak. You might could trade him and get a veteran piece to really help them. Because oh. Jalen Green, he looking like a franchise player, right? He looking like a baby McGrady. But mm. you can't get a Shen Goon just out of the out of the clay, bro. You can't just go to. But the they gonna have to make decisions on Shangun, bro. Jabari Parker. Keep all that together. Why can't you? You, you can't got a keep young all that together. But why can't you? I mean, Jabari Smith, Jalen Green. Man, Minnesota doing it. Oh, 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 OKC doing it. No, they don't Orlando, got three, they don't got three young it. dudes like that. that basically, Orlando going to have to make a decision, too. Man, you got a core. <laughs> all right. Um, you know what? I, did he mention Amon Thompson? He did not. I don't think he – he didn't. I mean, because that's the key right there. Is I, And this is where I get – I get really nervous, man. When a team makes a push – late in the season and things look good and especially when it's versus bad teams that you start to delude yourself into thinking like oh yeah yeah the nba is all it's all positionless basketball these days and i'm in thompson's you're five anyway and it doesn't really matter and then all of a sudden you run up against good teams and you got to win in the half court and it's not as simple as like Doing what the Astros thought they were going to do when they got rid of Clint Capella a few years ago. And, oh, yeah, who needs, a, who needs a big man anyway? It's all spacing and ball bearings these days. Uh, yeah, I feel like at, at that point, I just start to question, all right, well, then what are coaches even for? You know, oh, oh no, it's not a perfect fit immediately out the box. Then, then what are coaches actually for if you can't make it work with Shangun? I don't, I wholeheartedly dismiss and discard 
Any uh, notion that somehow, like, uh, the, it's just impossible for Jalen Green and Albert Ch uh, and Albert Shangun to to actually coexist and be a good basketball team? Yeah, together. yeah, no, because yeah, skilled big men have never existed with skilled smaller men before ever in the history of the NBA. Um, being sarcastic, um, it got heated actually. Like they they continue As it should have they they continue. With this cage gets heated when they talk about keeping the Rockets core together. This summer you got to sign Jalen Green for a hundred. Okay, and cool, you got it. Let's get it. So, he, he's so there. now next summer you got to make a decision on Jabari or Sangoon. They're in house. You can sign, resign all those guys as well. No, no, you can't resign. You only got to, to, uh, room for two of them. Bro, you can resign all those guys. Yeah, what I'm saying, bro. What are you talking about? They, they're your guys. Mm. You Houston, Houston ain't got the. They, they ain't. Bro, if you are serious about winning and you got a young nucleus that's growing, you gotta have a young group to be able to battle against OKC, Minnesota. Uh, what, what, what's else in the West? Uh, the Sacramento, yeah. uh, the Pelicans, yeah, the sure Magic. The Pelican. These all got young four, five, six motherfuckers on there. They got a young <laughs> nucleus. I'm just saying, bro, I'm watching the talent pool. And if you ain't got no four, five young motherfuckers and you ain't got them cuffed, bro, you ain't ready for the future. Yeah, Ke Kevin Garnett schooled Paul Pierce's ass in this argument. Like, school, he was the one that was getting heated about keeping Shangun and keeping Jalen Green. If you're having trouble making the distinction between the two voices, he, he smoked it. Paul Pierce... First of all, Paul Pierce is making an assumption that the Rockets, like he's he's making an assumption that the Rockets are going to be cheap, that they're not going to pay a bunch of guys right. of their right. own guys that they drafted. And look, they're not going to keep, they've got six young guys they've drafted in the first round of the draft in the last three years. Shangun and Green three years ago. Two years ago, it was Jabari and Tari Eason. Um, and then last year was Amen Thompson and Cam Whitmore. Newsflash, not all six of these guys are going to be Rockets in four years. Some of them are not going to play well enough to be. And then there will you will reach a point where, okay, you're going to have five max guys on your roster. I don't think that's the case. The only thing that matters right now is Green and Shen Goon because they're the only ones that you're making decisions on or have the yeah. ability to make decisions on this summer. That's where Pierce was off as well. He's lumping Shen Goon with Jabari Smith in that class. Shen Goon and Jalen Green are the two that got drafted together. And so there's really – there's – there's three scenarios, I think. There's both of them get extensions, Shingun and Jalen Green, like max level extensions. One gets extended and one doesn't, which would be very interesting. <laughs> and then, um, and I think the other the other scenario would be if there were a trade, I think it would be Shingun who gets traded. I don't think the Rockets, especially with how Jalen's playing right now, I think the possession arrow has always been pointed towards them really, really wanting Jalen Green to work out. And if he gets anywhere close to looking like he's going to be an all-star, and he's surpassed that in the last month or so, like he's been amazing, um, he ain't going anywhere. I don't think either of them are going anywhere, but if one were to go somewhere, I think it would be Shingun who would get moved. I, I think, uh, I guess part of the problem then becomes to, I, I think you have to be really, really careful in thinking that Jalen Green has, like, unlocked something that just coincidentally coincidentally happened when Alper, uh, when Shangun uh, went out like obviously the spacing is there you can drive to the hoop a lot easier with nobody clogging the the the, the, the low post down there like all of that makes sense but you can't think that yeah that's the end result and that's what you're going to move forward with like it, at some point there needs to be genuine growth between Jalen Green and whomever they have else who isn't Shangun out there. Because you're just, you're, you're not going to, you know, I'm not sitting here like, you know, Charles Barkley back in the day saying that a jump shooting team isn't going to win the championship right. or anything like that. Like different styles work in the modern NBA. But there's still an avenue by which both those guys work on the same team and it's by them both becoming more mature and versatile basketball players. Like if you genuinely want a championship, I just don't see a better... It's hard for me to just believe there's a better avenue to getting to a championship that starts with getting rid of Shangun and that that's and that's what it is yeah. because you're just flat out with everything that made Jalen Green work over the past in the 11 game win streak. What the hell? Sorry, my computer started playing music. It got it. It, it gave me a theme song to my little Rockets rant. Um, it's, that's not the end product. Like, that's not the championship team. The, the Rockets, as of right now, are not a championship team. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, so, uh, like, I got I to gotta know what the plan is without Shangun. It, it can't just be like, oh, yeah, these guys, right here. This right. crew right here. That's, that's, that's the plan. Right, 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 right. I think in the short term, the plan for your big man, like short term by, like, next season, I mean, is you're getting Steven Adams back from injury. Like, he would be your center. 
But I, I get what you're saying, like long term. And, and Steven Adams isn't a guy that plays into what you were talking about earlier, which is when things tighten up in the playoffs. Yeah. And you're in the half court. You're not lobbing the, you know, you, Stephen Adams. Yeah, am I wrong? A, yeah, you're not kicking it out to Stephen Adams St- for a for a for a clutch three. Nor are you b- dumping it into him down in the post and letting him go to work. Like he's yeah. a big body that's there to rebound, and and you know and, and protect the rim and do all those things. Shangun is a Shangun is a highly skilled. Shangun is one of the most skilled seven footers walking the planet. Like that's not yeah. an exaggeration. Like he is a highly skilled. Big man who who brings other things to the table, but that's also the I mean that's the other side of it where it's on both of Jalen Green and sure. uh, and Shangun to like okay look yeah it's awesome that you're able to defend Wembenyama but he also weighs 162 pounds you know like there's there is that element of during that that win streak too they hadn't run up against the like badass maulers that you have to face at times like that's that's where Shangun defensively has to change so I'm like I'm very optimistic about a lot of the things on the Rockets, but I think we always just have to remember that, yeah, they are, they are still very much a work in progress and that the, the win streak was nice because it showed you potential and it showed you what it can look like when things are working well together. But I, there's, just a, there's a certain amount of um, throwing the baby out with the bathwater just because your two young stars can't coexist right now. And as far as we know, it has nothing to do with, like, personality conflicts oh, no. or philosophical differences or anything like that. It's still that they're just still both very young players. That's the scary thing. They're, like there's a few things in, in this debate and in the sound we just heard from, from Pierce and KG. In fact, Ben, cue up number two from them again. I'll, I'll toss to it in a second, but it just goes to show you, like you've got to make decisions on these guys so early. Like they're not, they're not even, they're barely drinking age, I think, you know, and you're having to figure out, okay, do we give this guy a max deal? And a max deal is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So there's that. The thing, if I'm Adam Silver, that would be a little bit chilling about listening to this cut from KG, when KG gets super heated about where the Rockets fall in the West, take a listen one more time. This summer you got to sign Jane Green. For a hundred Okay, and cool. You got it. Let's get it. So, he, he's so there. now next summer you got to make a decision on Jabari or Sangoon. They're in-house. You can sign, re-sign all those guys is what no, I'm no, saying. No, you can't re-sign. You only got to, to, uh, room for two of them. Bro, you can re-sign all those guys is what I'm saying, bro. What are you talking about? They, they're your guy. Mm. You Houston, Houston ain't got the – they ain't – Bro, if out. you're serious about winning and you got a young nucleus that's growing, you're going to have a young group to be able to battle against OKC, Minnesota, uh, what, what, what's else in the West? Uh, f- Sacramento, yeah. uh, the Pelicans, yeah, the, the Magic. The Pelican. These all got young four, five, six more on there. They got a young nucleus. I, we're good. I got what I needed. Um, Orlando's not in the West, but the, I, I think if I'm Adam Silver, you listen to the the teams he's rattling off right there. Yeah. And you're thinking about just the NBA and the blue bloodedness and how teams like the Lakers and the Knicks and the Bulls and those are the ones that have this is the Celtics. Celtics are good. Um, in the West, Oklahoma City, Minnesota, Sacramento, New Orleans, like these are tiny markets in the NBA. Like these yeah. are these are as non blue blood as it gets yeah. in the NBA. Yeah. You know, just yeah. I think it's I just find it interesting. Like the NBA is not going to die or anything like that. But you're you're about to head into the post LeBron era, and I guess it's Giannis for kind of the older crew, and Victor Wembanyama is the younger buck here. Is Victor Wembanyama, yeah, like how much. How much appeal does Victor Wembanyama actually have for the youth? Um, is that, like, how many Wembanyama jerseys do you see when you uh, take your daily trips to Galleria Mall for it's your a, walk? It's a good question. I think if he played for somebody other than San Antonio, like if he played for a big market team, you'd see a lot of them. And I know San Antonio. It's hard to embrace a Frenchman, man. Like Tony Parker tried it for years, and yeah. they just uh, it's, it's hard to embrace a Frenchman yeah. in, in the NBA. Yeah. And, uh, they even, uh, yeah, yeah. People yeah. like winners. Um, he's not on a winning team right now. I, you know. I don't know. Weigh in. I, I maybe I'm out of touch. Seven one three five seven two four six ten. Do you guys is Wembyama? He because he is touted as the future face of the league for better or worse. You know, yeah. he is he is that guy. Um, a pain and Pendergast with you. Um, I, the top jersey sales in the NBA most recently, the, uh, the Steph Curry, LeBron James, yeah, Jason Tatum. Yep. Yeah, no win, no Wembenyama on this list. Tonight. Oh no, wait, wait, Wembenyama crashes the top five. Ah, damn it. Okay. All right. Yeah. We gotta get Shangun up in there, man. Up in the top. Yeah. 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 Got to get a rocket in there. Any rocket, we'll take any rocket up there. Um, Payne and Pendergast with you. We're gonna get to the eight at eight in just a second. The Kim Mulkey article came out. 
from the Washington Post, the one that she was lawyering up to go combat whatever was in it. And as it turns out, the 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 um, the bombshell revelations we were hoping for, or maybe some were hoping for. I was hoping for some. Um, it didn't really didn't really turn out that way. It turns out she's just very single minded in succeeding. Offends a lot of people. Fractures a bunch of relationships. Things like yeah. that. She's very brash and holds grudges. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Is there uh, is there anything that you saw, that you read in it that was uh, lawsuit worthy? Well, it, it that she should sue them over. Not that I saw. Admittedly, I didn't okay. read the actual article. I only saw synopses of the article. I'm sure if there was something lit- litigation worthy, we'd have yeah. heard about it. Um, one of the things that was kind of funny that came out of this article, though, is of course Kim Mulkey left Baylor to go to LSU, and you know Baylor is Baylor's still a very solid women's basketball program, not performing at the level it did with Kim Mulkey there. But the name of their coach is Nikki Colleen, and mm-hmm. she had one of the funnier quotes that when you cut out just one part of the quote, I laughed very hard. This is the very beginning of a long rant that she had. Apparently, the article Kim Mulkey, the article about Kim Mulkey. The writer described Baylor as a withering program. Like, is, oh, you know, it's, it's, been yeah. back, it's been backsliding since Mulkey yeah. left. Nikki Colleen took great offense to that. This was the very beginning of her rant, and just in a, in a vacuum, this little chunk made me laugh. I'm not afraid to say I was really, really offended by the article that came out. And I didn't read any of it. Didn't read any of it. <laughs> <laughs> that just made me laugh. I, I'm gonna do her a solid. Like she went on to explain. She went on to explain that, that she got wind of the withering categorization yeah, yeah, of her yeah. program. So she was offended by she was offended by that categorization of her program, which she has yeah. every right to be, and then wanted to make clear she hadn't she she didn't give this writer the time of day by actually clicking on the article and reading it. So she was, was offended she, by that one categorization. Was she being tongue in cheek there though too? Was no, she, she went on. She was very serious. Yeah. I get it. Okay. I, this is what bothers me about coaches and players of a certain age, like Aaron Rodgers, I would include in this. Anybody that's been in the league or been a coach for more than a few years, how are you possibly allowing yourself to get triggered by articles that you haven't read yet? Like, how do you not learn this lesson at some point that it's almost never as bad as people present it to you when it's just the little snippet or the little soundbite um, or the little quote without context? And like to waste energy over it without actually having read the article, I'm amazed. I'm really, really amazed that uh, that now with Mulkey, Mulkey is probably the type of person that likes having a chip on her shoulder at all times. So that might have just been the thing that she was using over the last few weeks to really to really drive her and motivate her. And almost with her, it, it might be just almost like a ha- by force of habit, she's got to have something to be pissed at. Yeah. So I I can allow it in that circumstance, but I still might not. I might not get up and give diatribes about it in front of the media. About to be clear, it. that was the Baylor coach. That wasn't I know, Mulkey. I know, okay, I know. I'm but I'm saying sure Mulkey's been the one that's yep. started. Mulkey's the only reason anybody knows about this article. She's been talking about it nonstop. Yeah, yeah. So the, the Baylor coach, us. I have no clue whether she operates that way or not. Her and us, yeah. She didn't like being described as a withering program. She said there's things sprouting here. There's things growing here. That's what she said. Yeah. I just thought that in a vacuum, like, I was so offended by this article, and I didn't read a damn word of it. <laughs> it just made me that's laugh. What, like, that's what Rogers has been doing for the last few years. Yeah. He'll, like, lambaste something that was written about him, and you're like, well, that's, that's, it sounds like you haven't read the article. Right, <laughs> like, right. you know, like, that's not actually what they said about you. You allowed, you allowed Florio to give you, like, the, the juiciest Troll quote, you. and then you're going to hate the writer of the original article instead of Florio, who just ripped it off. My yep. God. All right, let's get to the 8 at 8. Uh, eight stories here. Get your day going. You're listening to KLT and KLT HD2 and Odyssey Station. One. Ground ball. Dubon throws the first. Go header. Run up, Blanco. In his eighth career start, the 30-year-old makes magic on April Fool's Day. There you go, Todd Callis on the call. Space City Home Network last night. Good. That was. I, I would say that was a very solid final out call on a no hitter uh but the truly solid performer last night was Renell Blanco 105 pitch complete game no hitter two walks to George Springer was all he allowed uh all day long or all night long for the Astros and I guess equally as important the Astros bats woke up two home runs from Kyle Tucker two home runs from Yiner Diaz Jeremy Pena hit a home run 
If you're sitting there going, I haven't heard you say that in a while. Yeah, it's because he hasn't hit one since July 5th, 2023. But Renel Blanco, the big story last night, Seth, his eighth career start, and he pitches the earliest no-hitter in a season for any team in the history of baseball. Yeah, and I think for a guy who's pitching to a, a young first-time, full-time starting catcher in Yiner Diaz, um, I, the, it, was a, it was a little shot to the arm um, in terms of winning with new guys. Uh, not, that Gar- not that Blanco is entirely new. Um, and Blanco is just, he's so unique in his own regard because he's 30 years old and yet also a very young and inexperienced starting pitcher. So, uh, like, there's a lot to get excited about with this win over a, a, a good, a good what projects to be a good uh, Blue Jays team. Um, honestly, it was, it was really cool to watch Blanco work and look just like a Terminator the entire time. He's got a certain, he's got like a... I'm trying to think, he doesn't look like this guy, but I feel like almost uh, the demeanor of him reminds me of Vin Diesel. Like any <laughs> Vin Diesel role almost, where okay. he's kind of like emotionless and a big dude, kind of like an angry look about him, but yeah. he's not going to let you know it. Yeah. And, uh, and I don't really like Vin Diesel all that much as an actor. So it, it goes to speak how impressive Blanco is as a person that I can enjoy him as a, as a pitcher, even though he reminds me of Vin Diesel. Yeah, Vin Diesel. I'm not a big yeah. Vin Diesel guy myself either. Um, but I'll give that one. I'll, 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 I'll attach that one onto Renel Blanco. The, the pitch count was set like at a soft 90 in this game. And again, he, he showed no fatigue at all. It didn't look like he was getting rattled at any point. I mean, there really weren't a lot of points to, at which to get rattled other than a couple George Springer walks. Um, but I think the, I guess, is, is this an Espada? This was an Espada decision slash non-decision that may have been different than Dusty? Do you think at any point Dusty would have pulled Blanco because I do. there was a 90? I, 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 do you I, think? Yes, I do. Okay. I do. I think he would have. I think he would have pulled, uh, I think he would have pulled Blanco after seven or eight innings. At the, by, certainly by the eighth, by eight innings, I think he would have. And that's not – You think after eight? Because he was up, what, like, he was at 93 or 94, I think, going into the ninth Yeah, well, you know what? I, I, okay. If the score were two to nothing, he would have pulled Blanco. I think that's something to point out here is that, that – they they had the game won. the game was won from about the sixth inning on you okay, know like yeah, they they could yeah. afford to put Blanco out there and let him yeah. get a little touched up in the ninth inning because aside from Montero I think you could bring anybody in and they can hold a, an eight or a ten run lead I'm being I'm being a somewhat tongue in cheek somewhat tongue in cheek about Montero um, but I think the big lead in that game probably played into it if it were let's put it this way if it were two nothing Josh Hader's pitching the ninth inning of that game. Mm-hmm. If one base runner brings the tying run to the plate in a lineup that has a ton of power like the Toronto Blue Jays do, uh, then I don't think I, I think I think the ten nothing score contributed to, to a spot of may, maybe a, a, being allowed to be a little bit looser with leaving him in there. You know, you could load the bases and the tying run still and come to the plate for another five hitters. You know what I mean? I'll tell you what that ninth inning. One thing that kind of struck me. At the time was in this, uh, this uh, it always feels this way when you're playing the Blue Jays, um, but even more so last night. So Biggio grounds out to first. That was with the great, very nice play by Jose Abreu, yeah. who makes up for a gaffe he had in the first inning. Then Springer walks, um, and then Vlad Guerrero Jr. grounds out to second. Like I, uh, like they continue. There always continue to be ties to the uh, to the Astros there, um, and Springer. I am kind of glad that at the very least, if, uh, if anybody was going to do anything to keep this from being a perfect game, that it was Springer getting a couple of walks. That's fair. Least. That's a little consolation yeah. for old Georgie boy. Yeah. Um, Two. Quick updates here on pitchers for the Astros. Uh, Luis Garcia threw 15 pitches yesterday. He's ahead of schedule on his recovery from Tommy John surgery. Um, Justin Verlander threw 52 pitches in a live three-inning BP Yesterday, so Verlander's getting closer and closer. I was reading online yesterday, Seth. The next step for Verlander is probably a rehab start, mm-hmm. which I guess, does that mean we get a little Sugarland appearance from Justin were, Verlander? Mm-hmm. And they, yeah, and they were talking about that like it was very imminent. Yeah. So that uh, that that feels good. Luis Garcia being ahead of schedule. Um, yeah, 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 maybe we see some Sugarland, perhaps. I don't know. Yeah. We- um, as far as Garcia goes, I think that um, – 
I'm trying not to get too excited about him being ready ahead of schedule. I, I would prefer just to I, I kind of I, I put these guys in a silo off to the side until I know that the return is definitely imminent. Well, this is where a guy like Blanco, and I'm not saying he's going to be a no hitter every time out, but a guy if a guy like Blanco proves to be a capable starter, you don't have to rush guys like Luis Garcia back. Now I don't think they're going to rush him back anyways because it's Tommy John, but Luis Garcia may feel compelled to rush himself back. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So if you've got some depth in the rotation, the starters keep pitching well. That would be a good thing. Three. Uh, visit for the Texans yesterday. They get 30 players, up to 30 players they can invite to NRG Stadium. This was an easy one. My guess is they didn't have to even have to pay much in travel expenses if, if Luke McCaffrey still lives in his dorm room at Rice because he visited the facility yesterday. Brother of Christian McCaffrey, former quarterback at Nebraska and Rice, turned wide receiver a couple years ago and is thought to be kind of a sexy early day three pick at wide receiver. Is that um, – and I don't know if – did it definitely count as a top 30 visit? I, I read I think, it was a top 30 visit. That, yeah, that's what I wonder about because guys who actually live or play in the area, there's a, there's some blues, but whatever. Um, yeah, I think, look, wide receiver is going to be the position to watch on days two and three yeah. where this is a very, very deep draft. And uh, it'll be – and honestly, at this point, it would be a huge surprise if the Texans don't take a wide receiver in the second or third round. Too. I agree. Um, unless they go out and – I pick up Brandon Ayuk or something in a trade. But barring any huge trades or free agency moves, uh, I'd be really surprised if they don't take a receiver. I'd still take one if, if, if it's the right guy, you know, even if you sign Ayuk, you know, because yeah, it's still yeah. a pretty big drop off. To I mean, I mean, you know, hope John Mechie starts living up to where he was drafted in the second round, you know. It all depends, too, because remember, this is a, that's that's fast forward to three months from now where they're getting gashed up the middle versus the run, and yeah. uh, you took a wide receiver instead yep. of Tavondre Sweat. That <laughs> might end up being part of the, there's a There's multiple positions on a football team, I've learned. <laughs> that's what I'm told. Four. Uh, women's Final Four is set. Uh, UConn beats USC last night. The main event, though, which ironically was the first of the two games, uh, was Iowa beating LSU in a rematch from last year's tournament. Caitlin Clark versus Angel Reese. Caitlin Clark got the best of Angel Reese this time. Last year was Reese getting the win. This year it's Caitlin Clark with 4-1 scintillating points and including several bombs from way downtown. 94-87 um, to 87 the final score. Caitlin Clark, I'm looking at the TV screen right now, a scored or assisted on 67 of Iowa's 94 points. That... Her shooting is the most impressive thing, Seth. But next to that is she is a great distributor of the basketball. I mean, yeah. she sees oh, the floor yeah. amazingly. Yeah, yeah, she really, she's complete and total. It's not just, these are not uh, James Harden style assists. No. You know, um, like she's fully integrated into, into everything. Yeah. And it's really cool to watch. I would, because I, I see we've had at least a few texts already of like, don't try to force this Caitlin Clark story. Oh, I got to be honest with you, man. I feel like if you feel that way, then you definitely haven't even given it a chance. Like if you've never, like that game last night, that was just an old school, awesome grudge match. Uh, the only thing that took away from it was that Caitlin Clark and, um, and Angel Reese themselves seemed to try to tamp down all the, the public lust for hatred between yeah, those two. Yeah. They, uh, they very much uh, talk about their respect for each other and everything, but they're just gritty-ass basketball players. Yep. And they just they, – they fight their asses off. That was – um, and it was just an incredible performance by Caitlin Clark, Clark ultimately at the end. But also Angel Reese, like, uh, turned her ankle pretty badly early in the game, came back, and was just fighting throughout. Really, really – Good game. It was it was good TV, no doubt. Five. Five. Uh, Rasheed Rice, wide receiver for the Kansas City Chiefs, who had who allegedly left the scene of a of an accident that was caused by speed racing between a Corvette that is leased to him, I believe, and a Lamborghini. Um, he had fled the scene when this crash took place over the weekend. Uh, he is cooperating with authorities now. Uh, Rasheed Rice is. Um, his lawyer put out a statement on his what behalf. What a guy. Yeah. Yeah, he's cooperating because on a crash that he likely a, caused or by, helped cause. Bystanders thought they saw them taking a duffel, uh, duffel bag full of weapons out of the trunks of one of the vehicles yeah. as they were leaving the scene. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's no allegedly about him leaving the scene, Sean. Right. He totally left the scene. Yeah. Yeah, uh, but as far as, yeah, exactly. Uh, but now he's a hero because he's cooperating. He's cooperating, yes. yeah. Good his job, lawyer said, on behalf of Rasheed Rice, his thoughts are with everyone impacted by the automobile accident on Saturday. Oh, so nice. Rasheed is so cooperating with local authorities and will take all necessary steps to address this situation responsibly. Over, uh, under, over, under, 
three and a half game suspension. Nobody was injured, which is the which is the good thing in all this. I mean, there were people uh, like oh, the, no, like minor an, injuries. Injury. Yeah, like my, no, you know, no. By all means, dude. If you get an accident and you see. And what if you see a, a, a Lamborghini and what was the other one? A Corvette, Corvette. driving recklessly, yeah. recklessly. By all means, any little muscular discomfort you have afterwards, be sure you write it down. Oh yeah. Um, uh, yeah by all means, do that. So, but but beyond that, uh, yeah, the fact that nobody was injured, I know it shouldn't matter, uh, but it does ultimately in how they get punished. I'm guessing a two-game suspension. Two games. Okay. For for leaving the scene. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Six. Um, the NFL announced yesterday all the players that are on kind of low-level, relatively cheap contracts that get their performance-based pay bonuses. This is a bonus system put in place by the NFL uh, to properly compensate guys who may be on rookie deals like day three or undrafted rookie deals that wound up playing similar snap counts to regular starters during the season. The largest check handed out in the league was to guard John Simpson – who was a fourth-round pick back in 2020. He's with Baltimore. He got a check yesterday for $974,000. Wow. You know? Yeah. Holy crap. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. That's a big deal. They, they, <laughs> they, put out, they put out the list of the top 25 highest-paid guys on based on yeah. the performance-based pay. They got the biggest checks this week. Brock Purdy's 24th on the list. How are there 23 guys ahead of Brock Purdy on this? He was the quarterback of a team that came within overtime of winning the Super I know there's a formula for it. It's based on snaps and how well you play and things like that. Yeah, but you're right, though, because John Simpson, too, my first thought was, is he a rookie? Because then his pay is lower. But no, he was drafted in 2020. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not going to I'm not going to start a petition demanding an inquiry into it or anything. But uh, I'm with you on that one. That's confusing. Biggest check that a Texan got yesterday, Seth? Christian Harris. 524 G's. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. Good job, Christian Harris. Christian Harris, 524. Uh, it's been a big week for Christian Harris. Mm-hmm. He was on Texans All Access. Yep. And then he got $550,000. I don't know I don't know who's, what he was more happy about, but one of those two things. I know which I'd be more happy about, and I love Mark Vandermeer and John Harris. And yet, That would be awesome if Mark could have given them the check. Oh, a big cardboard check on, Pretended on their YouTube like it was channel. for coming on Texans All Access yes, that he got it. Yes, yes, yes. This is your NIL money. There you go. Um, Sad story from the NFL yesterday. At the age of 35, Vontae Davis, a former Pro Bowl cornerback, passed away at his grandmother's house in Florida. Um, It's sad. There's two things that I think of when I think of Vontae Davis. There's the very famous hard knock scene where he learned that he got traded to the Indianapolis Colts, where in the middle of the conversation with GM Jeff Ireland, uh, he asked if he could call his grandmother. And yeah. I'm not even being tongue in cheek or funny. Like it is one of the more touching scenes in Hard Knocks. Like he was. It's, it's heart wrenching. It's heart wrenching. He seemed yeah. like a little. He seemed like a little kid yeah. when he said it. He yep. said it. it was right after he found out. It was right after AJ Ireland, Ireland Jeff, Ireland, Jeff Ireland, told him the news. He said, uh, "I, I want to call my grandma." Yeah. I mean, it was it, that was the one that turned me against Hard Knocks. Like this shouldn't be. This guy. This shouldn't be. Uh, this this poor kid shouldn't have this out there. That's no. messed up, man. No, nope. and it's out there, and it's still out there. I went back and watched yeah. the YouTube yesterday, and. Imagine what it would be like to play for Joe Philbin and Jeff Ireland on your team. Yeah. Joe Philbin is your head coach. The other thing that Vontae Davis is probably best known for was literally retiring at halftime of a game oh, <laughs> in yeah, week two right. of 2018 yeah. when he was a Buffalo Bill. Here was Tredavious White and LaShawn McCoy on LaShawn McCoy's podcast. This is Tredavious White, who at the time was probably like a rookie or a second-year yeah. guy in the cornerback room with Vontae Davis, describing what it was like on the sideline with Vontae, D- Vontae Davis basically announced to his teammates on the sideline during the game that this was it for him. He came like a three and out. He just made it. He just had just made like a big, big stop on third down. He had put his fist up, got the crowd pump and everything. So we got to the sideline. You know what I mean? Offense going, going. So we about to punt. Coach was like, y'all get ready. He was like, yeah, I'm done, young boy. <laughs> I looked. I was like, hold on. He was like, yeah, this is my last go round. So I looked at him. I was like, uh. What you mean? Like this your last? This, oh, this gonna be your last year? He was like, Nah, this gonna be my last game. I'm done, man. <laughs> <laughs> he said, "Say that boy. Say that boy. They said, I'm, I'm done, young Trey, man. Y'all boy, God, this is your man's game, man. I, I just ain't got it no more, Yo, man. Yo, hey, I'm thinking the whole time, like, why the f- would you go through OTAs and camp and you gonna do this? <laughs> 
<laughs> in week two, <laughs> it was uh, it, it was it was fun. That that podcast you know, um, is from a while back. They didn't record that yesterday. You know, uh, you know, one of the nice things about it with Vontae Davis uh, that uh, it, going back to what he had said about his grandma. His grandma was he was very close to her, and it was like his mom, uh, as I remember it. Yeah. Um, was it the the house where he was found uh, a couple days ago? Is actually it was from the looks of it is really nice house, a huge house, um, yeah. And it's actually it's his grandmother's house. Yes. So it's the house that he had bought for his grandmother. It's a beautiful house, and they're like okay, it's it's uh, hopefully um, you know when more details emerge from this, the very least, uh, it looked like he'd he continue to take care of his grandmother. Yeah. Um, and uh, obviously it's just a sad, sad. Story. Yeah, great dude by all accounts. Uh, became a two-time Pro Bowler in Indy. Didn't want to go there and then became a two-time Pro Bowler there. So that uh, sad story, RIP, Vontae Davis. Mm -hmm. Uh, Last one, friend of the show, colleague of yours over at KHOU, Seth, uh, in your work that you do at KHOU, uh, Matt Musil. Yeah. Calling it a career after decades covering the Houston sports scene. 40-plus years at KHOU, which is a modern miracle in sports media. Big time. And uh, and a guy that really, kind of like John McClain, really adapted and adjusted to the changing landscape over the years and like for that job especially like where being a local sports tv person it used to be you know you could show up and read the script that they'd written for you uh and they had all the packages prepared for over the last 20 years it's transitioned into you have to be a one-man show where you're taking a lot of you're doing a lot of the editing yourself and everything else and and he Adapted all that really well while also just staying incredibly like lighthearted and easygoing about it all. So um, really, really cool. And a guy that's been – a lot of our listeners has been with them for obviously a long, long time going back to their, their childhood. Definitely evolved over time. You know, that, that, that position's definitely evolved. He's one of the good guys too. Matt, I mean, Matt's just – he's a great dude. He's a great dude. Um, so congrats to him on retirement. Now, he, we know he's a big golfer too. I'm guessing he's going to go enjoy a lot of golf. Uh, all right, Payne and Pendergast with you on a, uh, on a Tuesday. Draft season is here. A lot of people celebrating yesterday, the beginning of April is the beginning of draft season. So we are going to attach a warning label to draft season. Analysts and guys to run away from during draft season. The warning label comes next. How about a warning label for getting up on your roof and cleaning out your gutters? You guys know.
3580. Sports Radio 610 presents Payne and Pendergast. Payne and Pendergast with you. Good to be with you on a Tuesday, just rolling along. Um, draft season, I think we can say, is officially here. It's really here once the season ends, but you got free agency in the combine to distract you for a little bit. Um, April, the calendar flips to April, and no disrespect to any of the free agents that are still floating around out there in the free agent universe, but it's draft seasons. Three weeks from, well, it's three weeks from Thursday for most of the league. Uh, three weeks from Friday, thanks to Nick trading out of the first round. Thanks a lot, Nick. It is. No, because, you know, the Texans fans, even if the Texans don't trade back up into the first round, get to sit and watch 32 players become unavailable to them. That is true. So, yes. Yeah, so you do get to sit there and, like, maybe there's, this, maybe there's a guy in the second round you're really hoping for, but then all of a sudden he's a surprise guy that goes in the uh, – Sean, I apologize. I, have, I was trying to figure out what the hell. My, I've got my voice to text on my computer somehow, and now I'm getting a transcript of me describing oh, voice to text how's on my it computer. Read? Going, you, you, uh, I, let me read it back to you. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then all of a sudden, there's a surprise guy that goes in the, Sean, I apologize. I was trying to figure out what the hell. I've got my voice to text on my computer. Okay. Yeah. Let me read it back to you. And then all of a sudden, there's a surprise that goes in, Sean, I apologize. Oh I was God. trying to figure out what the it's hell. Inception. I, I've got voice to text on my computer. Let me read it back to you. I feel like we could go insane can on, a loop. Doing this. <laughs> on a loop. I can keep doing this all day long. Uh, <laughs> um, Stop it. Let me. Uh, Stop let, it. Let me. What let, the I, I'm going to close that computer. All my, right. My so. computer's working fine. Let me take the baton here. My computer's working okay. You know, I'm trying like hell not to look at my computer. Yeah. And then out of the corner of my eye, I see just like it, it, it going into hyperdrive. I know. I know. Um, anyway. Yeah. What was I talking about? You were talking about how it's cool. We, at least in the first round, get to watch 32 guys go off the board and yes. see who's left over for the team. We can root for guys to not get drafted yeah. on Thursday night. Maybe you like, I don't know, uh, maybe you really like Tavondre Sweat, for instance. Yes, and he's, by, by all accounts, kind of expected to be a second rounder. But maybe he goes in the first round. And he's sitting there at 32, and you're like, yeah, tomorrow's the day. Tomorrow's the day we get Tavondre Sweat. And then, boom, there he goes. Well, that would suck. I know, I, I know, but it's some, it is yeah, a storyline. It, it'll yeah. keep your interest. It'll keep yeah. my interest. Yeah, you know, that, that yeah. is true. That is true. Um, so, either way, draft coming up, and you're right. Now, look, we'll all be watching on night one. We'll, we'll be carrying it here on Sports Radio 610. Um, the, I want to give, now that we're officially into kind of the run-up to the draft, the warning label on certain analysts or types of guys to run away from during draft season here. And you tell me if I'm yeah. off base on this. Mm -hmm. this, all, this, for me, kind of started back in February when I saw Matt Miller, who's a draft expert for ESPN. I saw a tweet of his, and I held on to it for draft season, for this very day. Pre-combine take. The Patriots should not draft a QB at number three overall. This roster isn't ready for a rookie QB and would just set his development back. This isn't Houston with a Hall of Fame left tackle and solid supporting <laughs> cast. This is closer to Carolina, and we saw how that worked out. So we got two things to unpack here, okay? Two things. One, just the general, the, the, the general theory that you yeah. hold off on drafting a quarterback till you build everything else, as if building everything else up will 100% accurately happen, right? Yeah. yeah, which, by the way, this is where people get it mistaken sometimes. It is a great theory or a great plan or a strategy to, it, to kind of build your roster around a QB who isn't even there yet. Like, we're going to get all the, everything right until that point where we stumble into the, to, to the right quarterback. But... That doesn't mean that if somewhere along the way the, the quarterback of your dreams comes up ahead of schedule that you don't take your chance at it because that is the rare thing. Like, we've watched this in Indianapolis for year upon year. Chris Ballard has done – he's built a roster that could help a young quarterback, and they just can't find the right quarterback. Yep. Um, so you have to do it. Warren Buffett once said something about, like, how the importance of – you know, like, Warren Buffett does a lot of reading and a lot of learning and studying and everything – but, like, if all of a sudden there's a great opportunity in front of you, you don't necessarily you, – you don't pass on it just because you haven't done all of the research that you'd ideally like that's to. That's right. That's, that's what right. taking a quarterback is. You gotta, that, that's such a rare – that's like turning down a diamond because you haven't picked out a financial planner yet. Right. You know, like somebody, right. somebody like you're, you're walking in the woods, you see this 18-carat diamond sticking up out of the, uh, the muck, and you're like, well – 
Oh, boy, I'm still whittling down my list of prospective financial planners. I don't need that diamond just yet. <laughs> I don't uh, have the ring to go with the diamond, so I'm going to hold it. Yeah, on. yeah, yeah. Um, so, and then this whole, this is in Houston with a Hall of Fame left tackle and solid supporting cast. Matt Miller, show me the tweets where you were touting Houston's supporting cast this time last year. That's and what I know I one, of our, one of our listeners went and found the receipts, did he not? He was. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. No, he, yeah, he thought Carolina was, uh, was uh, yeah, we have a listener, Peter C., who yeah. found the receipts from Matt Miller saying that Carolina was definitely doing the right thing by taking Bryce Young this yeah, time Yeah, he said year. Young elevated in Alabama offense. So this is Matt Miller after the draft Same last year. Same guy who just said Carolina's trash. Bryce Young elevated in Alabama offense in 2022 that lacked star power. Yeah. In Carolina, yeah. he'll have elite offensive minds, right. a solid and improving O-line, and veteran targets. It is a great landing spot <laughs> None for None of Young. that was true. None of it. <laughs> None Turns out what I meant to say None was if only he'd gone to Houston where they have just an incredible, oh, incre yeah. everybody was just gushing about how what a great spot Big Houston time. was last year, Big were they time. not? That's um, where I honestly, Sean, that's yeah. where I get, I get a little bit, like I want to defend C.J. Stroud's excellence sometimes. Yeah. When people start talking about like absolutely needing a third wide receiver, I'm all for bringing in a third wide receiver, and I think it can un unlock a lot of potential on this offense. I think because they only really have one viable all-around uh, tight end right now, especially, they might end up being a little bit more on the Rams side of the, 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 the Kubiak offense. Um, but I also think that C.J. Stroud is not Tua Tungavailoa or one of these schlups that need – wide receivers to come in and show that they're good. I agree. You know, like, CJ's already at the stage where he's making the other guys around him better. Yep. Um, so you've been warned, draft a court, don't draft a quarterback, build the roster first guy. He's yep. annoying. Um, draft so-and-so because such-and-such such is in your division. In other words, a Texan example draft of that. Draft Mario Williams because Peyton. Peyton Manning is in your division. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Draft, using a high pick because – of one guy in your division, two games you play out of 17 a year. Be aware think, of that um, guy. Part of that, at the very least, so too, I think when it's happened with the Texans, the Texans have just had the bad luck of being really, really bad the year before there's not a really good quarterback mm -hmm. in the draft. So I think twice now, that's been the best alternative, which is, all right, you can't get a quarterback. Let's get somebody who affects the quarterback. And, you know, Mario Williams, that was the best available Non, well, uh, both Mario Williams and Jevian Clowney. With Jevian Clowney, you could have drafted um, uh, Mac, uh, certainly. Um, but I'm, I'm okay with that. I, don't, I, I feel like sometimes that's not the actual reason. It's more something nice to say afterwards yep. after the selection. Um, next one, anybody harping heavily on hand size as a reason to downgrade a guy or arm length as a reason to upgrade a guy? You know, like this guy's yeah. got really long arms. Who no, this guy's got really he's got ooh, his hands ooh, nine and an eighth. Ooh. I, oh. I think the question with those things is always, all right, does it show up? You know, does the guy fumble a lot with his tiny little elfin hands? Um, if the guy's got long arms, does he actually use his hands well? Because there's some guys that have long arms and have no idea how to use them. Yep. Other than to get extra holding penalties. Uh, but then there's likewise with guys with short arms. Guys with short arms, uh, the uh, pass rusher Trevor, from oh. Sure. From uh, Detroit that I'm blanking on. Uh, Aiden Hutchinson? Thank you, Aiden yeah. Hutchinson. Like, he has short arms, but when you watched him in college, it didn't really look like he had short arms. Uh, the other thing that bothers me when arm length discussion comes in is when they talk about a guy who has an inc – he's incredibly strong. And you're like, how do you know that? It's like, because he benched 225 a bunch of times. And you're like, oh, he's got tiny little – T-Rex arms, of course he can bench yeah. 225 a bunch yes. of times. And then you turn on the film, and he looks like a guy who's got short arms. Yes. Likewise, the same thing with a or, – or the biggest thing, too, is uh, the, guys with those, the guys with the long arms, they'll complain about how he's not that strong. Like, no, he's, he's actually really strong on film. He just can't bench 225 a lot because he's got really, really long arms. They got to get rid of the 40 and the bench test. They're, they're both the dumbest for, tests there are. For, well, in, in yeah, football. For, yeah, for well, for, for certain positions, they definitely are dumb. You know, I think that no, honestly, the positions you think the 225 is good for is actually where they're the worst. Where like offensive and defensive line, they don't really tell you. It, like the bench test doesn't tell you much at all about the actual strength of a yeah. player. It, it's a, uh, it's. Uh, and it, like America's the only place in the world that actually cares about the bench. It's a stupid exercise. Um, last one for me. Stay away from fill-in name of school quarterback guy. 
Stay away yeah. from Ohio State quarterbacks. Stay away from Alabama quarterbacks. Stay away. Attaching schools to quarterbacks, guy, has yeah, been proven to be very stupid over the last 20 it, Sean? years. As I recall, there's no way that you should have draft, drafted Pat Mahomes. And how well has that worked out? Yeah. Mm, let me check. I go yeah. Google. He's CJ good. Shaw, the same people who told you that you can't draft an air raid quarterback were also telling you you can't draft an Ohio State quarterback. Who plays in like a place so, close to a pro style as there is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, yeah, the, the quarterback stuff, I, I think the, the thing that's most frustrating about that is that there is no such thing as a QB factory in the NFL. And the most, most colleges – have put out a grand total of, and I wouldn't say most, colleges that have put out a really good NFL quarterback have put out one really good NFL quarterback. Yes. Um, you know, like there's just, there's very few actually genuinely good NFL quarterbacks. And uh, like the number of quarterbacks in the, in the Pro Football Hall of Fame would tell you that. There's very few of them. Very few. So, yeah, I, uh, I agree with you there. Very it is, it's amazing. It is amazing, though, like what a crapshoot it is with quarterbacks in terms of, like them not coming necessarily from football factories. Yeah. You know, like it's just as likely to get one out of Purdue as you are to get one out of Notre Dame. Yes. For instance. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Specifically those schools? More so. I yeah, can more tell so you. Out of yeah. Purdue, yeah. I can tell you more well, Montana so. Montana was all right. He was you know? okay. He was okay. Yeah. I'm talking like. He was no Drew Brees, apparently, Sean, in your estimation. Uh -huh. I, feel like you're, I feel like you're trying a little too hard to. <laughs> no, no, no. Purdue. That's what I'm saying. Like, Purdue, uh, they, like, uh, Drew Brees is why I say that. Like, Purdue puts out really you know, They put out some good quarterbacks through the years. Um, all right, Payne, right, I'm saying I feel like you're you're giving uh, Joe Montana short shrift though if you're if you're I, putting Purdue above Notre Dame. I'm talking in the age of the internet, they're, they're like oh, early okay. '90s. My era of watching football as an adult. You're not kidding, dude. Your voice to text is going crazy right now on our rundown. Oh, is it on the it's rundown? Filling no, in it's our still whole going. rundown is. I was still laughing with, at that earlier. It's like ha 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 ha. It's on my. Phone. I must have cracked you up at some point because there's a hundred ha's next to each other right here. And you're doing it again. Oh, my God. Yeah. No, I turned it off. It you stopped, did? Okay. It stopped, okay. right? Yeah, it stopped. I think the voice of text is just catching up. Okay. I had shut my computer because I assumed it was my computer that was doing it. Yeah. Look at this. I've done I've written basically. I could write for the Chronicle with this. You could. You could. It's you know? Hell, I got to go back and read this. That was a hell of a segment we just did. I get to go I relive it. We'll just start. I'm going to do voice to text the entire show, mm -hmm. and then I'll plunk it into chat GPT okay. and say, do this uh, in the style of Jerome, uh, Jerome Solomon, and then boom, there we go. <laughs> You're all over it. <laughs> all right, Christian Harris. Uh, Christian Harris has – he's got new friends. He's got new teammates. How is Christian Harris, ascending Texans linebacker, feeling about the acquisitions the Texans have made on his side of the football. We'll hear from the uh, Texans linebacker coming up next. Hey, maybe you're not, uh, maybe you're not the only one who's suffered it.
Exclusions apply. Live from the Twin Peaks studios, Sports Radio 610 presents Payne and Pendergast. Christian Harris has new friends on the uh, defensive side of the football. Uh, Aziz El Shair, Daniel Hunter, Danico Autry. Feels good just to say those names, man. They're Houston Texans now. Here's Christian Harris, Texans linebacker. Last night on Texans All Access, uh, John Harris, Mark Vandermeer. Asked him, what do you make of the acquisitions on the defensive side of the ball? Straight killers, man. I'm, I'm excited to get back and get everybody gelling in the locker room, um, defense getting together, understanding what our plan is and focus is for this year, and just really getting to attack the whole thing, uh, full head of steam. One thing focused on our mind, which is that Super Bowl. I think, you know, these two guys were 100% of it, be a, a great addition to that piece. I and mean, like I said, like it's the same mindset, though. Straight killers just attacking this one day at a time, though. Yeah. One thing on our mind. This, uh, this right here is the D'Amico effect, and I love it. It's D'Amico's ability to Ned Flanders his way to getting away with extreme <laughs> violence. Like, D'Amico. <laughs> Hi, Anybody... ho! This is the kill zone. <laughs> yes. His defense has a kill zone. This is the he kill has... diddly ill zone. <laughs> of the three defensive players last year who were suspended for unnecessary roughness, two of them were on the Texans. Kareem Jackson did his violence with the, the Broncos, but he ended up on the Texans. <laughs> but we had no problem um, picking him up. <laughs> he had, I mean, he it said it a pep right rally. He just, this is where D'Amico knows. He knows how to toe the line because he always has a smile on his face when he said it. <laughs> but in that pep rally at NRG last year, he said he wanted to be sure that the other team, the team that plays the Texans, yeah. when they wake up in the morning, they they know it. They they feel it. it is, is D'Amico's very... Um, Congenial way in a Ned Flanders style of saying that, uh, yeah, hi, diddly ho, we're going to murder you and your family. Hi, welcome to our kill diddly ill zone. <laughs> <laughs> what do you I mean you're new so acquisitions? Many... Well, they are straight up kill diddly illers. Hey, D'Amico, how do you, uh, uh, <laughs> what's the persona of your team? Uh, basically, we'd be serial killers, except we're on the appropriate amount of antipsychotics. That's uh, that's where we are. Okay, Dude. that's where we want to be. And everybody's like, "Yes, this is the way. This is a, a wholesome example of uh, the American way." Yeah. I uh, I need you to do a video about this on your YouTube channel, just so I can see the thumbnail where you got <laughs> Tomiko Ryan's head on Ned Flanders' body. <laughs> well, remember. <laughs> Remember when Antonio Pierce was on Max Crosby's podcast yeah. and he, he talked, he made, he, oh no, he used the dreaded analogy of taking the head off the snake or killing yeah. the head and the yeah. body will die. Yeah. And he was talking about Pat Mahomes and hitting him. And Florio started a campaign that, uh, to, to, to start oh. a league investigation into it. Yes, um, I remember. But that's because Antonio Pierce is sitting there and talking very much like, uh, you know, like a badass on the podcast. D'Amico says the exact same stuff, but he says it with a smile on his face. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and uh, with an expectation that after you lacerate somebody's kidneys, you're going to extend your hand to lift them up oh. if they're capable of standing at that point. That's the best. That is the best. Um, you're more from Christian Harris. What was the key, the big key, to the Texans' success last season? Believing and going at it one day at a time is all it takes. Uh, I think, you know, when you pick your head up at the end and, you know, okay, you're like, damn, yeah, we really came a long way. But, you know, that's just what it is. When you're going through that process, you're in the middle of it. It's head down one day at a time. Keep grinding, like, regardless of what everybody's saying. Um, whether they're hyping you up or dogging you out, like, it is what it is. Like, we're going to attack every day. And, you know, we believe that the work that we're putting in is going to, you know, have a great outcome. You know, I mean, like I said, it's just that belief. I think, you know, it turns everything differently. Um, when, he, when he brought that up, I like as a player, it, it made me think about what it's like having certain types of coaches versus other types of coaches because at some point in a speech, uh, every single coach will say something about focusing on just you know the next moment, the next play, all of that. But it's really hard to be disciplined with that. Um, and it's also hard to be disciplined with guys that like Christian Harris. Christian Harris had a long ways to go as a football player. But you don't, you don't fix them all at once. I, D'Amico's day-to-day mindset is to just pick that one thing that you need to get better at and, and really don't worry about the large, the large picture in that moment. You just got to focus on the next improvement. And I thought you saw that over the course of the season. You saw guys, Christian Harris might have been the most extreme example of a guy that just got better um, within one season. There's just – I like – I. Sometimes there's coaches that they want everything all at once, 
And it does. It's good at putting a lot of pressure on you, but, man, it can be overwhelming because you can only fix so many things all at once. Mm -hmm. And some coaches want everything fixed immediately now. And D'Amico's just not that guy. He's got more of a, a patient and long-term outlook on it. And it's, it's fun to play for guys like that. Yeah. It's, uh, and especially when they're also still, you know, serial killers at heart. They are. Well, and it, it's just, yeah. to, to me, it's really cool. And, and Christian Harris isn't the only one that is, is, you know, it's basically like repeating D'Amico verbatim. Like, it's really cool to see the message get filtered down to guys. Yeah. And, and, and see them articulate it that way. Well, that, that's, that's it's fun. The same, yeah, it's the same thing that, like, Fred Warner says when he's asked about D'Amico right. in San Francisco. And yep. this is very much, like, he very much has had, he's had an ability to take young linebackers and teach them how to play the game. And it's that position maybe more so than any other on the field other than quarterback has a lot of nuances to it that people wouldn't realize that that can take you way above and beyond. Just by being smart, you can go way above and beyond other guys of equal physical skill because you can just see things happening before they happen. And But that, that comes, like people like to tell, call that instinct where the vast majority of it is just crap you learn about what the offense is trying to do to you. One more from Christian Harris. Uh, was it the process or was there a specific moment for him when things started to click? I mean, I think like the whole time, like just, I don't know, just my mindset, every team that I've been on, like I approached the game and every game, no matter who we're playing, um, just with the same mindset, you know, I'm trying to kill. You know, I think, you know, we all just have that aggressive mindset. Um, D'Amico 100%, you know, kind of, you know, drives that throughout the entire team. Uh, you know, we 100% understand his message going into game day. So, um, you know, like I said, we feed off of that and um, that's something I could feed off of and that drives me every day. So when I go out there, it's just, like I said, I just approach it with that same mindset. I'm trying to kill. <laughs> I like what I'm hearing, man. It's awesome. I like it's what so I'm hearing. It's so awesome. They need to – I don't know if they're going to get away with it, though. <laughs> now that they're on the radar as a good team, I think my, uh, people might start picking up on just <laughs> – on how many other suspensions or illegal oh, hits yeah, or anything else happen. Target yeah. on their back. Well, you know, Jimmy Ward, I think one of the textbook cases of a – a hip drop tackle was a Jimmy Ward one from a couple years it ago. Was, it was Jimmy Ward on um, uh, Tony Pollard. Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah. So I guess uh, barring, a, barring a, like a deluge of hip drop penalties this year, I think the Texans might still get away with it. I, just by the way, to answer the question that I seemingly get more often than anything else about the hip drop, people say, well, Seth, how are you able to – how are you supposed to tackle somebody in this instance? Almost every single hip drop tackle I've seen – if, you, if the guy would have simply kept driving his legs at contact like you're supposed to, it wouldn't have to be a hip drop. Like, it's very, very, very easy to avoid hip drop tackling somebody. The fact that people ask it uh, that question as much as they do, it, it, I get frustrated because it, it tells me that they've never actually been taught proper tackling. And um, there's a lot of people that whine and complain about tackling that don't themselves actually know how to tackle. You, you think that the new hip drop banning rule is going to be no big deal. I, yeah, I really don't. I don't think it should be. Like, it hardly ever happened until a couple years ago. Right. It happened like 100 times two years ago. It happened a couple hundred times this last year. And and it really is. It's like, okay, keep your feet driving instead of just trying to drop on your little hiney. Yeah. Okay? And just for context, when you say a couple hundred times, that's out of like 20,000 snaps. You know. So yeah, you like less. it was still less than one time per game. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. All right, Payne and Pendergast with you. Good to hear from Christian Harris. All right, let's circle back to last night, a magical night. For the Houston Astros, Renell Blanco with a no-hitter. We need a 30-for-30, 30 30, I think, on the Astros' approach to how they have stockpiled pitching. And Renell Blanco's story might be the craziest one out of all of them. We will uh, we'll run through that. The, how the Astros put this staff together, and Renell Blanco, just the latest cherry on top of the Sunday. That's coming up next. Uh, no-hitters are hard to get. You know what's not hard to get? An awesome deal at Bayway Chevrolet.
contest. Sports Radio 610. The Texans play here. And Odyssey Station. Sports Radio 610 presents Payne and Pendergast. All right, Rennell, <clears throat> Rennell Blanco, no hitter last night for the Astros. Um, They needed a win badly and that they got a no hitter and that they got five home runs in the game. Uh, feels like they've recalibrated some things. We need Fromber to go out and look like Fromber tonight and kind of build on this. Um, the With Rennell Blanco throwing this no hitter, Seth, this... um. Jay Kaplan article about Rennell Blanco from two years ago. It's from April of 2022 when he made the the big league team out of spring training because they had two extra spots on the roster to start the season that year because of the lockout. So they they had 28 roster spots. Rennell Blanco got one of them. Since then, he's been up and down from Sugar Land to Houston, back and forth, pitched at times well, pitched at times poorly. Last night, obviously, is the crown jewel in what he's done in his brief career, but the Jake Kaplan article lays out his story, which when you combine his story with just the overall story of Jeff Luno stockpiling pitchers from Latin America, it's really remarkable. Ronel Blanco was literally working in a car wash part-time when the Astros found him, and the Astros found him. It's a lot like when you, you have these small schools that are having a pro day, and they're coming to see some big, you know, stud prospect. Oh, no, by the way, look at this guy who's running around over him. Hey, this receiver looks all right. We came to see this quarterback, you know, but well, this receiver looks okay. That's, you know, we noticed a few other guys. Renel Blanco was playing with Julio Rodriguez in the Dominican Republic. So yeah, they, they had every, come to, the Astros had come to look at Julio Rodriguez. Every and, uh, under the and sun, he does down this, there. Saw this 22-year-old, yeah, like his, like his dad pitching to him. Yeah. Um, and as they do, like, it was one of those things that Jeff Luno had realized. And, you know, it's hard not to imagine that Luno, having grown up in Mexico City, um, maybe also helped put him at a better – a better ability to be both a gringo, but also somebody that had more insight into um, Latin America, Latin American baseball. Great or, point. Yeah, you know, being able to speak a language and everything. Um, like, what what did the Astros do? The Astros have been able to identify inefficiencies in the market in a lot of respects, and one of the biggest and most glaring ones was that these Latin American players, scouts from teams, would look at them, and if they were if they were 18 years old, they were over the hill. Like they just wouldn't even, they wouldn't even consider a Christian Javier. 18 years old, he's an old man, you know? And it's, an, it's just, a, it's honestly, I, I don't know if enough people have been fired over this enough, as there should be. Like owners around baseball should be like, wait a second, wait, this, what were you guys thinking about Blanco? Oh, we don't even have anything written on him. Yeah. Oh, what about Christian Javier? Ah, we didn't look at him. Oh, what about Framber Valdez? Yeah, he was too old. Like, what, like, how many times do you have to just pass by all-star caliber talent without because he was too old? My God. To put some context to what you're saying about age, the youngest of the Latin America prospects in this article that Jake Kaplan did a couple years ago about Renel Blanco, the youngest one that gets mentioned at time of signing with the Astros is Christian Javier for $10,000 at age yeah. 18. So he, so when you're saying 18 is like over the hill, that was the youngest one of these guys they signed. Here's a list yeah. very quickly. Christian Javier, $10,000, age 18. Enoli Paredes, $10,000, age 19. Luis Garcia, $20,000, age 20. Framber Valdez, $10,000, 21 years old. And then finally, Renel Blanco, the oldest and lowest paid of all of them who threw a no-hitter last night, yeah. a complete game no-hitter. Five grand, age 22. He's 30 now. You know what? Um, I guess, you know why? I, I, I just realized why I probably get worked up over this. Because football is extremely this way in that you get, like, you take, you take young men who aren't usually physically mature until you're 22, 23, 24 years old, and you're making these decisions on them when they're 17 years old. Is that go who's, who goes to the D1 schools? And then that NFL players come largely from those Division I schools. Yeah. You know? So if you're not an early bloomer, they pretty much just you, – you don't enter the pipeline that the NFL is looking at. And there's exceptions here and there. But, like, I just know that because I was a guy that was two I, – I grew two inches in college. Like, I was not – I was not a D1 prospect coming out of high school. And it was, like, kind of dicey as to whether I would have ever gotten a shot at it. And it's, so – There's a lot of untapped potential out there. The Astros were smart enough, and Jeff Luno specifically was smart enough, to 
to listen to his scouts when they would bring back these guys who were 21, 22 years old. Um, and then also, credit Dana Brown, though, too, because in the case of Blanco, Blanco was a career reliever. Uh, Dana Brown comes in, watches him last year, and, and says, you know what, I think uh, this guy might actually be a starter. And it uh, ends up being a no-hitter starter. Yeah, man, maybe he makes for some tough decisions when guys come back, you know. My guess is Verlander will be the first one back, and obviously Verlander takes his place at the top or near the top of the rotation at least. Then I think at that point you just go with a six-man rotation with Blanco being, you know, with Blanco still in there with, yeah. the, with the four other guys. You, with, you know, it's Fromber, it's Javier. Uh, it's Hunter Brown, it's J.P. France, and Rennell Blanco. Verlander gets plunked back in there. My guess is you go with a six-man rotation. Yeah. J.P. France might be the odd man out at that point. Like, you know, I'm not saying Rennell Blanco is going to throw a no-hitter every time out, but if all of a sudden, like, he had a really good spring, too. Like, if all of a sudden he's, like, figured some things out here, um, then it makes for some fun and tough decisions down the road when you get Garcia and McCullers back, too. You know? I just feel like Blanco and Har Javier, especially, I wonder if there's always a little part of them that knows, like, ah, crap, I'm the guy with the varied background that yeah. makes it easy to turn me into long relief, you yeah. know, or the piggyback guy or what yeah. have you. Yep, yep. And, uh, and, because, and especially because the Astros minor leaguers, leaguers have so much experience piggybacking. I mean, every, everybody does it now, so it's not as big a deal, but the, it, it was a bigger deal back when the Astros were one of the first teams to do it. Um, but yeah, I think you, if you can make it through this dicey beginning stretch where you've got so many question marks with your pitchers, yeah, you could, you could end up very soon being back to hand-wringing over the fact that we've got too many starting pitchers. Oh, no. Oh, right. it's awful. It's just a, it's a horrible place to Horrible be. problem to have, yeah. Um, yeah, this article, is, it's a really good read. Jay Kaplan in The Athletic. Chandler Rome retweeted it, if you follow him on, on x.com, Twitter. Um, he retweeted it this morning. And it's, it, it, to, today especially, it's a really fun read because it goes deep on his background um, and what his upbringing, you know, in the Dominican Republic. The right-hander was already 22 when the Astros signed him April 27, 2016 for a $5,000 bonus. Blanco said he had tried out previously for the Yankees, Mets, Pirates, and Rays to no avail. Like, this is not somebody who was fireballing the Dominican Republic at all. Like, this is someone who is, he's, he is the actor who is waiting tables, who is going on every audition he can go on. Except yeah. the restaurant is a car wash, and the auditions are the Yankees, Mets, Pirates, and Rays, and the Astros. And even the day that he signed with the Astros... The article says he had five more tryouts lined up for later on that week. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when, uh, when they talked to him before the Astros signed him, uh, Akimarez says, when I saw this guy, I basically asked him, Rennell, why aren't you signed? Why are you still available? He basically told me part of what happens right now in the scouting system. He said, uh, Oku, when you turn 18, 19, for some of the teams, you're old. That's why I'm still available. And imagine, though, too, that he's – he had just started pitching when he was 18. He'd given up on being a shortstop or position player, and he just started pitching when he was 18. So not only was he, like, he was old to begin with and a project. Like, it, it, uh, they paint a picture almost of, like, this would be like a double-A a player coming to you at the age of 40 and saying, I'd like to switch to pitcher. You know, right. like, oh, like, oh, yeah, whatever. Get out of here. Scram, kid. Yeah. <laughs> Scram, old man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and here he is. He's doing it, and he's 22. It's, when, you, when you lay it out, it's, it really is incredible what Jeff Luno did with all these guys, that there weren't other teams down there to offer Fromber Valdez $12,000 yeah. instead of $10,000. You know, like, it's, it's crazy. It's wild. The other good part about that article, and I'm glad you, I'm glad you went back and, uh, and found that article. Uh, I'd forgotten this part of it, that he still washed it. As of last year, he still, or two years ago, he still washed his own car. Yeah. Got a Toyota 4, yes. 4Runner. We got to follow up on that. Yes. Does anybody know? Does he still drive that same Toyota 4Runner, and does he still wash it oh, himself? That'd be fun. That'd be fun. Uh, I bet he definitely, I bet he definitely washes it himself. Still. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's, he's I mean, definitely, if he, if he replaced a Toyota 4Runner, there's almost even more of a guarantee that he still washes it himself. Yep. Because uh, he's a guy that, like, uh, obviously, he's got experience washing cars, and uh, he, he's, I, I don't think he's ever going to forget where he came from. No, you know? no, no. Seems like a great dude. His mom, you know, he grew up supporting, he washed cars to support him and his mom in the DR. Yeah. And she was there last night for the game. 
Uh, she was at the game last night, uh, so that was pretty cool. Who's the other heartwarming car washing story? Is it Christian Kirk? I think it's Christian Kirk. Definitely was, not uh, Marvin Harrison. I'll tell you. I that. think his father owns a car washing business or something. Oh, yeah? and that's where, like, that's where he people listen because so because so few football players or athletes in general these days do actual hard manual labor, and the American-born ones, um, like whenever scouts find out about a kid having grown up like having to like work at his dad's auto shop or something, oh. They love it. Yeah. They love it. Because it used to be, used to be you could, like, you know, throw a ball up in the air and it hit a farm kid or something. And now there's none of those anymore. So they, they look for anybody that's not afraid of hard work and that also understands that uh, a two-a-day here and there isn't the end of the world. You're going to be just fine. Yeah. It's not, it's not the worst thing in the world. That's, ad- that's the adversity. What'd you do, kid? Worked in a car wash. Sounds good to me. Done. You checked the adversity box. Yeah. Um. So, um... So the other big thing last night, Jeremy Pena hit a home run, finally. Uh, first one since July 5th, 2023. Um, it's five games in, feeling really good about Jeremy Pena, feeling really good about Yiner Diaz so far. Like, these are the, the guys who haven't been getting it done are your OGs thus far, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, Jordan, your, I'll say Jordan has struggled. Like, he has struggled. Statistically, he has struggled. There's no doubt about it. Some of the Don't swings. Don't make me go to baseball. Savant no, 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 here. no. I, I, you won't need to, because I. Oh no, I'm gonna. Oh, you got it. Right. No, no, I don't have it. I'm just saying, I, like, I, because I, your trip to baseball savant is going to be to counter counterpoint something. Um, I, I, he's taking good swings. He's right, making right, good contact. Right. That was the point yeah. I was going to make. Um, I'm not accusing you of being one of the people saying that Jordan's not doing well. I was gonna, I was gonna buttress what you're saying okay. and saying okay. like yeah he's got a boatload of hard guy like honestly all the x stats my favorite stats that tell you not what happened but what should have happened yeah okay it, like he's a tell 19 me, tell me what should have happened with him please he should be batting 438 uh oh no sorry that's his ex woba his uh <laughs> <Of course. laughs> all apologies he should be batting 300 okay uh, his average exit velocity is 93.3. That's in, that's in the 96th percentile. That's really he's hitting, good. He's hitting super, super He's hard. hitting the ball. That's the big one to me. Like, he's yeah. hitting the ball hard. Like, he just Honestly, keeps hitting the ball hard. He's fine. Like, uh, barreling it, that's when you hit it at a certain speed at a certain launch angle, hit it just right. He's 99th percentile on that. Hard hit percentage, 96th percentile. Um, he's just, yeah, he's he's doing everything right. It's just a matter of, I mean, he's got, he's got two 400-foot, Flyouts from the the yeah. first series with the Yankees. That was in one game. So I, I'm not worried about him at all. His batting run value is in the 99th percentile. I don't know what that means. I haven't looked into that one. Batting yet, but run it looks, value. It's at the very care. top. Yeah. It's in the 99th percentile. I'm here for it. I'm very, very, I'm very much here for it. Um, so uh, <laughs> text message. Jeff Kent washed his own car. LOL. That's from Nut and Clear Lake. Yeah. He got hurt. <laughs> he got hurt Jeff, watching his own Jeff car. Jeff Kent washed his own car probably because he – I'm guessing he beat up a, a car wash attendant at some worker. point in his life. <laughs> He's like, I can't I, – I don't need any more issues, man. He did. <laughs> he was an angry man. He got – I feel like Jeff Kent drove down the road, like five miles down the road and realized that they'd missed a spot in the back seat or something, turned around and came back and, and went, <clears throat> went after the attendant. <laughs> You're having issues with Fubo, I see here? Uh, I'm just a little bit, I, I made the switch from YouTube TV. Now that football is officially over from last year to, uh, Fubo for the Astros. Yep. I'm having a hard time getting everything to work when I use it on my laptop. Like the, mm. I don't like the, the DVR capability is I'm, I'm not pleased with it so far. I got to figure a few things out. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not complaining. I'm not, I'm not making this word first world complaint. But it's a little bit more of an adjustment, and I feel like maybe this is what's affecting the Astros. We had is the, uh, the Fubo <laughs> is you, experience. you being on Fubo? Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. I feel like uh, they're just uh, they need just like the Astros. I need a few games to get this figured there out. There you right? go. Yeah, we had we did Fubo for a couple of years. It was okay. The big thing, honestly, the big thing, especially this time of year in March, is that they don't get any of the Turner stations. They don't get TNT or TBS or True TV or any of those. They don't. Yeah. Well, when it comes to like, I have that for the tournament. I have it specifically for the Astros mm-hmm. and that like when I'm out of town, I like to be able to, you know, sometimes you need to make it look like you're somewhere that you aren't perhaps like if you happen to be in the Yankees broadcast area, but you want to watch the local broadcast, you got to use the VPN theoretically. And it doesn't, I, baseball did something where they figured it out. 
<laughs> they know when I'm lying to them. So when I try to make it look like I'm in, uh, in Houston, it, it like somehow like roundabout after about three innings or so, all of a sudden I lose my feed. So that's, I can't complain about Fubo for that. No. That's just them abiding by the law. By the rule. Well, I'll tell you about Fubo. Amy and I had it, and we, we went up to New York on vacation one year, and we, I didn't even have a VPN or anything like that. I, I wouldn't know how to set that up to begin with. Um, but I turned on Fubo on my laptop, and it still thought I was in Houston, so we were able to yeah. watch all the Astro games up there. Yeah. Like it wasn't, yeah. I, I don't even know if it was a VPN thing as much as it was a we see where you're subscribing from thing, and these are what all your local channels are. I feel, I feel like they've done a better job of cracking down on that. Yeah, so I, I hate can't, that. I can't get overly distraught about it. I'm not one that feels like, like, like yeah, it's like, yeah, the copyright and licensing and all of that is there for a reason, and people are putting money into it and everything. Yeah. If they, if they, it's, it's perfectly within their right to keep you from stealing from them, which is what you're doing when you use your VPN. Yep, yep. It's finally like, all right, I got caught. Don't get to watch the Astros on Fubo anymore. Dude, I'll um, tell you what. My stepfather was a son of a bee about that stuff. The uh, Napster and everything. Oh, yeah? He, yeah, he really sat me down when I was a young kid. and uh, Or no, it wasn't me. It was my stepbrother. Um, because he was at peak Napster age when that was all the rage. And, uh, and he really, like, guilted him out of his Napster subscription. Talking about how he was screwing over his favorite musicians and everything. By, it's by, kind of true. <laughs> oh, no, it is. It yeah. is 100%. Yeah. yeah, it's very much... Um, it's, it's very, very, very selfish to steal for your own benefit like that, but people don't look at it like it's stealing. Uh, so, and I'm, I, I'm selfish at times, but, uh, but I, try not to, I try not to get up in arms about it when somebody's like, hey, stop stealing from me. Right, like, yeah, I gotcha. right, right, I gotcha. right. Um, Payne and Pendergast with you on a, uh, on a Tuesday. We were talking earlier about quarterbacks and the hit rate on quarterbacks, um, the schools they come from. Um, the uh, CBSSports.com, Cody Benjamin, I believe, went back, all the first rounders going back to 2009, the Mark Sanchez year, put them into categories. Man, as a Texan fan, you're going to feel awfully lucky when you hear some of the things he found out in going back through this. And um, where, do, where do we put old C.J. Stroud? Where do we think he lands in this mix moving forward? That is next. What's Nick Casario cooking up with all that?
Pendergast.com. Sports Radio 610 presents Payne and Pendergast. All right, feel good, Houston, that we don't have to worry about hit rates on quarterbacks in the first round. CBSSports.com. Cody Benjamin, I believe, did this. I was reading this yesterday. It's very interesting, and we don't feel it as acutely now. Actually, we, I don't know how acutely we feel it at all compared to other markets because we've had two first-round quarterbacks in the last seven years, and one was working out fine till it didn't. Smashingly well. Yeah, smashingly well. For a period of time, pretty good, and then it yeah. didn't, and then it didn't for a variety of reasons. This one feels like 17 games in, we're in a pretty good spot, uh, C.J. Stroud. Um, but, yeah, Cody Benjamin, Seth, went – and regraded every first-round quarterback pick of the last 15 years. Uh, all of them. And he put them into five categories. And I think it illustrates here just how fortunate we are to get C.J. Stroud, um, but also just how all the things you're going to hear about these quarterbacks coming up in the upcoming draft in three weeks, literally the expectation has shifted now to where the first four picks in the draft could yeah. be quarterbacks. We've never seen that before. J.J. McCarthy of Michigan has kind of put himself in that mix now with the other three. That would be the first time ever? Four in a row to start the draft? I believe so, because I think 2021 was the first time we ever had th- – well, it was the second time we had three to start yeah. the draft. 99 it's, we um, did. And 99 yeah. we did with Couch McNabb and Achilles Smith, and then in 21, yeah. It's uh, – you know what? I, I it's, it's probably a good indication and a sign of the times, but also something that is starting to, you know, more, uh, starting to really annoy me is that it's such a valuable position that, yeah, it's just getting drafted earlier and earlier. And yet the prospects getting drafted in the first round, it's not like, it's, it's not like they're getting drafted in the first round because of all of a sudden there's so many good quarterback prospects. It's a combination of the, the CBA change, so they're not, as, they're not making as much money. Um, so people are willing to take a risk on guys who previously would have gone in the second or third round. But it ends up with guys like Kenny Pickett acting like, they're the lords of the manor. Yeah. And they're like, oh, how dare you bring somebody in to compete with me? That's right. yeah, I'm me. Kenny Pickett. Yeah. A first round. No, you suck. Yep. You know, like it just, you just play the position of quarterback. Yep. My God. Well, and teams are willing to eject on guys earlier now, too. I think that's part yeah. of it. Like, even, even you, you know, when you take, just use Trey Lance as an example, because he's on his second team, and they traded a bunch to move up and get him, uh, the, the Niners did. Uh, yeah, the, you know, they could have taken something else at that position, someone else at some other position, but the bus factor's high on those positions as well. So I think the feeling is like, all right, if it could be any position, we're, we're, if, it, if they're bad, let's just throw a quarterback in with the other positions that we're willing to flush after two years and move on from it. So I think that helps. The five categories that, that um, Cody Benjamin put the quarterbacks in, there's 46 total quarterbacks that have been drafted Since 2009. That's the Matthew Stafford draft. Um, Home run, which is you're a bona fide star with championship caliber talent. Solid result is the second one. Good, maybe even great, still with hurdles to clear. The third category is mixed result, a QB who's flashed, but for whatever reason did or did not pan out. Justin Fields is sort of like the face of that category right there. The fourth category is incomplete which all three quarterbacks, including C.J. Stroud from last year's draft, are in, plus Jordan Love. So all these guys who have only been starting for a year, they're all incomplete. So there's four of them, push them off to the side. So you push them off to the side, there's 42 left over. And then miss, which is a bust, a clear flop as a short-term or long-term starter. Of the 46 that started this process here, 46 quarterbacks drafted since 2009, 23 are misses. So it's a... It's a 50% bust rate. That doesn't even include the ones like Justin Fields. Like, Justin Fields is not considered a bust, even though he's traded to his second team. Um, uh, You know, uh, uh, the mixed result category has guys like Kyler Murray, Daniel Jones, who's about to get booted out of New York, Baker Mayfield, Deshaun Watson, Jared Goff, a bunch of guys who are on their second or third or fourth teams where they've retired, like Mark Sanchez and Sam Bradford. Mixed result and miss are 32 of the 46. 32 of the 46. 32 of the 46 are mixed results. Mixed result Wait. or miss. Or miss. Or yeah. miss, yeah. Um, yeah, it's really it, – like, and again, look, I go back to Chris Ballard from the Colts, who's done a fine job as a general manager in a lot of respects, and yet 
he, he just could not find a quarterback. He just kept resorting to old hag after old hag after old hag of a quarterback because he just couldn't find one. And now I think, I think he may have found one that's going to be really awesome for like four games a year when yeah. he's not injured. But even now, like I, I don't – I'm, I'm – I'm pessimistic that Anthony Richardson is going to be the long-term solution at the, for the Colts. I guess I should say I'm optimistic that he'll be the long, that he won't be the long-term. As solution. a Texan fan, you're optimistic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The seven home there've been seven considered home runs, like championship caliber. You can win a Super Bowl on the shoulders of this guy: Joe Burrow, Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson, Patrick Mahomes, Andrew Luck. It's an interesting one. Cam Newton, Matthew Stafford. Yeah. So those are the seven. And and I'd say even one or two of those seven are I like I think I think you could have a healthy debate about Andrew Luck or Cam Andrew, Newton. Yeah, I guess Andrew Luck you know what you're right. Andrew Luck kind of gets I, I see him getting like almost shuttled into the elite quarterback category without without any discussion about it. And that's just not the case. That's not how he was as a quarterback in his career. He was, uh, he's in the hall of pretty damn good, but was still question like there were still unresolved questions about Andrew Luck. Um, and you know, a lot of it had, and, and you can't sit there and act like the injuries and the abuse that he took off times it, it being his own fault, like that, that was just as simple as like, well, he was awesome, but he just had bad luck. Like, no, a lot of those hits were his own fault. So yeah, I would, uh. I would question whether that was a home run for sure. Me too. And, I, and Cam yeah. Newton, I look, Cam Newton got the Panthers to a Super Bowl and he won an MVP. Um, but outside of that, like it was, you know, I mean, that was clearly the crown jewel of his career is that 2015 season. They went 15 and one. He was the MVP of the league. Um, but he, he never, in any of his other seasons, never sniffed that level again. Like Patrick Mahomes is elite every year. Lamar Jackson has won two MVPs. Hadn't gotten to a Super Bowl yet. I get that. Um, I, you know, I suppose that at, the, at his peak, Cam Newton, peak Cam Newton did more than Josh Allen has done so far, but Josh Allen has been more consistently good over consecutive years since 2020 than Cam Newton ever was for that long of a period in his career. Um, yeah. Burrow's been to a Super Bowl. Matthew Stafford's won a Super Bowl. I don't have huge problems with any of them, but I think the big thing is seven out of 46, 46 first-round quarterbacks since 2009, only seven have been home runs. And yet, if I ask the question, which bucket will the guys in the incomplete category fall into? Bryce Young, C.J. Stroud, Anthony Richardson, and Jordan Love. The one guy I would for sure pick to be the home run out of those four guys would be C.J. Stroud. Um, yeah. You know, so yeah. I feel very lucky I, about that. I, I think if you look at the, the incompletes, like for Richardson, Love, Stroud, or Young, um, I think with Love, the biggest question is still going to be one of like, what is your decision-making in clutch moments because that was the question about him beforehand. It came up against him in the playoffs. Yes, like He's got this Carson Wentz-like tendency at times to just heave the ball off into the ether and hope for the best. And he, like, he's gotten a lot better at it, and it might just be a matter of being in more clutch situations as a starting quarterback. Um, but that's a big question for him. Hey, he and It's weird because... He and C.J. Stroud, I feel like, are being almost evaluated on the same standard now, and yet C.J. Stroud is the one who was a rookie last year. Yeah. So, like, Jordan Love had the benefit of having to sit behind and wait before yeah. he got a chance to play, and he's gotten better since he started playing. Um, but I just – I think C.J. is still the, the more precocious one based on what he did as a rookie. Yeah, I, I think I, – I, look – 32 teams, if you put C.J. Stroud and Jordan Love out there for those 32 teams to pick which one they could have, I think C.J. Stroud gets probably two, at least two-thirds of the vote there would be my mm -hmm. guess. Um, it's interesting. So there's other than the incompletes, there's four other categories. Home run, solid result, mixed result, miss. If you had to take the four incompletes and put one of them in each of the categories, I think C.J. Oh. CJ's the, it's almost like our game of kiss, marry, kill, but it's home run, solid, mixed, miss. Um, CJ's the home run for me, for sure. I would say okay. who, who solid, who, solid yeah. for Jordan Love. I think Jordan Love is solid. I agree with you on that. Um, mixed result. I don't know. Well, Young and Richardson. It's just impossible to say. I guess mixed result would be Richardson at this point because at least he's shown some. 
he's shown way more flashes yeah. and just four speckled starts than than Bryce Young did in his entire time in the NFL this year. So I would put Richardson in mixed result and Young as the the miss. Yeah, I'm kind of so going. Far. I'm kind of coming at it from a standpoint. If you and I are doing this exercise three years from now. Which categories oh, are these guys oh, okay, in? You know, like if we're you. predicting okay. ahead, you know, like if we're looking ahead. And I think I think CJ's home run, and I think I think I, if I had to, I would say Jordan Love is more likely solid that second category. And I think I, I think the way you laid it out currently would be the same way that I would predict this plays out over the course of the next few years. Like I think there's a yeah. really good chance Bryce Young is a major major miss for the Carolina Panthers. I think that Bryce Young again. And I don't want to harp on this because I don't. He seems like a nice young gentleman and all, but man, for a guy who's so short, there was just there's just so little to make up for him being short. Like he doesn't. He's got horrible footwork. He's not that athletic. Um, he's not even bigger. Some guys that are short, they're at least kind of like Russell Wilson is short, not as short as Bryce Young, but he's thick. You know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, and he does like Bryce Young does so little to offset that, and it was just. And I'm not, I'm not even saying that he shouldn't have been drafted high or anything. It's, it's that when you watch him play, you got to see, okay, what's it going to be like when he gets in the NFL, and just the sheer disparity in so many different physical skills beyond just height make it really hard to imagine him being a good quarterback in the NFL right now. No matter how much you no matter how much good stuff you put around him. I think sometimes too, even they did the right thing. They went out and they got a couple of guards to bolster the middle because look for a guy like him, it's it's especially devastating to have pressure up the middle. You still have the issue of like when he does throw over the middle, he's late. Like even though it's wide open. And not to mention that Sometimes a well-blocked pocket might be the worst thing for him because he's too tiny to see over those big <laughs> offensive linemen they just added. That's true. You know? He needs gaps. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, think that the problem, I, I feel like Drew Brees, Drew Brees doesn't get enough credit for managing his height as well as he did, and he's yeah. not that short. But his ability to throw with anticipation, to kind of like play off his tippy toes in a lot of respects, mm-hmm. um, and all of that, you, you can't really appreciate it. Until 10 different guys get drafted with people thinking like, oh, yeah, he'll do it just like Drew Brees did it. Yeah. Um, does Josh Allen belong in the home run category? A couple people saying that. Hey, Josh Allen's overrated. Is Josh, and, and I kind of paused on Josh Allen, too, when we were discussing Andrew Luck and Cam Newton. Again, the seven home runs, yeah. according to this, in the first round of the last 15 years are Joe Burrow, Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson, Mahomes, Luck, Newton, Stafford. Remember this. Remember this. By Tom Brady standards, Josh Allen played well enough to beat the Chiefs in the playoffs. If in a bad weather game he drove them into field goal position, but they didn't have a Patriots kicker to kick the field goal. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I think that Josh Josh Allen is in that class. He's in that James Harden spot of really, really, really good player on a really good team, but has the misfortune of playing in the same era as the Kansas City Chiefs or the Golden State Warriors. Yep. And I, so, yeah, I think Josh Allen is there. Yep. Um, the two or the three that are in the solid. I, and honestly, result- sorry, Sean. That's okay. Like, just uh, if you want justification or verification of it, even this year, like when they, they had to fire their offensive coordinator as the Bills were top five in multiple offensive Statistic, uh, offensive categories, and it mostly be, and it was a justified firing because most of their offense was Josh Allen pulling rabbits out of the hat in in, in really difficult situations. Yeah, yeah. And it looked it ended up looking a lot better when the new guy came in. Yep. Um. So uh, the solid result, the second tier, we named the seven home run. The solid result: Trevor Lawrence, Tua, Justin Herbert. And see, I think CJ's better than all those guys. I know CJ's incomplete because it's only one year. Like if we're if if I had to pick a bucket that CJ Stroud yeah. lands in, I think he's I think he's cut from the same cloth as the seven guys who are the home run draft picks. Yeah. I don't understand how you can put solid under Trevor Lawrence right now when there's a, a real legitimate debate as to whether he should get an extension uh, or like what actual successes he had. And I can make excuses for him. But I, uh, but I don't see where the performance, where has been, where has the performance been that justifies him being a solid result? I might, like, you might believe that he's on the right track and he'll be okay and all that. But I just, I don't feel like he's been a solid NFL quarterback so far. No, unless you give him like 17 injury-related excuses. Well, and and throw Justin. I mean, he he beat Justin Herbert in a playoff game, and Herbert's on that same level too. Like I, I would say, both of them. I've got. 
questions about it. The only thing, the only, the main difference is Herbert's gotten paid. I, yeah, I'm way more bullish on Herbert than you are. I just, uh, I, I feel like he's had zero support from his defense the entire time he's been there. And yeah. just, um, like, I've, I felt like he had a pretty solid year last year. I just, uh, they don't win football games, but I, I'll make excuses. I, like, I'll make excuses for him when it comes to them not winning. But I feel like his quarterback performance has been okay. To be clear, I would take Justin Herbert over Trevor Lawrence if I was starting a football team. I would yeah. take Justin Herbert ahead of him. Um, it's just, it's, you, you start to get so many years of underperformance as a team where you go, okay, you are the quarterback of this thing. You guys did go 5-12 and 12 last year. But, um, all right, Payne and Pendergast with you. All right, um, so yesterday kind of highlighted for me again one tradition here in America and probably around the world that it would be just so nice if we could do away with. And I've got several examples as to why we need to do it. Why are we creating so many comedians that is coming up next. Ability Trees is on your side as we start to enter the really, really hot months. We're getting the thick of it here in Houston. Your trees often pay the price. A lot of them did last year. And you
Live from the Twin Peaks studios, Sports Radio 610 presents Payne and Pendergast. Seth, you know that I carry around a list of things that annoy me. I carry it around on my phone. I've got it right yes. here. Um, I feel like it's healthy for me to keep that list. Allows me to know what to avoid out there. But sometimes some of these things are are unavoidable. And I added something to my list yesterday. I, I only started this list probably within the last year. So these are things, several of them, that, that have annoyed me for a long, long time. Um, but uh, I, I decided to put this list together. I added one yesterday because this is the – yesterday was the first April Fool's Day that has occurred since I started my – iPhone list of things that annoy me. So I added April Fool's Day to my list because I find April Fool's Day to be one of the dumbest things on earth. It's not funny. It's uh, it's stupid. It's, I feel like it used to be better. It used to be easier. It's just the problem is we, we just have so many alerts and so much information out there today. I actually got, I got done by one yesterday. Though, you did? And it was relatively late in the day. And it's one that I know that you're going to mention. So I'll wait. You can, you can guess which one I got taken in by. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, I'm going to guess that it's this first one I'm about to read from Justin Reed, former Texan safety, where yesterday at 8.35 a.m., he tweeted, for the last four years or so, I've been in this cycle on injury, pain, rehab. I feel stuck in it. The only way I see out is to no longer play football. It's taken my joy of this game away. Thank you, everyone, who supported me on this incredible journey. I love you all. Heart emoji. That is former Texans, current Super Bowl champion, Kansas City Chief, safety, Justin Reed. I, uh, yep, you'd, you'd be entirely correct. That was me. As I was composing, as I was composing uh, a, a response to him in which I commended him for being one of the ones to stand up to David Culley's tyranny, because uh, you'll recall. <laughs> yes, he had, to fight I, through, he had to fight through David Culley's henchman, Chris Conley. I like to imagine... I like to imagine that it, that it happened thusly. Uh, David Culley was going through and talking about how well the offense did or something. Because he loved – Culley loved to point out how awesome the – even if, even if something happened well defensively, Culley had to point out about how somebody on offense yeah. did something well too. Like, because we all know he was the offensive mastermind apparently. Oh, yeah. Um, I like to feel that he was, like, trying to give praise to something that Davis Mills had done. And Justin Reed stood up and said – what, like, what, honestly, what the hell are we doing? What the hell are we doing here? And then he turned back to the back corner and looked at Jack Easterby and was like, seriously, what the hell are we doing here? Yeah. And, uh, and that that was part of the beginning of the end for Justin Reed. Uh, but then I thought, and then I realized, like, oh, wait a second. Let me follow up on this. And his, he, he replied to himself. And Did he even say April Fool's? He didn't say April he Fool's. Just... He replied to himself with a, a gif of a kid peeking over a fence yeah um i don't i'm sure someone who's seen whatever that whatever movie or tv show that's from will go yeah sean that's from whatever whatever i don't know where it's from um and then he wrote like a he started doing like an andrew luck style dearest mother tweet i don't know he didn't yeah he, yeah yeah he started that dearest uh yeah, yeah. oh no 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 that's a, that's jim carrey sean that's not a kid oh is it jim carrey jim carrey peeking okay, over it looks like and... a, it looks like a kid <laughs> I filled in the rest of it with a kid's face. What is it? What's it from? He's got he's got widows. Uh, he's got crow's feet. You can see. Uh, okay, kid. I didn't yeah. see that. The reflection. <laughs> All right, my bad. It's Jim Carrey peeking over a fence. Um, so I I almost got done by that one too by by Justin Reed, but I paged down just to just to see what the replies were like, you know, because he's yeah. a very he's still very popular here in Houston. I think Houston Texan fans have fond memories of Justin Reed. So that's annoying. So that my first my reaction then, and I'm like, oh, ho, ho, ho. that's hilarious, Justin Reed. Oh, I'm retiring. No, I'm not. <laughs> it's yeah. April Fools. Gene Steratore did the opposite. Former referee Gene Steratore, mm -hmm. uh, at one o'clock yesterday. Picture of him in his referee's outfit. Excited to announce that I'll be returning to the field this season. You can only keep these zebra stripes off me for so long. Hashtag Let's Go. <sighs> that's just a. Uh... I'll tell you what. <laughs> listen, not, listen here, Gene Steratore. I don't need. Uh, I don't need you. Ag I don't need you like laughing at all the hate you are going to receive as further confirmation that a lot of NFL officials really don't care about doing their job well uh, because they actually enjoy the tears of others. So yeah, I uh, I don't. I didn't say all NFL officials. Yeah, yeah. I said some. And uh, no, I, I don't. I don't. I don't buy this or take it's this one. It's not bit. funny. Like it's there's not. And I'm not even saying it's not funny because I feel like I got duped. 
I didn't get duped ultimately. It's just like I don't like the the ah ha ha April Fools. Um, Clutch City Entertainment, which is a Twitter account that I that I like, they actually tweeted yes. They tweeted per Adam Schefter. They actually tagged Schefter in it, and they have a big graphic of Jack Easterby. And it said, quote, the new success of the Texans has caused new owner Cal McNair to seek counsel. He welcomes Jack Easterby back into the fold as director of player personnel and team chaplain, end quote, thoughts. And their graphic says April Fools at the bottom of it. Like, I, like, like my feeling, their graphic <laughs> Easterby says April Fools right there. Like, if you're going to do it, then try to fool people. Like, I, don't I straddle don't the fence and put no. April Fools at the bottom. I respect this because I think with Clutch City, I think they probably straddle a line where they want to be taken, they want to be taken seriously when they break news, you know, because they, they're, they're a blog and they have fun, but they also take it seriously. Right. So I think what they probably figure is like, look, we don't, we don't want to make a mockery of ourselves or have people look uh, like we're the onion or something. Yeah. So they just said, look, it's right here. It says April Fools. Okay. In that uh, Space City. I can accept at the very that. Bottom. I can accept that. The pr- see the problem with April Fools. And the concept of April Fool's Day is that when news trickles out like commanders announced they're signing Jeff Driscoll, I don't know if that's real or not. Is someone really signing Jeff Driscoll or is it an April Fool's joke? Turns out it was Uh, real. Sean, he's like the second best athlete in the league after Lamar Jackson. That's right. Andy Bischoff told us so. Did you not remember that or realize that? I I forgot about that. You're right. I stand corrected. Don't you remember there's also a tight end? I did. Kind you know of. what? He's got versatility. What am I saying? Yeah. Don't you remember that he made the move to tight end and then back Dude. to quarterback in the same year? <laughs> it's in the same week. Jeff Driscoll is everything I ever need to remember not to trust any talent evaluator in the NFL. Oh. Like the fact that, to, like, that anybody ever watched him actually play football and thought Dude. he was a good quarterback, it makes me want to punch holes in walls. He started uh, like, the game last year. He was such a horrible athlete. Such a horrible athlete. Oh, my God. Like, he couldn't turn... You had to change direction with him, like you had to, like you had to punch coordinates into a big dude, track or something. Dude. He was awful. April. It 4th. was awful. I'm not even mad at Jeff Driscoll himself. No, I'm mad it's not that his fault. I'm mad that offensive coordinators thought, "Hey, this guy's got a fast 40. Let's put in packages where he can run." How the hell did anybody ever think Jeff Driscoll was a good athlete? Yeah. How? Yeah. How? How does this happen? <laughs> I feel generally good about the way things have gone with the Texans lately. But I'll never get over them thinking Jeff Driscoll was a good athlete. No, ever, I don't ever. I don't either. He was the worst athlete on the team who could have. He happened to run fast. Yep, yep. Straight line. Yeah, honestly, did. honestly, there's some dumbass in the Texans front office right now who actually thinks that Tom Hanks is a good athlete because he watched Forrest Gump. And he's like, that ah, guy's. Did you see him run? And he could do it for speed and distance. Incredible, this guy. He could carry an offensive lineman on his on his shoulder out of the. Out of the jungle is this yeah, guy, is this true, guy, man. Tom Hanks. Yeah. Oh, Gumperu, he was pretty good. He had the speed to be a kickoff returner at Alabama and the endurance to literally run for months and months it's across the country. It's rare that you find somebody that's so good at sprinting and distance running. Yes. It's very rare. Very rare. Um, word of advice from the text page. When you wake up on the day of April 1st, make a mental note to yourself to not believe anything you read or hear. Sadly... Sadly, I make that mental note to myself every day now <laughs> to not believe everything I read or hear. <laughs> like, in all honesty, like yesterday on X.com wasn't all that different from other days with the fr- front porch sports and fax sports radio and all the, you know, all the different fake accounts and whatnot. One of the this is uh, this is kind of related to April Fools and that like I maybe somebody was somebody was concerned that we may have spread a falsehood earlier because we've been saying that this was the earliest no hitter that Blanco ever uh, that's ever been pitched in Major League Baseball. Yeah. Understandable that there'd be a miscommunication on it because during the broadcast they were saying the earliest no hitter ever was like the second game of the season a long time ago. Yeah. Yes, that is true, but. By the calendar, this was right. the earliest. And I actually, I just went back through and, and, and uh, controlled uh, control F for April and went through every April no-hitter. And, okay. yes, this was indeed the, the earliest by calendar date no-hitter ever. Okay, there you go. Yes. There you go. Um, 4226, lots of April Fool's jokes are funny, though, Sean. Not really. No, not really. What about, when, uh, what about the really fast pitcher back in the day, Sid remember? Sid Finch, that was stupid. Yeah. George Why was it Plimpton. stupid? I bought it hook, line, and sinker as you, a kid. Well, as a kid, yeah, yeah. As a, was I, it the Cubs? No, it was the Mets. It was Sid, the Mets. Sid Finch. I believe it was George Plimpton wrote the article. Yeah. 
Oh, Plimperoo. I, I think uh, I've, I think I bought it hook, line, sink, too. It's probably well, we were it. that age where we yeah. would have been suckers for it. And that was when there was no ESPN to speak of. Right. It was like that. So it would be like for 30 seconds on the nightly news, they would show that was a crossover hit. Yeah. Because they, they built up to it for yeah. weeks. Yeah. This Sid Finch, because it was in spring training that he was like, remember, he broke a catcher's hand. Yeah. He was, there were like, uh, there was like a tarp with holes in it because he'd been throwing against yes. the tarp because nobody would nobody would catch for him and he, he was uh and they're like perfectly shaped baseball size holes in the tarp he, he and wore, we all bought it he wore like a work boot on one of his feet like <laughs> as one of his shoes john lopez just walked in i'm guessing he knows exactly what we're talking about here. Uh, one of my favorite all-time stories yeah. sid finch right Sid finch yeah did sid. you fall for it john uh, oh big time i mean that's all you had was print Sports Illustrated. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know you're a subscriber your whole life, and uh, it was written by uh, George Plimpton. George Plimpton. Yeah. That's right, Plimpton. Yeah. Uh, so he was. So it was actually. So the original story was in Sports Illustrated. No, no. I remember getting the magazine, and he's yeah. on the cover. And I want to say, was it a boot or he had like the some? Boot. It was some weird shoe. It was a weird on. shoe. That's what I was just saying. Real like gangly, a work, like a work boot on or something. Yeah, yeah. No, I. Oh, abs- I think, and I wasn't alone. No, no, I wasn't no. alone for falling. No, there was no internet there to check the truth for us. You know what I mean? Yeah, and like the, today and the, the story was just so plausible and real, and what the happened? fact that they got the Mets involved in it months in advance. Yeah, was did uh, it was it a red flag at all that like George Plimpton was the guy writing it because he'd kind of done goofy stuff before, right? Like yeah, he paper did paper and all that, and all that yeah. stuff. Uh, but no, I mean, I I I remember reading it and I'm thinking. God, I got to see this guy. Can't wait. For- well, that's the-, the other thing. See, that's the other thing. You really only had national baseball on NBC Game of the Week. Yeah. Uh, so Yeah, you, that's right. Yeah, so you, I was like, when are they going to be Dude, on the Game of the Week? You got This week in baseball was how you saw the other yeah. players, like that you got your baseball <laughs> yeah. cards. Right? Yeah. Like, that's how I saw Andre Dawson. <laughs> yeah. What? Wait a second. And Seth's reading something. <laughs> wait a second. What? How did we fall for this, though? According to Plimpton, Finch was raised in an English orphanage. Oh, dude. Learned, <laughs> learned yoga in Tibet no. and could throw a fastball. Listen, yeah. as fast as 168 miles yeah, per that, hour. That was the dumb part. I was just going to bring that up. I'm like, I forget what his velo was, but his velo was something where we should be ashamed that we. <laughs> I. I was expecting it to be like 112 or yeah. something, like something absurd. I remember, but not, yeah. I remember the one in the eight. So I was thinking 118, I 168. God, we were stupid as a society. How did aliens not fly down here and take over? Like they, we were ripe to be taken over. I feel like it was well done, and I was not gullible the at all. Sid Finch era. Oh my gosh. Oh, yeah. oh Sean, listen to you. Oh, you I'm the worst. Silly Sean. I, I, How did like as if it hasn't already happened? You're so naive. That's true. Uh, That's true. Uh, no, open your eyes, man. Open your eyes, sheeple. I know. I know. How about that no-no last night, huh? How about that no-no last yeah. night? Yeah. Uh, it, it was it, – it, it obviously, you know, couldn't have come at a better time. Of course. Like they had the worst start you could possibly imagine. Uh, there's some questions that we got to talk about, though, man. Um, I mean, there's – can I ask you something? Yes, sir. Is Dusty Baker in your rundown today? Dusty Baker is mentioned. Okay. <laughs> Dusty Baker I feel like is it, mentioned. Uh, yeah, just the interactions on social media, on the text page and Dude, whatnot. Dude, he's I trending. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, there's a uh, there's a big faction of Astro fans that are, like, behind, like, Dusty. Be- like, this, this yeah. isn't Dust. This isn't bringing up Dusty just for the sake of bringing up Dusty. No. It's relevant because Yiner Diaz had two home runs and managed to somehow game manage a pitcher in his eighth start. To I, I don't know hitter. how he did it. But we should all be thanking Dusty for this, right? Like, that's what he told us last year, that yeah, we'll thank him yeah, for yeah, how yeah, he exactly. handled Yiner Diaz. Yeah, all right. Exactly. No, his name is mentioned uh, on, the, on the rundown. He is? Okay. Okay. Yeah, just making sure. <laughs> I hey, put Landry. him in my daily affirmations. Uh, <laughs> Dusty I think, Baker. I think I'm grateful for everything yeah. that Dusty Baker yes. has done for Yiner Diaz. Yep. Mm-hmm. One yep. last Sid Finch thing. Mm-hmm. The Sid Finch hijacks us post-mortem. That's right. The first, so the subtitle, John, you'll appreciate this. The, um, the subtitle of the article about Sid Finch said, he's a pitcher, part yogi and part recluse, impressively liberated from our opulent lifestyle. Sid's deciding about yoga and his future in baseball. 
the first letters of the until the very end there spell out the first letters of the word spell out Happy April Fool's Day. Oh, well, I, I found that, that out was, afterward. Boy, yeah. man, G Plimp had it going on, man. He's the best. He's the plimp. I saw him speak once. It was one of the greatest speeches. Really? Ever. Yeah, he really? was a great speaker. Okay. Great speaker. Okay. Yeah. I just remember him from uh, stories for days. I remember him from Goodwill Hunting. He was the. Who was he in Goodwill Hunting? Was he, was, he the, he was one the, of the. The psychologist? He was one of the psychologists, yeah. Yeah, the psychologist. Okay, got the one that was getting into the dancing and stuff. The... Uh, he was the one that Matt... That, that was gay. The one that Matt Damon accused yeah. of being right, gay. Right, right, yeah. yeah. Like, he was... Uh, yeah, dead. Matt was talking about being in the nightclub. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know how y'all thinking about me right now. <laughs> what are you saying? <laughs> All right, um... We, uh, we are done. We're out of time. You're listening to KLT and KLT HD2 and Odyssey Station. Seth, antibodies to you. Antibodies and an even earlier whatever. Yeah, George Plumpton, goodbye. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we'll see you. Uh, Landry Locker, John Lopez, Figgy Fig. They are in the loop, and they start now. All right, so a party crash yesterday. Uh, it was supposed to be a historic matchup. Supposed to be all the headlines right there, and I'll be damned. The Houston Astros burst into the top headlines on ESPN with the little... Little no no action. First dub of the year and the the women's basketball party that I'm sure that you and uh B Scott I loved it. and Figgy threw on Monday. It got mm-hmm. it got just just a little bit of a not crash, but just a little bit of a guess there. Yeah, they they're they're on the they're on the headline, but uh, dominating still is Caitlin Clark. We'll get to that in Iowa and all that. I am not Figgy, I don't know about you. We will? I am not going to let Landry rain on our parade. What parade? Y'all's the women's basketball. Absolutely. Crowd enthralling mesmerizing uh women's basketball game <laughs> okay. uh i i know what's coming trust no, me I, yeah. I, I, trust me i know what's it's coming. cool man landry <laughs> probably watching some tape or something yeah, he's on watching, the texans watching some tape no i mean i <laughs> it's all good man he, he watching the office of line I'm tape sure it was fantastic it man. was i'm sure it, it was, was. Great. Every, it was amazing i'm not <laughs> i have no no issue with you guys enjoying the the great game of women's basketball. No mm-hmm. problem with it at all. Okay, none, none at all. No, not I'm even sure, a little bit. I'm sure y'all got some great takes, dude. We do. And like Kate and Clark's good. Uh, I'm a, I'm gonna make a comparison there that's gonna blow your mind. Uh, blow your mind. Yeah, I doubt it. Blow your mind. Doubt it. But we probably shouldn't bury the lead here locally. We'll get to it. No hitter, man. Yeah, Houston Astros. They they got a dub and. Uh, Mr. Blanco with the no-no. Uh, here was what it sounded like on AT&T Sportsnet. Todd Callis with the call. I think this was the first acknowledgement of what was going on. The Astros get a no-no. The Astros get a dub. Here's what it sounded like. Ground ball. Dubon. Throws to first. Go hitter. Run up, Blanco. In his eighth career start, the 30-year-old makes magic on April. Fool's Day. How about that? Was that the first time he mentioned it? Yeah. Throughout the game? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know how they are, those people. We're not going to get into that too much, I don't think, <laughs> unless you guys stir the pot and get me going again. Uh, and, and you're both good at stirring the pot and getting me going, but uh, I'm going to call him Queso Blanco from now on until he, until he comes back down to earth. Throwing that oh, cheese. What? Throwing that cheese, man. Queso Blanco. You like that, right? I, I'm going to stay away from it, but <laughs> you can have that if you want it. Yeah. Queso Blanco, depending on how you want to say it. So you were uh, you were flipping back and forth between the Astros and the uh, other game? Okay, how about a confession? Okay. Let's hear it. How about a confession? Watch this. These are my confessions. I didn't flip to the Astros like and watch it on TV. I was keeping up on my phone. Yeah. But I didn't flip to the Astros until after the LSU-Iowa game was over. Okay, that's fair. So what was that about, the 7th, 8th? What was it, Figgy? I'm sure you did the same thing. I think it was the 7th. Yeah, I think that's like 7th, yeah. 8th. Yeah, I think it was about the 7th, 8th. Yeah. yeah, somewhere in there. No, nah, man, it was a great night of sports. Like You're thinking a Tuesday in April, ho-hum. Goodness. I mean, and, and, and I'm just, I'm just going to be honest here when it comes to uh, the Astros and, and uh, the LSU-Iowa game. I was first on the basketball. I was, like, surprised myself at how entertained I was by that game. Really? Like, it was just – it. sports is entertainment. Yeah. You know? And no matter what it is, you could be watching a Little League game, and if it's really enthralling, you're going to get into it. I was, like, into it. Like, it, what she did was spectacular. Isn't that what she always does? 
dude, but that that's third, that's that third what she quarter does, right? against the national champions, Angel Reese, 17 points, 20 rebounds. You know, all that rivalry, the atmosphere. I'm going to be very curious on the ratings because we've been talking about that. And well, that's going to be the highest rated women's game of all time. It has to be. I mean, there's uh, no doubt about that. Yeah. And then I go to the Astros and, and we're watching this thing happen. And I don't want to be that guy. But I, I think there's two serious questions we have to ask here. And I'm going to ask them to you uh, with Ronel Blanco. First of all incredible story himself probably like beginning to end a much better story than caitlin clark like you know she she was born to play basketball and was given every opportunity and worked her ass off no don't don't get me wrong and she's probably the greatest women's player in college anyway that there's ever been but ronald blanco was 22 years old washing cars in the dominican republic he was washing cars trying to latch on with a team got turned down and turned down and turned down by club after club after club. Finally, the Astros gave him 5,000 bucks. I, I said 2022, 20, it was 20, 2016. Uh, 2022 is when he made his debut. Um, they gave him 5,000 bucks. And at 30 years old, he does that? At 30 years old, he does that? It's kind of similar to Fromber, right? Wasn't Fromber 15,000? Yeah, it was 10,000, I think, something like that. Yeah. And uh, so what a great story. But here are my questions for you. <laughs> And, and, and it's going to sound really bad. You're going to hike your leg on this? No, no. No, I'm not. It's a question. I don't know about this. I don't know if this is going to be just a question <laughs> or a leading question. <laughs> so just a question. How does it make you feel? How does it affect how we feel about the starting pitching? What he did last night? Better. Starting pitching hasn't been that bad. Mm -hmm. I mean, Fromber wasn't good, but it hasn't been terrible. I don't think they... I, I think they still haven't allowed an, a home run. Mm -hmm. It makes me feel better, I guess. I mean, do I think this is going to be normal? No, but it, it makes me feel better about the starting pitching that at least you have a guy who can go out there and do this. Mm -hmm. And then another question. Well, let me let me give you my thought on that. I, I think we still need more from Fromber. We still need. Oh Ver, no doubt. We, we still need Verlander Verlander to yeah to to show something. Garcia more, threw more a bullpen yesterday. Garcia threw a bullpen. So it's like one of those great moments. But I think it's not going to answer a lot of questions. Maybe one big one in terms of him. Uh, you know, in starting pitching. Here's my second question for you: How sustainable is Ronel Blanco? Not, not at all. This is as yeah. good as it gets, and it's going to. As long as he can be a serviceable five guy, then I think you're I think you're good for it. But I would I would tap the brakes on any expectations. I don't think he's in the rotation at the end of the year. Oh wow. Maybe. Uh, I mean I, I mean that's not crazy. I don't. Yeah. I mean I think Gar if Garcia comes back and if Verlander comes back, I don't think he's in the rotation. So I don't think it's sustainable at all. I don't I, it was a, it was a great outing. Hopefully he can hold it down, but yeah. Yeah, because I what made me think about that question is this was just his eighth start and 25 appearances you know and he added the changeup, which was like a ridiculous pitch last night um and he so like this is the major leagues as we all know and that adjustment those adjustments that are going to come the scouting reports the data the analytics of what he throws and when he throws them uh i feel like that's going to be he can if he's just really good it's a huge victory but it's going to be hard to sustain that given that he's just really being looked at for the first time is a no hitter like is that something you build on? I mean, I, that's the thing that I do wonder about baseball because if I wanted to overreact, I could sit here and say, okay, the Astros really needed a win in a big way, and they went out there and they blanked a very good baseball team. They dominated. They no hit them, and now maybe this is the start of some much needed momentum. I, I don't know that it. I don't know that it propels you to do anything different it, it is kind of a day-to-day -day type of thing I, last year fromber fell apart after his no hitter and it was in yeah. the middle of a struggle you know yeah. and and fromber fromber's fromber so mm -hmm. i want it like the it's early guys like do we do we kind of flip now and say you know maybe they can build on this mm -hmm. I, I don't know that this is like a walk-off win or something like that i would say maybe they can build on this because there's a little more attentiveness to it and maybe you can get a streak going but is a no-hitter like some sort of momentum thing that they can build on? I don't think it's something that the Astros can build on, but I think it's something that he can build on. Uh, and that's and that's going to help the Astros by extension. I, I think the confidence level now, 
you know, I can do this, even though he only hits 92, 93, uh, et, et cetera. He's got that change up like we talked about. Uh, so it, it's not – I don't think the Astros can necessarily build on it, but one thing it did do was stop some severe bleeding. Like, I can't – I mean, you know this. We, we talked about it yesterday when B. Scott was – that was like the absolute worst start you could possibly imagine. Well, yeah. I mean, they lost – Two and a half percent of their games. Yeah. Do you want to put it in perspective? Two and a half percent. And that, they were bleeding, man. I mean, they. I don't care what they say. That was that. That was a horrible start. Yeah, swept by the Yankees, and then you get the no-no. So, shout out to Blanco for for getting that no-no. Uh, shout out to all the loopholes uh, here on Sports Radio six ten. So was uh, April Fool's Day a popular topic God among the people yesterday? We were talking about this. I'm on the athletes, yeah. How, what do you – do you think people are going to actually go, ah, ha, good one, when you do an April Fool's joke? Like, is, are you that dumb? Like, oh, man, that's awesome. What a great – what a great prank. What a great joke. <laughs> you, you got you me. You got me. Like, how dumb do you have to be to think, I'm going to do an April Fool's joke and it's going to kill? That's my thing. There, there, no April Fool joke hits. Not since the one they were talking about on the morning show, the Sid Finch thing on, on SI. Who was that? It was, talking, it was y'all were mentioning a bunch of names at the end of there. I had no idea. I didn't want to be. I didn't want to like make my entrance back. Y'all, <laughs> I mean, and then y'all were citing. Good, when did Goodwill Hunting come out? Ooh. When y'all are like going line for line with Goodwill Hunting and talking about who were those two guys y'all talked about? Sid Finch. Sid Finch. I heard him mention. Who's that? Yeah, he was. It was. It was actually a legendary story that Sports Illustrated did pre-internet. That was uh, it like Manti Teo. Uh, yeah, well, it was, it was George Plimpton that that who uh, see the writer. Who's that? He, who? He's one of the greatest writers there's ever been. What? Yeah, George what? George Plimpton. Okay, yeah, yeah. like an author writer or like a journalist. Both. Yeah, okay. he, he did. Okay, both. so George Plimpton did something about Finch. Yes. Okay. Yes, and back in the day that it had uh, it, it had the country. So what was the story? About this phenom pitcher that they found in the middle of nowhere that could throw 168 miles an hour. And he's kidding. And the Mets played along with it. The Mets actually had paperwork and all this other stuff. It was actually very complex and well done. But even that now you, you think of as just a horrible. So people read it and thought it was real? Yes. Like all over the country. It was on the cover of Sports Illustrated. Like it was, it was crazy. Uh, but not since then has any has any... Uh, April Fool's joke hit. None. You're going to think I'm just taking, like, an opposite stance on this, but I've I've actually kind of done a complete 180 on April Fool's. What? I have. I, I really, really have done a 180 on April Fool's. And maybe I, I don't look at this as... I, I look at this as actually kind of appreciating what things can provide you with as foolish as they are. I think April Fool's is stupid. I agree with y'all that the April Fool's jokes are moronic. I think it's goofy, all that. For kids or whatever, it's fun. But I actually think it's a valuable resource. I, and I actually think we should put April Fool's to practice in our daily life. I think I know where you're going with this. Because <laughs> I, I, I'm dead serious, man. I think I know Because where you're I, going I actually think this year April Fool's changed my life. <laughs> and I think my life is better because of April Fool's. Yeah. And the reason is, I think on the internet... A healthy amount. And this was one of my main journalism lessons. Rest in peace to Robert Wernsman. He always said you should have skepticism. Uh, as, as someone who's a journalist, as someone who's gathering news, as someone who's presenting news, a healthy amount of skepticism is a good thing to have. And I think sometimes we go on the internet and we just list all these dumbass moron reporters, people that are just tweeting and all that, or athletes that are saying stuff, and we just... We take it so serious, and, and we take it at its word, and we act like it's like some sort of gospel. And for me, like on April Fool's Day, I, I realized this yesterday. Mm -hmm. I think it's. I'm not saying that it's. I'm not saying I enjoy the jokes. The jokes. The jokes are the jokes. But I think the mindset in which you go into the internet and you say, half of this is bull bleep. No, these people are morons. I'm not going to even like value what mm -hmm. they what what is going to be said. All that. This writer says this. This hot take. I actually think if, if if I developed that April Fool's mindset in my daily life, I think the world would be a better place because I think a lot of times kids, media types, 
real life people, you go on the internet and you sit there and you read something and it's really just some jackass starting something and yeah. trying to find some sort of like the extreme opposite of their argument and, and portray that as the real world or set some sort of like narrative and storyline and then all of a sudden you're, you're like living your everyday life and you find yourself you find yourself feeling that type of way when really the reality is you open up your eyes everything's pretty good and at the at the end of the day yeah when i push up and i go to twitter and i pull up this app it's full of crap and even the stuff that's not full of crap really in the big scheme of things is not important so i think april fool's day actually changed my life i i, I see what you're saying that's not where i thought you were going to go I thought you were going to go uh, here, and, and it's kind of where my mind is a little bit. I like April Fool's joke because it weeds out all the morons. <laughs> like, like I can never look at Justin Reed oh, the same again. Oh, he's a loser. I can never look no, at no, him the same No, no, again. no, we're, we're on the same page. Yes. He's a clown. It, it kind of clarifies who the morons are. That is true, too. That's what I'm saying. Like, April Fool's is actually a really valuable day because... <laughs> you know who they are. Yes. <laughs> they show themselves. Yes. <laughs> so, like, that, like, even Jack in the Box. I like Jack in the Box, but... Like now, I'm gonna look at them differently because they're, you, like, they're like we're canceling breakfast. Don't you think if you adopted in in like just your normal scroll th scroll through on Twitter mm -hmm. or, or whatever, if you adopted that skepticism, yeah. Again, rest in peace to Robert Warrensman. If you just adopted that daily, don't you think your life would be better? Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm saying. But yeah, <laughs> Justin Reed's a loser. Yeah, like all the all I, those. I will never take him serious. No, he's a moron. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he weeded them all out. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's a little out of control. Did any of us like do any April Fool's I've tweet, never, tweets? I sure hope not. No, no. I don't even think I tweeted yesterday. I might have. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, you were eating that stew, baby. I was I was stewed up. <laughs> you were barbecued up. Whew. That was I was, I was really actually gonna tired. Rob you, fool. I was, I was I, really gonna rob you. I was actually tired. I cooked so much meat between the getting up at three thirty and then all the cooking and then running around setting up stuff. And then meat sweats after I started eating everything. <laughs> Dude. There's nothing better than a good meat can we sweat. we have a talk, though? About what? Have someone else record you next time. Why? That video you sent me and Figgy, I, that uh, looked yeah. like duck hunt. I was, it was 3.30 in the like morning. Mario Brothers 1 on the regular nah, the, Nintendo. the quality, I'm, I'm going to show Lopez the quality of the video it's we got. It's your phone. It's your phone. Look at the one, it's your phone. It's Look your the, phone. It worked on Twitter. <laughs> It worked on Twitter. I don't know what that was. You should have sent it to us on Twitter then, man, <laughs> because the quality did not look good, man, at all. It was like skipping. Get an Android. <laughs> I'm going to show you the video. Get an Android. So I don't doubt you. I was like, man, what is this guy doing right here? <laughs> what is going on here? Mm -hmm. uh, so the Astros crashed the party. Uh, women's basketball uh, on display yesterday. Uh, and the Texans figuring out their uh, their situation. Landry Locker, John Lopez, uh, and Figgy Fig with you uh, here on Sports Radio 610. We're learning a lot today, man. Yeah. Learning a hell of a lot today. We know who the morons are now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was Justin Reed doing? And he wasn't alone. Wh who? That was another I, one. I'm I want to say uh, Quadre Diggs. What do you do? I, I want to say he just posted a picture of some cliques. And then with the That's peace right. emoji. Oh, he did the Marshawn Lynch. Moron. <laughs> a moron. I wouldn't mind him coming to Texas. To be yeah, honest. well, <laughs> he'll be a, a beloved moron. <laughs> it does. It, it, it's like it tells you who's who. The the people that do the, the jokes, the April Fool stuff. All right, so the Astros, they achieved something that in a past life, it would have been without a doubt the top story in sports. Where does a no-hitter rank when it comes to feats uh, that, that can be achieved uh, in one game? We'll discuss that next. All right, guys, uh, listen to this. Uh, the Ottawa Award season uh, has just happened.
Scott Bibby with Landry Locker. Landry, I mean, you're going to be in midday forever now. And John Lopez. On occasion, Lopez makes a statement that's so ludicrous, it makes me pick my phone up and call you guys. You're in the loop on Houston's Sports Leader. Your champ, 16. Sports Radio 16. <laughs> All right, so I have a no-hitter fun bag for you. A no-hitter fun bag? No-hitter fun bag. I'm going to ask you guys five questions about no-nos. Shout out to the loopholes. If you listen, you are one. Doesn't like a fun bag. There you go. I knew that was coming. Yeah. Uh, In more ways than one, you hornball. Landry Locker, (laughs) John Lopez, Figgy Fig. I have five questions about Mm -hmm. no-hitters. Mr. Blanco, you're calling him Queso Blanco with the no-no yesterday for the Astros. They get their first dub of the season. Yes. I'm going to ask you questions, and we're going to cuss and discuss this Amongst ourselves and among the loopholes. Shout mm-hmm. out to the loopholes. If you listen, you are one. Happy April. Happy uh, three weeks and two days away from the draft. How about that? Question number one. How big is a no-hitter these days? And and I think, I think it probably magnifies even going back to your days, uh, your childhood, I will say. Mm-hmm. Because in my childhood, if a no-hitter happened, I mean, that was the talk for a while. I mm-hmm. mean, I, I remember, you go back to the Daryl Kyle no-hitter. I remember when Jim Abbott threw a no-hitter with uh, one arm. I'm, all the Yankees no-hitters. I was, at, I was at a perfect game when Kenny Rogers threw a perfect game. Nolan Ryan, seven no-hitters. We know those stats. Yeah. And from, from where we were to when you were a child to when I was a child to mm-hmm. now, mm-hmm. What what is the magnitude and overall glory of a no hitter? I do think that there's still, I mean, obviously, great magnitude to it. I mean, it, it it's still a, a a mark in time. Magnitude, that, I'll yeah, say, yeah. I'll say, glo- I'll say, like glory. The, well, glor- I was going to put it this way: How glorious is it? I think the it's not as illustrious as it used to be, and the reason I say that is because of the game changing. Uh, like it's 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 a strikeout home run league now. And so a lot of teams, a lot of players aren't really slapping the ball, you know, all over the field like they used to, uh, you know, and, and I know the shifts have changed and all that, but but still, because of the approach of most baseball players, I think it's lost a little bit of the illustrious. Let, let me put this in perspective. I don't like to use ESPN as a top resource of um, what stories are, but I'm looking at the ESPN top headlines right here. Mm-hmm. There's two, four, six, nine. There's there's eight. There's nine right here. You want me to read you these headlines? Yeah. And I'll go in order because they, they put top to bottom. Okay. Uh, Iowa, Iowa wins LSU rematch behind Unstoppable Clark. Okay, it makes sense. Uh, PG Perry decommits from USC after an infield's exit. Hmm. Former Red Sox CEO dies at 78. Uh, Reese played through pain, won't use it as an excuse. That's Angel Reese, right? We haven't gotten yeah. to the no hitter yet. Um, Vikings suspend Phillips three weeks over traffic traffic stop. Uh, Pep on uh, Grillis Exchange, I do it for cameras. Mm-hmm. Watkins makes history by. By uh, but oh, Watson Watkins makes history, but stung by Trojans' loss. Okay, cards ordered to pay XVP three million for defamation. So it didn't even make the top nine headlines. Damn. And again, don't use ESPN as the end all be all, but that's just kind of where it is. Now, now let's go to the front of the MLB page. That's what I was gonna do. Okay, it's number two. It's behind uh, the former Red Sox uh, CEO, Larry so, Aquino. So there you go. So maybe. As we talk this out, because I didn't come into this segment thinking to make this point, maybe it's more of a baseball thing than it is an actual accomplishment of what went down. Because if there's an equivalent of a no hitter in football, um, let's say what is it? Five, what I don't even know what the equivalent six would touchdowns, be. six touchdowns. I, I got a feeling that it makes it somewhere in the top nine, regardless uh, of what the hell's going on. Yes, I, college or pro. Like I said, I don't think it's as illustrious as it used to be because of the way the hitters hit now and the game is played and baseball in general. Dude, one of those headlines you read, that's that's Pep Guardiola. That that's a soccer coach. Okay. That, that's a Premier League soccer coach. Uh, so that tells you something right there. And I also think there's this this aspect. If it were Justin Verlander instead of Okay, that's fair. Ronel Blanco. It, that's it, fair. It's about playing the hits, right? That's fair. You know? But I think it I think as far as like locally, the appeal of Blanco doing what he did with his yeah. story is yeah. more, but that makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. I mean, they play the hits. Yeah. Just like we do. 
Yeah, you that know? makes sense. Yeah. So question number two. How many one-game milestones slash events would you rather witness? Like, in other words, you can go to a sporting event and you can see this. How far down the list would no hitter be? I've seen three. Wow, it used to be like one or two. I've seen three. I saw one perfect game, but that, but even yeah. like that aside, I've seen two in person. Well, three in including college, but I've seen two in person, um, and I and I was awestruck by them. I what, were you awestruck by this yesterday? No, no, no. I don't know why. I think it's I think it's the game. I'm very I'm I'm impressed with his individual story. Yeah. Yeah, but how many how many things would I put ahead ahead of that? Yeah, like in baseball, I would rather see a bench clearing brawl than a no hitter. I would rather see a hit for the cycle. A hit for the cycle. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, three home run game. Three home run game. Would you rather see three home yes, runs than a no hitter? I would hitter? rather see a three home run game. Okay, so you'd rather see three bombs than a no no. Yeah. I'd rather see a bench clearing brawl. <laughs> would you re- Would you rather see? I'm trying to think, too. Would you rather see a walk-off Grand Slam or a no-hitter? Walk-off Grand Slam. Like, even even just a walk-off home run, like what we've seen in the postseason. You know, whether it's Altuve or Jordan or whatever, I would rather see. Right? Yeah. I I just, I don't know, man. It just doesn't, doesn't hit like it would. And I'm not saying this to, like, hike my leg on it. I, I, I just remember the days when if this happened, you go... You go up to there, and it's uh, but it's, you're, it's the main thing. Like you go on Sports Center, it's the main thing. Now with the shift, even though the shift has been altered, uh, with the way it's a home run strikeout league, I think it's taken some of the illustrious illustriousness off of it. All right, final question: mm-hmm. How many people in the ballpark? Oh yeah. That are at the game, do you think know that a no hitter is going on? I bet you. What percentage do you think don't know? Ninth inning? No, nah, but let's say by the sixth. 50% at the most. At the most. And sixth inning is when you start making those calls. So you would say half don't even know? Yeah. In the sixth inning, half don't even know. Yeah. By the way, shout out to Karen Warren. Do you know who Karen Warren is? The, photo- no. the photographer. She's been for the Chronicles. She's been there since I was there. She's been there since the early '90s. She was off yesterday, like doing some gardening or something. She she put on her Facebook. Sixth inning. This is a pro, man. This is someone who knows baseball. Sixth inning. She stopped everything, went in her you know, whatever jeans or shorts and, and, and t-shirt, whatever. Picked up her photo gear and got three pictures on the front page of, of Chron.com. Three pictures on the front page of Chron.com. Karen Warren. She li- she's a loophole. She listens. Karen. She's the best. Karen. She's the best. Salute. Yeah. And you got to relax, man. No. <laughs> I got to be there. I got to be there. She She's taking pictures. Every memorable picture of the Houston Astros in your, in, in, in your time here, there's a really good chance she took it. Like a really good chance. How disappointed would she would have been if, yeah. Yeah. if they gave up the no hit? What if would have hit out, hit, gotten a hit? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hey, I'll tell you what. I'm it going was close. back home. <laughs> it got it got close for a while there. A couple of couple of ones that nearly got. So she went up there, huh? Yeah, from wherever she lives. Shout out to her. Shout out to uh, Mr. Blanco for doing his thing. Landry Locker, John Lopez, Figgy Fig with you. Um, speaking of uh, longtime folks, we have another retirement man. Oh man, Matt Musil. He's the best. Matt Musil yeah. has called it quits. You know the. You know what? He's going to retire well too. 44 years. He's going to retire well. I think so. Uh, they just moved out further. I was talking to him not long ago. His uh, drive was like, he, his yeah. drive was up there. They got a new house. He was asking me about a pool. He's never wanted to have, he's never had a pool. He wanted to add that. So, okay. so he's living his best life. Uh, you know what? When, when I think of Matt Musil, what I think of, and this is kind of corny, but I think it's accurate. He's a gentleman. He's a gentleman. He's a gentleman. But he's also, he's also, I think he's very, very, uh, gentlemanly but he's got like a firm presence yeah no he'll get it done like he's got a firm like very likable presence to him yes he will get it done i've never had a conversation i didn't enjoy with Mm -hmm. Mm him and been here forever man always ask that question too man Mm -hmm. shout out to musel he'll chill i think so because he's in the burbs now yeah he's gonna chill yeah he's gonna be hanging out yeah berman's man he's all over it 
Oh, Berman is a huge, like, he's like super fan. Berman's now. on that feed. He's like super Did fan. Did he talk about the no-hitter? Oh, Did he tweet about oh, it? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Berman, Berman is, I mean, he's your resource. If you want to find out everything going on with sports, that's a dude who loves him some sports. Yep. Yep. Shout out to Berman. Coming up, the Astros crash a party or did they? Let's uh, go inside the mind of the two biggest new women's college basketball fans this side of the Mississippi. Next. Pain and Pendergast. The big.
Making the stories from outside the loop matter to you. This is Localize It. Don't you know I'm local? You're in the loop on Houston's Sports Leader. Sports Radio 6. So there was a big headline yesterday, uh, a big game, a hyped up game. And uh, the Astros happened to crash the party a little bit and generate some national attention of their own. Look, I've, I've been trying to be... As respectful as I can about this new <laughs> fascination that you guys have for college basketball, yeah. women's college basketball. You're trying. Basketball. You're trying. No, no, but I, I got to confess. I, I just got to be completely right. honest right. with you, the audience. Shout out to the loopholes if you listen. You are one. Just let you know the very truth about. I want you to. Yesterday. Yeah. Watch this. These are my confessions. So I got to confess yesterday mm-hmm. with all this hype. Yeah. And it seems like it's been a game that's been hyped up for a long time. A year. Um, LSU, Kim Mulkey, Angel Reese mm-hmm. uh, versus Caitlin Clark, yep. women's basketball on the big stage, ESPN primetime. Yeah. I'll just admit it. I'll just admit it, okay? Mm-hmm. For the first time this year, I sat in front of my TV, mm-hmm. I turned it on, and for the first time I watched mm-hmm. the entire highlights of a, of a women's basketball game. So I, I I will admit that while you guys were gravitated for the first time this year, I got through the entire highlights of a women's basketball game. So it's one thing for me to poke fun. It's baby steps. I'm just admitting <laughs> that I, I caught the fever too. I sat down and watched you go. all of the highlights. Baby steps. That's where it starts. Yes, I did. What'd you think of them, first of all? It looked all right. I mean, okay. it looked like probably, you know. Oh, uh, here it comes, Figgy. Here it comes. Uh, I would say, yeah, maybe Yates. <laughs> they Basketball, might. yeah, I think Yates. Hey, would, they're 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 national champs in high school a couple of years ago. Yeah, I think Yates would beat them, but it was it was they <laughs> were, some good high school they games. Might be able to get within uh, twenty of Yates. Yeah, twenty. <laughs> All right. So that being said, I got to tell you. Now I'm going to go to the extreme the other way. First of all. I watched every second of that game and couldn't have been more entertained. Like, like that, w- that was a hugely entertaining game. The rivalry, the uh, obviously, you know, the stakes, uh, the talent on the floor, um, and all that. It was, it was just sports is entertainment, and it, it's going to be, as you said, the, the highest ranked women's game in the history of, 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 no doubt. of basketball. I mean, it won't be close, and it won't be close. I got to tell you. She was, she being, well, they both were, but but especially Caitlin Clark, she was better than I ever imagined. Let's just be serious and let's just say this, okay? And, mm-hmm. and I think I think this just needs to be admitted, and I think it will actually, I think it will actually do this young lady a lot of, uh, it it'll, it'll clear her mind a little bit because mm-hmm. yesterday, based on the the stuff, she needs her mind cleared. Yeah, she, and she and they're young, so I don't mm-hmm. I don't want to like, I'm, yeah. 
these polarizing takes on I don't have one. Mm-hmm. Let's just I, if I were if I were uh, Mrs. Reese, I would do this, and I think it would it would it would ease a lot of pressure. Look in the mirror and say, I'm not on Caitlin Clark's level. You'll be good. What do you mean? You're not on her level. You're not as good as her. Right. You're not, you had a better squad last year. You're not as good as her. Don't mm-hmm. don't try to live up to that. Just be yourself. You're not on that level. Yeah. I'll take it to the to this level. And I'm not talking about apples to apples in terms of level of play. I'm talking about She's what, a star. what I saw. She's a star. But, a, but she made it seem like she didn't want to be. I think she's kind of reluctant about it, yeah. you know, but 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 she knows she's a star. She was uh, she was rubbing elbows with Jason Sudeikis after the game and all that stuff. But th- this is this is what, and I'm just being honest too. Her third quarter performance reminded me of what Reggie Miller did to the Knicks back in the day, like just 28 feet, 29 feet, 30 feet, nothing but the bottom of the net, tied game at the half. Figure you watched it. She comes yeah. out and hits five three pointers in the th- in the third quarter from way out, and then the passing she was making full court passes and uh, you know bounce passes through traffic and all that. I got to tell you, man. Like I've I've always kind of respected what she's done in highlights, and I'm being honest. There, all I've seen is highlights. I watched the whole game. Yeah, that was incredible. That 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 was. An, I, I'll put it this way. I'm gonna watch your next game. There you go. Now, I'm gonna watch your next. They're game. They're gonna lose next game. Figgy, they might. Figgy, yeah. I actually, so I you went in watching this game. No, I think they might. I think they might lose. Go ahead, Figgy. Yeah, I actually went into this game. I'm like, I'm gonna check it out. If it's not really interesting, I'm gonna flip. I'm gonna flip to the Astros. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But I stayed on there the whole time, there you man. Go, man. Yeah. Yeah, I think UConn's gonna get them. I don't even know much about it. I'm just, yeah. I'm just trying to join the party. Well, you Sound know their like best know player, right? About. The one that Gino Ariema said is, is the best player in the country. <laughs> yeah, they took it back. <laughs> oh, Beckers. Yeah, Paige Beckers. They took it back. <laughs> That's going to be fun. So you enjoyed it. Is there any other sweeping takeaways from the Yeah, she was Reggie Miller-like. Like, she just took over the game and uh, was and it was unconscious. Like, it, 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 was, it was something to behold. It really was. What was she like in the post-game interview? I didn't see that. Kind of humble, you know, my teammates, and I'm, you know, I'm just trying to. to trying be, to take it one game at a time. Well, I don't know if she said that, but something along those lines. We still got two, we still got two more games. Yeah, yeah. We still got two more games in front of us. Yeah. It all means this is good, and, you know, it's nice to avenge the championship last year, but, you know, it's all for nothing if we're not cutting down those nets. <laughs> well, they did Final cut down Final game those. of the year. Yeah. That's all I got for you. Yeah. It was, it was fun. It was very much fun. Boy, there is a sad presence in this building. How's that? Uh, Talking about Bill? Man, Bill Powell from sales. <laughs> he is, he he looks He's distraught. sick He's, from the U of H loss. He still heard about that Why loss. Why is he so sad about this Cougs loss? They've left it all out there. Uh, it, it, they went down in glory, they went down in glorious fashion. Mm-hmm. They... Biggest Cougs fan in the building, maybe one of the biggest Cougs fans any of us know. Like, they played Friday, man. Uh, I, I saw him yesterday. How you doing, Bill? Oh, man, I'm still crying in my beer. That's what he said. <laughs> and, like, just like that. And then, figure you saw him today? Yeah, I saw him today. Was, Jamal Shedd. Man, so. if we just, if Jamal Shedd never got hurt, man, <laughs> we would have had a chance. We would have beat Duke. Well, they might have well, been. They would have been Duke, Duke. Sure. yeah. Would yeah. they beat NC State? Maybe. He said he said they would have throttled in, uh, NC throttled. State. Throttled. Throttled yeah. NC State. So team of destiny, these nuts. <laughs> Duke was a seven-point favorite. <laughs> yeah. NC State made it look pretty easy. Yeah. So throttled. Throttled. He did. Okay. How yeah. about, uh, you know, then, UConn? Then what about Purdue? I think he said he would have beat them, too. Okay. What about UConn? I, that's where I stopped them. I said, I don't know if they would have beat uh, UConn, but he had, he had U of H beating UConn. Oh, he did? Oh, he did. All, right. All right. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, it's hard for me to watch UConn and think my, think that there's anyone on that level. That's why I told him. I'm sorry. I, I, I'll be honest with you. This I don't is, even like UConn. This is kind of another <laughs> confession for me. Mm-hmm. UConn has worried has kind of ruined my tournament watching experience because I almost watch every other game now like it's the NIT. Like you're not you're mm-hmm. you're playing without a real chance to even win the tournament. And yeah. and maybe that's unfair, but what is going on? No. Like I mean, it, what what all their scores are like 25 or more and and they they take their foot off the gas the last 6 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. 
I think Alabama's the best chance to beat them. You said that before the show. I think you might be right. Because I don't think either one of these big, big ass centers is going to. I think they'll expose you. Mm-hmm. You're going to have to run. They're going to know. They're, they're, I, I think whether it's uh, Edie or DJ Burns, you're going to. I think they can expose those guys on the defensive side of the rock. Alabama can at least hit threes. If they can just hit threes and play out and of their mind. And they can run, they can yeah. beat you down the floor. Which okay, good luck. But I mean, they're obviously it's a yeah. tall task. Yeah. But if anybody can do it, it's going to be Alabama. Uh, like UConn, I said it last week. I'll say it again. If, if, if just championship game. If I set the line at nineteen and a half, what would you what would you pick in the championship game? I'm telling you, I'd take the over. I mean, if it's NC State, I'll take the over. They went on a thirty to nothing run. A thirty to nothing run. In their last game, dude, I don't know what's going on either because <laughs> it, it, I don't. It almost feels like they're cherry picking, but they're not because every time they get a rebound, they just like get back. two guys yeah. on each side already ahead, yeah. and it's like are these guys just like the are they, are they gambling or what? Because <laughs> they're doing that, and then that tall ass white dude, yep. whatever the hell his name is, yeah. the sophomore, I think, Dern Dungan, something like that. That sob's <laughs> running like yeah. Kim Noah used to, <laughs> yes. which, by the way, is the last time that a team won back to back. That's right, Florida, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and and that's exactly what they had. They had mm-hmm. they had a very well coached team. They'd run, and they had those big ass big men that looked like Usain Bolt running down the court. Yep, because let's just. Let's just go ahead and chalk UConn as a dub over Bama. Okay. Anything can happen, but let's just chalk it. Mm-hmm. Are either one of those bigs going to run with the UConn bigs? Oh, God, no. <laughs> like, what are they doing? DJ Burns? Or Edie? Yeah, or Edie. They're going to be gasping like crazy because they're also going to have to play in the half-court game. They're going to have to slow it down. Here's my other pet peeve. And I know he's a heavy set guy. This is my other pet peeve from the tournament, and this is who the Cougs would have played. If you let, let me give you and Figgy a new job, okay? Mm-hmm. Let me give you a new job, okay? All right. So, congratulations, you guys are going to be the first employees at the Landry Locker Houston Carnival. Okay. You are hey, you, you are my carnies. <laughs> I'm paying you fifty dollars an hour, okay? Oh man. I'm because I'm, y'all are y'all are prime y'all are Ooh-hoo. prime. <laughs> but y'all are going to have to. Y'all aren't going to be controlling any of the like. Mm-hmm. The car games. Y'all are going to control the game where you have to guess the weight. Okay. And you have to get within five pounds or whatever or else they get a prize. Okay. Are you guessing 275 for DJ Burns? Can we get taken him at his Which work? leg? <laughs> they, they his keep right saying, leg's a little bigger than his I'm little like, leg. Over. And it's one, over. Thing, it's one thing for, like, the broadcast to take his word for it, but I'm seeing when DJ Burns is playing – I saw a lot of NFL guys. Dude, I, that's say another that, pet Say peeve. that he could be a starting left tackle Why? in the NFL, and they said he's 275 and looks like he can add more to his frame. Brother, he ain't 275. Yeah. <laughs> and why is it that we think anybody who can somewhat move can be a left tackle in football? It's one of the hardest things to be. Like, what are we doing here? <laughs> well, and the other thing is, why would he want to? Like, uh, it was driving me nuts. Uh, who was it? It was Albert Breer, maybe somebody. Uh, was talking about. I talked to a number of GMs, and they would be interested. Why would he be interested? As what he's done already, he can go to Europe and and make him two million dollars a year, even if he doesn't play in the NBA. But they're acting like it's just like, oh man, anyone, any yeah. big guy who can move around can play left. Imagine tackle. putting him up against Miles Garrett. Yes, yes. They're T.J. It- Watt. Mm-hmm. They're talking about it like it's just. A given. This dude should play left tackle. Yeah. What, what are we man, doing here? Yeah. He's going to get embarrassed, man. Yeah. God, shout out to that young man, though. Seems <laughs> like a good dude. Uh, coming up next, CJ Stroud breaks the internet, and he didn't even do a damn thing to do it. Next. First, I want to talk about Orchard.
access exclusive content the Texans play here. Always live on the free Odyssey app. All right, so C.J. Stroud broke the internet. Um, this was making the rounds. This was on the Titans Coliseum podcast, uh, the old Oilers. We, we know the Texans Oilers. They got their obvious beef. Uh, I saw this making the rounds. Um, we've we've kind of had some fun with Morocco T, uh, the obnoxious Titans fan. Um, he's on a podcast, the uh, Titans Coliseum podcast. And one of his, uh, one of his co-hosts was breaking down CJ mm-hmm. Stroud and he was talking about, and I mean, they're, they're excited out there. They're spending a lot of money. Um, we, we know there's some beef, but he basically said is CJ Stroud, the next Dak, Dak Prescott. I want, I want to say his name. I don't want to disrespect. Uh, Leonard Firestone, uh, is the guy, uh, he said this and I'll, I'll let you decide. This was him talking about the, the title of the, the podcast was is CJ Stroud Dak Prescott 2.0. Yeah. And you can imagine how that uh yeah. how that sat <laughs> around here. Here was what he had to say on the uh, Titans Coliseum podcast. There's a sophomore slump. There's all these other things. We know how you want to play. We got film. They're going to start scheming out. Defense is going to know how you're going to want to do stuff from an offensive coordinator standpoint now. So, yeah, you had a good first year. But so did Dak. They won the most games in Cowboys franchise history their first year. What have they done since? It's it, It's... You can't sit here and crown somebody after one year and think it's going to be good. You can't. Because this next year, we're, we're, defenses are going to come for you. All right, there you go. So that's, that's basically his, uh, his notion there is really just a sophomore slump coming down to earth, not crowning too early. Uh, and, and, it's, and the, big, the big picture is the, the mm-hmm. C.J. Stroud uh, outlook. What, what are your thoughts on that? My, my primary thought on that is that's all they've got. Like, like, like that's all you got. Like, like the only hope you have is that there's some sort of sophomore slump. And by the way, I've kind of been waiting for this. Like this, and and I'm not not because it's uh, it's ludicrous. I I think it is, but because that's going to be a, a very common narrative with C.J. Stroud. Will there be and and not just podcasters that have hope in one hand and you know what in the other? Uh, you know that that the Texans will come back down to earth. Like national narratives will include, will there be a sophomore slump? I get it. I understand it. I don't think it's necessarily unfair, but I think it's wrong. Uh, I mean, we, it, it really is like C.J. Stroud, what we saw, it's an eye test thing. Okay. Like what we saw, we know we saw. It wasn't yeah. like, you know, padded numbers or – two or three games that skewed everything. No, it was, it was consistency. It was smarts. It was uh, things that, 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 that rookies don't do. But I don't blame them because that's all they have. All they have is hope. Yeah, and, and I think that's, that's, a, good, that's a good point. I, I would say, like, on the, on the – I, I get what he's saying. Like, I don't I – don't, like, I We'd mean, be saying it. No, and I think I think no. it's the, I think it's fair, I think it's a fair thing to say. Like mm-hmm. you can't always assume that the best is yet to come. We say that often. Yeah. And Trevor Lawrence came into the league. You thought he was him, then he wasn't, then yep. he was. So there is kind of a seesaw. But I but I would say, I would at least you know if we're talking about Dak Prescott, first of all, he, he didn't just fall off a cliff. He's been pretty good. Mm-hmm. I know it's like a polarizing thing. Like, like he hasn't, his, yeah, <laughs> yeah, he hasn't been asked. Like if 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 C.J. Stroud ends. That being Dak Prescott, and, yeah. I mean, I don't. Is he going to have a better coach? Is he going to have? Are they going to do a better job he's of? He's had multiple coaches. Yeah, I yeah. mean, he's he's had Jason Garrett and he's had Mike McCarthy. Mm-hmm. So are they going to do a better job? Yeah, with the coach, whatever. But the the Cowboys were built to win right then because they were knocking on the door before, and then Tony Romo got hurt. Dak Prescott came in, and he kind of inherited a situation where. Had Tony Romo gotten hurt, they never would have been looked at as the three or four win team they were. Yeah, the Texans had a young squad around C.J. Stroud, mm-hmm. so it's 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 you you got to think if the front office is competent, if D'Amico Ryan's is a good coach, then his surroundings are only going to improve. Yeah, so there's that, but but I do think it is healthy to you know, uh, there's what we have to base C.J. Stroud on right now is one year of elite play. That's it. Yeah. That's all we have. Yeah. So arguments like this, they're kind of tough because there's only one way to find out, and that's them actually playing. Mm-hmm. 
Like, it really means nothing. Like, if you wanted to say, well, C.J. Stroud is better than this guy, then y'all can take the data and you can base it on what you've seen before. But when you say what someone is going to be, it's not any different than this time last year where I was saying Bryce Young's going to be him and C.J. Stroud would be plan B. Yeah. It's changed at the snap of a finger because we actually see it. So when you actually forecast stuff like this, it's kind of an impossible argument. Mm -hmm. Well, and look, just to, to use the deck comparison, like I'll take what he is, what his career has been, but keep this in mind as well. His, his big rookie year, they had Jason Witten, they had Des Bryant, uh, Ezekiel Elliott, you know, in his prime rushing for 1,600 yards, uh, and then they had Dak. They were protecting him. He was uh, – C.J. Stroud is carrying the the weapons here. Yeah, C.J. Stroud difference. carried. Yeah. That, that's a big, big and difference. And they, they had built the offensive line for Tony and Romo. They, and they had the they line, They had a too. very good offensive line. Yeah, so they had the line, Jason Witten, Des Bryant, and Zeke running for 1,600 yards. Yes. You're going to have a pretty good year if you're a quarterback. And you can also – yeah, you can make a case, perhaps, that in that season, that was the best team that they put around him. Mm-hmm. Oh, no doubt. I mean, they were or that they, one, and maybe the next one well, as well. Was, I mean, wasn't it? I think it was two years after the Des caught it year. Yeah, I think so. In which they they could have perhaps been in the NFC Championship game, mm -hmm. and then Romo hurt his shoulder the, yeah. in the preseason against Seattle. Yeah, and then Dak had gotten drafted. Or, or yeah, Romo missed the season, and then Dak got drafted when Romo got hurt again. Yeah. So this, this whole thing, there. this whole thing, it doesn't even make me mad or even. No, it's funny. Or, or, or even roll my eyes. I, I fully expect it, and I expect more of that to come. It's actually kind of a compliment. Like, like that's all they have to hold on to is, well, maybe, you know, maybe he's going to have a sophomore slump. Yeah. Okay, keep holding on to that hope. And, and the whole thing, like, when you're talking about sophomore slump, because I, I do think it's good to warn. I, I do think it's good to warn in the NFL that, mm -hmm. you know, you, you can – you can even have a really good rookie year and then come down to earth and then become elite the next year. Like that can happen yeah. all the time. Yeah. But, and, and with CJ Stroud, my reason f that that could potentially happen, I think there's got to be an, uh, there's got to be a reason why. I don't think they're putting as many weapons around him. Mm -hmm. um, I think the division is getting a little bit better. And I think the schedule is going to be tougher. That that would be the per, perhaps the reasons why, if you want to look at it that way. Yeah. But to just say sophomore slump and generally say sophomore slump, like come on, like, like he, you got to like you got to give, give me a reason why. Like like they played a lot of close games and they might lose some of those next year. They won some close games too, uh, so maybe it'll balance out. But like I, he's not his performance is not going to fall off a cliff. It, it, it might be a, a worse record because of the schedule and those things you mentioned. It might be. Uh, the weapons that they they've miscalculated, or or you know, we they still may add some, uh, but uh, that, that but say they don't, it could be any number of things. But if that's all you got, I think that's a compliment for the Texans. I really do. Yeah, if you're gonna if you're gonna just say sophomore slump, sophomore slump, then, yeah, okay. I yeah. mean, yeah, that that could definitely happen. Mm -hmm. I I don't see like the actual you know comp there. No, there's not. The there's two. not a comp. But we will see. We'll see what happens with CJ. Hopefully, they get him some weapons. Uh, the draft is. Three weeks and two days from today. And right now the Texans are, I don't want to say they're in like a quiet phase, but there's really not much going on right now. And I, I don't know where the opportunities are to immediately improve the team unless they do something that, and I, I say improve the team, improve the team significantly unless they do something that we just don't see coming. So we talked about this last week, and, and I have a follow-up for you. Like, they're going to do something, right? You don't clear up. Over $10 million that you really didn't need to clear up unless you have a plan. Um, and I'm starting to wonder if it's post-draft, you know, that old June 1st thing. Maybe somebody's going to be released that they're going to be able to to, to uh, approach. I really don't think that that Casario and, and D'Amico, um, I really don't think that they're going to make a – there is no big splash to make. You know, it's going to have to be draft. Like, I feel like they've – they believe they they have a receiver or a couple of receivers targeted in that sweet spot in the second round that they think they can get. Okay. And, and that's a that's a risk. That's a risk because that means you're going to have an impact receiver that you draft in the second round. There have been some good ones drafted in the second round. You've gone through some of them. We've we've talked well, about Nico some. and Tank were both third round picks. Yes, they were third round picks. Uh, but I I gotta believe that's where they're looking at the weapon. I mean, because there's not a whole lot weapon wise. That you can get right now, but they saved that money for something. I mean, they they did they they got that they did they had to have. 
It's not just for no Could it be reason. be a Nico Collins extension? See, and B. Scott mentioned that yesterday. Wouldn't that have already been in the works? Wouldn't that have already happened? Why or? would that excite me? It shouldn't. Like, I don't get why. I don't I don't care about that. That it's, means nothing to me. That would be the, a big letdown. Yeah, if that's yeah. if that's what you did it for, what does that mean? Yeah. He's going to be on the team this year no matter what. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Like, are you going to get some sort of bargain and the price is going up? Like, I, I, I want to see more weapons around CJ now. Yeah. Which is what they wanted, too, because that's why they tried to make the two moves that they did. So, yeah. okay, good. You freed cap space. You're bringing back Nico Collins. He's had one good year. We haven't seen what he can do. Does that mean that I'm dismissing that he could possibly do it? No, but that doesn't excite me. No. It's nothing. And, and, and nor should it. You um, could, you're, he's not going anywhere. You're not going to let Nico Collins go. If he does what he did last year, you pay him. He'll be motivated to have another great year. Not that he doesn't need it, but uh, that he needs it. But uh, you know, he's going to be really. He's going to get paid a lot more if he has another big year. So it, it's an investment in himself, uh, and for them, that would be a big disappointment. It'd be a big letdown. Uh, if, Why would I celebrate if, that? If that's that, yeah. If that's what it is, what's there to celebrate? Nothing. Nothing. He's going to be there anyway. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's here. Yeah. What, what is that? Mm-hmm. Awesome, dude. They 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 re-sign Nico Collins. Cool. What about next year? Yeah. How's he going to perform? Is he going to perform like he did last year? Mm-hmm. That's that's something I can get. I we can get down with that next year. Yeah. Or you can do it in the season. So what do you think it is? I don't know. I, I think it might be the Nico extension. Oh God, I don't want I don't want that to happen. I think that's what it might be. Mm-hmm. Casario's brought it up, and that's it. Mm-hmm. Which is cool. I mean, especially if he goes out there and balls. But but I'll say this. I only have one extension to judge Nick Casario on and look Nico's further along than this guy was last year Mm -hmm. especially in camp but Titus Howard Mm -hmm. you paid him like he was a top five right tackle he never had been yeah Nico at least performed like a top 10 receiver are you gonna pay Nico Collins like as an elite receiver before he's like established himself as someone who can do it in multiple years and again this is not an argument about whether they should keep Nico. This is not an argument. Don't 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 get lost on this. This is not an argument about whether he can or can't do it. My point is he's going to be on the team next year. He either is going out there to prove himself, or you're going to give him an extension and he's still going to be out there. I'm not saying that's going to change his his mindset because we've said this a hundred times. No. The kid is is built like you want a kid to be built. He's out there. He works his ass off. He's no. great. Like all that. I'm not questioning that. All I'm saying is. If you're trying to sell me on a move, okay, you traded for Keenan Allen. Damn, okay, this receiving core is a little bit better. That would have been, yeah, right that okay. been something here. Oh, you paid Saquon? Okay. Yeah. Let's see what him, Nico, and Tank can do. Giving a guy an extension? Okay, cool. But see, that's why I've got to believe that they have another move in, in, in mind because we have evidence they've tried to get that receiver. They've tried to get uh, Saquon. Uh, and so are they just going to all of a sudden say, well, shrug your shoulders and – and go get a, you know, just re-sign Nico. I can't believe that's it. I can't believe that's it. I, I don't. I mean, it, it's going to be fascinating to see how these next few weeks, you know, unfold. But the draft, I will say, it, the draft is not going to lie. The draft is going to tell us where, what they really are believing, and maybe it's a receiver in the second round that they have targeted. You also got to think that the uh, the Chiefs might be drafting a receiver now, right? Um, or maybe not. Uh, they, they just had the incident with Rasheed Rice, no. um, the uh, the traffic accident, which he two cars registered to him were caused a big crash. No. Uh, there's video of him and perhaps his friends fleeing the scene. Nobody seriously hurt. Um, One woman had a little thing. Yeah, yeah. she had. Oh, she, hey, ma'am, magnify that on the report. Yeah, um, yeah. Exactly. You, you need a neck brace and a wheelchair. You walk into court yeah. in a, yeah. in a, a roll into court in a wheelchair. Yes, for sure. So yeah. go ahead and do that, ma'am. That's my <laughs> advice to you. Um, but yeah, I wonder if this impacts the Chiefs who are drafting at thirty-two with the Texans uh, sitting where they are, and the Texans perhaps having another team that's receiver. Uh, needy in Kansas City. They did bring in Hollywood Brown, too. So who knows whether they do or not. And they're visiting with uh, J.K. Dobbins. How about that? Good for him. Yeah. I'm pulling for him. him. Oh, always. Yeah, I'm pulling for him. Always pulling for J.K. Yeah. Love me some J.K. That Rice thing was interesting. Um, So so yesterday, I'm interested in your opinion on this. Yeah. Because yesterday, my, my overarching opinion was, I don't understand in general 
why people drive that fast no, I hate on that. interstates. No, I think I think driving 100 should be um, at least a $10,000 ticket. I think it should be up to par on D-dubs. Yeah. I really do. Like, uh, Look, the, the, the reason that D-dubs are so bad is because um, you're using bad judgment driving. Yes. If you're going, it, it, or the chances of you using bad judgment and not being able to perform increase. If you're going... 30, 40 miles an hour this over the speed limit like that recklessly. I mean, yeah, all bets are off. And somebody texted yesterday, well, you don't understand they're adrenaline junkies. Well, jump out of an airplane mean? then. You know, go skydiving. So was Jeffrey Dahmer. Yeah, go. Well, <laughs> no, really, though. Like, honestly, like, what do you think? Of, like, could you imagine if that was an excuse? <laughs> they're adrenaline junkies. So was Jeffrey Dahmer. Yes. <laughs> 100%. Uh, I'm sure Diddy has some uh, adrenaline. Yeah. R. Kelly probably had some adrenaline. What the yeah. hell is that? Mean? No, what I'm That's saying the dumbest is, excuse why, ever. There are adrenaline why junkies. Are, why, if you're an adrenaline junkie, a junkie, great. He's but why are you putting junkie. other people? He in just danger. gets a thrill. Yeah. Why are you putting other people in danger? Jump out of an airplane. Go skydiving. Climb a mountain, Mount Everest, or whatever. Go, you know, go zip lining over the Grand Canyon. But don't put other people in danger. But I feel like heard. you have a very, very unique take on this. Well, my thing is this: like, man, like he's twenty, he's twenty two, twenty three years old. No one was hurt, so mm-hmm. the result is there. Like if you want to, if you want to sit there and get mad based on what could have happened, then you're gonna live a crazy life. Like you're gonna, you're gonna inherit a lot of a lot of guilt and all that. I look at this as a 23 year old young man. He made a mistake. Nobody was seriously hurt. He fled the scene, which you can say is awful, but I mean it doesn't really take away from anything. If he takes this as a lesson. Um, especially given the actual result, mm-hmm. then 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 hopefully he turns it around. Just yeah. be happy that no one got hurt. Like that's that's it. Is he an idiot? Is he a moron? Could he have killed ten people? Yes, sure. yes, and yes. Is there a chance that maybe there was like more to it, and he had some stuff on him that he shouldn't, or maybe he was drunk? Sure. Mm-hmm. But as long as he takes this, and some people aren't as lucky. Yeah. And maybe that makes you learn even more. Like. Henry Ruggs wasn't as lucky, mm-hmm. and Henry Ruggs is in jail, and he's rotting away in a cell, and hopefully that young man figures out whatever he's got to figure out. But if no one was hurt, and he takes this as a lesson, and he betters himself for it, who the hell cares? Well, I think what you're saying is if you're a Chiefs fan, while you might be appalled at what he did. Oh, I've seen some Chiefs fans saying that ain't him. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sure does look like him. That ain't him. <laughs> but if you're a Chiefs fan, while you might be appalled at what he did, you probably appreciate the business decision. Oh. Because it was a business decision. It's called Sergio Kendall. It was. It was. <laughs> I remember in 2008, Sergio Kendall. Shout out to Sergio Kendall. Yeah. My, uh, shout out to you, my man. Best yeah. high school player I've ever seen. I remember he hit a apartment complex in his car. <laughs> and her, uh, the, uh, they witnesses say they saw him pushing his car away with his boys. <laughs> Turned himself in the next day. The next day is key. No one was hurt. Yes. And Sergio had a great junior season. Yeah. Yeah. Or senior season. Yeah. Uh, Texas versus Alabama. I think he had three sacks in the national title game. Yeah. It's a business decision that you probably appreciate as a Chiefs fan because, let's be honest, he might have been under some substance, you know, the influence of some substance. Yeah. Uh, You know, he he clearly could have. Or could have had something on him that he he didn't want him him to see. Because they were grabbing bags. Yeah. They were grabbing bags. Who knows? Maybe a gun. Maybe something else. So he went home or wherever. Yeah. Came back the next day and said, "My bad." Yeah. <laughs> I remember. So there's no evidence. There's no. I remember uh, the uh, Sergio Kendall because the thing about Sergio Kendall, one time I ended up drinking with Sergio Kendall. I was I was visiting the girl I was dating at the time. She was at UT Law School, and Sergio Kendall was like he had like a a big ass white tee on. Mm-hmm. And it was back when, like, the tees were extra baggy. This was like, oh, oh the big, seven, long, down to eight. your yeah. tees. Yeah. yeah, down to your thighs. And it had, like, it had, like, the Dallas skyline on it or something, and it said something like that. And he was, like, triple fisting Dos Equis. And I walked by, and my girl walked by, and, dude, he is just checking it out. I'm like, dude, what am I, I going <laughs> to I got no shot. This? I'm like, oh, God, like, what is, what? Like, yeah, what, what I got this, no shot. What, am I going to have to, like, yeah. And he goes, that you, dog? <laughs> and I was like, yeah. He's like, already. And he hands me one of the Dos Equis. <laughs> <laughs> Respect. <laughs> Respect. <laughs> Shout out to Sergio. But yeah, look, like it. when some people are saying, well, he had this, this, this. Look, I, I don't look at it that way. Mm-hmm. I'm not I'm not a hater. Like, if he, 
if, if, if whether he what, what he did or didn't have on him, what he was or was it, if he takes this moment yeah. where no one was significantly hurt and he learns a lesson as a 22-year-old kid, and some people, maybe you were more mature at 22, good for you. Yeah. I was not. Yeah. Okay, so 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 props to you. But if he takes it as a lesson and 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 and, and maybe he even like takes it as the worst that that happened. Like maybe he's taken the worst that could have happened more than you. Then then better then yourself, learn, my friend. Like, yeah, as long as he does. Go out there, go out there and and lean on the Patrick Mahomeses and the and the influences you got. And, as long as he and does, do your thing, young man. And it doesn't escalate, and he thinks he got away with something. Yeah. As long as he learns from it. Yeah, I mean, and that's that's what that. Why would you not root for that? More so than oh, you should be in trouble. Okay, he might get suspended. It's fine. Go do your thing, young yeah. man. Yeah. Do your thing, man. I could not imagine having a Lamborghini at 22 years old, a Super Bowl ring, and being Patrick Mahomes' go-to receiver at 22 years old. Yeah. I would have feared much worse than this. He walked away from it. Go better yourself, my friend. Coming up, the story of the no-hitter that was yesterday, courtesy of the OG John Lopez, next. In the loop.
No hitter yesterday at the juice box. Surprising one, man. Astros get their first dub. Ronel Blanco, his eighth start, 17th no hitter in Astros franchise history. And an interesting story, to say the least. We've seen Fromber Valdez throw no hitters. We've seen Justin Verlander throw no hitters. We saw the team combine no hitter few years ago but uh this might be the most if, if you really go inside the story yeah might be the most interesting of all j-lo yeah look I, I, i'm fascinated by stories like this uh because he was like the mets he, he went to the mets he went and when he, this is in 2016 and he was already 22 years old um trying to to do what a lot of you know ball players do in the dominican He's from Santiago. Uh, he went to the Yankees. He went to the Mets. He went to the Pirates. He went to the Rays for tryouts. And his fastball hit like 92, 93. He only had like one or two pitches. They said, no, thank you. Astros signed him for $5,000. Like, he was washing cars uh, in in the Dominican, trying to make uh, help his mom make a little money, help the family, whatever, whatever, trying to work out uh, wherever he could. Um and the Astros, and I, I wish I could remember the name of the scout because I saw the story. Um, Just make up a name. No, um, no, no. It, it, Just make up a it's name. It's kind of on the tip of my if you, tongue. If you were making up a scout name, what would it be? In the Dominican? Any, yeah, go ahead. I'll go careful, with – <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's it's accurate. I mean, it's it's a Hispanic guy, probably. Right, go ahead. If you're going to send a just, guy, just make up a scout name. Uh, Fernando Vasquez. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So John Smith, pretty much. <laughs> I was going to say Joe Smith. <laughs> Fernando All right. Vasquez. All right, so Fernando Vasquez discovered him, and then what? Something like that. Okay. Five thousand bucks. Okay. All right. And but he only had a few pitches and was hitting like ninety two, ninety three, which is is enough to get a. When's the last time you spent five thousand bucks? When was the last time I spent five thousand Saturday? dollars? Get out of here, man! It was, how much did that oh, meat yeah. cost? <laughs> I was about to say, how much hey, did that meat that cost? Ain't far even, off. I don't even yeah, how much say. did that meat cost, Tommy? Six hundred. I don't even want to say. Six hundred? No, not that much. Four hundred. Three hundred. Okay. Yeah, three hundred. All, right. all right. Um, <laughs> you always turn it there. <laughs> um, so anyway, so so he's he's in he's in Chile, Chile. I mean, in Dominican. Oh, now that's a race car. Um, and so he didn't even remotely have a chance. He finally got, uh, into the Astros organization. He was older than Fromber and Fromber was already on his way up. Uh, and he finally gets to AAA. uh, so it goes like six and five, gets his chance, gets into the rotation a little bit last year. And he had only, this was only his eighth start, only 25th appearance. Um, and at 22, in, 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 to be able to sign at 22 in 2016 for, for that, it doesn't happen. Like, the, the, the standard for signing a Dominican pitcher is like 16 years old, 17 years old at the oldest, you know? And for him to do it, uh, it was just ridiculous. So it got me to thinking about a couple of things. He developed this changeup, which was he threw it 36 times yesterday, more than his fastball. Okay. And it was dropping off. The, you know, it was, it was just incredible. Obviously, he threw a no-hitter. Is there anything you've gotten better at athletically, remotely athletic? No. Because I thought of one. Hell I thought no. of one. Figgy? Absolutely not. Anything that you, athletically, that you remotely got better at no. when you hit age 30? No. There's one for me. I'm being honest. I'm being sincere. sincere. Golf. Well, you probably played more. No. I slowed down. I wasn't trying to kill the ball all the time. You know, you, you mature and you're like, why am I trying to just just crush this ball. You're using more of a swing and tempo than uh, than everything else. I got a lot better at golf when I was in my 30s than before. Okay. That's it. Like, for him to be able to and get – I think that's normal. Yeah, for him – I think to, people get better with age with golf. Yeah, or, or at least to a point. Um, but for way, him to get – Shout out to Scheffler for that missed punt. Tim. Dude, six foot. Come, Come on. Man. God. By the way, he didn't go eight under yeah. on Friday. Yeah, he did. <laughs> So for him to be able to do that is truly an incredible story, and his mom was there. She was, she was there yesterday, just happened to be there to, to watch him pitch, and this, he was washing cars. Uh, absolutely turned everything around. Um, I did start to think about two things. One was Adam Splane. He told us last week, remember? He said, well, Ronel Blanco, I'm hearing some good things about how he's performed. Remember that? 
We gotta ask him about that. We gotta pull that. We gotta we gotta Biggie, make a mark of that. Yeah. We gotta pull we gotta give him his props. Yeah. <laughs> that baseball spo mentioned Blanco by name last week. Okay. Yes. And I probably glossed over it. We all did. We, we all did. I was like, yeah, I'm hearing some good things about Blanco. I'm hearing some good things. I talked to a scout and he <laughs> yes. said that his uh, He did no, he said something just like that. I talked to a scout and he, he said that his uh spin rate on his uh change up has yes. actually gone up three decibels. Yeah. <laughs> decibels <laughs> which if you uh if, if, if you compare that to what what the average 30 year old does that's yeah. like 0.955 more yeah <laughs> well but, what do you think about the five thousand dollars it took to get him it's not my money <laughs> <laughs> actually it could have been he probably would have splurged five thousand for <laughs> for that and then and then become his agent um but couldn't have happened at a better time because the astros were just absolutely bleeding like they were i it, you know, it's early guy. I didn't have any time for him yesterday. I mean, I had no time for it's early guy because everything was looking bad uh, for this team to start the season. And and now we'll have to see, you know, how sustainable he is and, and how the starting pitching staff responds. They just need to start raking. Well, yeah, they need to start. How about? Uh, no worry about the bullpen, by the way. Mm-hmm. No worry about the bullpen. Middle relief, I'm worried. They're f- oh, okay, but yeah, yeah, like Abreu, he's just figuring it out. Abreu's figuring it out. Middle relief is going to be a problem. You can't count on what what you got yesterday every day. That's for dang sure. Um, and now we'll have to see how Fromber responds. Fromber's pitching today. He he needs another. That that's how you do. It. You you mentioned it earlier. You can't. I don't think a no hitter is going to start the team off on a big run, but it can stop a team from spinning out of control. Oh, whether they won six five yesterday or they, they yeah. had a no hitter, they needed a dub. Yeah, they needed a dub. Bad. They needed a dub big time, mm-hmm. and they got it. Yeah. And Todd Callis and uh, Jeff Blum still still no no hitter thing. They still are, not, are doing that. I heard not all broadcasts were doing that though. Oh really? I heard others were were saying it. We're saying it. Yes. You know the other interesting thing is like as soon as he hit that last pitch, they put up no hitter. Yeah. On the scoreboard. Yeah. Did would they have jinxed it? Because you know that was ready to go. I don't know. It's <laughs> just it's just silly. Coming up. The Strohs crash an all-time party. One team is on standby, and another is hanging by a thread. The hits are lit next. Area 45 with Bajani and...
in the loop with John Lopez and Landry Locker. All right, so we got to get to the bottom of something at noon. You loopholes, and I do mean you people. Shout out to the loopholes if you listen, you are one. You might have uh You might have been warned that this no-hitter was uh was going to happen. And we might have kind of hiked our leg on it. Might have. We'll check. We might have. We'll go to the tape at noon here on In the Loop on Sports yeah. Radio 610. I got to clear up that scouting thing, too, at noon. <laughs> it was uh, not, in fact, Fernando Vasquez. In the Loop, Sports Radio 610. Hits or lit. Playing all the hits. These are the hot stories of the day. You're listening to In the Loop with Houston's sports leader, Sports Radio 610. All right, so this was what it sounded like on AT&T Sportsnet. They acknowledged it. It happened. Ronel Blanco threw the first no-hitter of the MLB season. First one for the Astros since Framber Valdez last August in the 17th in franchise history. Take it away, Todd Callis. Ground ball. Dubon throws to first. No-hitter. Ronel Blanco in his eighth career start. The 30-year-old makes magic on April Fool's Day. Good call. Uh, didn't necessarily need the April Fool's Day, but I get it. Uh, let me ask you this. You were asking earlier about does it have the same luster that it used to have, no hitters. And and I said not really because of the game has changed, et cetera, and, and it's a strikeout and home run league, and and he's not a Verlander. He's a Blanco. You know, I call him Queso Blanco. I'm going to stick with that for a while. Uh, until he comes back down to earth. But a part of it also, do you think like we're kind of being, in the backs of our mind, we're a little bit biased because we saw Fromber throw a no-hitter and then fall off a cliff? I don't know. I, I just, No, nah, I don't think so. Or because the Astros throw a lot of no-hitters? Astros on a, are on a tear with How no How many hitters. times have they shut out uh, no-hit the Blue Jays? That's three, right? It's got to be three in the last four years. The Verlander, the Verlander, I know that one. Where the Vistoro. Yeah. Wasn't the combined no hitter uh, I thought, against the Blue Jays? Let me see now. Or am I wrong? I don't yeah, know. I don't remember. It might have been the Tigers. I don't know. Yeah. And then this one. So, so it's at least the second time they've mm-hmm. no hit the Blue Jays in like a half decade. I wonder how often that's happened. And they throw a lot of them. The Astros are, are on a big, big tear. Man, I just, you know, the, the lucky people last night. And there's a lot of people that probably can't afford full season ticket packages. Mm-hmm. The lucky people last night are the ones who just had to settle for the scraps. They get the third pick in the in the season ticket draw. That someone's like, I want opening day with Fromber. Yeah. Oh, I want to see Hunter Brown. Oh, I want to see Christian Javier. Oh, I want the Yankees. Hey, Johnny. Okay, well, you got the Blue Jays. You can have the first Blue Jays game. <laughs> I'll give it's you the Blue Jays. Yeah, there you go. It's on a Monday night. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Just have to I got a buddy got free that. tickets for tonight. Uh, because they, somebody was uh, a season ticket holder was, was so mad about about the Yankees series. By the way, here's in the last few no hitters. Uh, obviously, Blanco, Fromber was against the Cleveland Guardians. Uh, the combined Javier Abreu, Montero, and Presley was at Philadelphia. Uh, Javier Neris and Presley in 22 was at Yankees. Uh, Verlander was Blue Jays, and the other combined was Seattle. Okay. In 2019. Okay. Yeah. There we go. Mm-hmm. So that's the uh, that's the history. Now get back to it. You got to you got to win another one. Got to win another one. Let's let's build some momentum here. Uh, and Framber Valdez got to get back on track. It's huge for him. Uh, it, it absolutely is. You were you were. This is the first time he's ever been like anointed the ace, except he wasn't. Like he's you know we've had this question and we've talked about it. Obviously, is he an ace? When's he gonna? But this is the first season where you're going into it like you're the ace. And then you do that? Bounce back season from yeah. Valdez. Yeah. Yesterday, women's basketball was on the big stage. Caitlin Clark, she did not disappoint. This is what it sounded like, uh, courtesy of Ryan Rucco on ESPN. Before that UCLA game, that's how sick she was. Clark! She's possessed. Evades Van Lith and drains it. Wheels around, evades Van Lith, and drains it! My goodness! Clark trying to redirect a pass. Clark, oh my! From Schenectady! 
Man, those three that you that you played there were 28, 29, and 30 feet. <laughs> it was incredible. She does that every game, though, right? No one can stay in front of her. She does it all the time. She does it all the time, but the stage was it's normal for her. It is, but the stage magnified it. Iowa wins 94 to 87 after the game. Uh, Kim Mulkey, uh, she was asked about how you guard Caitlin Clark and what she said to her uh, in the uh, in the handshake line after the game. Not a whole lot of strategy. You got to guard her. Nobody else seems to be able to guard her. We didn't even guard her last year when we beat them. Um, she's just a generational player, and um, she just makes everybody around her better. That's what the great ones do. I think they had a kid that scored 21 and 18. She had 12 assists. Caitlin Clark's not going to beat you by herself. It's what she does to make those other teammates better that helps her score points and them score points to beat you. Um, what did I say to her? I said, I sure am glad you're leaving. <laughs> I said, girl, you something else. Never seen anything like it. Right. Mm -hmm. I was waiting for her to pause and puff. <laughs> what do you mean? Her voice sounded like a smoker. <laughs> what? I don't even know if she smokes, but it sounded like a smoker. She sounds like a smoker? Yeah. Or does she sound like someone who just screamed at the well, top of her I, yeah, lungs for three was. hours in the ba uh, number one basketball game of all time, according yeah, to you? Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's what it was. But it's <laughs> smoker. I said she sounded like one, and I don't even know if she does. But she sounded like a traffic lady. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. Oh, a little bit. I think you're right. A little oh, bit. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. What does that mean? I don't know. Maybe Kim Mokey doing the traffic here. <laughs> Goodness gracious. Uh, Gino Oriema, uh, the uh, UConn coach, uh, last week he, he said that he had mm -hmm. the best player in the country. was pretty, pretty emphatic about yeah, it. Yeah, he was. Paige Beckers. Now he's going to play Caitlin Clark in Iowa, and he's kind of backtracking a little bit. I hope, I hope, I hope Caitlin Clark had a personal agenda against LSU and I know there's nothing personal between me and her so I, I don't need to be seeing her drop 50 on us next weekend you know so I love her I think she's the best player forget I ever said Paige is the best player in the country I think she's the best player that I, of all time I don't know whoever said that I said the Paige is the best player in the country all right yeah you said it <laughs> you said it it's gonna be on it's going to be on. It's going to be on. Are you, is it going to be on your TV? It is going to be on my – Figure, are you with me? Like, I went in there thinking, i got to watch this. And then I was so entertained. By the time it was over, I was like, I sure as hell am watching the next one. Yeah, I All did. Right. I, so I went in thinking, like, if it's not really entertaining, I'll watch something else. But yeah. I stayed the whole time. And Landry watched all the highlights. I watched all the highlights. First time this year are I've you, done that. Are you going to watch the game? Uh, probably not. I was a two-and-a-half-point favorite if you want to wager. Well, I don't know if I'd go that far. Come on, put 200 on it. I don't know anything. Be a real about women's <laughs> basketball fan. Put 200 on it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that. I don't know if I'm going to end up doing so that. So they're a two-and-a-half point favorite. South Carolina, they're undefeated. Yeah. They're in their fourth straight Final Four. They have a freshman baller uh, by the name of uh, Malaysia Fulwiley. Mm -hmm. She's supposedly pretty good. Um, that's what I hear. Uh, Malaysia Fulwiley. Um, where's she at? She's, uh, yeah, she's averaging 12 points and she's shooting 44%. So she's great. They're great, but she's doing something that I just can't. And I'm, I'm not going to give a double standard. If a guy did this, mm -hmm. you would roll your eyes. This is courtesy of ABC Columbia. Okay. Keep in mind four straight final fours. All right. Before that, they'd, they'd won a national championship. Don Staley's one of the. Great coaches in college sports. Mm -hmm. Listen to this. Come on. In the winning locker room with freshman Malaysia Full Wiley, the smile is beaming on your face. You're headed to your first ever Final Four. How does that sound? Mm, it sounds amazing, you know, just being here with my team. I mean, nobody believed in us. Nobody thought we could be here, and now we're here, so I'm just proud of us. Four straight Final <laughs> Fours for this team and Don Staley. Come on, man. Nobody believed in us. It's only our fourth it's straight. The fourth straight one, and you're undefeated. <laughs> when you committed there, they'd been to three straights. <laughs> nobody believed in us. Come on. <laughs> well, I mean, I know we haven't lost a game, but nobody believed in us. <laughs> That got to be the go-to line, That's right? The worst. But come on, That's man. At worst. some point. Yeah. What's wrong with saying everyone expected us to be here when you set the bar this high? Yes. Sometimes people crater under pressure. Yeah. But you know what? We didn't crater under pressure. I think it says a lot about the character of this locker room and this coaching staff. Now that's a good quote.
Now, that's a good quote. <laughs> Nobody believed in us. Uh, Rockets two back from that uh, final play-in spot, the uh, 10 seed. They got a big game against the uh, Minnesota Timberwolves. Um, this is going to be the second straight game the Rockets are playing against a very good team in the Western Conference that needs it as much as they do. Mm -hmm. uh, the Mavericks needed to hold on to that six because they don't want to fall into the play-in game. Right. And Minnesota, they're a half game out of the two seed. So they Minnesota needs to avoid having to play Denver in mm -hmm. which Denver would have home court advantage because we know how big that is in Denver. Right. So this is going to be the big challenge before they face the, the Warriors in two days. They, go ahead. And, and again, there have been times where they face good teams, mm -hmm. but the teams haven't needed it as much as they have. This is the second time they have. They've had some good luck with the scheduling and it's good luck great. good luck with injuries. Jalen's been great. But they're getting it done. Uh, it's Jaylen, been a successful you know, season no matter what. No matter what. And I don't want that to sound like a, co a, a cop-out uh, because they they clearly have, have shown some things. But, boy, these, the, this one right here is going to be huge for them because then all of a sudden let's see what the Warriors do, uh, and that's the battle for them right there. be sick. Yeah. Uh, here's Ime Adoka. God, I love him. Uh, here's him talking about Jalen Green and the maturation uh, of him and the up and down season that's been where where he's found himself on the bench at times. Guys pick stuff up at different paces, different speeds, and um, when you're requiring people to do different things than they've ever done in their career, it's going to take some time, and it's not always going to happen overnight. So understanding the big picture with our guys, and you see stages of growth, you see incremental steps, and I think that's what you're looking for, just making that more consistent. So although it may look like struggles at times, you're seeing growth of uh, game game. Like I said, less mistakes across the board and recognition and understanding of what we're looking for from you. And so for me, I, I don't judge Jalen on the past two years or even the start of this year. It was how good is he going to get with us throughout this season? And now you see him hitting the stride and understanding. And so um, that's what we're looking at big picture wise. It's not always going to happen overnight for guys. And uh, patience is really important with our young guys. That's what he came in for is to erase the past. Erase the, 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 the perception of Jalen Green, uh, but it's easier said than done, and it seems like he is convincing him, you know, to 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 all of a sudden do things this way. The crazy thing about it is that you ask the question before the season, like is like if you're the if you're the Rockets and you're having the conversation, is is Jay, can Jalen Green be elite? Can Alfie Shingoon mm -hmm. uh, be really good? And you've seen them both be really good under Adoka. So I guess you've made progress because you yeah. get sample size. The question now is, can they coexist? I saw McMahon said he could see them trading one of them. It's got to be Shingun. Like, yeah. if, if you're going to do it, and I'm not saying, look, I don't know. I, I, I want to see what Jalen Green does over the course of a full season because I do think this has been low-pressure basketball. Yeah. Um, and also, you might have to make Shingun work, which, which might make it a little bit different. But I, but I think at the very least, you kind of have to lean Jalen Green over Shingun at this point, right? If, you, if you're going to trade one of them, I would agree with you. I'm starting to kind of go the other way. We have, to, we have to wait and see if they can coexist, how they can play together. I think maybe it's just more like belief. In, so you think they can? I think they might. I want to see. I think they're going to give it a shot. No, they should. Yeah, I think they they're going to give it a shot. But I, I, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be almost like a seesaw of how it fits. No, they, and it's on they Odoka. Do, I, I think it's Odoka we trust kind of thing, right? Yeah, uh, I trust him. If he can make it work, I think he's going to give it a shot anyway. Trust him, no doubt. Yeah. I will say, I go back to, you know, they tried to trade both of them. At, or, or yeah. Basically, demote Shingun by bringing in Lopez and – trade Jalen Green at the deadline, and they've just continued developing them. So okay to props to them. We'll see what happens. Uh, coming up next, so there was a no-hitter yesterday. Should we have known this was coming? Uh, baseball Spo, did he warn us about this and did in the loop just hike the leg recklessly? We'll get into it next. Pain and Pendergast.
Houston. Insider Access. Exclusive content. The Texans play here. Always live on the free Odyssey app. Did in the loop get warned about the greatness of Ronel Blanco and dismiss their baseball leader. Landry Locker, John Lopez, Figgy Fig with you. Here on Houston Sports Leader, Sports Radio 610. Astros finally got a dub. Big dub. Historic dub. Uh, no hitter from Ronel Blanco. And I think most people didn't see this coming. Like, people didn't see Ronel Blanco pitching well, right? Most people did not. It's been brought to our attention. <laughs> yeah, it has. That perhaps Adam Spillane... Baseball Spo. This is why we call him Baseball Spo. We don't just hand out nicknames. We just don't hand out segments. Figgy just doesn't make theme songs for anyone. No. Um, it's 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 a select group. Mm-hmm. And our baseball leader, Adam Spillane, he said this last week. And I want to investigate as to whether or not in the loop kind of dismissed. Did, did we buy in the possibility? Did we did, did we did we not buy in enough? <laughs> That would be the question. This was last week. By the way, he's going to join us tomorrow at 1045. This was baseball spo. They were really pleased with what Hunter Brown did this spring. Hunter mm-hmm. Brown had a really good spring. Ronel Blanco had a really good spring also. So I don't think the rotation Hunter Brown, is. Ronel Blanco. The, the problem is I don't think the rotation wow. rotation isn't great mm-hmm. right now, but I think that it might be maybe a little bit better than we think it. Okay. Oh. Ronel Blanco, huh? <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah, I don't think we bought in. I, I, I'm not speaking for you, but I don't think I bought in. No, I think I, I was bought in. You were all in? Yeah, it sounds. Let's check the tape again. I, yeah. I, I feel like that. Yeah, I was in. Yeah. They were really pleased with what Hunter Brown did this spring. Hunter mm-hmm. Brown had a really good spring, and Ronel Blanco had a really good spring also. So I don't think the rotation Hunter Brown is. Hunter Blanco. The, the problem is, I don't think the rotation wow. rotation isn't great. Yeah, I was in. You said, wow. Yeah, like, wow, that's great. Yeah. I, I can't wait to see this guy on the bump. I, I don't think you're telling the truth. Yeah. I I mean, really it depends really... how you take the wow. The, you, the problem is, I don't think the rotation. Wow. <laughs> that wasn't wow. That was, no, that was wow. We might have rotation. something. That was wow. That was wow. We might have something. The wow. rotation. Yeah. Baseball spo. Always plugged in. The thing, though, about the Astros, and I think they set themselves up to, like, a certain point to where you expect them to, like, spend big money and big names and all that. Mm-hmm. But if you look at what's made them great, nobody gave a damn about Jose Altuve before he got here. Uh, What do you mean? I mean, he was, that was a gem. Like, they, they discovered Jose Altuve. Like, that was, uh, nobody saw that coming. Yes. And he's the best player in franchise history, right? Right, by, by, by a long stretch. They got Jordan Alvarez for a reliever that, None of us even, we, we couldn't even fathom what the hell was going on there. Mm-hmm. Like, what is that? Yeah, cheap. Yeah. Framber Valdez and Christian Javier, I think it was like less than 40000 combined was their signing I think, bonuses. Uh, I think Framber was 10000 and I think Javier was twenty five. I think it was a little more. Mm-hmm. And um, Blanco was 5000 By the way. Luis Garcia, too. Another one. Yeah, and Luis Garcia, another one. The scout. That I projected his name to be uh, Fernando Vasquez. It was not Fernando Vasquez. I believe you did that. But it's in the neighborhood. Really? Yeah. This is in the neighborhood? Yeah. Fernando Vasquez. No, Fernando Vasquez is the one because I you couldn't. You guessed. Re- I, I, c- said, I said guess a name. Yeah, I couldn't remember the scout that signed him for 5000 I want to hear bucks. this neighborhood. Yeah. And I figured, well, he's in the Dominican, so he has to be Hispanic. Okay. So I said Fernando Vasquez. Okay, what was it? The first initial is correct. Francis Mojica. Boy, that's a big ass neighborhood. That's a, <laughs> that's a big ass neighborhood, John. I said Fernando Vasquez. It's Francis Mojica. Maybe one side of the woodlands to the other. <laughs> if we're talking neighborhood, it's a Harris neighborhood. County. It's a big neighborhood. <laughs> it's a big neighborhood. But that you know that's the other thing, and we've talked about this a little bit. But like everybody scouts the uh, you know South America and the Dominican, and Cuba, and all. Man, the no, they've Ast- done it the best. The Astros are just. Yeah, the thing is that. Well, I'm just saying that to say that, you know, we we look at the the top end guys and we expect certain things. And I'm mm-hmm. not I'm not sitting here saying that, you know, you're going to be able to ride this Blanco thing from here to the end of the season. But it does seem like sometimes the moves that you don't expect 
are the ones that make the Astros so great. Like Charlie Morton. That was a good signing, but mm -hmm. did we expect Charlie Morton to be like one of the best postseason pitchers in Astros history? Well, you mentioned Altuve. Like he he got turned away twice. Yeah, and then came back and they 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 finally signed him. Uh, like like Blanco, you know, he was washing cars. He was washing cars. He was too old to to sign uh, by most MLB teams. They have a they have like this this sort of standard. Like if you're if you're 17 years old, that's about the limit. 16, 17 years old, that's about as old as they will sign uh, for pitchers. Uh, out of the Dominican for a number of reasons. You know, you never know their real age, first of all, uh, and that's just being honest. And they have a, they take a long time to develop. They signed him at 22. They signed Blanco. That alone makes it an incredible story. But then from from all the other things that he did, how do you wash your car? You know what? I I'm I'm one of those guys that's anal about it. I don't do it enough. Do first. you do it yourself? Uh, well, hold on. You go to the spray thing? No. I I go to the the, the the good drive through right there on Washington Avenue. I forget what it's called. Okay. And anyway, but then I It's not a Mr. Car Wash. It's not a Mr. It's one of those. Uh but then I stay at the vacuums for like probably 30 40 minutes okay. cuz I bring my stuff like you know to wash the wind like Windex. Oh, okay. And and all that stuff and then I vacuum and then I do the little blower thing. Yeah, those blowers are cool. Yeah. Yeah, but I I need But I just, you go through the drive through? Yeah, I do I do okay. the drive through. You? Um I went to Mr. Car Wash the other day. Um, I was a little disappointed, man. Mm -hmm. Not because of the the car. The car was washed great. Yeah. I, I just know they have this wash club where, when I'm sure we have some listeners who are, it, it's it's worth it for sure. You just mm -hmm. drive through. But my thing is this, man. I get that you're going to give the membership people first dibs, but you got to draw the line somewhere. Oh, they let them through like crazy. Brother. Yeah. My car was sitting there for 20 minutes yeah. waiting to get in line. They and let they them let, through like they let a whole like caravan of like twenty cars drive yeah, by. Yeah, yeah. I'm getting the premium wash here, man. You know what it is, Mister Car Wash. Yeah, Mr. yeah. Mister Car Wash. Yeah, Mister Car Wash comes in Washington. Yeah. It's worth it. I'm I'm thinking yeah. about getting the membership. But you know what I also like, and the time before that I went there, I like those car washes where you just put the five dollars in quarters and you're spinning and you get the the uh, the light spray. Then you work your way up to the soap. You get the wax. They got the brush and all that. Yeah, yeah. Have you ever done this? Because I've done this probably half the time I, I go by one of these places. The fundraiser car washes, like yeah. at some CVS or something, yeah. the, the, you know, they have the, the, the choir or the cheerleaders or the whatevers, you know, doing a, a fundraiser car wash. I give them money and tell them, don't, don't, worry, about my don't, car. don't worry about washing it. I did that. To they some, do a horrible job. The last time. Some, they do a horrible job. The last time I had a couple of uh, Washingtons on me and... Uh, one of those homeless cats came up with the damn mm -hmm. thing. I gave him a buck, said, don't touch anything. Yeah, uh, at those fundraiser car washes. What y'all doing, It was man? a Little League team. The worst is when you run across one that don't know English. Yeah. And you're sitting there like, no, <laughs> yeah, please, no. And you're like, yep, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, please. Like, no. Please don't do that. That is the, man. And it's uh, it's all mud water and stuff on there. Yeah. Sir. Something they stole from a gas station. And I feel like Sir, they get please. insulted. No, really. Like it was, it was like a Little League team going to air quote national wait they wanted to really wash your car they and, didn't want the and, money? and i was like i gave them like well they wanted to earn it 10 bucks 20 bucks whatever it was uh and i said i'm good you know here's just for your fundraiser and they were they looked at me like like we can do this i was like i you know you can't <laughs> i mean a lot of times they don't do it like that you get to one of those car washes where you got the spray and the yeah there's one on the way there there was i mean there's no no english bro mm -hmm. some dude came up to me uh he was asking about change, because you had to go in the you had to go in the washeria. The wash, yeah, washeria. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because the coins were out. Mm -hmm. He, I, I had to explain it to him. He didn't know what was up, man. <laughs> I mean, he he had no idea. And I was like, "Well, I have four quarters. I'll give you, you know, right here." He, yeah. And he's like, he still didn't know what I was talking no. about, so he just went away from. <laughs> him, man. He that's went the, away. That's from the me. worst, man. <laughs> I'll be feeling so bad. I'm like, here, here, quarters, and then, nah. <laughs> my man had, my man was washing the hell out of his car. He was making a day of it. Uh -huh. He had a six-pack of, uh, I think it was Michelob on the top of his hood, and he was just, just. He, he, was, he, was, he was drinking beer while he was washing his car? Oh, yeah. I don't know about that. Yeah. He was drinking the hell <laughs> out of his car. I don't know about that. Man. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure about nah, that. Nah, he was, I'm not kidding. He was probably because I I just got five minutes because it mm -hmm. I, I, you get to the point where if you if you don't have the certain amount of coins yeah when you're in those wash things 
you find yourself in no man's land because mm-hmm. especially the ones then where you start rushing well if it's so yeah. old that it doesn't have the timer yeah if it has the timer and you can see oh i got two minutes i gotta get Let around get real quick back. and Let then i gotta get, to get back and then i gotta get it but yeah. if there's no timer this one was like such a yeah, su- yeah. such an old one that it had no timer it's a crap shoot so if you grab the foam brush yeah and all of a sudden that you're done Err! Yeah, it you're stops. Done. You're, just, you're done. And you don't have quarters. You're screwed. <laughs> you're driving around with the damn with foam, foam on there car. with no clock. Exactly. Like it's like playing. It's like playing football without a shot clock. So I'm sitting man. there. But I'm. I put. I put twenty quarters in, which I think is seven minutes, if mm-hmm. I'm not mistaken. Like based on my experience in those things. Mm-hmm. So in seven minutes, this fooled down four Michelobes. Four Michelobes walking his car. He was by himself. This guy had because he had the sixer on his on his hood. Yeah. This dude down four Michelobes in seven minutes, <laughs> and then came over asking for change. That's big time. Oh, he was beasting. He asked it for change so we can get another beer. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, "Hey, change." I'm like, "Hey, the uh, I said the Wasteria back left." Yeah. I, I was trying to like speak. Yeah. I was trying to do as best I could. Then some dude walks over to me. This is an old white dude. Mm-hmm. He's got like one of those holes in his throats. Oh, where the yeah, in the trach or the whatever. Yeah, he's got like one yeah. of the trachs. Yeah. He comes over to me. He's like, but he didn't. He didn't like sound like he didn't sound like out of tone or anything. Yeah. But he comes over to me. He's like, hey man. I'm like, oh god, where the hell is it? This could go anywhere. <laughs> no, this could go anywhere because I'm telling you, man. This there was like parties going on in front. My white ass. I, I don't. I mean, I just. I just. Yeah. Just right there. Yeah. Just. Hanging out, posted. I left the keys in my car, and I just went in the washer. Like I, I was just, yeah. I was just like, I, like I belong there. Yeah. This dude comes up to me, and he's like, "Hey, I, I'm, I'm, I'm needing some money issues. I have some money issues. <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I just, he's like giving me like a whole story, yeah. and I, he's saying why he can't get a job and all this stuff, and I'm just like, brother, I have a dollar. Like I don't know, like I don't, yeah, what, I don't what, know what, what are we gonna do? Yeah. Like here, here's a buck. And then he looks at you like you're like small balling him. I'm like, like what? What do you want me to do? Go to the debit? Go to <laughs> yeah, the, go to the ATM. Go to get two hundred out for you. <laughs> and I also noticed that he didn't ask anyone else this, man. He didn't ask the guy that was drinking. You were the an easy. This. You were an easy mark. I think I got racially profiled by this. You guy. were an easy mark. You didn't go ask my Michelob drinker that. Several texters said, you know, Twin Peaks has an interesting car wash. Yeah, that's not a car wash. <laughs> Wait, do they? Yeah, they do. Uh, I think on like Thursdays or Fridays or something they have car washes at Twin Peaks. Come on, we're doing that still. Yeah, come on. Like, Shout out that, to that, Twin Peaks. That's not a car wash. We love you. So we're out there. They're car washing. Yeah, in bikinis. Where on Kirby? Uh, I know they have one in Webster that they do that down toward uh, toward Galveston. The car wash hustle can be nice. That's a nice fundraiser. Do mm-hmm. you like that fundraiser? I I don't I don't think they wash the car very well as I mentioned. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I mean they they generally I'm sure they do well. I'm Someone sure. says I was at 1960 and Kirk. No, nah, it was like close. It was it was like on the other side of Gassy. There's there's a bunch of food trucks. Mm-hmm. Like it's no it's 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 not it's no English. Yeah. What? No no I'm just saying yeah. like I don't yeah. I, it, it's. I mean you know you sign up for it. Beast when you mode, go, man. <laughs> you sign up for those. They got things. like a badass fruit stand that I stopped by right there. Those fruit stands are awesome. Dude, Those Mexican fruit where stands. Where y'all getting this? Dude, this is so where good. Where y'all getting this, man? <laughs> it's really good. There's one, there's, speaking of 19, there's one night on 1960 in a Tacita that is so good. Right by Will Clayton. The, I don't know where they get that uh, fruteria, where they get the fruit from. Yeah, I don't, I don't know where that's coming from, It's man. delish. It's absolutely Ridiculous. delish. Ridiculous. The car wash life, yeah. though. Yeah. What about the, uh, the, the Little League team hustle? Which one? <laughs> yeah. On the corner, the uh, the candy bars, no way, no way you do those. Those with a world something candy. What bar? about carrying around like a basketball and asking you to put the money in the basketball or the shoe? No, the one the that, AAU the, squad. The one that's weird is I feel guilty when they have water bottles, like they, somebody bought a bunch of water bottles. Yeah, or waters. Yeah, and and they're like, you know, that's a good hustle. Two dollars, but yeah, but you feel guilty like you're cutting into their profit if you actually take the water bottle. I guess my conscience is always like, oh, So you just give me. it. I just give them, like, whatever. I don't need any water. What's going on with these flower hustles? Have you noticed these around I town? I think that's... I, I have... I'm skeptical I, look, of those things. Yeah. Usually under a Brother, bypass, a highway. always... Under a highway. I always think she of a trafficking ring, ring, man. Yeah. Yeah. Every it's time I see those. always a woman, and she always has kids. A kid and with always have, like, fresh-ass flowers. Like, if, I've seen, if I'd seen it once or twice, mm-hmm. I would say it, but... 
You go downtown, you see the lady and her kids. Anywhere there's you a go, turnaround on you, the highway. You go by the plucker. Yes. Yes. Anywhere, yes. The pluckers the pluckers yeah. right there off of Tim where yeah. you have to U-turn past yeah. Home Depot. Anywhere there's one of those, there's going to have flowers. And Ojos Locos. Like, you go, you go right past it, right there yeah. on the left. It's a woman or a husband. They have kids, yep. and they have a bunch of flowers. Yep, in a bucket. In a five and it's the bucket. same flowers. Yes, yeah, the same ones. So what? The purple uh, and the yellow, like, flowers. Why am I so skeptical about that? I, because it's weird. It's weird. Because it's not presented as like a company. It's a like it's it's the same thing. But it doesn't matter over. where you go. And what? they look so sad too, yes, man. They do. I feel terrible for the kids, man. Yeah. I feel terrible for all parties involved. But yeah. I'm like, what is going something this is not just this is not just, hey, I'm I'm on the corner and I'm getting my hustle on. There has to be some some sort of scam involved. I don't. I can't. I can't, can't figure it I out. I always think of trafficking, man. I'm sorry. Yeah. Or maybe I don't know. I mean, they always have to have the kids too. Yeah. Always. Mm -hmm. Like three kids out there, with them, and they're they're like slinging the flowers. Yeah. That, man, dude, they had it. They had it this week. I went to my mom's up there. It's there. Mm -hmm. It is like statewide. Yeah. Yeah. It's all over. Damn. How much do those cost though? I bought some here and there. Okay, what is it like? From 10, them? I want to say, yeah. 10, 5? I'm an easy mark, too. Uh, I want to say it's like 20 bucks. 20 bucks? For the bouquet thing. thing. Am I wrong? 7135. Hey, we're seven, charging seven. them, man. Yeah. Is it 20 bucks, 10 bucks? Do y'all deliver? No, you, you grab man. them right there. No, I mean, damn, if you're going to charge me oh, 20, you might as well be delivering. Dang. 20 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> It's been a while, so help me out. Seven one three five. No wonder they're so damn organized, man. A lot of people saying it's just they're trying to guilt you. Yes, I understand that, but yeah, the, but it can't but be whole, everywhere. It can't be the everywhere. The whole flower thing, like why is it? It's just the like exact a, flowers. Yes, exactly. Yeah, people are going to start noticing this and say yeah. this. Yeah, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely insane. Landry Locker, John Lopez, Figgy Fig with you here on Houston Sports Leader Sports Radio. 610. People were asking to call CPS. Man, you're doing too much. Man. <laughs> <laughs> Got a lot of time on your hands, yeah. man. I'll go 10 and 2 and drive. I'm fine. <laughs> Coming up next, lunchtime confessions here on In the Loop on Sports Radio 610. What's Nick Casario?
All right, lunchtime confessions. We confess our sins to you, the loophole. Shout out to the loopholes. If you listen, you are one. Some of these confessions have to do with sports. Some have nothing to do with sports. We're transparent with you 24-7. Let it hang a little bit lower. To the left, to the left, during lunchtime confessions. It is time to confess. Watch this. These are my confessions. Thank goodness for people out there in the trenches that are doing God's work. I'm talking about one Brian McTaggart. God's Brian McTaggart. Word. Astros writer for MLB.com. Talk, about to talk about like nurses, doctors, first responders. Uh, yes. God's but in, work. Brian but, McTaggart. But in, but in this case, I'm talking about Brian McTaggart doing God's work. So he tweeted right after uh, the no-hitter yesterday, another no-hitter that I did not jinx. He is one of those that just is has a brain in his head, first of all. And understands that uh, saying something, tweeting something about uh, a no-hitter helps the broadcast, helps your writing, helps the uh, the, the footprint that you're going to leave, gets more people involved. Uh, the whole concept of not saying anything, and I'm not going to go off on a tangent. I've done it enough times over the years. Uh, but McTaggart is proof, uh, is proof positive. He's at just about every game, most every game. And every time they've thrown a no-hitter and the Astros have thrown more than any team, uh, in the last uh, decade, plus, every time he's talked about a no-hitter as it's going on. Shout out to Brian McTaggart for doing that. Watch this. These are my confessions. I was so annoyed, so irked by the way that DJ Burns was getting talked about mm-hmm. after he led his team to the Final Four. Now, a lot of people thought, well, that should have been the Cougs. You could be right, uh, but... Bad luck with the Jamal Shedd injury, and as a result, DJ Burns and NC State, uh, they end up getting the dub over Duke. So this young man is out there playing basketball. He's fun to watch. Big dude. And then we have NFL guys. I saw Peter Schrager do it. I saw Albert Breer do it. I saw a bunch of other people say that this guy should be a left tackle in the NFL Mm -hmm. or try to be an NFL prospect. I got to confess, I am disgusted yeah. by the lack of respect that is being shown at one of the more difficult in the NFL to play, as if DJ Burns, because he's out there gracefully playing basketball, can now sit there and go toe-to-toe with NFL guys. Furthermore, I don't even see, like, I hear the Antonio Gates connection. Antonio Gates is out there hooping. He's running. He's jumping. Yeah. He's grabbing the ball, all that. You can see some similarities there. There is nothing about the way in which DJ Burns is moving that is proportional to what an NFL offensive lineman is supposed to do, especially when you factor in strength. So my confession is this dialogue disgusted me. And and who's to say that he might not get a shot in the NBA? If not, he's going to be a pro somewhere and make a lot of money. Why would he want to play in football? Why? Don't know. Watch this. I don't know if this is possible, but I kind of believe Angel Reese, and I kind of... Angel Reese is the uh, LSU? Yeah, the LSU star, 17 points, 20 rebounds yesterday. I kind of believe her, and I kind of don't. I want you to listen to this and what she says. I just try to stand strong. Like I've been through so much. I've seen so much. I've been attacked so many times. Death threats. I've been sexualized. I've been threatened i've been so many things and i've stood strong every single time and i just try to stand strong for my teammates because i don't want them to see me down and like not be there for them so i just want to always just know like i'm still a human like all this has happened since i won the national championship and i said the other day i haven't had peace since then and it sucks and, but I still wouldn't change. I wouldn't change anything, and I would still sit here and say, like, I'm unapologetically me. I'm going to always leave that mark and be who I am and stand on that. And hopefully the little girls that look up to me, and hopefully I give them some type of inspiration that, you no, know, hopefully it's not this hard and all the things that come at you, but keep being who you are. Keep waking up every day. Keep mo- being motivated. Staying who you are. Staying ten toes. Don't back down. And just be confident. Okay, so... It where, has, where are you going with this? Okay, no, no, I'm just being honest. It hasn't been easy being her. We've seen it. 
really? pe- people attacking her or saying things about her. Well, that's because a lot of people took her under her wing and tried to push their own little agendas yes. because of her argument with Caitlin Clark last it, year it, on it, both sides. Yes. Weirdos. So it hasn't been easy for her. I'm not doubting that. I know it has been. People, more money, more problems. People have attacked her. But I haven't been. To... But here's the part. I have yeah. not had a happy day yeah. since they won the national championship. I haven't been happy since they won the national championship. I think I think she's probably maybe maybe I'm just reading too much into that. She's been she's been terrific. She's had to have had some some really good days. It hadn't been easy being her, but uh, she's also been. I'm sure that would have been greatly. the same speech if they won too. So let's yeah, that would have been it would have been identical. Yeah, I don't know. I don't yeah. know about that. I think she had that one. That one was, oh, in, the that was in the in the chamber. Yeah, if they'd won, <laughs> if they'd won, and she'd shut Caitlin Clark out, it would have been the same. Yeah. Watch this. I'm sticking with the college hoops. I, I feel like uh, the the lack of football has us kind of on a high horse, but I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna stick here, and I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna tiptoe around something here. The game that U of H lost, they lost to Duke. Mm-hmm. The there's there's a very 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 positive fun to watch young man on Duke's team mm-hmm. that also happens to have uh, painted nails and he uh, makes money off the nail painting. Yeah, and I saw the back and forth on the internet. I think DJ Academics got in it and a lot of people got in it. Uh, just talking about how the guy paints his nails and and they're not fans of it and, and basically mocking it. Mm-hmm. That's okay. Because on the other side, I see some people acting like because you're making fun of a dude painting his nails, it's like somehow like homophobic or something like that. Yeah. Some people just dart down with like the nail painting. It might be a generational thing. So like, why does everything always have to be a phobic or an ism these days? I saw, I saw a lot of people making fun of the nail painting. You know what my dad did when I had frosted tips? (laughs) He made fun of my ass. You know what my dad did when I wore a big ass uh, shell necklace or whatever? He made fun of my ass. You know what my dad's dad did when he had long ass hair in the 70s or whatever in high yeah, school? Yeah. He made fun of his ass. Mm-hmm. He didn't sit there and cry that he was homophobic or anything like that. Some people just Toughen don't up. look at the nails is something they would like to do. It ain't that deep. Yeah, sometimes. But sometimes it, they, they create stuff, too. But uh, really. But, yeah, just uh, just toughen up. I will say this, too. Nobody criticized the Hardy Boys for doing it. Nobody said anything about them doing it. Mm-hmm. They're wrestlers. That's what I'm saying, yeah. Yeah, well, they were men's men. So, uh, yeah, some people just don't look right. Some people get clown, man. Yeah. Well, I mean, did anyone? Well, no one criticized mankind for wearing a mask, either. <laughs> I, I know. Yeah, the nail polish though. That's that's it's that's, wild. It, it, it's it's wild. wild to me. I'm sorry. It's not. It's uh, do what you want to do and stuff. It's wild to me. But because back at back mm-hmm. in like my day, mm-hmm. which I think was like two years ago, <laughs> yeah, like it was like a funny scene to see your daughter like your like the the guy with his daughter letting her paint his nails. I, I did that. Yeah, it was like a funny thing, right? Yeah, I did that. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's not that deep, guys. Yeah, Y'all that see deep. the Rock getting roasted for that, by the way. What did the Rock? He was. Do? Yeah, he he, let, he he did exactly that. He let his daughters like put a wig on them yeah. and makeup and all that stuff. I, I, let, I let got roasted daughter, for that. I let my man. daughter okay. do, do both of those things. Okay. It made her happy. Yeah, and the kids was like under five. I didn't take any pictures, but it made her happy. <laughs> and it wasn't last week. It was when she was a little bitty. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know if that was a reward for being volunteer of the day. By the way, yeah. Sarah's husband got volunteer of the day. I that? seen that. How about that? I seen that. He I heard everyone. Me. I heard every other person gets one. No, day. no. What I heard? No. I heard Sarah, it's a fifty-fifty. Sarah and Patrick, studs, studs, <laughs> is what they are. Uh, yeah. Here's my here's my next confession. <clears throat> Brandon Scott has to be sick today. Not literally ill. Brandon Scott. He was here yesterday. And we were talking about the the big basketball game that we were going to watch. And I said, you going to go to the Astros? He goes, well, I don't think so because I want to be able to watch both the – he was planning on going to the Astros. Uh, but he wanted to be – he stayed at home because he wanted to be able to watch both the women's basketball and the Astros and flip. Okay. Dude missed a no-hitter. B. Scott's a loophole. I think he cares. I'm asking. Have you ever seen a no-hitter in person, Brandon? Because if he hasn't, he's got to be sick. Like, you have to, like, I've seen a couple. You said you've seen three. Uh, once you get one, you're like, okay, cool. Kind of a kind of a bucket list kind of thing. If he's, 
As, as good as the basketball game was, he's got to be sick about not being out Minute Maid for a no-hitter. I can't believe Figgy brought the Hardy Boys into the nail What's wrong with that? No, no, the reason I brung it up is, you know, it's cool if your home, I mean, if your homeboy painted his nails or something, you could clown him, but, you know, it, it might not be that same energy with the Hardy Boys. Yeah. Like, they, 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 they kind of fit them. They make it look cool. Maybe. Your homeboy might not make it look cool. Mm-hmm. You might not look cool with the frosted tips. I I probably I didn't. bet Justin Timberlake did. He did. He did. <laughs> I didn't pull it off. Mm-hmm. Um, so I I feel like I found a new appreciation for April Fools, and I think I'm going to put it to practice from now on because I think it allows you slash me to look at the internet the way I think the internet should be looked at. Yep. Not that serious. Uh, everything taken with a grain of salt, healthy amount of skepticism. I did that yesterday, and I kind of realized, you know what? I'm going to treat the internet like April Fools from now on. It ain't that serious. I'm not. not um, people are living are their you lives though? no matter what. I am, hundred percent. All right, we're going to call you on it, hundred percent, man. Yeah, hundred percent. Not. I. I am. Boom! Right there. I think the internet. Uh, I mean, excuse me. I think April Fools, uh, for me, is is productive in one way and one way only. It lets you know who all the morons are. That is a fact here. (laughs) Because if you're making an April Fool's joke, you're a moron. Coming up, let's look at the, uh, let's check in on the status uh, of the big three. Uh, Astros, have they gained momentum? Texans, what the hell are they doing? And the Rockets, uh, they're hanging by a thread next. In the loop.
213-2138 or visit Prevnar20.com. Live from the Twin Peaks studios, Sports Radio 610 presents In the Loop with John Lopez and Landry Locker. All right, so where are we at on the Strohs? Where are we at on the Texans? Where are we at on the Rockets? Hanging by a thread. Let's do approval. Okay. And I think approval is approval kind of... ratings? Yeah, I think it's all subjective. I think it can all change based on expectations, et cetera. But let's just look at the the Astros. We're five games through. It's early. Mm-hmm. Coming off a no-hitter. Beat the Blue Jays. Swept by the Yankees. How are we feeling? We feel like this is like a recharge? Are we... What's a good analogy for what the no-hitter was? I'm trying to think of one. Um, because... I really don't – I still have the same questions about the Astros at large, at the Astros in general. Like, everything we've talked about, you know, since since the the, the season started. Will Frommer be an ace? Will he ever be an ace? Still have that question. What's Verlander going to return and and be like? Still have that question. Is is Joe Espada's aggressiveness a good thing, or is it going to be something that that ends up uh, biting this team? Still have that question. So it was kind of like a, a a salve, a, a bomb. You know, it kind of it kind of stopped the bleeding uh, of what we were talking about at the early of the season. I my opinion on the Astros really hasn't changed that much, except for one thing. You know, Blanco might be a huge part of the first part of the season. You know, with McCullers, and we don't count on him, but still, McCullers out. Luis Garcia, you know, who knows what he's going to end up being. Um, Verlander, as I mentioned, so like. It, the only thing that's changed is I think you got a guy that at the beginning of the season can kind of help carry you, you know, at least a little bit. You think Blanco can carry him? Help carry you. Like, be a part of a, a pretty good rotation, even if Fromber is not an ace. Uh, you know, we'll see what Hunter Brown does, but you got you got a weapon, a real weapon there that can kind of help you. What was the panic, you think, after the Yankee series? I, I, I was not panicked, but I was trying to be very real here. This is not a little thing that's going on. I mean, they... They it, it couldn't have been more embarrassed, couldn't have come to against the worst team. Uh, Fromber was a huge disappointment, huge game for him today. Um, I, I wasn't trying to minimize it by any stretch. If you're minimizing it, uh, then you're kind of ignoring Would you have minimized it if they swept the Yankees, you know, instead of gotten gotten swept? No. You know, so you can't minimize it in this regard. But I think Blanco can kind of help you in this early going. So <laughs> did I answer your question? Where are we? Yeah, you, about it seems the like same. You feel the same. Dude. About the same. Yeah, yeah, you don't seem to. No, I thought it was cool. Obviously, but I'm about, about the, winning a series. I'm about the same. Win a series. About win a series against the Blue Jays, and then you feel good. Yeah, like this is an opportunity. Win a series. One series then at a time. Then you'll feel like okay. That's that's the new in the loop motto. You know who I feel bad for? Enjoying baseball one series at a time. We haven't mentioned this once. I feel Yanni here. No, Tucker. I've, no, I feel bad for Joe Espada. Why? He won his first managerial game, his first game ever. He's one four. Well, but but still, he won his first ever. What's he supposed to do? Well, you're, you're supposed to at least party? acknowledge Dump it. Dump some Gatorade on he's, him? I'll tell you what, he's not getting anything from the game. It's all going to Blanco, <laughs> like the ball. He's getting something. He's got, no, I, I know. he's he Lineup is, card. But maybe the lineup card, yeah. But but he's, uh, although sometimes they give the lineup card to the, to the no-hitter pitcher, too. Like, I feel bad for him. Dude won his first ever game as manager. Nothing. We didn't even mention him. Let's move on. Yeah. Uh, Dusty, you were bringing up Dusty earlier today. What what, yeah, what Dusty gonna, do to you? you? He didn't do anything to me. What's the deal with Dusty? Why is Dusty, Dusty coming up? You're going to hear it again in the internet going all nuts. What's up with Dusty? What are we doing? Dude, he was trending. I'm, I'm trying to see if he still is. Trending nationally and trending in, in, in number one in Houston for a while this morning was Dusty. What for what? What what, what, do, you, what do you think? Not hang out. What Dusty do you think? Being Dusty. No, what did Dusty do? What do you think? Why do you think he was he was trending? Is he going to be in the Hall of Fame? Like did they move him? Did they talk about him being a Hall of Fame? No, what are we doing? That's not it. No, nope, that's not it. Did San Francisco Giants do something? Did he quote? Nope. Did his wine? Nope. Pop. What what's he doing? Nope. What do he do? Uh, he, uh, Yonner Diaz is, is what happened. Managed to catch a no hitter. Got a couple of big hits. We've known this though. We've known that he the told us. bit was a little much. <laughs> oh, he's going to take credit for this. We got to thank why. Dusty for this. Oh Remember yeah. You said that. You'll thank me later. That's right. <laughs> is Dusty creating, still creating yes. disagreements with Astros fans? Yes. <laughs> 
<laughs> what? So anytime something good happens, it's dusty, or if it bad, uh, bad, good. <laughs> Gosh, man, can't let that guy just go chill. No, and I didn't have anything to do. I was just reading the the what was trending. I didn't tweet anything or say anything about him. <laughs> Status checks here on In the Loop Sports Radio 610. So with the Astros, a little bit just meh. Okay. Let's About the see. same. I need a series. Yeah, I'm, we, we need to see more. I know I know it's early. I'm, I'm going to do baseball one series at a time. That's how I'm going to look at it. So you're, you're one game up, mm-hmm. lost the first. One, one series at a time is how I'll look at it. So give me one more dub. I'll feel better. The Texans. We're three weeks and two days away from the draft. Roller coaster first week of free agency. Cap space cleared. No significant pieces added on offense. Now, you, you lost Devin Singletary and you added Joe Mixon, but for the most part, you no. replaced, you, you upgraded at starting running back. Where are we at, man? What, what is our approval of the Texans' offseason? In other words, if I would have told you this was the Texans' offseason up to this point, let's say a month ago, mm-hmm. how would that make you feel? Uh, definitely approval of the move so far. Now, I don't, I can't tell you like I'm over the top and uh, like think you know, hey, you know, book a trip to to the Super Bowl. But definitely, I'm I, I approve big time. But I'm also I think where I am with the Texans right now is is like really intrigued. Like I, I'm very intrigued, uh, curious because I know they're doing something. They you do. They yes. Uh, I could be wrong, but in my heart, I know they've got. What if it's a Nico Collins extension? That that would be very disappointing to me. Not not because of Nico Collins, good for him, but because I feel like you, you. That shouldn't impact you adding talent, right? At this point, right? And and you and you can just run it back and 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 pay a little more next year. I'm just really intrigued. I'm I'm, I'm very curious to see what it is. Nick Casario and D'Amico, especially Nick Casario, they don't do anything without a meticulous plan in place. They did it. They did it for a reason. They're going to do something, and I'm thinking it's going to be pretty significant. But I don't know what that could be. So approval, but curious and intrigued. I'm just hoping they're focused on offense now. Yes. I don't want to beat a dead horse. Could be Simmons. Focus on offense, okay? Give me some weapons, please. I mean, I don't disagree, but it could be. Simmons. And I'm not celebrating a Nico Collins extension. No. I mean, I'm already like Sean. I think Sean's ready to mm-hmm. make a T-shirt. <laughs> you made a T-shirt. Yeah, I'm, I'm wearing. Hey, the, turn around for the YouTube channel. Biggest star on the of the off season. Uh, let man. me explain what's going this on. This is here. the biggest star. I got a customized shirt. I thought biggest it was star of the off season. Figgy, did you see this thing? I did, man. I thought it was a I gift. I walked in with Landry, man. Okay, I, I thought it was a gift, and and I asked him, and he said, "No, nah, I made it." <laughs> So on the front, the turn around for the YouTube, history, for YouTube and Twitch. He's got the Texans logo on the front, uh, and on the back, number twenty-four. Remember, remember number twenty-four. And if you don't, right underneath it, it says leaked model. So you're honoring the leaked model, number twenty-four. Star of the off season. He was. It's pretty sweet, actually. Shout out to him, man. <laughs> it's pretty sweet. The leaked model. <laughs> <laughs> It's about what they've added on offense this year. Mm-hmm. I like mixing, man, but yeah, I, I, I need more, man. Like Nico Collins extension, um, cool. Like I, I, I anticipate him being here no, no matter I'm, what. I'm with you on that. Yeah, yeah. I anticipate that no matter what. Mm-hmm. And I don't even know if it's the right time. Yeah. Like if I'm playing, if I'm playing a casino game and I'm sitting here and I have to slap it on the table and give him an extension, I don't know that I feel. That that's the right move at this point. Right now. No, because yeah. I've got to see what the extension is. If you're going to pay him like he's elite right now, mm-hmm. and the price isn't going to go up much more, and you have control, you have the franchise tag and all that. Yeah. What are we doing? What it, if he what if he goes back and starts getting hurt even more than he has? I mean, he missed he still missed a few games last year. I I, I totally agree. Uh I, I think you can kick the can down the road a little bit and it won't hurt you that much. Yeah, if he has a superb year, well, you know what? You're probably having a terrific year as an organization, and you wouldn't mind paying a little more uh, or tag or whatever. I mean, it makes more sense than the Titus Howard. I'm not saying that. Yeah. But there you go. No, it does. Uh, Rockets, they're two games back for that 10 spot, that play in in the NBA. They got Minnesota tonight. 
Coming off the loss to the Mavericks. Luca, by the way, had a pretty good game. Mm-hmm. Where are we at on the approval rating of the Rockets? Uh, very high. Very, uh, very, high. Uh, very, very high on the Rockets. I don't Rockets. think it could have gone better. I, I got to be honest. Uh, most of this season, I, I, I was kind of under the impression, boy, I bet you Adoka hates this roster. Like, I just didn't feel like any of them were really his guys. Mm-hmm. You know, like guys that he wanted to coach. Uh, the way he's he coached in Boston, the way he likes to, you know, the way he came up, you know, I I, I always thought he he must hate this roster and can't wait to, uh, to start building it, um, you know, you know, better and, and with different players. I think he kind of likes it. I, I think you know, it's, and, and they clearly like him. You know, Jalen Green has has developed like crazy. Uh, Shengun was already uh, up there. Some of the role players, some of the other guys, some of the pieces that he brought in that were his uh, doing. Are, are fantastic, you know. Um, I think he's it, – it couldn't be higher right now for the Rockets. That doesn't mean I feel like they're going to win a championship in two years, but I think they're they're definitely pointing in the right direction. I didn't think he liked the roster. I, you know, he brought in guys that were more his type. Controversy around what you know what he thought, should he bench Jalen Green, all this other stuff. But I think it's it's working. Yeah, I think he's been the perfect hire. I think he's done a perfect job um, of managing both of those guys up and down. We'll see what happens. I mean, you, I, I kind of look at though, like I, I know there's two games out of the playoffs technically, but I still look at the eight seed and the separation from the eight seed. Mm-hmm. Like maybe that's just like the old majority of my life. Yeah. They, they would be five back of the eight seed. The eight were the one that you were counting on a dub. Yeah, that that would be like five games back of mm-hmm. an AC, which is a pretty significant jump. I still look yeah. at it. Yeah, uh, that the, the playing game. My mind is not adjusted from the from the playing game. I think it's one of the very few things that they've done well. I think it keeps people interested. You like it? I don't. I'm not gonna say I love it, but I think they that was a good decision. I mean, look at the Rockets. You know, and it's something, especially for a young I team. Hate the play-in. It was a veteran team that was just scuffling. That's a different Dallas. story. Tanked to get out of it last year, and they mm-hmm. got, I mean, mm-hmm. they got a hell of a player that's helping them out. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. The uh, the status report here on Sports Radio 610. Moral of the story, things are pretty good around here. Yeah. Feeling all right about the Astros, feeling all right about the Texans, and feeling really good about the Rockets. So there you go. Coming up, let's go around the NFL here on In the Loop on Sports Radio 610. A lot of stuff going on. Let's get into it. Area 45 with Bajani and Creighton. I am in love with the back.
Let's go around the NFL to keep you in the loop. This is Houston's Sports Leader, Sports Radio 610. All right, let's go around the league. Three weeks, two days from the NFL draft. Might be three and three, though, uh, if you're a Texans fan. Might have to sit back and watch that first round. Who knows? Once upon a time ago, there was a football team in Houston. They were called the Houston Oilers. Mm -hmm. They left. They went to Tennessee. Around that same time, there was a football team in Cleveland. They left. They went to Baltimore. They're back. Houston has football back. And my goodness, politicians pandering when it comes to sports has hit an all-time low. Has this, it? This is, <laughs> this is Cleveland Councilman yeah. Brian Casey. So Brian Casey threw a press conference, and he basically had an announcement to make. Mm -hmm. Here was Brian Casey's announcement. This basically does, ladies and gentlemen, is ensures that the Cleveland Browns have to go through the legal process of leaving the city of Cleveland. Whether they want to move the team to Timbuktu or whether they want to move them to Brook Park or to Lakewood or to any other state, um, they have to uh, go before Cleveland City Council, ask for permission to leave that team or to move the team, or they have to put the, give us six months notice and offer to put the team up for sale. We're hoping that the latter does not happen. However, this is going to ensure sure that, that the Cleveland Browns are going to be a part of the legislative process. These are the Cleveland Browns, and, and I stand by the Cleveland Browns. And a lot of people who are involved in the negotiations right now were either too young or weren't even involved or, or remember when the Browns left the first time. And the heartfelt that um, this city went through. We want to assure that the, the the Cleveland Browns remain the Cleveland Browns. This is a Cleveland team. It's not a another city team. Um, so that's that's me where I stand with it. It was already a law, dude. <laughs> like it literally, it's literally already a law. Well, here's the the weirdest part. Is there like rumors about anything happening, or is he just uh, grandstanding? I think he's just grandstanding, right? <laughs> like. Figure you got some people in uh, in yeah, Cleveland. Yeah, it's What's so going stupid. On? So uh, the Browns ain't moving out the state or anything like that. Yeah, it was rumors that I guess a new stadium could be like in the suburb of Cleveland, right. which is Brook Park, which he named. Yeah, yeah. What's wrong with that? So yeah, what? It's it's, still it's a bunch of teams that don't play in the actual city the that play, play on the Arlington. The doggone Giants and the Jets play in New Jersey. In New Jersey. Like, yeah. this is just grandstanding. And it's not that far from grandstanding. Cle Brook Park is where you fly in to Cleveland. That's where the airport is. Okay. Yeah. To, to compare that, the same is embarrassing. It's yeah. stupid. Uh, look, I'm, I'm reading some of the comments on 92.3 The Fan. Um, <laughs> comparing the team moving to Baltimore to a potential move 15 minutes away within the same county is quite the reach. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they'll still be the it's, Cleveland it's Browns. Stupid. Where, Bur the, where do the Cowboys play? Someone says, build a dome. <laughs> <laughs> Like, it is not that big of a deal to keep the stadium in the city of Cleveland. There's no. a dome movement going on in Cleveland, I'm noticing. Good. They're, they it is. They want a dome mm -hmm. uh, in Cleveland, which, by the way, that would be a hell of a move by them. Very smart. I, I have a prediction about our friend uh, Brian Casey, not our friend. He's going to be running for something, either like Cleveland 
mayor but or governor. You know what this is the equivalent of, and I hate bringing this up all the time. I know this is, I, I, I feel like you've rubbed off on me on here, or actually, I just actually have common sense. Mm -hmm. This is kind of like the weasel trying to keep the Astrodome up. Oh yeah, the guy and acting like acting like you're turning your back is. on the Oilers if yeah. you if you don't if you want to tear down something that gets in the way that is dated and yeah. makes the city look bad and kind of yeah. takes away from the actual relevant experiences. That's what this is. He yeah. wants to keep the stadium where it's at right now. Who cares? Nobody cares. Exactly. Nobody cares. Yeah, who cares? Yeah, you want and still building the dome. And but plus, it's hard because it's on the other side of a lake, so you can't even bring traffic in from multiple areas of where the stadium is right now, right? And there's way too much money to put a dome on that. Yeah. Yeah, it was like it's, it's exactly so like that. That, that dude from Clear he want to keep the Astro Dome up. Yeah, that was he, exactly he made it a he Texas is. historical monument. Okay, you ruined it for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> that dude ruined it for everyone. I saw the Irwin Center's getting torn down, and someone said, "What's your favorite memory?" And I'm like, "Oh wow, they just don't leave those things up." <laughs> <laughs> uh, a Yes concert in about 1983 at, at the, the 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 drum they used to call it. Do they still call it the drum? Uh, oh, that was your favorite event? Yeah, at Irwin Center. Okay. Uh, that was memorable. And they need to leave it up then. Man. That, that was memorable. And Mine was the uh, state championship, Chris Bosch versus Kendrick Perkins. Well, that's a good one. Yeah. Yes. Sports-wise, probably those – you know me, I, I, I was kind of uh, unloyal to, to the Aggies back then. I liked those TJ4 teams. Uh, did they play in the drum? They did, right? Yeah, yeah, they played the drum. Sure, they were at the Irwin Center. Yeah, uh, those were those were probably some of mine. It was always the high school state championship, though, basketball. Oh, what am I thinking? Where you go watch all of them. That's yeah, it. Come on, bro. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, what are you saying? I was thinking college. Yeah, nah, it's always the high. You, you go watch oh, all that, four. That's first through yeah, fifth. Yeah, you get yeah, the ticket that. and you go sit down. Yeah. You're watching. You're because that was when it was yeah. really easy to follow. You're watching the two A, then the three A, then the four A, then the five A. Man, yeah. that was sick. I loved that. That was nasty. Man. Uh, I absolutely loved that. That I've probably been to about four or five of those. Yeah, those are the best. That? Uh, I, I used to go to that pretty regularly. Yeah, Not every badass. year, maybe a couple of years. I went, in, I went in, twice to consecutive. I probably went about four Man, or five. Was, of and I, I was so regretful because whenever I saw I, I saw um, T.J. Ford win there in high school with uh, Daniel Ewing yeah. and uh, iMac and yeah, and, and then I saw my guy Taylor. Nick Wise win it with King. No, they it was the year they lost it with Kingwood uh, there. Now that that's that's my top five because my pops used to take me to the state championships at Texas Stadium, which by the way, Cowboys. They tore it down. Yeah, that freeway is like it's. You, it's you amazing. Isn't it? yeah. other, <laughs> you, you can literally. It's. I think a bridge goes over it now, yeah. and you know, people still it's remember. Amazing. Yeah, Emmett Smith, Troy Aikman, and uh, Michael Irvin still yeah. remembered. Yeah, uh, they, they. People still know who they are. Who? <laughs> <laughs> who are you talking about? <laughs> I but, lost my memory yeah, man, because I, they tore it down. I used to go to those state championships, like when they were at Texas Stadium. And that, but the basketball, sick. that was sick. Yeah, that, I that was a lot Art of Bryle, Stephenville back then. I watched. I watched everybody. Fox Tech High School out of San Antonio with Fennis Dembo play there. Fennis Dembo was a was a March Madness uh, icon like uh, DJ Burns. He carried Wyoming. I want to say to like the Elite Eight or something. Yeah. Damn, how you end up in Wyoming from here? Man? That was the only one that recruited him. Damn. Yeah. How'd they find him? Fennis and his sister Fennice. Fennis and Fennice Dembo. Are you sure it's not Finesse? Nope. I, trust me, I followed his career. <laughs> uh, R.I.P. Vontae Davis, uh, the 35-year-old uh, two-time Pro Bowl cornerback, was uh, found in a home. By the way, registered to his grandma. He was found in a home, registered to his grandma. No foul play was detected. Real nice house. That, that's what they say. Yeah. Uh, but this was him when he got cut at Hard Knocks. This is... Some people might have looked at this a different way. I looked at this as endearing. I looked at this as, like, real authentic. And it, and it looks even better because after he got traded from the Dolphins, he ended up being really good with the Colts. Big part of their success. Yeah. This was uh, the great uh, Vontae Davis uh, back in the Hard Knocks days. Uh, we just traded you. Okay? We traded you to the Indianapolis Colts. All right? So... Um, you okay? No, I'm gonna call my grandmother. You call your grandmother? Okay. This hasn't this hasn't hit the papers or anything no, like that. Okay. Well, what we just do? Why don't we do a little business first? Okay. Before you call grandma. Okay. I mentioned that. By the way, this hat broke during our show yesterday, and it made me hate. It made me hate April Fool's Day even more. 
Because I had to like double and triple check. Yeah. Yeah. I was doubling it. Were you doing that, Figgy? Yeah. Yeah. And and then I realized that it was real. Um, and, and that, the video is amazing. Now, the audio is great. Yeah. It's touching. And it's even more touching now. Yeah, because it's like, you know, the first thing you're thinking about is calling your grandma. And some people looked at it as, you know, he wants to call his grandma and... Not like I think he wants to comfort his grandma or let her know. Grandma, I just got traded. This is the situation, all that. And he's and hurting then, and he wants yeah. to hear his grandma's voice. And that house was registered to his grandma and is a real nice crib. Yeah. So it's even better. Yeah. Shout yeah, it's very, Monte. very, very sad. Rest in peace, baby. And uh, we also heard uh, how, he, how he left the game. Yeah. <laughs> how he left Second the game. game of the season or whatever yeah. it was. <laughs> Nah, man. With McCoy and them. I'm done, young boy. <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't know for a while that he was Vernon Davis's brother. Yeah, I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. Man, this is that's rough, man. Yeah, that's rough. Uh, the Kansas City Chiefs going around the NFL. They signed Carson Wentz to a one-year deal. Mm-hmm. How about that? Why not? Back up. Get yourself for another ring. <laughs> oh, he do got a doggone ring. Where yeah. did he get I a ring? Didn't he get a that. ring with, the, with the Phillies? Oh, with, the, with the Eagles? Oh, God. Yeah, yeah. I forgot about that. Uh, he Nick, was MVP, though, yeah. up to the up yeah. till he got hurt. Yeah. Get yourself Nick another Foles. ring. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Took over. I yeah. forgot. I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't the MVP running. I was thinking, damn. Yeah. Damn, sure did. <laughs> he did. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Rasheed Rice's attorney has uh, spoken uh, after the uh, the accident. No, no one... Uh, Seriously injured, but two cars registered to Rice, muscle cars going over 100 miles an hour, uh, created an accident uh, in Dallas. He went to SMU, so he was out there. Uh, there's videos of what looks like to be him and a couple of his friends leaving the looks scene like with him. bags. <laughs> looks <Yeah>. like him. <laughs> yeah, I would say. By the way, Maybe you, he was you, running late to something. You have one statement. I have the first statement he released. Okay, what was the first statement the attorney released? Whew. <laughs> Whew. Dodged a bullet. <laughs> that was the first statement. And then he got a little more refined. <laughs> Thank God you came to me. <laughs> Woo. That was his first statement. Woo. Baby. Man. Woo. On behalf of uh, Mr. Rice, his thoughts are with everyone impacted by the automobile accident on Saturday. He will be cooperating with local authorities and will take all necessary steps to address this situation responsibly. Close quote. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah. Thoughts? I'm glad no one was hurt, man. I hope the young man learns from it. I mean, mm-hmm. that's that's the reality of the situation. The, the, a lot worse things could have happened. Uh, I hope the young man learns from it. That's it. Like, it, it you know, your, your life flashes uh, in front of your eyes. Not everyone's as fortunate as him. Um, I get what could have happened. I get what, you know. But yeah. the fact that no one was hurt and he's going to – have a long life to live and a long career. Wish nothing but the best for the young man. To be honest with you, mm-hmm. that's it. And, and I, as I as I would say, the if I'm a Chiefs fan, you 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 feel everything that you just uh, talked about. Relief, no one was hurt. You know that everybody's okay. That you know this is not going to be. But you're also sort of glad that he handled it professionally, like a professional athlete should it, it may not be right it may be deceitful but he left the scene left his cars went and 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 just got away presumably got rid of some things that he had in those yeah. bags but presumably and this is me presuming it uh sobered up presumably possibly, possibly and then go goes to the police the next yeah. day and says i'm good yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. This is look, awful. I'm going to learn from it. Look, I mean, sometimes consequences, uh, yeah. you know, like you, you, the the cons- there's there's multiple ways, like areas of consequences. There's like mm-hmm. consequences based on how you take it. Like if if, if, yeah. if he's going to learn from it the right way, he's probably being as hard on himself that, um, man, like almost as if he did something bad did happen. Well, what you hope is that right? he, yes. What so you, you react based on, like, hopefully you don't react based on, well, I got away with this and I'm going to go back to it. But you react based on, man, like, almost as the same way you would if you got a second chance if something had happened. Look, he, he might make some really, really bad decisions still, but the hope is that he got scared straight. You know, that he's like, I am never doing that again. Yeah. You know? That's the hope. Yeah. And that's the opportunity he has. Unfortunately, he doesn't have to do it at the uh, at the cost of something much bigger. So, yeah. 
We'll see what happens there. His teammate, I'm actually more disappointed in his teammate right now, to be honest with you. Um, friend of the show, Justin Reed. So Justin Reed put out a fake retirement yesterday on April Fool's. Yeah. Uh, I got to tell you, man. Yeah. I was legitimately disappointed in him for I was. being this weird. Yeah, I was. I'm not even going to read the retirement. It was like basically what you would say when someone retires. I'm, I I was very disappointed in him for doing that. Yeah, uh, we said it in real time as we we're watching these silly April Fool's uh, tweets coming down. I'm like, it, 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 it's almost like a Darwinian kind of thing. It it, it kind of, you know, t- it shows you who the morons are. Uh, natural selection, if you will, on 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 April's Fool's Day. Like you look at you look at Justin Reed just differently now because he's one of those guys that posts silly April Fool's jokes that everybody can see through. Yeah, and I gotta wonder it was was the Seven Eleven hot dog water a real thing or not? I don't know. That's, you had to go there to find out. That's something we're gonna need to fall. fall no, I'm never going there again if it is if it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm never going there again if going it isn't. there if you don't see it. Then that's your answer. Yeah. Are you looking it up? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> the hot dog seltzer. Hot dog seltzer. Yeah, that was the word on the streets. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hassan Reddick just got traded to the Jets. He's kind of feeling himself. He's kind of feeling the Jets. Here was what Hassan Reddick had to say about his new squad. I love it. You know, you got dogs at each level on the defense, literally. Inside, interior guys like Quentin, Ken Law, even on the outside, Jermaine, Will, you know, JFM. You you look at the inside linebackers. You got C.J. Mosley, Quincy, like those two guys are just dogs themselves. And then even, you know, for DB, Sauce, his name speaks for himself, you know, and then even seeing like DJ Reed and what he's done over the last couple years and, you know, the name that he's making for himself. I'm just, I'm happy to be around a group of guys like this, a, a talented roster such as this one. Um, It's going to be fun, man. I don't think anybody's ready for what's about to happen, but it's going to be fun and it's going to be fun to watch as well. You're not ready for it, Landry. I was going to bring this up, uh, internet going nuts, but let me ask you right now. Are the Jets a contender? No. Figgy? A contender for what? A Super Bowl or just to make a run? Maybe the, uh, make a run at no. the Super Bowl. Quarterback's forty plus years old, coming off a of torn Achilles. Yeah, I think they'd be flirting with the playoffs, but yeah, they're definitely a playoff contender. But they have yeah. the Bills and they have the Dolphins. Yeah. yeah, I don't see them getting past that. They got a good defense, but I mean, what is Aaron Rodgers? Forty plus. No, it, I, I he get wasn't it. that good last time we saw him. No, uh, I understand, but boy, when you have they a defense a good like backup that, quarterback, man, how good does he have to be? Man, they're they're just si- they're just sign- signing everyone now. Yeah, they're acting like the Eagles that dream team thing at this point. Mm-hmm. I have to side with you guys. I I, I just can't buy in, buy in just yet. They I do got, have the t- tenth pick in the draft too, though. They have that. Some people take, thinking they might take quarterback. Quarterback? Mm-hmm. I've seen Bowers. I've seen Bowers too. I've heard O line. Mm-hmm. But then they sign Tyron Smith, which, by the way, I mean, he gets hurt all the time. Yeah, he's good. No, he's good when he's healthy, but that stop you from drafting an O-lineman? Mm-hmm. Seems a little wild to me. Uh, Derrick Henry, he was on the pivot. He had an interesting tale about Nick Saban. I this, guess this Nick Saban great. didn't really uh, <laughs> like the, uh, I guess the, uh, let, let's let Derrick Henry tell it. Yeah. We was in the meetings. We were in the meeting one day after the game, forgot who he played. He pulled up film. He's showing everybody. Then he, he to my aunt, you guys, you stop doing all that showboating, doing all that uh, praying hands and acting like you're thanking God. And then later on that night, 12 o'clock, you're down there, got black and mouths, got liquor, you're chasing. He was like, he's like well, get all that. <laughs> we're getting another land because he was right. Like, you do your praying hands, you get on one knee. Then 12 o'clock, 12 o'clock comes, you're down there smoking black and mouths on the corner. <laughs> Drinking liquors, Jackson, Jackson girls. There might be something to that. <laughs> there might be something to According to Nick Saban, there was. You're up there crossing yourself and pointing to God and then getting plastered on, what do you say, some black and milds? <laughs> there might be something to that. Uh, you know, it happens. Sometimes mm-hmm. it just be like that. Mm-hmm. It's around the league here on In the Loose Sports Radio 610. Coming up, C.J. Stroud didn't do a damn thing, and he had the internet going nuts. What gives next? 
Rain and Pendergast. The biggest need is cornerback. The one that I'm actually more concerned about would be in finding a third receiver. Just because I think there's plenty of good cornerbacks out there in free agency already. We don't know for sure whether we're going to have a competent slot receiver there starting in week one. Wake up with Sean and Seth, 6 to 10 every morning on Sports Radio 610. Hey, baseball fans, go yard with BetMGM, the king of sports books. All season long, we're offering top odds on your favorite home.
got the internet going nuts. All right, internet going nuts here on In the Loop on Sports Radio 610. Landry Locker, John Lopez, Figgy Fig with you. Stuff that broke the internet. C.J. Stroud didn't do a dang thing. All that happened was our guy, Morocco T, crazy dude, Mm -hmm. uh, with the Titans. He has a fan podcast. Must be a slow news day. Yeah, maybe. (laughs) Because this was what the popular topic was on Twitter. This was uh, the Titans Coliseum podcast. This was uh, Morocco T's, actually his... uh, his co-host, uh, with a very impressive beard, by the way, his bald dude. He's got like a freaking insane beard. Uh, he was talking about Dak Prescott. Look at this beard. Let me see. I didn't. I just heard the audio. Oh, that's big time, Leonard. Uh, Leonard yeah. Firestone. Yeah. Uh, and he said this, and it had people rush into the defense of C.J. Stroud. There's a sophomore slump. There's all these other things. We know how you want to play. We got film. They're going to start scheming out. Defense is going to know how you're going to want to do stuff from an offensive coordinator standpoint now. So, yeah, you had a good first year, but so did Dak. They won the most games in Cowboys franchise history their first year. What have they done since? It's, it, it's you can't <laughs> sit here and crown somebody after one year and think it's going to be good. You can't. Because this next year, we're, we're defenses are going to come for you. Right. You know how I feel about this. It's it's actually kind of like encouraging in a way because that's all you got, man. Sophomore slump. That That's what you're hanging your hat on? You don't believe in the sophomore slump? No, I, I think it happens sometimes. But, you know, we've talked about, like, how many players that have had that kind of year, like, like C.J. Stroud have, have really fallen back down to earth. Because even Dak, had, he had a great year, but he had Jason Witten. He had Zeke. You're rushing for 1,600 yards. He had Dez, and he had a really good year. C.J. Stroud's doing the exact opposite. He had rookie tank, uh, always hurt Nico, uh, who knows Dalton Schultz, and Damian Pierce. Yeah. And, and and ended up having that kind of year. Yeah. I mean, you just give me the reason why. I, I would say offensive weaponry, perhaps, you come down to earth. Who knows? But, yeah, that's just – the, the concept is right. Like, you can't guarantee the best is yet to come in the NFL. The the comparison between him and Dak, a little, little different. Yeah. I, 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 got, I got the internet going nuts. People never forget, man. People never forget. Uh, it's not trending right now, but this morning it was uh, on the national uh, uh, trending list and number one in Houston. Just one word. Dusty. <laughs> so... In the wake of uh, yeah, uh, cool. Bruno Blanco's uh, no hitter, and Yonder Diaz, by the way, having two home runs and catching the no hitter, Dusty Baker was trending. He had okay, the internet it going. Nice. Well, it was a Twitter X, whatever you want to call it. Uh, that that's incredible to me. Like I didn't even think about that until I saw it trending. I'm like, yeah, people don't forget. People, that, you know, what would Maldonado have done? I, 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 I got the internet going nuts. Lopez thinks he can cook. It was uh, trending on the internet on uh, on Easter. John Lopez well, getting up at 3 a.m. I don't think I can cook. By the way, I actually think that tweet was timed. I don't think that was live. <laughs> Did you see my eyes on my hair? Yeah. I just rolled out of bed. I don't know. I kind of feel like that was timed. I yeah, feel like you no, did that today. You're, you're wrong. But uh, you're, John you're Lopez wrong. cooking. I'm Middle bringing this up. Yeah. You, you tagged me and Figgy on the internet. Mm-hmm. Here's my question to you, and I want you to be completely honest. Yeah. How much money did you spend on food? On the meat alone, well, one of the racks of dino ribs was $104, and the other rack was 96 and that's not counting all the chicken and the sausage. And I, I was given a pork, lo- uh, a venison loin. Um, so I'm guessing probably 300 bucks, maybe a little more. There's nothing wrong with that. That's 30 people we were feeding. I mean, obviously, I'd rather not, but that's about right. Three hundred bucks on the meat. Yeah, what about the si- we're going to size. Did y'all have? Uh, well, we had pea salad, of course. <laughs> I mean, that's a given. Can't of win course. them all. Yeah, of course. Can't win them all. <laughs> really, Wouldn't be Easter without it. Uh, really, really good potato salad. I, I made the beans too. I made the, all the meat and the beans. Um, then we had all kinds of salads. We had uh, oh, salads. Huh? Really good. Uh, what is this? Was this meal sponsored by uh, early LeBron on the Cavs? Uh, no. LeBron really, with no help? Really good corn. <laughs> the meat was LeBron. <laughs> it was 
Really good corn casserole. Oh, I renewable corn casserole. <laughs> <laughs> really good corn casserole. Oh, Damon Jones corn casserole. Squash okay. casserole. Oh wow, Mo Williams. Yeah, okay, yeah Mo, Mo Williams some casserole. Wally Zerbiak. Uh, what else did we have? Oh, real, real good desserts. Had some uh, banana pudding and Tyrone Hills. Uh, <laughs> Man, the ribs turned out good. I'm going to bring some tomorrow. I made a sandwich yesterday. I'll bring it tomorrow. Don't do it to me. Yeah. Keep it away from me. It was delicious. The bark on it was just yeah. perfect. Keep it away from me. Nice and fat. I'm on a cleanse. Uh, it, was, it was really good. I'm on a cleanse, sir. And you had stew. Yeah. Yeah. It looked good. It started yesterday. Yeah, it looked good. Did you bring some home? Uh, there's a little bit, yeah. Yeah. Just a little. I, 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 got, I got the internet going nuts. So the Astros play the Rangers. Pea soup. Seven pea salad. Even worse. It's much better. Uh, the Astros play the Rangers seven times in the next, uh, what, 10 days, 11 days, something like that. They caught a break. I mean, you don't want to see this happen, but but they caught a break. Uh, and shout out to Bruce Bochy for actually telling us what the injury was that Josh Jung uh, sustained. He broke his, was it his wrist? Broke his wrist. So that's, that's a little bit of a break for... For the Astros. Okay. Seven games against the Astros in the next 11 days. Okay. Yeah. A little bit of a break there. There you go. Yeah. I, 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 got, I got the internet going nuts. Uh, so we have rules in the uh, Mike Tyson, Jake Paul boxing match. I, I, lay what them out. You, what do you make yeah. of these rules? I was going to ask you that. Lay so them out. these are the rules. Uh, now, I feared the worst. I feared that they might be even softer than this, but, th- but these are the rules. Mm-hmm. Have you heard these yet, Figgy? I, yeah, I did. So they're going with 16-ounce gloves. Typically, gloves are 10 ounces. Yeah. So 16-ounce gloves. They can go down to eight. Yeah. Uh, Two-minute rounds instead of three. No official judges. No winner unless there's a knockout. Mm-hmm. And each fighter must pass an EEG and EKG test, which I'm assuming uh, head just wellness, and heart. all that. Yeah. 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 Okay. That's cool, man. Like, that's not – it's not like we're talking about, you know – can't hit him as hard as it. Like, yeah, I thought seems, it was going to be no KOs. Yeah. Do you, that, that, that's kind of what I was going to ask you. Do you feel like this is going to lend credence to that this is a real fight thing? Well, I don't know. I don't know if it's a real fight. I, I just. I think I, I think. I mean, that's, I think it's okay. 16-ounce gloves and two-minute rounds means they're actually going to be moving around. You know, what they're is, actually going to be for for just a simple price? Because I don't, I know that you'll you'll put your all right, for, if if the price were five thousand mm-hmm. dollars, five thousand, yeah. What is the least amount of ounce that you would let Mike Tyson punch you in the face? Five thousand bucks in the face in the face. Five thousand bucks. You get eight hundred, eight hundred ounces. <laughs> <laughs> if he can lift it and swing at me, I'll take it. I'll take that punch. <laughs> Well, this is an auction, so you're gonna you're out of it. Figgy, we go seven ninety nine. I can't. Yeah, yeah. Seven ninety nine is yeah. Seven ninety nine. I would yeah. I would do that. Yeah. Will you yeah. go two hundred? Two hundred ounces. This, yes. Okay, so you'll go two hundred ounces. Okay. That's all. Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. No, no. Two hundred ounces. That's is, twenty boxing gloves. That's only twelve and a half pounds. But that's twenty boxing gloves. If he could get twelve and a half pounds to you, but there's gonna be padding. You're dead. But there's going to be padding. But it's heavy. Whereas I said 800 ounces, and that's 50 pounds. He ain't going to hit you hard with so 50 So Vicky's going 200 ounces. Uh, that's not, the lowest I go. I'm not going under 500 ounces. I'll go down to I'll go down to 175. <laughs> Do I hear 174? No. Okay. I'm out. So you're going to let Mike Tyson punch you with an 11-pound glove? Yes. I think he would kill you. He might. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a lot of padding. It's a lot of padding. 16 ounces are what they train with. You know, they're a little heavier yeah. bulk. You've seen them. So we're going 175. Yeah. yeah. 10.9 pound glove. How big are those big ones when you used to have those? The big, soccer bop? Yeah, I mean the boppers? This, you, remember, you remember when you used to have that? The uh, plastic kind of looking ones? No, 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 no. no like, remember, they're oversized. Like, they had it in a uh, blank check. You ever oh, seen those, the movie Blank Check? Those. I don't know how Back much those day, would weigh. Yeah, yeah. those big ass They're guys? like real big. How big are those? I don't know if they're that heavy. They're probably light because they're not real. But like a real 11-pound Would glove, you let him hit you with one of those? For 5K? For 5K? Yeah, I don't think he could hurt For me. the big, like, blank yeah, check the, the, ones. The big ones, yeah. Oof. Yeah. Man. I'd let him hit me with that before an 11-pound glove. 
Yeah, I might just be talking out of my ass here if we're being honest. Somebody in Laporte says he can bare knuckle punch me for five thousand. Uh, hey. No, you might be dead for real. <laughs> yeah. Hey, shout out to you, my friend. Shout out to it you. It was nice knowing you, man. Uh, I don't know about that. Much respect. Hope you got insurance. I, 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 got, I got the internet going nuts. All right, this is confusing to me. It's going nuts right now. It's all over. I'm sure you've seen it already. Figure you've seen it. All this. So Adolis Garcia got his shirt kind of ripped apart when he was he got hit by a pitch uh, yesterday, and he's walking and talking uh, some noise to the pitcher, and and he's like really bulked up. I mean, obviously, but like you could see, you know, with his shirt open a little bit, and Adolis Garcia steroids. Is is trending? Okay, dude's been yoked up for. I mean, he's been like jacked for a while. What? What? Like people are like we need to have a discussion about him, dude. Then have a discussion dude, about. He looks the exact same. Yeah, dude. Have a discussion about everyone. Then he's just a big monster of a man. Is he taking something? Maybe. Probably. Oh wow. No, they all are. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm not saying steroids. No, they all are. Hey, wow. shut up, man. Most I don't need them coming looking over here, man. <laughs> That's what I'm wow, saying. Man. That's kind of my point, Figgy. Like, do you want people to start digging into drug testing and, and, and that's beyond? Yeah. How many shows are on steroids there, then? Tell me. Uh, I don't know. Give me some a names. A lot of them. Yeah, give me a name. I think a lot of them are taking something. Give me a name. I'll leave it at that. I think a lot <laughs> of them are taking something. Do you disagree? I think they're a clean ball club. <laughs> Lying I think they're a clean ball club. Man. Look at this picture. This is the one that made it all go crazy. Okay, he's a monster, and yeah. he's probably taking some supplements. I think they're clean. And they, they may not all pass uh, uh, tests, but name a team that doesn't. Are the Astros the only team that doesn't take uh, performance-enhancing supplements? At maybe the not the A's. Because <laughs> they stink. <laughs> yeah, maybe not the A's. All right. I, 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 got, I got the internet going nuts. So the Kelsey brothers had Saquon on, and all of a sudden they started getting into a discussion about a competition that they may be having sooner rather than later. Drinking contest. Who's winning? At a drinking contest? I'm pretty sure I've beaten Jason the last three to five times. He's on a This is off. completely made up. Who's calling quits? Yeah, I can definitely drink more volume. I don't even think that's a question. What? Yeah. You're already down to 260. 283 this morning. Still, we're in the same weight <laughs> class now. You don't have the heart that I do when it comes to drinking. What? You've been drinking more than I have recently. He hasn't stayed out past 10 p.m. since 2017. Do you not see me at your playoff games? Do you remember any of that? I, But no, because I was drinking all day. <laughs> I think drinking games, I will destroy him because I got the mental advantage. What? You're not beating me in Pong. <laughs> beer Pong, I'm not beating you in, for sure. If you got a but. shotgun a beer, who's winning? I'm smoking him. Well, the last time we shotgun one, Travis cheated. He threw it down before it was entered. What game was that? Was it Bills? We didn't shotgun a beer after the Bills game, did we? See, this is... I don't remember much at the end of the Bills. I knew you didn't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I was at the big tree in all game. <laughs> yeah. All right. The, the answer is Jason Kelsey wins all of them. I think he wins all Does of them. Does he? Yeah. Big old offensive lineman. I mean, I know they both drink heavily, but we already see that Travis Kelsey. I mean, uh, he might pass out. What does he mean the big tree in? Was he was he on that? Was he smoking? Oh, maybe. He said he was at the big tree in. Yeah. Is this legal in Philly? Right. I don't know. I know it's legal in New York. Mm Mm-hmm. Bills. They were in Buffalo. Okay. Now he acknowledged that Travis would beat him in, in Pong. Yeah. So I'll give him that. But like all the other drinking games, Jason. But beer pong is not a sign of a drinker. The best, no, the, no. The, the best beer pong players are the ones that aren't drinkers. Uh, or you're avoiding drinking. Or they they take fart- like you're literally playing <laughs> to avoid drinking. Yes. Now when when I used to play, like I'm drinking while I'm doing. It. Yeah, yeah. Matter yeah. of fact, I, I I made a rule. Hey, I'm gonna drink, and when I make the cup, let me have the drink. <laughs> what kind of drinking game punishes you? Like your reward is don't drink. Yeah. That's weird. Yeah. You know who's probably good at beer pong? People who don't drink. Uh, show is amazingly uh, intense. Oh, yeah. He had like a pong table, right? Yeah. 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 yeah but he had one in his car. In his car. You're avoiding yeah. drinking, though. Yeah. What are you doing? Exactly. That's the whole idea is to not drink. <laughs> Pull up on you with the pong table. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I need to see. Here we go. Here we go. He was good, though, right? Excellent. Uh, you know, a little flashy. 
you know, a little cocky. But he's good, so why not? Who was his partner? Was he yelling at him? This was at my house, right? Yeah, I don't remember who his partner was. Yeah. Was it Bajani? Yeah, I think it was. Oh, wow. Yeah, I think it was Bajani. Oh, he was at the crib? Mm-hmm. Okay. He stayed there a while, didn't he? Oh, I think, I think he stayed till two. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Did you speak to him? I, I, I think I did, man. <laughs> yeah, look at the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at the time. <laughs> Coming up. So, the biggest form of heartbreak that has been suffered locally, is there a case to be made that perhaps it's actually a blessing? I will try to explain this, and I, and I emphasize try next.
Sports Radio 610 presents In the Loop with John Lopez and Landry Did Adam Spillane warn us that the uh, no-hitter yesterday was coming? That Ronel Blanco was going to be on his game? Some were dismissive of him. Mm -hmm. Guy sitting across from me. And the guy sitting across from me. I said, wow. Well, let's hear how you said, wow. Here was Adam Spillane with John Lopez hiking the leg on the possibility that Ron L. Blanco might have something. They were really pleased with what Hunter Brown did this spring. Hunter mm -hmm. Brown had a really good spring. Ronel Blanco had a really good spring also. So I don't think the rotation Brown, is. Hunter Brown, Blanco. The, the problem is I don't think the rotation wow. rotation isn't great mm -hmm. right now. But there you go. I think that it might maybe a little bit better than we think. That was the most dismissive wow <laughs> in the a, history of wow. It was wows. like a wow. We might have no, a rotation. It was not. Say that again. How you did it? Wow. We might have a rotation. No. <laughs> wow. Rotation isn't great mm -hmm. right now. The rotation wow. rotation uh, isn't. That, that, that's like it was a wow. We might have a good rotation. It wasn't wow. The rotation. Wow. Is, wow. <laughs> the Ronald, rotation. Wow. Ronel Blanco, huh? That's how we're hanging our head our, our head on. The rotation. Wow. <laughs> it happened though that's why baseball spo is the is the best uh you'll hear from him tomorrow at uh 10 35 our guy baseball spo uh as the astros looking to win two straight and we'll, and we'll see how that goes i, I want to throw a hypothetical your yours and figgy's way okay all right so i'm going to give you two options okay does it have to do with getting hit by mike tyson it does not okay but these are two options when it comes to sports fan, mm -hmm. I think we can both agree that right now, if someone held a gun to your head for the next two UConn games, and they said, "Will you got UConn win or lose?" I think, uh, will, "Will UConn win?" I think we would all answer yes without any hesitation. Correct? Yes. Like, and you would feel you feel pretty good. Like you probably, you'd probably feel like you're gonna live, right? Very good. Yes. Yeah. No matter what, right? They're they're yes. good. They're they're amazing. Like look at their look at their dude. They're look at their games. They, <laughs> I go back to what I said earlier. A thirty to nothing run. Ninety one fifty two in the elite eight. That's round one. Round two, seventy five fifty eight. Mm -hmm. They wasn't that close. Eighty two to fifty two, and then seventy seven to fifty two. Yeah. So I'm going to give you guys the benefit of hindsight, and I'm going to ask you this. Mm -hmm. You're U of H Cougar fans, okay? Hell of a run. Yeah. And let's say you're common folk. You don't have John Lopez money, so you're common folk. God. And you can either have a scenario where, again, we've acknowledged that UConn's the strong favorite. Mm -hmm. You can have a scenario where your season ends – and you can hypothetically have an excuse for why you didn't win the championship, like Shed going down. Yeah. Or you can go to the Final Four mm -hmm. and get just completely skull drugged by UConn. Let's say it's you're the gonna, same. You're going to get skull drugged. In this, wor in this world, it's yeah. going to happen. Yeah. So no matter what happens, when you with the, the, your, your season either ends the way that it did against Duke, where you can say, all right, if we would have had Shed, we might have had a chance. Or... You play UConn, and they beat your ass the way that they've been beating everyone else's with, ass. With Shed. With Shed. Yeah. Which one would you rather have? Which which end of the season would you rather have? See, I. it's interesting that, like, you're saying, like, with Shed, you go to UConn, and yes. you lose by 25-30. Yes. I think. But with that, because the only reason you're going without him is because you can you can say, Man, we would have beat them without him. You don't know that. Anybody could say that. Yeah, you don't know that. Our, we, yeah. we lost our best player. He's yeah. he's the best player in America. Yeah. No, no. And, and, yeah, you, you absolutely. You know what? Instead of making the trip, and you're making the trip there. The better. So you're paying that money to go watch it. This is going to be counterintuitive because for me, and I was saying this yesterday, I'd at least, I'd at least like to have my shot. You know, like we were talking about the shed versus going on and beating Duke and, and NC State. They would have beat NC State. Uh, I think they would have beat, beat NC State. I think State. they would have beat NC State. I don't know that they would beat Purdue, and I and right, I would right. not bet on them against you. But but yesterday I was saying I'd at least like to have my shot. But if you're telling me I'm going to lose by 25, you're going to lose the same way. Yeah. It's not a, it's not a battle. You're yeah. going to get swept like just across the court, like they've been sweeping teams yeah. across the court. It, 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 it sounds kind of defeatist. But the better story for the rest of your life is, damn, we could have beat them. Man, we had them. We had them. We could have beat we them. we were a team of destiny. I know they were great, but we would have beat them. Yeah. You know, that, that that's the better story. We had a shot. Yeah, that's the better story, and Instead that's the better. Sweat. You, you kind of have your chest out a little bit. Like, otherwise, you're saying, 
Yeah, remember in 2024 when we went to the championship game? Yeah, how'd you do? Yeah, we lost by 30. Right? Yes. <laughs> because I will tell you this. There are a few things worse than making a road trip to watch your team get their ass whooped in any form, whether it's just a small college road trip, yeah. whether it's whether it's going to the actual national title and watching it. If you're like a true fan, it I, I know you'll try to convince it's yourself their satisfaction. It, if you're really a fan and you really have yeah. a rooting interest, there is nothing worse. Especially if you're driving. Oh. Like when you drive oh, God. to a like let's say out of state and your team gets drug that's the longest drive you'll ever have. It, it might have been eight hours on the way, but it's going to be 28 hours on the way back. It's just going to feel like that. Uh, I'm with you. Yeah, I, I, that, that, that's the worst. Uh, now, there's not a lot better than going into a stadium after a long oh, drive yeah. and you and you beat that squad. You're like, hey, good you game. Good out, game, man. Hey. It was a good experience. Hey, thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a good experience. Appreciate it. Y'all are really nice out here. Real hospitable. Hey, I've never been out here, man. I, yeah. Y'all got a yeah. great stadium. Yeah. Hell of a team, too, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Very, hey, that's a good ball club right there. Don't, yeah. don't, don't yeah. hang your hat. You got nothing to hang your hat on. Very hospitable. Hey, where's the best place to get some grub? Y'all are great hosts. Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right, man. Hey. Congratulations. Yeah. Who y'all got next week? Yeah. Oh, hey, good luck to you, man. <laughs> good luck to you. <laughs> like when you beat them in their own turf. It's the most passive-aggressive politeness. Yes, all of a sudden, you're like a saint. Yeah, this has just been a fantastic experience, guys. You guys should be proud. <laughs> Y'all got something going. <laughs> hey, I've been to a lot of stadiums with this team. <laughs> Y'all have the best fans. <laughs> yeah, because they were sitting on their hands. <laughs> hey, what's Sadie Two's name? <laughs> Man, he's going to be a hell of a ball player. Yeah. I know we had a tough day today. <laughs> That's going to be a hell of a ball player right there. <laughs> Like you know, like like, like, like you. Know. I've been through the same ass whooping too, man. <laughs> oh man, it's great when you go and you and you walk out of there with a dub. It ain't so great the other way. <laughs> and then and then they'll try to compliment. Oh, nah, nah hey man, you know, it, it just it was just a, it was a real good game, and they, they just they left it out there. <laughs> That's the best thing about the SEC trips. I've been man. wanting to come to Tuscaloosa all my life, man. It was great. It was a great experience. Yeah, Johnny's pretty good. Pretty good. <laughs> They're crying. <laughs> They're crying in there. Hey, when when did y'all remodel this? <laughs> I, I, I was here in 03. I saw it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Boom Pickens. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Vince, he's a hell of a ball player, man. Yeah, hey, y'all had us. 35-7, it's all good. You had us, man. <laughs> Again, we're there down 35-7 and one by 21. Yeah. Man, that Eskimo Joe sure does have a good... <laughs> man, it's true. Yeah, see, even uh, Ernesto saying the drive from or drive from P-Town to, to Houston is rough, like, just when you when you lose a game like that. From where? Uh, from Pearland. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, 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 yeah. Uh, He's saying even that is a drive when like the oh, Cougs lose. Heck yeah. I mean, you lost like that. That's tough, man. Yeah. That's tough. But, well, but it, it's I don't I don't think it's as tough as getting your ass whooped by UConn in the national championship game. I just don't. Well, I think just the 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 legacy you're gonna have is man. We were rolling through people, then Shed got hurt, and you know UConn won. I think we would have beat him. We matched up well versus yeah. We made it to the championship game. And lost by thirty. Uh, that, that that's when. And then, get, how can you be confident the next year? Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. That that's true because and, you got drubbed. And then, if, if this is what Landry the Duke fan would sound like after that, uh, after that Houston win. Mm -hmm. Hey, man, that's tough, man. Mm -hmm. that's, I hate to see that happen. I hate to see that happen to him. <laughs> hey, how far is Houston from here? Oh, just four hours. Okay, yeah. That that doesn't seem like did, you drove, right? Oh, that doesn't seem like a bad drive, man. Um. Best of luck to y'all. Y'all got a hell of a program. Yeah. That Samson's a hell of a coach. I know we'll see you next year. <laughs> I know we'll see you next year. <laughs> it's the best. It's uh, you get those long drives, man. <laughs> and it's uh, it's almost to the point where, like, even when someone's being extra nice to you, you're just like, ah. Oh, oh yeah, you feel like in your head, in your head, you're telling them to go jump in a like lake. I would. You're acting like I would. Yeah, you're telling them to go jump in a lake. Yeah, I, I, you can read. You can see through it. Yeah, you're acting like me. You can see through it.
No doubt I'm, about I, it. I don't. I don't need your congratulations. Yeah, exactly. See you later. Bye bye. Mm-hmm. Goodness gracious, but Landry I, Locker. But John I think Lopez. you're right. Mickey Fig with uh, you. Uh, as a Cougs fan, if you're telling me you're going to get beat by 25, 30 points by UConn, the better story is shed hurt and you didn't even make the. Yeah. You, if you, you gave you me know. the two options and you told me that it yeah. was here, I would rather yeah. be able to be the able better to story. Hide, be able to make up in my mind that we could have won instead of just getting yeah waxed by UConn. Now, in yeah. my heart, in my heart, I want to take a swing at it. But again, those are the two. But options. But if you're saying you're gonna yeah, get the, beat by thirty, yeah, if you're gonna get beat yeah. by UConn the way they've been beaten, those are the two options. Not hey, obviously you'd like to advance. Yeah. Exactly. Although, although they would have, they would have probably had a tougher time uh, without him. Clint Sterner, Ron Hughley, um, they are in the building, fellas. But you get to go to the Final Four, though. Yeah, but you get that. That's a forever thing. Nobody, that, nobody cares about that. But that's not true. Nobody no, no, cares no, about the no, Final no, Four. no, no, no. Nah. If when you're talking about your squad, 10, 15 years yeah. down the road, oh, at least you got to go to the Final Four. No, no, nobody's gonna, nobody cares about that. Case, nobody talks about this. Going to the Final Four? Eh. Not not after the fact. Not if you get whooped like that. Yeah. We said that there's nothing. You've you've done this before, I think. Really? Where you take a trip to a to a game and your team loses and you have to come back. There's nothing worse than it. That's the longest it drive sucks. you'll ever make. It sucks. No, it sucks. Yeah. But it's awful. Especially if they just kill you. It's it's trash. Final four final four. Well, is, hell, is Ron, big. Ron just took a little short trip over here from from Sugar Land to, Jeez, to yeah. U of H Tra- and experienced it. Traffic was long. Guys. Oh, that's <laughs> right. Five, that's right. <laughs> Imagine no, you had to drive four or five hours. No, I, I get what you're saying. The experience, and then you're in the final four. Yeah, that, but that, cool. yeah, you, that one's always that's that's almost that's like a measuring stick. That's yeah. like that's like to me that's like saying I'd rather lose in in the mm. divisional round. Yeah. Instead of making it to the to the Super Bowl and get beat the way like the Broncos did against <laughs> the Seahawks. Yeah. Well, but I think the other. But element, I made but, the Super Bowl. That, that came quick to mind, other, though, didn't it? The other that element came really quick to mind. The other element to it is that you can you can hype you can make up and say that you would have won because Shev went down. That's my thing. Like you you can you can be a fan and say, "Hey man, we would have had him. He went down." Hey, mm-hmm. real quick. Y'all think Shev? I think if Shed didn't get hurt, they still would have won the game. I do. Yeah, I do. I think so. I mean, hell, they could have won it without him. They could have. They yeah. were they were fighting. They were fighting it offensively without him. I was I mean, with them in there. Exactly. I, you know was, what I mean, like I just and we've seen them go on. I agree with that a little bit. Yeah. And, and, and I, I I can see why people get there and 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 I do agree with Kelvin as he mm-hmm. said. We don't have another Jamal shit. He's a first team All American. Yeah. Maybe the toughest player in in the sport. I mean, he was a good one for five. No, no, no. <laughs> but they were, I, I they do were agree with it. that. But somehow he finds a way. We've seen it so many times to. Big shot, drive, dunk, whatever, dish. Uh, I, I do think they would have been. Yeah, yeah, I that think they would have been. Rough. Dead. Yeah, that was rough. Yeah. It's tough, man. Anyone but UConn. God. It's hard to mess with. There. <laughs> I said, I said to Clint. Yes, I said to Clint yesterday. I said, now UConn's going for back-to-back championship. You got, you got a UConn Husky. Hurley. You got, you got a Husky. That's crazy, though. Like I just, and then I said, "You got an Iowa Hawkeye? <laughs> <laughs> you, you got a you got an LSU Tiger? He's got, he's got, I got to him. <laughs> it's great, but I don't think he's alone. I I wonder how many people yeah. have very many UConn Huskies. Yeah, I got the coach. They got a first. I got. They got a first <laughs> team All American in Tristan Newton. I mean, I wonder how many people have yeah. have a UConn Husky. Crazy. Yeah. Not a ton. Is. Not a ton. <laughs> You're listening to KILTAM, KILTHC2. The drive is live. It is live, and uh, we got a little, uh, we got a little no-no to celebrate, baby. Come on. How about that? Got a little action over at, over at the Astros, didn't we? How about that? Now y'all got, y'all got paid, didn't you, last night? Right, four and a half. Uh-huh. I, I wonder yeah. that that, Took that about was four innings. That was quick. I won hundred and sixty-nine dollars. I was nervous. I said, please don't, don't rip their hearts out. By getting four in the first, or, or however many they got in the first, and then just staying right there, because that happened to Clint, uh, and that happened to, to, to a couple of other people. But we said it yesterday. I said, uh, "Well, I mean, how how, you, <laughs> how are the Astros gonna get to Presley? <laughs> how are they gonna how are they gonna find a way to get to Presley? Abreu and Josh Hader were unavailable. I said, right now, boy, if you press the button." For five innings, boy, you you feel real good about that from O'Neal. Absolutely. And then Neil said, no. Get on my back, boys. I know I've never thrown Ooh. six innings before in my <laughs> life, but I'm going to go ahead and bang nine out. I'm going to go ahead and bang nine. You got Ty Callis. You got TK. Let 
Let me hear that final call, man. You got TK. I, I, we said somebody's got to step up. We said somebody has got to pull them out of this thing. Stop and old, the bleeding. And old Nail said, hey, everybody take a night off. Mm. I got you. Everybody take a night off. This is how it ended last night. Ground ball. Dubon throws the first. Go header. Run off Blanco. In his eighth career start, the 30-year-old makes magic on April Fool's Day. Eighth career start. They needed somebody to step up. And old Ron Nail. Oh Nail! Oh Ron Nail! I, I didn't know I didn't know he was 30. I'll be honest with you, I didn't know he's that old. You didn't? Got I a late they, start. I, I didn't, I didn't know up. he was they that scooped, old. They scooped him up at 23, I believe. What a what a what a what a evening for that young fella, man. I'm telling eight, you, man. His eighth start in Major League Baseball is a no hitter when the Astros needed a no hitter. Uh, or hell, they just needed somebody to run deeper in about four or five innings, um, and, and this guy goes a complete game. Ain't what no way, a ain't no night, way in man. hell nobody had that in the cards. Oh well, no, hell no, no way, no, nobody. I mean, no. I'm telling you, I was like, well, can this can this cat get through five? Can he get into the six and then try to put it together? And he said, "Hey, Joe Espada, take the night off, baby." <laughs> Dude, one of those innings, he was out on the mound for like. Three minutes and eight seconds. Yeah, I, like, was, I, I I didn't even get the top of the the, uh, the dishwasher field, the top <laughs> rack, the top rack of the dishwasher. I remember that inning. I was it was cu- it was cups and small bowls. Yeah, and that, and then and I looked up. I said, "Damn, you know what this means, Ron? <laughs> what you Line got? Up. You got to do the lineups Line again up. today. That didn't have anything to do with it. Oh yeah, dude, dude come on. No, it yeah. didn't." You have got to do the lineup. Right, that's going to go on a show. little run here, man. With with, with, uh, with you doing the lineup. No, man. we can't oversaturate. You got right, to tighten it up a little bit. Yeah. And you got to tighten it up a little bit and and, um, and and do it again today. So you have some issues with what I did yesterday. Well, I mean, you, you don't know. Just the more more reps you get, the better you get. You know, yeah. I, I, mean, I don't know. We'll, we'll we'll look at that. We'll we'll see. I mean, I I don't think you attribute. I, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to attribute what a performance that was last night by the offense. Well, that's not like you. And Ronnell Bron- Blanco. That's not like you to take a little bit of credit just, for the me, win. Me taking no a, a little three minutes and doing the lineups. No, no. I, I'm going to tell you what, though, Clint. Last night, and you all, and we've sat here and watched this golden era of, uh, of Astros baseball, but that right there was kind of what it's been about. Like, we know Altuve has shown up. Jordan Alvarez has shown up. Bregman has shown up. Over the years, Correa and Springer, the great players have shown up. But as long as you've watched it, as long as I've seen it, they always have guys that step up like this. Whether it's Christian Javier in the, you know, the 2020 and 2021 season coming out of the bullpen and stepping up. Whether it's Dubon last year coming up and stepping up. Even Josh Reddick had some moments uh, as an unsung player stepping, <laughs> stepping up. And Ronel Blanco, you didn't know who it was. You were hoping. And then he comes out of nowhere and steps up the way he does. It, this, to me, is is about the winning Astros culture that any of these guys, not just the big guns, but any of these guys step in and give you what you need. That, that, that was, to me, was a show of why they have been the best organization in baseball the last almost decade. Well, look, I I, I, uh, <clears throat> I agree. I mean, obviously, there's no disagreeing with that. But but the the uh, Ronel Blanco uh, that we watched last night, I mean, I, I need more of it, Ron. Oh, you'll, you'll it, get another it, look, start. Look, in, in, in today's game, in today's game, folks are looking for excuses to not overextend themselves. Looking for excuses to not overextend themselves. Coaches, coaches are looking for reasons. Managers, I'm sorry, are looking for reasons to not overextend and, and overload players and not put them at risk. And you can call them coaches. Stupid. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I got the text line corrected me. Baseball, the they're managers. I know. They, oh. You can call them coaches. They're hitting coaches. They're yeah. pitching coaches. Yeah, I agree. No, what, what are you saying? I text. I text our text chain. I say, you think they're gonna pull them? Yeah. Yeah, no. I, look, I mean, it, there was um, on two two fronts here. Ronell, in in no way, shape, or form, was going to bitch and moan about how many about the pitch count. 
Right. What did he end up with, Tyler? I was trying to look that up. 105. It was, 105. It was over 100. I saw him. I saw him hit triple digits. 104, 105. 104. But uh, love, love the young fella just bearing down and and going a distance. Love the fact that Joe Espada did didn't pull him and 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 use the excuse of well it's early in the season his kid's never gone beyond six innings his kid's never done this never done that and, and look I, I get it I understand that in today's game every every decision is under the microscope and, and gets criticized and 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 I get it but man it was refreshing to see a young player a young pitcher, say young 30, but a, a, an inexperienced pitcher at the major league level so early in the season with every reason to say, ah, you can just, just give a seven or eight, man. We got Presley. We can roll with it. He said, no, nah, I'm going back out there. And the spotter said the same thing. That, that's refreshing, man. And then to be able to obviously put the nail in the coffin was was money as well. You think this is a, mm-hmm. You think this is a signal of this is a crew that's not going to be as – as worried about pitch count, because that because everything you're describing, and th- and the reason why I sent that to the group was, this is his first start. He is first off, he's never pitched more than six innings in a game, uh, and he had. I mean, he's not thrown a hundred pitches yet. I mean, it, it, it get warmed up. He's not been stretched up, stretched out, and they decided let's go ten inning, ten ten runs. They got a huge lead when he got somebody on. I thought in the ninth they might pull him. But I, I wonder is this a is this a signal that Joe Espada is not as you know as worried or crazy about pitch count? Is this something where he'll run people out there and run guys out there a little longer, and he's not afraid to kind of get up in that pitch count? Because everything would say this cat's first start. We got injuries in the in the starting rotation. Hell, if he goes down, we got to bring a rookie up. Let's get let's let's calm it down. I wonder is this a signal of, ah oh, man, we we we're not going to be as fear as as, as I guess going to have as much fear about the pitch count and arms. If, if it is, I'm here for it. Oh, I'm definitely I, I'm, here, I'm for here for it. I'm here for it. I'm definitely here for it. I thought maybe in the seventh he might he might pull his ass. Yeah, man, I, I'm I'm absolutely here for it. Now, if, if I had to guess. I would guess that it had a little bit to do with the fact that it was Ronnell Blanco, not not uh, Justin Verlander. They just, just think Justin's been out of there. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think Justin would have came out in the seventh. Justin uh, Verlander. But but the so it probably had a little bit to do that it was old Ronnell and 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 he's early in his career and he's obviously a guy that's a fringe roster guy. Um, and and I imagine it had a little bit to do with what Joe Espada has watched so far. That bullpen is has is is a problem, and they had been strained over the over the first four days with with the Yankees. And if he could get a little bit of distance out of old Ron L, even if there was a little risk associated with it, why not? And then you look up and, and you get him into the eighth. You go, hell, he's got a no hitter going. <laughs> now you can't pull him. Um, so what, when he what, got when he got through six, it was like job well done. Yeah, you did it. Yeah. Hell yeah. Hit the, hit the shower, hit, big hit, fella. Then he hit the seventh. Said, Man, he's about to give everybody a night off. Nobody even has to get up. <laughs> that uh, changeup was nasty. It really was. By the way, you want to talk about a three technique. <laughs> you can't slide him out. He, he's a, That's a D-tackle oh, right there. Oh, you can slide him out. No, that's a D-tackle yeah, right there, can. G. That's <laughs> a, a D-tackle. He's at, least a, he's at the very least a five Mm-mm. technique in a three-four. No. The line you can make with him, Framber, and Luis you Garcia. Gonna, let me tell you what. You're going to keep him between the tackles. <laughs> Tell you that right now. He can shade, he can shade it. <laughs> hey, hey, come on, don't get off Ron L like that, man. By the way, somebody texted on the text line seven one three five seven two four six ten. I see those of you on YouTube and Twitch. He's earned himself to be the fourth or fifth starter in this rotation. Easy. This yeah. rotation, the way it sits right now. No, it's a great start in making that argument, but let's. It's not. I'm one. Yeah, you're right. Too carried away. As it sits right here, obviously, hell, he's in it. But right. I wonder if the texture is meaning. Because like I, I think if we're meaning if if everyone's healthy, and that is, and now when I say everyone, I mean the real realistic people, not Lance. But if everybody is healthy, bury me in the H. And the guys we know are going to be coming back sooner, like the the Verlanders and Urquidy, those two that really jump out the most. Um, I. I, I don't I, I don't know if I'd be willing if I were Joe Espada to say this performance says that he he would get in the rotation over Jose Urquidy. Obviously Vern later. 
goes then at the top. But I don't know if this this does that. I do think this creates an absolute role where he is a weapon of some sorts. But I don't know if he's if he's a guy that's earned a spot when everybody's healthy in the uh, g- Given given the way that this this pitching staff is is built right now, and I'm, I am including the obvious all the injuries. Yeah, you're talking about everybody right now. Um, look, if if you tell me you got a guy on the shelf that's potent, can potentially throw a no hitter. That 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 his first outing can can throw over a hundred pitches with this particular bullpen. I'm gonna have a hard time leaving him on the shelf. I mean, now there's, he's got work to do, but I mean, there, there's he's in the comp before before last night. This was just a hey man, Ronnell, hold this thing, hold this fort down, man, hold it together until these guys get back healthy. If he goes out there and can and can like let's just say he goes out there now, Ron, and, and let's say he gets. Two more starts, three more starts before guys start coming back. And he shows the ability to get deep into games. Six, seven innings. Get, gives you gives you six, seven every time. I got to believe that there's a little bit of, I got to believe that there's a little bit of, hey man, right now, the way this bullpen is, it's more important that we get seven out of somebody than the risk we take of getting four or a third out of somebody. And, and see, what you just said is why I think to me, he he feel he feels of all the guys. If we start to talk about all right at the back end of that rotation, let's when we say everybody's healthy, the back end is a, it's JP France, it's Blanco, and and, and Urquidy. Like, the biggest the biggest issue right now, arguably on the team, is that attempt to get to the big three in the back end of the bullpen. Yeah, and you're talking about your way of thinking. We can get Ronell. To be a pitcher that gives us length that that makes us have to skip if he can do the skip that and and his ceiling is a potential no hitter yeah now now Clint if he's if he's out here the next if he gets as you said two more starts before Urquidy can come back and if he's pitching like say the way Christian Javier was pitching when he was a starter remember that was they were shifting him and back yeah, and forth yeah. and he was giving you six seven innings and looking dominant now you got some but I I think he. He is really needed potentially for the role of bridging to get sure, to sure. Uh, that, uh, to get to yeah. Presley, Abreu, and if Hater. If that's where you know I mean? it, yeah, it, it's I, options. I, I think that because I, I, I like I don't know if he's going to be able to give what we're saying, but right now, like if you say he's going to turn it up and he's going to that that ninety three ninety four is going to be ninety seven because a hey, big fella go out and, and empty the clip. And that curveball and that changeup is 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 a little harder and a, like I I like his stuff to translate coming in the bullpen more than JP France and Arkady and I think that void which is missed because I mean Montero I don't think a lot of people are really are really fired up about that that thought I think right now people probably trust Ronell more than they trust than they trust him so I I I hear you if he keeps now if he has two more starts and. and we get up here and he gets a seven inch start and he gives up two and, and he goes seven again and gets up. Then you got you got a real dilemma on your hands about about taking him out of the starting lineup. Well, Ron, I mean, if, if if he proves to which again, we don't know who the hell he is. He's had eight major league starts. I mean, we don't we don't know who he is, but we know what yeah. the ceiling is right now. I mean, his ceiling is a no hitter. These other guys have had several more starts than he has and and, and hadn't got a no hitter. Hell, most of them ain't even flirted with a no hitter. And so, I mean, the ceiling is obviously high, and then you get a guy again, given the current the, the current situation in the pen, that can give you consistently give you depth into a game, give you six, it may seven. I mean, hell, that's what we've been talking about. How how many conversations have we had leading up to this year? Hell, and last year about, hey man, just give me a guy that I, JP France is a perfect example. I like JP France. Why? Because I feel like he's gonna go out there more times than not. He's gonna give me six. May not be pretty. There may be some traffic on the base bat, but damn it, his pitch count's not going to skyrocket in the second. He's going he's gonna to get us six innings and, and, and give us a chance to win the ball game. We've been asking for that with out, outside of really Verlander and, hell, Fromber. Uh, we've been asking for that big time. Hell, we asked Hunter Brown and Christian Javier to do that. If Ron L can prove to do that and we know the ceiling is a no-hitter, hey, man, there's a conversation. I'm not saying it happens, but there's a conversation there. He's no. now square. He ain't he ain't in the conversation with Belak anymore. Oh, I mean, no, he, he's no, in the conversation no, I, with, with with that fifth starter or sixth starter if you go a six man rotation. Or six, but to me, there is the, the gaping hole on the pitching staff, sure. and maybe on the team, is how you get there. 
And and right now, I'm gonna tell you right now, you're talking about yeah, I know what he did last night. Are you or how much confidence do you have tonight that Framber's going six? Oh, we are in a tough spot with Framber. <laughs> I think Framber's gonna be inspired. You think so? It, well, he needs to be. Uh, I'm gonna set them, this one out them, after them opening day. day Yankee. It wasn't enough. <laughs> yeah, I'm no, gonna I mean, set like this right one out. now, like you know, I'm right now. I'm not 100 percent confident that Hunter Brown is gonna get you is gonna get you to the sixth with the way his pitch count gets up and, and stuff. And we'll see. Hopefully, these guys can do that. It's just, who him him one day in the fifth starting spot when Arkady, you know exact kind of kind of what he can give you. Or him being the, the potential weapon, weapon to help in the bullpen. Because right now, if you look at it, and we'll talk to Robert Flores coming up here at 240. That's one of the first things he talked about was outside of the big three in the bullpen. If you look at it last year, I mean, they, they had about six or seven guys that you could at least feel a little bit of comfort to run out there besides, you know, Abreu and Presley. There was Phil Maton, and there was Stanek, and there was Naritz. And they they had some guys right now outside of them big three. What were you looking at? Seth Martinez, yeah, Taylor Scott, who we were making ourselves like. Uh, I like old Taylor, man. <laughs> we're, we're, he looked great last night after that bullpen. Nice and relaxed. <laughs> nice and relaxed. <laughs> we were making ourselves like. We got, we got Montero, who's everyone scared to death when he comes in the game. So I mean, they need they need some help out there. We'll keep an eye on it though. We'll see it. I mean, if this. Because I do. I remember when Christian Javier, when they were yo-yoing him back and forth, he had some really good starts. And I remember just being really annoyed that they kept putting him back in that bullpen. But it, to me, the, the, the Blanco situation, that, that might be a, a, a bigger need uh, than, than being the fifth starter. All right, <clears throat> coming up, your quarterback. Uh, maybe the most important athlete in the city of Houston, C.J. Stroud, sat down and gave an understanding of what success for him is like. You want to hear what he had to say, as well as uh, we may have seen the best of all time out there yesterday. We'll discuss that coming up next. But before we get there, I don't know what idiot said this yesterday, but this weekend, this weekend is the thing now. The nation's largest trading card and pop culture convention is returning to Houston
of free agent signing don't worry we've got you covered on the odyssey app every segment of every show broken down into chapters so you can get right into what matters to you just download the odyssey app search for sports radio 610 and tap on a recent episode of your favorite shows here in h-town houston's sports leader sports radio 610 
Sports Radio 610 presents The Drive with Sterner and Hughley. Coming up, 240, our guy Robert Flores will join the show. And I listen, I, I hate um this was a mistake by my myself. Sorry, Greg. Um that whole segment, man. We failed to mention Yiner Diaz behind the plate. Not 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 just what he did at the plate, but behind the plate. Um and and catchers, and we know about it here, get a lot of credit when uh when there are great pitching performances. And for a young guy in his first start of the season, eight starts, and you run through it, you have it rolling the way that Ron El Blanco did. That catcher in the back half obviously is playing a major role and making things comfortable calling a great game. So shout out to Yiner Diaz behind the plate uh, who played a major role in last night's win, both at the plate but even more importantly behind it with him. Yeah, look, I mean, another angle, man. There's so much good about what happened last night with the Astros. There's three or four different angles, man. So I got to listen to the whole show. That's right. Yeah, we so got to plugged yeah, for in. Us. So shout out to uh, Yiner Diaz. Big performance last night. All right, C.J. Stroud was on with Kevin Hart uh, in his, what's that called? Uh, ball, cold as the balls? Cold, yeah, the cold tub, cold as balls tub. Cold as, cold as balls, yeah. Old, Old Spice. Balls. Yeah, it's, it's cold. They sit in that cold tub, and, and he does an interview Interesting there. concept. It is. I like it. But you it, can't but hang it, in there long, can you? Uh-uh. Yeah, Stroud took his shirt off. Oh, I remember, uh, yeah, I, I, Allen Iverson was fully clothed almost. And he, really? Yeah, he said, no, I, ain't, I ain't doing it. I, I remember that. It. It, and just shivering and shaking. <laughs> Iverson looks like a guy that's cold, that's cold often. I, well, Iverson looks like a guy that ain't, ain't never need, needed to get in a cold tub. <laughs> He's a little fella. Like, nah, I'm out. I, I, no matter how much, what I just did to these legs, may, man, I ain't may, no damn cold He may cold have needed tub. to. I don't think he oh, yeah. ever thought of it. His body could have used it, but, nah. I, but I don't think he thought he ever needed it. Nah, yeah. He, I could he, be wrong. Maybe he was a cold tub guy at the house. Yeah, may, maybe, maybe. But, uh, but uh, C.J. Stroud talked about what success looks like to him in the NFL. Tell me what the world of success looks like for you in the NFL. You know, it's crazy. I, I got to talk to my dad last night after I won the award, and I was super blessed to be able to talk to him. And he was talking about my first ever, like, game. Uh, I did, like, a fake run to the left that you know how to do. Ah, yeah. fake rough roll. I, yeah, call yeah, it, uh, that one. I call it left roll fake. Yeah, that was the one. Yeah. Um, and the defensive end came free, and no one blocked him. I got the ball off, threw it in the flat, and the dude hit me right in the mouth, and my tooth fell out. Dang. And they were trying to take me out. And I was like, nah, nah, hold on, hold on. Like, you can't take me out. Like, I got to finish the drive. And the next play, uh, my coach, his name is Tojo, and he called a bomb, and I threw a touchdown. And he was like, man, like, like, why did you do that? And I'm like, I just love this game. He asked me, like, what do you want out of this game, CJ? Like, we're not going to do this, uh, you know, just for shits and giggles. And I'm like, uh, I want to be a Hall of Famer. I'm nine years old. So, like, and I still have that same level of focus, that same level of determination uh, to this day. I love it, man. Yeah, and I'm sure uh, Texas fans love to hear it, too. I, I just like to say, Clint. Now, uh, now CJ's just cussing now. I was an S bomb. He's just full fledged cussing. I I didn't think Tyler would ever have to use the uh, the the little sounder in front of cuss words, and now he's just cussing. I mean, I just don't think it's a coincidence. After I didn't think it, it he happened. gave Amber that ride home. Now he's now he's just full fledged using S words. <laughs> Never a doubt. <laughs> He ne- said, never, never a doubt. I mean, look, he's he's giving Amber Rose rides home. He's sitting in the in the uh, Kardashian suite with and a, now and now he's with, just with, dropping with a, 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 a glass that is is designed to drink yak out of with some <laughs> with some uh, a, glide, with, a with, glass with, that's designed. To I don't know what it's called, but it, uh, you know what glass I'm talking about that that little that that little mid size, a little bit bigger than a shot glass. It's got a, got kind of a funny <laughs> shape too. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Piece of positivity. You, you, if you multiply it times, magnify it times ten, it's kind of like what you drink them daiquiris out of. You know, it's a little smaller, <laughs> and it had a little dirty water in it. And and uh, n- never never a doubt that that uh, CJ was was uh, was it was, was, mean, was a decent cusser. And it, and it was one of the cuss words that that we can't say. I mean, Tyler makes a living of saying all the ones that we can't say, <laughs> uh, and we don't have to bleep out. That was one we had to bleep out. Yeah, FCC doesn't like that you remember, one. You remember that time? Now I wish we could play it for you. Do you remember that time where he said he, he said something. he said hell and then and then stopped himself and apologized? Oh, excuse to me. Everybody for saying hell. 
Like, I mean, and now he's just out here just dropping the S word. That's what that's what getting into the ice bath with Kevin Hart will do to you. Uh, oh, that's what it is, yeah. Ice, I was thinking about a bath, too. I didn't think, I wasn't thinking about Kevin. <laughs> I'm not saying anything. I'm sure he just dropped her off. God bless, brother. Who? <laughs> Amber. As you said, man. Man's duty. Now, she is a bad influence. Man's duty. <laughs> what'd, you, what'd you say? Well, now we last last we've seen him, he's he's in the box with the Kardashians, drinking yak, dropping off, carrying Amber Rose's bag, dropping off Amber Rose, and now mm-hmm. now he's in a in an ice bath with Kevin Hart, cursing and dropping ass bath on TV. <laughs> I'm telling you, he's really coming into his own, isn't he? What'd you say? You knew he had it in him. What the hell I'm talking about? You knew he had it in him. I knew he had it in him the whole time. (laughs) He ain't fooling nobody, man. (laughs) He ain't fooling nobody. But, man. (sighs) What? He just. There wasn't. There was never a day in your in your mind that you thought no, CJ wasn't I, a good cusser. No, no. I I honestly have always thought he's a cusser just because of the locker oh, I did. room I did. thing. But but I didn't think he'd ever be on a stage like this and just be like dropping an S. I didn't. I, I didn't know. I, and I, no judgment for. I wasn't one hundred percent sure if he was a cusser. He I, dropped it off easy. The <laughs> way he stopped himself when he said hell that one time. Oh, oh, excuse me. That ain't even a, that ain't even a real cuss word. Like right now, if Trey said. Man, that was a hell of a catch. I don't think I'd say anything. Well, why would you? I just, but that's what CJ stopped himself like it was a real cuss word. Oh, okay, I got you. Now, if he said go to hell, I, I, I got you. But that was a hell of, he said it was a hell of a something. And then, oh, I'm so sorry, y'all. Excuse my language. Now he's out here. Now he's out here letting it rip. I bet he cuss a lot. Oh, ain't no doubt. You think now, he. Now, the, the, way, the way that rolled off. You think he cusses more now today than the day the Texans drafted him? I think he cusses now more today than than after that uh, that baseball that softball uh, <laughs> tournament that he was in. <laughs> yeah. I think he got his cussing turned out. Really working it up. Yeah, I think. Listen, by the way, we need to we need to do this. We we are joking. People not not saying that he that yes. he's run into Amber Rose and that is like there's some people going to take this serious just just a just a little fun. Just a little fun with with C. Well, look, I'm out. I'm I'm not blaming it on Amber. I, I just think it gave us a peek behind the curtain. It gave us a peek of the real CJ. Yes, yeah, and what's it? What's next? He'll be racing in Dallas. Let's hope not. Well, yeah. I mean, God bless, brother. Shout out to Rasheed Rice and his racing. Hopefully, he 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 won't be doing that. But good for him, man. Let it out. Yeah, he cuss every day. I bet he used the F word. Now, if we ever hear him use the F word, now that I bet he reserves a lot of his cussing for the basketball floor. You think he was cussing that night at that? You think he was cussing with Michael Parsons? Absolutely. I'm, I'm gonna be honest with you. Like I, that's that's the part of that's the part of CJ. When I've realized how good of a hooper he was and how competitive he is, I don't know how you're not a good cusser in that in that, in that world. Like you you lose some serious cool points if it's like yeah sucker. <laughs> I was just Got saying, you, right? wankster. <laughs> I mean, if he ain't mfing and, and mu- I mean, he ain't. I mean, he ain't giving it to. Him. I mean, he got. If that. there is well, anybody what? on the, on the basketball court ever in life that it was said, dot at that ass, Wankster. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm saying. I'm that's what, that's that. what, oh, excuse me, excuse me. That's a hell of a shot. Well, wasn't it Philip Rivers Wankster? who were, who refused to cuss? Oh yeah, Phil doesn't cuss. He he would say some pretty corny and stuff. And they said out he the was the gra- They said he was one of the greatest trash talkers that didn't cuss. <laughs> I, I've heard one. some mic'd ups of Philip Rivers. It sounds kind of funny. Yeah, no, I, look, I get it. It, it. There's one. I mean, I, if if CJ's the second one, it'd be it'd be the second one we've ever seen. I know Philip well, don't cuss. I know Philip don't cuss. I know one thing Philip do. Mm-hmm. Makes babies. <laughs> he is fertile. <laughs> he, is. <laughs> he is not protected in Jeez. any way. Coming up, <laughs> let's listen to our guy Robert Flores as they talked about it. The no hitter this morning. You can uh, you can hear him every day. MLB Central it airs eight a.m. on MLB Network. We'll hear from him coming up next. Get his thoughts on this early start of the season with your Houston Astros. All of that coming up next right here on the.
the Astros busting out of the 0-4 start in, uh, in, 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 a, in a crazy fashion in one of the most unlikely fashions, and that's a no-hitter from O'Ronnell Blanco. Uh, and to get more into that, our guy, you hear him a, a lot here. He's a Houstonian. He lives and dies with it. Uh, Robert Flores, Road Flow, MLB Network. He joins us. Remember, you can catch MLB Central each morning, each weekday morning, 8 a.m. on uh, MLB Network. All right, man, how how impressive – I guess a two-part question. You're never supposed to do this, but I think you can handle it. Uh, how impressive <laughs> uh, was Blanco last night? And for you, what should be the long-term role potentially for him? Well, first of all, to answer the first question, very impressive. Um, when you consider his story, uh, signing at 22 years old out of the DR, which I'm sure you guys have discussed, or maybe if people aren't completely aware about how this works, uh, it, it Usually the international signings happen at 16 or 17 if teams feel like uh, you're a prospect that they want to um, they want to sign or they think that you have a future. And the Astros signed him at 22 years old. Uh, he's 30 now, so he is a late bloomer. But, uh, you know, the the guy that was largely responsible, there's two guys for me. Oz Ocampo, who is no longer with the Astros, but found so many players like Blanco, Jose Urquidy, Framber Valdez, Christian Javier, guys that were a little older when they signed, but ultimately have pr- provided some big dividends. And the other guy is Dana Brown. Uh, I was at Astro Spring Training, and we were, myself and Mark DeRosa were, were there, and we were just chatting with, with Dana Brown, and we, I don't, I'm not sure how Ronel Blanco's name came up, but Dana Brown told the story about how when he came to Houston, he saw Blanco throw, and he knew that he was being used out of the pen, and he said to his staff and some of the coaches, hey, guys, I think we should try this guy as a starter. You know, I don't, I don't mean to step on any toes, but let's just see what he can give us because I think there's a starter in there. So uh, it, it's just a great story. As for what his long-term role should be, guys, it, it's anyone's guess. Um, this, look, the, last night was great, and it was much needed, and the offense was great, but there's still some flashing signs on the dashboard, uh, namely with the bullpen, and the rotation, as it stands right now, is a little light in, in, in my mind. So they really could use him in both, yes. <laughs> in both departments, the bullpen and the rotation. I think for now, obviously, he stays in the rotation. Yeah, real flow for me. It's it, the fact that it was a no hitter, and the fact that we are where we are in Major League Baseball, where where just everything's a pitch count and load managed, especially early in the season, to go out there and throw a hundred and some odd pitches and and never blink, never check up. Joe Espada didn't appear to check up either. I mean, I don't want to overreact to a no hitter, but if that's his ceiling, and he's a guy that 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 can give you more when need be, which as you mentioned, there's blinking red lights in the bullpen right now. They can yeah. they can use guys that can like right now the Astros. There's a lot of potential, man, but it's tough to find a guy that you you believe can give you six. You oh, know, without, without a doubt. I mean, that With, length is a, a major problem right now. So I, I don't want to overreact, man, but I'm just looking at it like, hell, I don't know how you take him out of the starting rotation under the current circumstances, given the fact Correct. that he can give you that depth. Uh, yeah, and and listen, uh, I, I know that uh, uh, Astro fans are have, you know, they're savvy fans, and they know, hey, Luis Garcia is coming, Lance McCullers is coming, but that's not happening, guys, until best-case scenario – out of the all-star break. So that's July. We're barely into April. Um, Christian Javier, I thought that is a great sign. I thought of, of, of all the, the disaster of a weekend that that opening series was, the uh, Josh Hader pitched well, despite getting the loss on Sunday. And Christian Javier, I thought was excellent. So that's great. Um, the other stuff, Framber Valdez, constantly behind batters, walking more than striking out. J.P. France, okay. Uh, Hunter Brown, still lacking swing and miss. Uh, so you're right. Uh, guys, there's a lot of what if. What if he gets going? What if so that, that's, that's very not, not really Astro-like during this recent run. They've never really had this much uncertainty in their entire pitching staff. So 
if Blanco can give you, not saying, obviously he's not throwing a no-hitter every time out, but man, if he can give you competent length of any type out of this rotation, if he can give you anything, that is so huge right now. Hey, Rofo, something else you said a little earlier in your comment earlier about Dana Brown talking about, you know, he don't want to step on his toes, but but Blanco yeah. may be a guy that, that's a starter. One thing that I think here locally we've seen, there ain't no doubt, Dana Brown ain't worried about stepping on nobody's damn I'm toes. Say, I, mean, I, he, I think he enjoys it. I mean, he, yeah. was step, he was standing on all ten of Dusty's at some point in time last year. <laughs> but but I mean, is that – and I just bring that up. Look, it is what it is. Whatever the dynamic is here at Minute Maid, it's, it's fine with me. But um, what is that in your, your experience with other ball clubs? I mean, is that pretty typical? Is that just something you have to, that has to be massaged with the manager – the owner and the GM, or or how do you view that that kind of general manager? I'll use the term overstep, yeah. if you will, but but you get my point. Yeah, no, I I, I think look, I, I don't uh, know Dana that well, uh, but I, I imagine look, I, I imagine it's a lot like when any person steps into a position of authority, whether it's being a general manager of a baseball team or being a district manager of a uh, pharmaceutical company. Shout out to all my pharmaceutical salesmen that are stuck in traffic on the 610 loop right now. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, there's a, there's kind of a, a period where you gotta, I mean, you, you want a cohesive working relationship. So I imagine there's a bit of a learning curve of, you know, this person likes this certain way, but then again, I'm ultimately safe for the owner, Jim Crane. I'm making the decisions here. So uh, Dana Brown is very smart. He knows what he's doing. He's a baseball man through and through. He's, uh, uh, you know, came up through the scouting ranks, which I think is very important. So, um, yeah, I, so I, I, I imagine that he had to find his way to which which best way to to kind of uh, assimilate his himself in, into the organization. But but ultimately, like you said, he's he's not afraid to to ruffle any feathers and make any kind of decision because that's what he's paid to do. Robert Flores, MLB Network, joins us, and you mentioned him. He gets the ball tonight. Uh, yeah, is it too early to be concerned about Framber no. Valdez? And you're okay. No, <laughs> no, it's not. No, because you're here's serious. why, guys. It it's been it's been a it's been a good. This is a pretty big sample size where he where he has struggled and not looked like the guy that threw the no-hitter. It, it's almost like, I, now I could be wrong, maybe I'm just thinking of it incorrectly, but it almost seemed like after he threw that no-hitter, he wasn't quite as good. And that was the way it stretched through the end of 2023. It went through the postseason, and now you see the first start. So is it is it panic, DEFCON one time? No, obviously it's early in the season, but it is just something that makes you go, man, they really need him to be the Fromber that we saw in 2022. They really need that guy back desperately. Because it's all it all looks the same, doesn't it? Every and how he he so gets in he trouble. was constantly behind. I was watching the game every time he, I turned it on. Two and zero, oh, three and one, four pitch walk. Two and zero, oh, three and one, uh, three and two, four pitch walk. So it, it, he was constantly behind. I think part of the problem is, and I'm not quite sure what the answer is, his stuff has so much movement. I think he's got natural movement, and sometimes I think it's hard for him to control. Um, we know that he's, you know, sometimes he has to battle himself, and I'm sure that he's there's a little bit of that going on, and, and no one wants to do better than he does, right? So um, every, every Astros fan rooting for him, and um, – Hopefully he can return to form pretty quickly, beginning tonight. Yeah, please. R Roflo, what, what about – because a big part of last night, there's so many different storylines with this no-hitter, man. And, and But but one, uh, I, I think, was the biggest storyline coming into the season was was uh, uh, Diaz, Yainer Diaz yeah. taking over from Maldonado. I Clint, mean, that, you're so right, man. You're so right. Uh, you know, for a kid – and he's still young – for a, a kid to come out and work with a pitcher – that I'm sure, you know, he knows, and I'm sure that helps, but Yainer Diaz doesn't have a whole lot of big league experience himself. He's obviously played behind Martin Maldonado, but for him to be the man behind the plate, putting the fingers down or punching in the button for the pitch com, working with Blanco under those conditions with that on the line, that says something. And then he goes deep twice. 
I mean, look, I, I love Machete uh, as, as much as the next guy. But, man, and, and I was a big, big Machete defender. I'll be the first one to admit. But, man, watching Diaz last night handle and call a game and then go deep twice, man, that's just, wow. It, it's, it's impressive. So I'm glad you mentioned him. Yeah, uh, before we get you out of here, Roflo, uh, listen, uh, as you said, there are some flashing signs, and they are one and four. Uh, last night was big, yeah. but they are one and four, and that mm-hmm. happened to the hands of the Yankees, who are now 5-0. and oh. And mm-hmm. I think most Astros fans look at the Yankees uh, and and just, all right, we got them. We got their number for good reason. And yeah, I, I'm, curi- I get that. I'm curious from you, do the Yankees feel different this year to you? Yeah. Yeah, they do. And uh, here's why. Uh, two words. Juan Soto. Yeah. Um, you, you know, last year, the Yankees dealt with a variety of injuries. Uh, Anthony Rizzo got hurt. DJ LeMayu hurt. Giancarlo Stanton hurt. Um, so when, when those guys went away, and there was really no one else in that lineup. So if Aaron Judge didn't hit a three-run homer, there's a good chance that that offense wasn't doing much. Um, you can't bank on that now. Juan Soto's in a walk year. He's in a contract year. So he is going to be at his best. Uh, I, so he, he's definitely in line for a huge payday. And he's hoping that the Yankees will step up and be the ones that to write him a big check. So I think Juan Soto, I picked him to be my MVP before the season because I knew he knows what's at stake. He knows what he's playing for. So yeah, the Yankees feel a, a lot different. And one thing that you could always say about the Yankees is more often than not, their bullpen's good. And last night, their bullpen gave up their first run of the season. That's a stark contrast in what the Astros have felt and seen so far from their bullpen. That was, un- that was unnecessary, Robert. It really was. It's an <laughs> unnecessary shot on the way out. All Dude, right, can we just get some outs? I, I, I get so frustrated in the sixth and seventh. I mean, this weekend was between the Cougars uh, getting uh, bounced out and then the Astros getting swept. It was rough in my household. I know. I was it was rough. rated as hell right oh, now. I know. It was. Yeah, exactly. You're right. That, <laughs> I, I had to that he weekend. To. Yeah. I know you did. That's exactly. all right, man. You, you're not alone. All right, Roflo, <laughs> we'll talk to you down the line. You got it. Real quick, guys, MLB Network is now available on Hulu. So if you're a Hulu customer, be sure to give us a try. MLB Network and then MLB Central Central Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. Houston time. All right, thank you. I ain't got to say it again then. He said it right there. You got it, man. Robert Flores, MLB Network. Go check him out 8 a.m. every morning on MLB Network. As he said, you can do that on Hulu as well. All right, we'll get back to not just the no-hitter. Last night was a big night not just for the staff, as they got the night off, but at the plate as well. We'll discuss that. And are we potentially seeing the best of all time right now? We'll discuss that coming up next, right here live on The Drive. Nobody knows what it means. Provocative, it gets the people going. Pain and Pendergast. The biggest need is cornerback. The one that I'm actually...
tax benefits. Call 800-741-GOLD now and tell them that Jason Hansen sent you. They'll send you a free 2024 gold investing kit with my exclusive economic briefing for 2024. Don't wait. Call 800-741-G-O-L-D. KILT. KILT FM HD2 Houston. Insider Access. Exclusive content. The Texans play here. Always live on the free Odyssey app. Oh, it's 3 o'clock. Sports Radio 610 presents The Drive with Sterner and Hughley. With the biggest stories of the day, it's the Big Three at Three. Number one. Tucker sends this one to left field. Well hit. Barsho into that corner. That's gone. Kyle Tucker. A two run home run into the Crawford boxes. His first of the year. And the Astros jump in front 2 0. There it is. Uh, last night, obviously, the big, big story was Ronnell. Oh, Nail Blanco stepping up and uh, and giving the Astros their 17th uh, no hitter in club history. That was a huge, huge performance, and it was seven strikeouts, only two walks. The first, uh, the first uh, at batter at the of the game, and George Springer, and then he got George again in the ninth. Uh, for walks. Other than that, he got everybody out in so many different ways. But, Clint, we talked about yesterday how are they going to bridge to to Presley? Well, obviously they did so with Blanco, but what we also talked about was that lineup needs to help him. And as you just heard there, that was one of Kyle Tucker's two home runs. And also, Yiner Diaz chipped in. They both hit home runs in the same innings both both times. Yiner ball. As they go, they go deep twice. Uh, Jeremy Pena. Praise be. July Good 5th. Lord. July 5th is the last time that kid hit a home run. It's he a damn near, He damn near made it nine months, boys. It's a damn shame. Now, yes, he almost, he almost went to childbirth. It's a damn. It's a damn shame that 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 a guy with that natural power would have to go that long for hitting home run. Hopefully that doesn't happen again. But the offense also stepped up, Clint, uh, up and down the lineup, and ten big runs also to go through. That's a big deal too, as well. Obviously, in that those first four games, the bullpen was an issue, but they also seemed to struggle getting the big hits. In uh, in those four, first four games, so it's good to see the lineup step up and jump out too. Yeah, look, I mean, anytime you can you can put up that that many runs in that fashion, it's it's a hell of a night on top of a no hitter. So, absolutely beautiful. I, look, I mean, we talked about Yainer Diaz and the numbers last year. Can he do it this year while he's full time catching as well with the fatigue that comes with being behind the plate three out of every four games, if not more. Um, you know, is the power that he showed, is it real? Can he be more disciplined at the plate and, and over 162 and more at bats? And, um, you know, hell, I mean, he was high 200s and, and dropping bombs left and right last year. Was that real? Ron, I, I mean, it, again, we don't, we haven't, I don't think we've seen enough to know, like, hey, man, is he a little bit more disciplined great, at the plate or great not? Great start. He appears to be, and the power and, and the pop is there. You said it. Great start. Hell of a start. Yainer Diaz is a guy that you, you're going to have a hard time. Right now, you're going to have a hard time not ha- not having him in the five hole, bro. Yeah, it kind of has been here a little bit, uh, especially with the injury, the little day off that, that uh, Al, uh, Abreu. Abreu had. Yeah. And he's been hitting ahead of Abreu here uh, the last couple of games, even when he's been in. So, yeah, he, he, he had a huge night last night. And he'll be able to do what he did at the plate and then to do uh, – uh, uh, you know, behind the plate and helping out Blanco with that that no hitter, it was big. It was big for him. I'm glad also to see that Kyle Tucker is off to a good start to start the season. Because the last time we saw Kyle Tucker, uh, Kyle Tucker looked like Shawn Michaels that time when he lost his smile Damn. and retired. Damn, he did. Shawn Michaels said, "I Heartbreak lost kid, I man. lost my smile," Drive and then he retired by. for. For months, a couple of those in the Astros. <laughs> yeah, a couple of those, but but it's big for him because you know right now. Now listen, I don't. Jordan will, will get the the ball is just not finding enough holes right now for Jordan, and he is hitting the ball hard and getting on on base even even despite uh, running into some outs. 
So I, I think it'll he'll be fine. But but this is was this three homers for Kyle Tucker? Uh, as as is this were those his first no, two? No, those last were his night? first two. Yeah, I thought he hit one against the Yankees. Um, yep. Just make that up. Try to add one on to you, Kyle. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> hey, but, it's a contract year. He'll take it. <laughs> yeah, he will. Uh, they took that that inside the Parker from him last year, I believe, as they made it an oh, error. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. He should have had right. 30, 30 last year. But, no, big night. Big night for the Astros at the plate uh, as um, as they stepped up as they needed to. We see if they, we'll see if they can add on to that and make that two in a row against the uh, the Blue Jays tonight. But they need that, that, um, that offense to help more. It is – it is clearly big. Well, I guess it really wasn't a Framber last game. They gave him a four nothing lead to start the first. But it is big to to get your uh, your pitcher out there comfortable, and yeah. I think it helped uh, it helped uh, Ronell attack the zone more when they were up early like that. So that'll be big if they can help out Framber tonight. Maybe, yeah, maybe look, seven I, runs will work. I, I think them bats are hot, Tyler. We're gonna look, need to look at that run total again tonight. But I already um, gave it a glance, what my is friend. It? And I think this whole trend that happened a bit last year where they would have these offensive explosions, you know, big crooked numbers in the next game, they get shut out or score one, I think that ends. I'm all over four and a half again tonight. Four we and hit, a half again tonight, huh? We hit that thing by what, the fourth inning last night? Yeah. Yeah, yeah let's ride. Is, Barrios is their ace. And and they need to win another home game. So I, I'm liking another crooked number tonight. Let's ride. I'm thinking about it. <laughs> let's ride. You think about that, too. They got their ace on the mound. We'll see. We'll see. Oh, we'll it see. ain't none to these strows. Hey, hey, anytime here, Alex Brigman, you want to get going here, that'd be great, too, as well. <laughs> God, you ain't kidding. This trend is it's just slow, not going to go it's away. Slow, <laughs> it's slow starts, man. It's slow starts up there, boy. It got, it got, like, he better hurry up because he's got Clint thinking crazy. I was talking about moving uh, old, old Diaz. He'll he'll shove Diaz right above. Yeah, I mean, hell, you, I mean, you gonna, you gonna put uh, Tucker and Alvarez at the top? You gonna put them big your, your power hitters at, at damn near anywhere in the lineup? Hey man, look out, Bregman. You better say you're, you're Look out, Bregman. Ticking. Clock is de- definitely ticking. Clock is ticking. Find your ass down there with a Bray. You. Diner bomb. Big three and three. Number two. I know there are people who are ready for that switch. I know there are some out there ready for that switch. All right, last night. Uh, the Astros, while they were uh, they were no hitting the Blue Jays, uh, I think around the sports world, the game of the night was Iowa at LSU, and Clint Caitlin Clark was absolutely insane. Forty one points, twelve assists, seven rebounds, breaking more records last night. They get to the Final Four, uh, avenging that loss in the championship game to LSU, and. It was a hell of a game most of the way, entertaining most of the way, 45-45 at the half. Angel Reese, the other star, was out and was playing well in the first half. And Caitlin Clark as well. But, Clint, I'm not going to lie to you, man. I, I There may be some people who, who, who may disagree, and that's fine. For me personally, I, I think Caitlin Clark's the best women's basketball player I've ever seen. I just I, – I just, her game, when you watch her play – how many have you seen? A lot. Um, I watch women's basketball. I know you I've do. watched I'm it just for a while. I know Cheryl Swoops will, will will be hot about this. This when I watch her play, Clint. Like it's hard for me to look at other women to compare to. Like and like I watch her. There's some other gay. There's some other players where I'm like, oh, that kind of reminds me of Diana Taurasi. That kind of reminds me of Candace Parker. Angel Reese at times without the shot kind of reminds me of Candace Parker. When I look at her, she looks. It looks like Steph. <laughs> yes. You know what not, I mean, like not it, another female player. No, it, it. no yeah. It looks. Right. It looks <laughs> like the way she is able to dribble and get get her own shot, and then she passes and she sees the entire court like like Steph or LeBron does. It, it's crazy. She led the league in points and assists this year, and like I, I don't get the sense that people are just gonna stop her at the next level. Either that that girl it's it's insane. She can get her shot off from anywhere. That that sidestep that she gets into a three. I I just I've never seen top to Rossi, Tamika Catchings was great. Uh Candace Parker was great. Sue Bird was great. I've never seen anybody with that game the the, the way that she has. Yeah, and and I agree with you wholeheartedly. Cynthia Cooper, the same thing. I I, I agree with you wholeheartedly on that. Now I'm not. I haven't watched a a a ton of women's basketball coming up. We can be completely transparent here, but it's not hard. I mean, you these comparisons are being made day in day out for the last. I mean, hell, really year. But but 
uh, definitely over the last month or so. And so it's not hard to to, to listen to 10 different comparisons and, and see the highlights of, of 10 different players. And and it's even, you know, watching um, – uh, what's the, the gal from UConn last night and, and oh, Juju Paige Watkins. Beckers, Paige Beckers and, and Juju, what is it, Juju Watkins? Yeah. Um, you know, watching those, they're, they're great players, but they're not on the same planet relative to shooting the rock and getting your own shot as as Caitlin Clark is. Oh, I mean, she just, the, her handle and everything. Yeah, it's it's ridiculous. And then and then to me, and I said this, I said this yesterday when we were talking about him. Is like there there is there is something about doing what she's doing at a school like Iowa versus in a day where everybody transfers. People say, well, she needs to win. Like I heard Rebecca Lobo, I think it was this morning, talking about, well, she don't need one. She needs more than one national championship to be considered the GOAT. Well, she could have very easily transferred to LSU and won one last year with LSU and won one this year with LSU. She could have very easily transferred to one of the powerhouses at UConn or one of the powerhouses in college basketball and – and done that. I mean, yeah, the fact I, that she's doing it at Iowa, I, I think, is that there's a, there's another. Not that I don't have anything against the people that that do it a different way, but there's something about carrying a program instead of being surrounded by five stars. Her actually carrying a well, program. Well, respectfully to Rebecca Lobo <laughs> and her lanky ass. Um, there, oh, no, weren't, so. there weren't but two real, real basketball programs for years there in, in, in women's college basketball. I mean, outside of Connecticut Tennessee, and Tennessee, right? yeah, there weren't there weren't Juju Watkins walking around at SC, and then Paige Beckers at UConn, and then Angel Reese and that crew at LSU, and then like the the, the, the competition and the players and the amount of players that are spread out all over the place, like they, it's it's the competition is different. South Carolina's over there. We haven't even mentioned them. They they've lost one game in two years. Yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> and, and and that's. Like there were, there were, there were one team just dominating, two teams dominating everybody. Like it, that's that's not the case anymore. All right, it's it's so so she's playing in a much tougher time and a tougher period than than, than people like Tarasi who won all of those yeah. those championships. So no, I, I, I it's eye test. You you look at her. That, I mean that it's insane. It's insane what she's able to do. I I, I can't even. I, I can't even believe it, but uh, they get to the Final Four. Uh, Iowa versus UConn as they win. Juju Watkins, they uh, they lose uh, a lot to do with a selfish player on her team. South Carolina, NC State on the other side. She is. I'm sorry. That, that young lady, 25, she had to be ashamed of herself. <laughs> Never seen anything like it. <laughs> just delusional. Just getting rebounds and coming down the court and not passing it to anybody, just jacking it up. Nobody, Nobody on the team knows you're shooting it. Just you. Damn, missed it. I think she probably shot it more than Juju did. Um, Said, oh, damn, so. Really did. But uh, for their lovely reward, they get to go to Cleveland. I don't know who came up with that idea, but let's do it. I just don't understand. <laughs> Sounds like a punishment. <laughs> it, uh, no, I'm serious. They, they, they have the Sorry, regionals. Sadie. They had the regionals in Albany. Yes, let's get fired up to go there. Not even, not, not New York, not in Albany. Hell, it could have been in Buffalo. They had it in Albany in Portland. And then let's 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 really give the ladies a treat and send their asses to Cleveland because that's where everyone wants to go. Anyway, man, Cleveland's nice this time of year, man. That's Figgy's. That's Figgy's old stomping grounds, man. Oh, is grounds, it? Man. Cleveland, that's where you want to go. Oh, it's nice. God, first week of April. Let's go to Cleveland. You didn't sound like even you believed that. He didn't. Oh man, <laughs> he's never had a nice, good time, man. Go to good temperature in Cleveland. Beautiful city. Here we go. What are they gonna do? Rock and Roll Hall of Fame <laughs> every day leading into it. Hey, we ain't far. Dave and Buster. We're not far from the NFL Hall of Fame. Oh, yeah, that's it. Let's ride to Canton. Make a little pit stop in Akron? <laughs> yes. We get to tour LeBron's home that he grew up in. There you go. That's well, one well don't lie it. now, Ron. You'd love that. Oh, of course. Not me. Not, not, not some of those young ladies from Raleigh, <laughs> North Carolina. Man, we couldn't get – we could get – the boys are in Phoenix. <laughs> we got Myrtle Beach right the, here. Uh, the, men, the men are in Phoenix. Where are we at? Cleveland. <laughs> big three at three number three all right tonight is a big one uh for the rockets uh they're on the road in minneapolis they play the timberwolves who are also uh needing this game for seating as well as they're third in the west right now uh huge game i i feel like these are must wins really down the stretch because we know they play the warriors thursday with that loss 
Uh, they are now two games back behind the Warriors. The Warriors play the Mavs tonight, which is a very losable game for them. So you could get back within one if things shake out right. Uh, this is a big, big game. They struggled in the last game. Last time, Jalen Green, who has been the linchpin of this, had 12 points. Uh, they got to get this dub. All of these are must win to make that, that one happen. If the worst case scenario happens, you lose tonight and Golden State beats the Mavericks that game Thursday, it's, it, it doesn't matter as much. It's a three game cushion. And, and really, right now, the Warriors hold the tiebreaker over them. So it, it, it's it's even more than that. So they Let's need. Go they need. It's a tough road game, but they need to win this one tonight. Yeah, look, I mean, Edwards, Anthony Edwards has got it. He's one of the hottest in the game right now, isn't he? Uh, he's, uh, he's, he is what you. Rockets fans are crossing your fingers that Jalen Brown exactly. or Jalen Brown, Jalen Green will be. Exactly where I was going with that, Ron. This is one of those deals where if Jalen Green needs a little extra little extra something to, to get up for tonight, that, that would be it. Yep. Yep. All right, lineup is out. Uh and this is this is becoming interesting what we're seeing in the lineup. And uh and I and I really kinda like it from S uh from S from Joe Espada. We'll give you that lineup. Also, we gotta get to the bottom of something that I know it's going to do Clint in about uh, Ron El Blanco. We'll discuss that coming up next. All right, Ron likes the starting lineup that Joe Spot has put out there. We'll see what that is. What I like is in prices over at Academy Sports.
this year with the odyssey app whether you're at the gym on the field or walking around the block find your favorite workout mix on the free odyssey app thanks to planet fitness there's plenty of options to help you find your groove check them all out on the odyssey app thanks to planet fitness get that big fitness energy Sports Radio 610 presents the drive with sterner and hugely Tyler's up on his monsters again and, and and wants us to match him as he's yelling at us. Get some get some energy in there. Like we like because we want us to I'll match. I'll give me a coffee in the next break, Bob. No, you're fine. Thank you. You're coachable. Ron, no, no, find no, some energy. Fine. No, we had no just because you're jacked up on monsters doesn't and Mountain mean Mountain Dew. Whatever. Yeah, mixing them doesn't mean I've got enough energy, damn it. I'll come at you like a spider monkey. I just don't even know what to what to say to that. Exactly. I'm inside your head. <laughs> I'd like to. <laughs> I'd like to get inside your face. I don't want you to get inside my head or my face. Uh, I'm already any, there. Any type of a spider or a monkey or any of them together. I'm inside there. Um, I want to get down to the bottom of something before we give you the lineup today. If you listen to the first segment of the show, this will really, really throw a wrench potentially into something we talked about Clint just looked up here and I I I don't believe this for a second and I I I I want I want proof of this Ron El Blanco is listed as six foot 180 pounds ain't no chance in hell (laughs) that unit six foot that that, that 180 they have him listed if he's six foot that's 280 it's like when I was in high school basketball and they added inches and in weight to shout, my listing. Shout out to a texter and said, somebody somebody texted and shout out to that texter and said, guys, they got Ron El Blanco listed at six foot one eighty. I said, no way. They know that. I, no look, I looked, I found four different ones. They all got him six foot one eighty. He's big as hell. That must be when he was twenty two when I the Astros say, first signed. This him. is this gotta be like a driver's license. I had two forty five on my driver's license for a long time. And that was that was that was definitely when I got my permit at fifteen. My basketball program said I was like six one, like one seventy. I was definitely five ten, maybe one fifty. One hundred and eighty pounds. There is nothing about that man. <laughs> like I want, I want him to stand next to your nine. Like I, I, I like. There's no way. Cause what? What is Ron? They- it don't. It don't matter who he's standing next to. <laughs> yeah. Tyler. Tyler's one eighty, bro. Tyler. No, he's he's one. No, 180 is actually like my You're exact 180? weight. Mm-hmm. I fluctuate oh, between 180. Same, you think Ron they're saying him and Ron L are the same size. I mean, you How kidding tall me? are you, Tyler? 5'11". So they're saying that, that basically Tyler and Ron L are the same size. You know, ain't no ain't chance in no hell. Ain't no way, what do they? What do they have Framber listed as? I don't know. 
But that 180 is like one shame. butt that's, cheek. That, it's just not possible. They got Framber listed as 5'11", 239. Somebody give him that 40. Somebody just, <laughs> is that Framber pushing to get underneath that pound? They got him at 239. There is not a chance in hell. Oh, no, hell no. That Framber has 60 pounds on him. Which end was he looking Sorry, for? Sorry, Framber, 59 pounds on it. There is no chance. <laughs> there is no chance. Oh, man, that's Six funny. foot 180? Are they just guessing? Are they just saying, what would you like us to put down? <laughs> Maybe he's self-conscious. He ain't been 180 in, 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 in six you're, years. I think you're right. There's, they must that, that must have not changed since they signed him at 22 out of the Dominican. He's self-conscious, and that confidence that they gave him by listing that got him to a no-no. There ain't, there ain't no way. That's like me walking out here. Ron Hughley, 197. <laughs> you try to lie to Astros. 6'1", 197, Ron Hughley. What? Aren't you like 5'4"? I will will slit the back of your knees. (laughs) Wow. And I I will lay you down and squeeze fresh lemon juice on the back of those cuts. You know I got bad knees. Or bad knee. What a jackass. Yeah, that that, that one caught me off guard. Man, look 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 at him standing next. Six foot one. They they got Yainer Diaz, six foot 195, which I ain't buying that either. But, But you look at. Him standing next, he's he's every bit of three or four inches taller than Yiner Diaz, and every bit is thick. There's no way he's 180. But the, I mean, the, the big one is they have him basically as the same height and weight as Tyler. Yeah, I didn't realize that at <laughs> that first. Works. That that's that's insane. <laughs> they got that's, that's crazy. Who's, who's got to get to the bottom of this, Dana? I mean, I, I would have maybe. I, I mean, look, I'm just. What would you on, have guessed? What would you have get? What would you have round the horn guessed on on? Ron El Blanco. No lighter than 240. I would have said 6'2", 225. Yeah, I think I would have said Have y'all seen the ass on this guy? <laughs> I mean, have you seen the lower half on this guy? I've not seen his ass as like much. Luke I mean, you see, when, when, when he got the, either the seventh or eighth <laughs> inning, when he got that out and he and his sucker walked off the field, I mean, it, it looked, I mean, that sucker's thick, boy. I thought inside linebacker. He's big as hell. No. Hell no. I did. I, I thought inside linebacker. He's obviously two, not as tall as I thought if he's only six foot. I mean, I, I would have gone I would have gone six two, two forty. Somebody texted and said that must have been Otani's translator who gave them those <laughs> Yes, yes. That's Stole a couple good. inches. That's pretty good. Yeah. Like, I don't I don't know how people could just write like write that in and look at that man. There is nothing. There is no way. One hundred and eighty pounds. I'm sorry, that just that just blew me away. It's unbelievable. Not tricking us. No, six. Yeah, not tricking. Not tricking anybody. <laughs> six foot. Okay. What what size does six foot one eighty equal out? That guy's six foot. You want to tell me that guy's six foot as well? I mean, what is, he can eat peanuts off his forehead. What size do you wear? What like realistically, you're a mm. you wear. I think you size a little big, but you a lar a large XL is what a guy one eighty should be able to get into. Ron, look at this. Ron L, get your ass in a large. I like to see. <laughs> look at his picture of Espada and Ron L. If, if Ron L is 180, Espada's 120, and he's about 5'4. There's no I way. I mean, there's no way. There, there, no way. there ain't no way in hell. There ain't no way. He lost Clint. He's no, got to get every photo he possibly can of me? Ron L. Blanco. I mean, that's wild, man. He may not be as big as I thought he was, but I'm going to tell you. 180. I, I didn't. I didn't have him within within. Must be the that. must be the same dude who said uh, Pujols' his age from the text line. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Six foot 180. How about it, folks? I'm gonna find you a good picture. of His glutes. <laughs> Clint, hey, there's, there's there ain't never been a man with glutes like that weigh a buck eighty. Clint comes off the top rope. You see that guy's ass? I mean his quads <laughs> and his ass. I mean it's it's ridiculous. Starting lineup tonight: Altuve. Jordan Alvarez, another man with a with a solid ass. Kyle Tucker, Bregman. Jordan's got to be what two ten. Um, another uh, another guy. <laughs> if they if they got if they have, I'm I'm scared to look at what they got. Jordan. I mean, they might have him listed. If they have him under two forty, they're 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 a lie. Anyway, uh, Tucker batting third. Bregman, Diaz is DHing. Abreu, McCormick, uh, and uh, and old Vic is catching with uh, with Pena. Behind him, I think the big thing is this is now two games, Clint. We've seen where Yiner Diaz 
when he is getting the day off from catching, because obviously you're not going to catch every single day, they're still keeping him in the lineup and putting him at at DH, which which pushes old Jake out of the lineup. Well, no, yeah, it pushes you know, it puts it's, today it pushes Jake out of it. Um, it pushes it pushes you're not in the outfield, which I don't love. But I mean, well, look, I mean, here's the deal, Ron. We we've got we got to keep that bat in there. We though. got we're, we're going on game number six for the Astros, and we've had three different center fielders. Start a game. <laughs> that damn Jake can't catch a break. That, that commitment to Jake lasted, what, two games? <laughs> oh, Somebody boy. Somebody texted and said, damn, I thought Clint was talking about Nicky, Nicky Minaj when he said, damn, well, did you see that I, ass? I mean, look, Nicky, Meg, I mean, it's all. I mean, when they, oh, when, when, right when Ron L walked off that mound, I, I thought the same thing. I would not, not. I mean, I thought size wise, same oh, okay. thing. I was gonna say. Same thing. I, I thought mean, I, I, when I, I, old Lohan Hensley, old Lohan Hensley, put his hand down there on oh, Meg's yeah. and white britches Dang, she had. Damn! Well, look at the ass on that Whoa. guy. Look at that there, boy. Look, hey, we'll catch you. Let let him get in an all white uniform. We'll see if that if that if that one eighty holds. What do you think? They, what did they list uh, Altuve at? <laughs> I don't know, but Jordan's listening at two twenty five. Oh, stop! <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> they got Jordan at two twenty six. You're right. You're right. What is Altuve way? I, listen, I know we're late. Sorry, sorry, uh, Parker. I got to get this one. <laughs> one sixty five. Shut up. So Ron Hill's they got, got, got him 15. at one sixty five. <laughs> so Ron Hill's got fifteen pounds on Altuve. <laughs> A foot and, and Shut fifteen up. pounds. No, Are they? The that's stop. You. Stop that right now. They got him at 165? Yes. What do you think he weighs? I think he weighs 165. There's no way they're going to have him at 165 and then go out there and look at that man who pitched that no-hitter <laughs> yesterday. He's only – that you that that Al, Altuve's got 15 pounds. It's 15 pounds lighter. Really, really Blanc. happy. That's what they're trying to push us across. I'm just staring at Tyler and they're going, that, that old boy right there just <laughs> threw a no-hitter last night. For sure. Yeah, I did not piece that together at first. That's way off. That's ridiculous. All right, coming up, I need some help. I need some help. And um, last night really brings in perspective something for one of the most important players in all of Houston sports. We'll discuss that coming up next.
Now through April 23rd, get a $15 gift card when you buy five or more quarts of Edge or Edge High Mileage Full Synthetic only at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Claim based on Sequence 3 H test versus API SP test limits. Live from the Twin Peaks studios, Sports Radio 610 presents The Drive with Sterner and Hughley. All right, welcome back in. As um, someone said, they got Clint at 175, soak it wet. <laughs> yeah. Is that I ain't been that. Hey, ninth grade, G. Ninth I, grade. I would, ninth yeah. grade, Buck 75. I'd like, I'd, like, I'd like to have a, uh, I'd like to attack their skill. You ain't never lied. I want to <laughs> get weighed in by the Astros. Maybe that's why, that, maybe that's why uh, Bregman was so confused on how much weight he, he gained <laughs> or didn't. Remember, we'd sit up there and said, yeah. Breckman said he gained 23 pounds. Yes. His trainer told him 23, and he and weighed in with the Astros, and it was 12. And it's 206. Damn. What? From the text line, Ron, it's 5'3", 220. Your mama. <laughs> hey, what are you, really? Good five, nine and a half. <laughs> he's got 5'10", Tyler. He's got he's knocking on 5'10". <laughs> I shrunk a little bit from my, my playing days, so about 5'9". See, we're getting older, man. As we get older, we shrink, man. I'll tell you, the shoes went down about 5'9". Two, Tyler ain't hit that shrinking stage yet. Two, two, I'm about 239, 238. Same thing as... Uh, who was that? Who was that? They got at two thirty nine. I don't know because they got Jordan, Jordan two twenty five. Two twenty five. Who is who is it? They had at two thirty nine. I would guess Jordan's closer to two thirty nine. It's got to be more. Oh no no no! It was uh it was Framber. They had Framber. They got Framber at two thirty nine. They got Framber weighing damn near two forty. Yeah, five. What did they say? Five five ten or five no, eleven two thirty nine. No I believe he's two thirty nine. You don't. see now? Have you seen his ass? Two thirty nine. That's what they got listed. Yo, I, I, that's why I said I wonder how how much they have Framber win, and that's why I said there is no way that there is that big of a discrepancy. Give me a picture those. next to Framber and, and Ronell. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're the only you're, you're the only guy in America that could do that, Tyler. Find me a picture of of, of old Ronell standing next to Framber Valdez, and let's see what let's see what two forty looks like next to one eighty. Let, that is a sixty pound difference <laughs> between Ronell Blanco and Framber Valdez, and fifteen who, who, and fifteen between Ronell and, and Jose and Altuve. Altuve. I mean, who's running that down there? I mean, I, <laughs> but hey, what you say? They didn't switch the scale out with uh, when Framber comes. I mean, up. there's something going on, man. What, who are they trying? They trying to sell? They trying to sell Framber? Hey, he's two forty and throws twenty five complete. Uh, 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 nah, Doug, he's two thirty nine. Quality starts. They, they keeping that pound. They keeping it under mm. two thirty. Two thirty nine. Hey, real quick, I, I I need a little uh I need a little help. So uh, you know I, I blew out the tire. Shout out to to Bryce yesterday to help me out. Not Byron. Not Byron. Shout out to Bryce. So of course you know. Listen, sometimes I get accused of being cheap. Um, I I wasn't gonna sit on the spare for for any 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 longer period. So today I went and got got new. I got both. Tires in the back, so I got fresh, brand new, all four tires. Well, I think I think you, you good buddy that you sit next to over here every day for for solid four hours. I think I may have told you to do that last time. Hold on, my man. But my then man. You, then you wouldn't have met Bryce, my man, my man right there, the tire guy who told me last. <laughs> uh, I told you. <laughs> he didn't hit you with I told you so. Told you. Oh no! They said it was the inside. I told you. He said, "Let me look at that tire." <laughs> let me guess. Inside back. He said, right. "Let me see." He said, "Is that tire in the trunk?" Let me look at that tire. Well, good to it, see you right again, there. Ron. <laughs> Right there, somehow I slid it. Somehow they got me for headlights too. But um, there you go. <laughs> but then, then he said to me, he was like, "You you want to replace these windshield wipers?" And I was like, "Oh, cool. I thought that was nothing." I was like, "How much windshield?" I said, "How much is windshield wiper?" She said, "Oh, it's fifty bucks a piece." I said, "Oh, no, hold on." I said, "I'll, I'll take care of that later." I just, I have no idea because in my mind, I'm not paying them a hundred dollars to change windshield. Is that an easy fix? Is that an easy one to Very. do on your own? Yes. So, that, like, like, that, like, I, can, I can do that one myself. Absolutely. I can go and purchase the windshield wipers, and do that. That one's easy. Because yes. that one in my mind felt like I felt like I could YouTube my way through that. Absolutely, you can. Now, have I'm, you I'm, have I'm you a, done that before? I'm, I'm, I'm going to do, 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 do you one better. Now, if you all would like to do it, if you all no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do I'm going to do you one better. Because in my mind, it, how I planned it in my head was go buy the windshield wipers. And maybe let's all get outside at once after we leave work. And hey, guys, y'all ever change windshield wipers? And then I was going to see if one of y'all. Well, well, I mean, here I'm, I'm going to do you one better. 
I'm not all auto zones, but there there have been multiple auto zones in my past and in my wife and in my mother. My They'll go mother, do it. When you buy them, if you ask them, hey, man, can you help me put these on real quick? They'll help you put them jokers on in the parking lot. Really? Yep. And I'm looking at AutoZone right now. And they do it? Somebody said Firestone Auto Zone, won't charge you. AutoZone, you can get them for, you can get you a pair of them jokers for about $20. I think that's what it is. Is that a pair of them or is that Someone one? said. Someone just texts in. AutoZone does it for free if you ask. There you go. <clears throat> go get in the zone, man. Your, your, said, your level of cheapness saved you about $80 right there. Oh, I, I knew that. I said, I, I said, there's no chance. I know I can do that myself. I believe I can't. Or I, at least I know one of you jokers can. I know somebody I walk to the parking lot with every day that can. Yeah, I can I'll put think, them on here at the office. I'm thinking to myself, damn, my father-in-law just did. I wouldn't have said nothing to him either. I got another, my boy Mike Ruiz, AutoZone and O'Reilly Auto Parts will put them on for you. Let's do it. I'm going to buy them bad men. They've got to be one of each. They're probably two of each. Man, on the Text line, here. damn damn Shane, a grown man can't change wiper plates. Yep, that's me. Don't got it. Well, it's and not, 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 not that off, hard. Not that now, first can. off, I, I don't think, it's not that I can't. I'm sure I can YouTube the thing. I could. I'm just listen, man. The, 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 the repair stuff, cars, it's not, my, it's, not my, it's not where I've been blessed. I've been blessed in other areas. <laughs> Let's let's talk about what those areas like in the next segment. <laughs> you know, I've been blessed in other areas. This one, this one is not it. R- wipers are an easy fix. I know one thing that I've been blessed on, not to just say, all right, go ahead, man. I, I'm going to toss this hundred to you. <laughs> and whatever the hey. tax you're about to put on this thing, no, nah, hey, I got you. My, my boy Mike said uh, next time we're at Twin Peaks, let him know he'll do it for $75. he will save you $25. No, nah, Mike, I, that ain't it either. <laughs> And either I was, hey, I was trying about, to make a quick buck. I was buck, about man. maybe buying one of you guys a drink and maybe <laughs> see if y'all. Hey, I'm man. your man. Walk me through it though. Let me let me do a lot of it. Tyler's like, don't let him at auto. Don't let him at AutoZone do it for free, man. Let me let buy me a drink. Let me do it in the parking lot. Yeah, man, your your man card needs to be cut. Sure, whatever. I never got a man card. I'm not sure where they issue them. Ain't that the damn truth? I try to keep my man card by being a as best of a husband and a father that I can be. Mm. So. Yeah. Take that. And your mama. Yeah. <laughs> Best as I can be. The drive plays for keeps. All right. Um, I, I I will say one thing from yesterday to another person who I don't believe puts on their own uh, windshield wiper blades, Framber Valdez. Watching that last night, I, I could not help but to think, fellas, like, if Ron L can do that against that lineup, if he can, if he can go nine innings, if he can be as efficient as he was in this pitch, and if you watched, if you watched it like I know you all did, the one thing that jumped out to me, and in, in comparison to what we watch when we see Framber, is he clearly attacked the zone. He was not afraid to throw strikes. He was not afraid to use his fastball. He used that changeup to perfection. I mean, he got so many out pitches on 84, 85 in in the plate. But he attacked the zone. And Robert Flores said it early. One of the things that you see and notice a lot in this extended stretch that Framber has struggled is 2-0 counts, 3-1 counts, uh, walks, including six of them last time. That's the thing that frustrates me is if we were looking at it right now, it is clear between Framber and Ron L who has better stuff. Mm-hmm. Far better. It's, it's Framber. That's the thing that I want to see. If 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 Ron L can go attack the Blue Jays, and they got a lineup, they got guys in there that can, that would concern you. If he can attack them with his stuff, I need to see that tonight for Framber. I need to see that because that was he he's he's like trying to make the perfect pitch and be fine and hit the corners. No, attack these jokers with your stuff. That was the big thing that jumped out to me from the difference from what we saw from. From uh, Blanco and what we've seen from Framber. Well, the, the interesting thing to me is what Roflo said a little earlier, Ron. Uh, it's and I don't know if it's lack of control or trying to be too cute with with pitches. I think that's so. But then, but I, I, look, I, and I, and I've never thought about it like that because again, we're talking about a guy that that had twenty five quality starts in a damn season, so you, you don't think there's there's going to be uh, like like some kind of uh, control issue, if you will, like like because the ball's moving so much, like day to day, fine, but. Um, but Robert Flores, we had on a little earlier in the 240 segment. If, if you're listening on the Odyssey app, you can, they got a rewind feature. You can go back and listen to it. It's always great when Roflo joins us um, talking the Astros. But um, he just mentioned that he he's at a point where, one, it is absolutely fine to be 
concerned about uh, about Fromber, but two, he wonders if there's so much movement on all of his pitches, really, that he's having a hard time controlling. I've never thought about it like that, but it is blatantly obvious when, when we watch him pitch. I mean, the movement on literally every, nothing straight. I mean, they're, 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 he is not capable of throwing just right down the pipe, straighter, straight as a string, and 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 getting a strike. It, it is there is huge movement on every pitch, and maybe that's something to to lean into. I, I never thought about that, Ron, but I guess it's. But he's going so many stretches where he has pitched good ball. Yeah, and has yeah, done yeah. No, I, like I mean, twenty five straight quality starts right. where he could be in the zone. I, to me, I feel I feel it feels like he's trying to be too cute. Yeah, he's trying to. You you've done it when you've played. Like if you've ever gotten to a maybe a rut or, or or slump or something, and you're aiming the ball and not just There's letting it go, there. trying to put it in a put it in the right the perfect spot. I feel like that's what he's doing, uh, and, and and it happens when he gets people on base and he gets nervous. Yeah, and I'm going to try to make the perfect pitch, paint the the perfect pitch. Just let it go. Ronell was not was not afraid of getting hit and putting it in play. He's got to be able to do that. What you got coming up at the four thirties? We. Dirty's daily, Dirty's baby. Dirty's daily, baby. We got to talk about this tipping situation going on in America. I posted a picture on social media, and it, uh, it, it it stirred them up. Now, it kicked the ant bed. I got called every name in the book. We got to talk about it. How much you tipping? How much you tipping when you go to the restaurant? Number one. Number two, my man Christian Harris, linebacker, Houston Texans, former Alabama Crimson Tide. Came on strong late in the season, y'all. He was on Texans All Access with the fellas, um, and he dropped some nuggets. Maybe potentially my favorite Texan uh, player. Maybe maybe my favorite. We'll uh, we'll discuss that next uh, right here on Sports.
KILT, KILT FM HD2 Houston. Insider access, exclusive content. The Texans play here. Always live on the free Odyssey app. Sports Radio 610 presents The Drive with Sterner and Hughley. And buckle up, ladies and gentlemen, because it's time for Dirty's Daily. How'd you like that big voice guy right there? Oh, yeah, that's is, that gro- is that is that going to grow on you? Yeah, I, yeah, I like the I like the verbiage. <laughs> you didn't like the delivery, the tone, the growl. I think why I'd have the vocal cords. The rest. <clears throat> what was going on right no, he, there? He man? can do better than that. He can do better. He knows he can. I can always do better because I'm always going to achieve better the well, second time I do something. You know, reps are, reps are are, uh, are are valuable, Tyler. Reps are valuable, man. We'll let you go at it again until Big Voice Guy gets <laughs> gets uh, gets it ready, man. We got one coming. Let's get on that. I don't way. know. It doesn't surprise you, man. Tyler's got a real thing. I'm gonna tell you. If you need something really he's, creative he's, done he's, he's for, got it. For, from the big voice guy, Tyler's got it. He can man. get to him quick. Let's Absolutely. see how quick he can get to him. You got it. You text him? You text you, you go straight. I talked to him. I emailed him last night and I actually talked to him. Uh, he was up here today. We'll have it tomorrow for sure. Good, right. good, good. That's good. I can't wait That's for that, speed. man. Not, not that I didn't like yours. You guys, I got How much y'all tipping at the restaurant? How much are we tipping? At a restaurant in 2024. I'll, I'll explain where I'm coming from. This. I, had a, I had a good friend of mine screenshot that entire response that you had to somebody and really enjoyed it. <laughs> I mean, Shout look. Shout out to Joe Summers. I, I said, at, at date night with my bride, dot, 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 your boyfriend to have a good night. It's some real idiots. And then I, look, I'll be honest. I, I'll be honest. I did not even think in, in a sense of it was it was a large tab. And that was my point was like, baby girl, you made me, you made me, I didn't had no idea this tab was going to be this big. And there were some people on there talking about flexing, and you know, but, oh, ha, ha, I, you know, I do, you know, I, I, I tip like that all the time, but I don't post it. It never in my, it, it never even crossed my mind. I, I'm not that dude. Because first what of all. if the, the I miss this? Like post. what if the the, cap, the caption that had nothing to do with t- yeah, it? It, it, it said, said date night with my bride. Dot dot dot. Your boyfriend to have a good night. But you put yourself out there. I just I, I yeah, which is fine. Here I'll let you finish. Well, no, it's fine. But I, right. like I mean. I, I, I'll take that one. I'll take the one of, hey, man, you know, basically posting a picture of a tab that big, you're trying to flex like you got money. I, I never thought about it like that. This is not something that happens very often for me. That's why I posted it. It was like, hey, you owe me one, uh, baby girl. This is this is a little bit ridiculous. But I, I see where somebody could look at that and be like, hey, man, look at Look at Sterner trying to trying to flex over there, posting that he spent four hundred dollars on a on a, a, a ran, it was a random Friday night that I asked my. So I, I'll take that one. I show you. I I have not seen this post yet, but to answer your question, if I get good service, minimum twenty five percent tip typically. Well, I mean, he, you may be, he may be one guy that that. Uh, I mean, I tipped. I tipped twenty percent, and, that's, and that's, oh, that's, that's not bad. That's the range I'm in. I, I, no, that's I'm, not a, bad. I'm gonna I'm be a honest. Good twenty percent. I'm a I'm a move the decimal guy. I'm the I'm I, I'm a move the decimal, double. That's and, good. And let's ride. And, and in this instance, I didn't double the change, so so it it, it fell slightly short of twenty percent, I guess. But the thought is, is you move the decimal, double it, it's it's roughly twenty percent, and. I mean, I got, I got. I mean, there's a couple guys gave me thirty percent, or you're a cheapskate. What a lot, of, a lot of folks had had to say. There's a hell that they Damn. can go to. Thirty percent. There's a hell they can. Go I mean, to. for that to be like the standard, the automatic, yeah, that that seems seems well, a look, bit high. And, and if Tyler, if you want to tip twenty five percent, or if this fella here wants right. to tip thirty percent, hey, so be it. I'm not taking any money out of anybody's Absolutely, pocket. Absolutely, yeah. But I mean, damn! I mean, it, like my man was coming at me like I'm cheap. Twenty percent is cheap. You need to you need to up your game a little bit. I mean, you're a. Do you know this person? No, I don't know any of these people. That, that's my thing. Is you're a special, weird ass person <laughs> to me. I'm trying weird ass person to me to say, hey man, this guy posted something about just dinner with this date with his with his <laughs> wife, and you know what I'm gonna do. I'm going to drive it home that he's a – I don't know this person. Never met him. I'm going to drive it home that he's a cheapskate <laughs> because he didn't tip a level that I wanted him to tip. I, like I mean, I, that, that like, for, for me, that is just wild. 
It'd be one thing if you had tipped like, you know, 10 or less percent or some, but then they don't even know if you got bad service or not. No, it was tremendous. Molly was great. Love Molly. Molly at Roca Accord. I love the restaurant. Molly was tremendous. Pretty gal. Blonde? I'm, I mean, no, she was not She was not blonde, Tyler. Um, I'm just trying to paint a picture. She, she was a, a, a beautiful Asian gal. Is is what she is what she was. Well, what and I, she what was I don't, tremendous. What I don't like is when they try to force your hand up there, and they put gratuity. No, nah, well they gonna they gonna put because they're full around and get me to hit that custom tip here in a second, <laughs> and they'll put twenty, twenty five, thirty. Like hold on, how, now how do you know I'm starting this high? <laughs> <laughs> this is I, the man well, who I tried the to 20, haggle but damn, for man, that, like, Well, th- there's a cu- there's a couple other things. I, I I tipped. So some folks believe twenty percent was low. Okay, um, and, and I, my tip made I was a dollar. I was one dollar and sixty seven cents short of of four hundred on a dot. And some some folks pointed out. They said, Clint, there ain't nothing wrong with twenty percent. The only thing wrong with your tip is that. The, my OCD would have forced me to make it a 400 even. I said, okay, you know. That's fine. I, I, can, I, can, I, uh, always do that. I can understand that. I can understand where you're coming from. I just don't understand. That. You know what? I don't know who this person is, but damn it, I'm going to give this guy a piece of my mind about his post about him and dinner with his wife. <laughs> I, don't, I, I just don't understand the person that does that. Someone who hates their life. I don't know, man. I, I The, the just, one... I, Jeremy, yeah, Jeremy's the one. Jeremy's the one that Jeremy's really the got one. me. That's who. That's who my my guy Joe hit me up about. Said I'm laughing my ass off looking at Clint losing on this Jeremy guy about this <laughs> tipping situation. Jeremy was the one, and, and he and he and he said cheap sake instead of in, in, instead of cheapskate. But but nonetheless, um, I, I had to re, I, I did have to repost the thing, and I said, uh, see Jeremy, it's folk it's folks like you that I blame for creating the monster. The monster that considers 20% cheap. The monster that never, that, I'm sorry, the never enough generation. The do less, expect more kind. The ones that are comfortable asking for 20% at point of purchase before the grease even gets hot. F, F out of here, Jeremy. That was, that was my, that was my, my, uh, kind of my, the end of the night, I just went ahead and put an exclamation point on it. Jeremy, you're in a different space. Yeah. You just tip at 30%. It's just whoever a that is. weird place to pick a Let's fight about. And then another another gentleman brought up that I did. I tipped on the tax amount. So I actually did tip 20% of the, of the tab. Interesting. I just want to make sure I wasn't crazy, man. I, I mean, I, I know Twitter, Twitter will, uh, will, will hit you sometimes. Oh, I bet it, Molly I mean, was happy with that. Good gosh. Molly seemed to be very happy with it. By the way, go down to Roca Accor, um, right down the street here. Uh, Molly's great. Just be prepared. Be prepared. That twenty, that twenty to thirty percent tip is is gonna be, it's gonna hit you in the face. It's gonna hit you in the face. But find that guy. Find that Jeremy fellow. Thirty percent, baby. I'm, I'm gonna tell you. Yeah, don't take Jeremy with you. I don't, don't don't take Jeremy. And no, in fact, take Jeremy with you. Let him let him there's pay, a, and then you'll he'll tip. He'll there's tip a 30. deal. Our deal downstairs where you can buy like drinks or something, and when you pay for it, it comes up with the tip oh, options. Yeah. I stare her right in her eyes and hit no tip. Yeah, those She's situations nice don't tip. Not, oh, I do. I just wanted to know. I'm. I'm not. She didn't have anything to do with that. Part. I know. I'm just telling you. I'm not. I. I bought a, a a Red Bull and I'm. I went and grabbed the Red Bull myself. I'm gonna tell you my. I'm one, not tipping. One, one of my one of my favorite food places. I'll go ahead and put it out there. They ain't, local foods. That that's the first ones that got me. Because you order, and then you go sit at you grab a number and sit at your table and they bring it to you. Well, I order and I pay, and they flip that damn iPad screen around there, looking at me, and, and you got tip options. And I'm and like, they stare for what? You, right? you, ain't, they you stare, ain't done nothing but yeah, I mean, no, they stare you right down. I want to, I want to legitimately say, I'm like, I legitimately want to say, like, you have, you, you pushed a button, like straight up, you pushed a button that said, that said, uh, poke the, the 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 salmon poke bowl that I want. Woo! Love that money. And, and you're asking for, come on, man, what are we doing? And then somebody hits me back. Well, you don't know how hard these people. Hell, everybody's working hard, man. Stare you right in your face. Everybody's working hard. I'm gonna keep on my 20. percent I'm glad to hash that out with you boys. I'm gonna stay at 20. Oh, percent yeah, I'm now. 20. I'm, I'm good 20. Even though I'll be honest with you, Molly was worth 25. Set, red 22. Hut, hut, hut. Potentially my favorite Texan, y'all. He joined Texans All Access. I hadn't decided who's who's my favorite this year, um, but Christian Harris has got a real chance. We've had him multiple times on the post game show, me and Pendergast, and I'm telling you, he he is he's money. And um, 
Probably should have led with this one as a uh, football horny clip of the day because... Um, oh, it's back. Well, I mean, we just... In today's world, we... So many so many guys, you know, you got to watch what terms you use and kind of how you categorize yourself. And um, I don't believe Christian Harris gives a rip. Here's what Christian Harris, but you know, he approaches the game. He was asked about the process or... Well, I'm sorry, he was asked, was it... The process, or was there a specific moment when you knew it clicked for you on the field? I mean, I think, like, the whole time, like, just, I don't know, just my mindset, every team that I've been on, like, I approach the game and every game, no matter who we're playing, um, just with the same mindset, you know, I'm trying to kill. You know, I think, you know, we all just have that aggressive mindset. Um, D'Amico, 100%, you know, kind of, you know, drives that throughout the entire team. Uh, you know, we 100% understand his message going into game day. So, um, you know, like I said, we feed off of that, and um, that's something I can feed off of, and that drives me every day. So when I go out there, it's just, like I said, I just approach it with that same mindset. That that rolled off his tongue a little too easily for that not to be the message that D'Amico is is uh, delivering to the guys. We're going to kill, and in and, and, and today's world, a lot of times that that can be looked at as as frowned upon, if you will. But Christian Harris had no problem. In fact, he went on. Um, he had something similar to say about uh, the new Texans linebacker Al Shair and defensive end Hunter um, when he was asked about those two acquisitions. Straight killers, man. I'm, I'm excited to get back and get everybody gelling in the locker room, um, defense getting together, understanding what our plan is and focus is for this year, and just ready to get to attack the whole thing, uh, full head of steam. One thing focused on our mind, which is that Super Bowl. I think, you know, these two guys will 100% uh, be a, a great addition to that piece. And like I said, like it's the same mindset, though. We, straight killers just attacking this one day at a time, though. Yeah. One thing on our mind. I, hey, I love it. I love it. I we're, think, we're killers attacking this thing one day at a time with a Super Bowl on our mind. I, I absolutely think, love it. I love it. I, I I may have to disagree with your first your first thought. Which one? It feels like it's a crutch word for him. Oh, you think? Okay, gotcha. I feel like it's a. I feel like ki- like killer's a go to word for it. Kill killer. He's killing. I feel like after he makes a tackle, he jumps up and tells him he's a killer. That boy's a killer. I'm a killer at he's birth. Kill. I'm a kill. I need a shirt with it on it. Get, get you, get you a jersey. Get you a, a, a what? What? Forty eight. Get you a forty eight with killer on it. In the forty eight. I'll just take the it's Mills 48. nameplate off and I'll put that on there. He ain't wearing ten. Straight Chief. killer. Son. Even though that would be clean. Oh, I know. I just. You're gonna change the number too, yeah, bro. It's a forty eight killer. You gotta change the number. <laughs> it, it, the, what, y'all, y'all, we all cover these guys obviously as closely as I do. What, who, who's y'all? Y'all got a favorite? Christian Harris has got a real. He's got a real chance to land at my one spot. Yeah. Um, oh, I like Nico. You know, Nico's uh, Nico. Nico's probably in the running for it for me. I like Nico a lot. Um, and I got this soft spot for Jalen Peachy. Yeah, he's, I he's, do. Well, no, he's he's extremely likable, and I and I like him a lot. Those two guys, I got a soft spot for Jalen Peachy. I, I I I really want that kid to. Tyler, what about you? Tyler's Davis was, Mills, clearly. No, God. I was going to say Nico, actually, because recently we heard from Nico, and I can't remember, I, I'm not going to have it verbatim, but he said something similar. He didn't use the term killer, but he was talking about, you know, getting physical after the catch and how, you know, you just got to be a dog and he yeah, looks for yeah. the contact. Yeah, that's and nasty. I already liked Nico, and then I heard that nasty, and I went, swing. Okay. I think for me, it's going to be between Tank and, and, uh, Ooh, and Christian Tank's Harris. Good. Well, Tank's a big one for you. Yeah, Tank, Tank and Christian Harris. Um, obviously love CJ, but I feel like the, the quarterback is probably just a little too low, low-hanging low fruit for this topic. Yeah. God bless, brother. Yeah, bless, God bless you too, CJ Stroud. Ah, come on. Red 22. Hut, hut, hut. Can, can I be honest, Ron? Uh, I've, watched a lot so. of, I've watched a lot of women's basketball the last few days. Did you win any money last night? No, I didn't. You, I had USC. I had USC needed them to, to lose by no more than three, and they and UConn went on that run. That that little Becker Becker gal just took when she took the game over, it was over. And then they missed seven free throws, and I thought, oh, we got a shot. That's and tough. and USC was just so, I mean, they, it's like they panicked. They panicked on, on their last three trips down the floor and, and didn't get good looks, and they really they it, it didn't it didn't work out for him. But it was a very entertaining evening. Number but but I, can, can I be honest, Ron? I, the, the Angel Reese. Sob story is is it, it annoys me. The sob story. It, it annoys me. Um, now look, I can't speak to to you know what she's dealt with 
um, off the floor and, and some some of the stuff that's unacceptable. I, I, I can't speak to that. But I, it just it, there's something about – and I love watching her play, and she's obviously a, a very attractive gal. But there's something about the, the, the one on the court that's shushing the crowd – the one that's waving at the girl when she gets fat, when she fouls out, the one that's playing the games of you can't see me and all that kind of jive, and is is hard as hell on the court. It's just something about then going to the to the podium, and and the sob story. I just I, it just it, I, I don't I I have a hard time transitioning from the hard ass on the floor to that that just talks and invites all of the criticism. To, I can't speak for myself, kind of deal. I'll, I'll give her, I'll give her a pass on this one. I want to see if it's a consistent thing. Yeah, I'll give her a pass on this one. It's her last game, her last college game she's ever playing. It's right after the game. There's probably a lot of emotions there. Yeah, uh, your your career is ending. The emotions of because I, I I mean legit she does, she does get deaf. No, no, death threats. Oh, yeah, she look, does get, and, and it's just all kind of all of that maybe coming down at once. I'll give it. But if this is something that you know continues at the next level in the WNBA, and we see, um, you know, consistent, consistently a trash talker, yeah, that that does well, that. But I, 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 I think there's a lot of emotion that went in the night. And, and look, night. like I said, man, there's no when it comes to like death death threats and and the racism stuff. Like, look, I mean, I obviously can't relate to that. Um, that damn sure ain't never happened to me. I got some. I got some. I wish you'd go somewhere and die on a hill somewhere <laughs> after fumbling the ball. But not, nothing like these kids deal with nowadays. But I, I guess I just, especially when you're as big a star as she is, man. Um, golly, I mean, it's, a lot of that just comes with the territory, you know. Not, not again, not the 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 racism or death threat stuff. I'm just talking about the the constant badgering and constant people talking trash to you. I don't know, man. I just the hard ass on the floor to immediately, I can't speak for myself is is tough for me to swallow. Said, like for her, like it, uh, you know, just an emotional time. She said, been through a lot, and I it, to me, I'll give her the thought of this is my four years that I've been here at LSU, and this is over. This is now coming to an end. This chapter is coming to an end. I'll give her, I'll give her uh, a pass in that, in, in that, in that space, because uh, uh, that was an emotional night for her. All right, coming up. Um, I, I I want to try to make you guys some money. I got a real good feeling. I got a real good feeling. It's worked out a couple times for us. Clint's on a heater right now. Tyler's clearly uh, to himself always on a heater. No, it was bad until yesterday. I, I think there's a potential uh, potential money to be made out there, and some news uh, with an Astro starter. We'll tell you about that coming up next. All right, spring is here.
worry. We've got you covered on the Odyssey app. Every segment of every show broken down into chapters so you can get right into what matters to you. Just download the Odyssey app, search for Sports Radio 610, and tap on a recent episode of your favorite shows here in H-Town. Houston's Sports Leader. Sports Radio 610. Sports Radio 610 presents The Drive with Sterner and Hughley. All right, little news. J.P. France has been placed on the paternity leave list. Reliever Dylan Coleman recalled from AAA. So J.P. France is out. When is he? When would he be scheduled to start next? Um, he was. Was he the last starter before last night's Blanco? No, no, no. no. Uh, yes. Was he? Did he start? He started the last, the last game? game against the, the Yankees. Uh, Yankees. All right, so they got an off day. They should be able to cover that, even if he is gone multiple days. Damn, didn't he? Didn't he just? Uh, I didn't he did. this happen last year? It wasn't a baby. There was a family emergency, I think, towards the end of the year. Or did he have a baby as well? I can't remember. I, I remember I the family remember emergency. Being, he's been here. He's only been here one year, right? Yeah. Was last year the first year or the year before? Was he getting called up and down? I last like year last was his rookie year. Was his first year. But I know there's a family say, emergency. Trying to keep late up me and low. Late in this, yeah, he's trying to, I guess. Phil Rivers. Yeah, yeah Philip Rivers. Nobody's keeping up with Philip Rivers. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Except for the Don't Duggers. Don't wish that on nobody, Tyler. Except for the Duggars. All right. Um, Father Abraham. <clears throat> All right, fellas, I think there's a chance to make a little cash tonight for you. I can't wait for this. Tyler, get it get it pulled up. <laughs> Huge game tonight. I'm talking about the damn oh, the bet betting. Oh, betting. Got it. Okay. What is wrong with him? It, He's, I mean, I mean just, it's, it's I'm always problem. ready, baby. It's a problem. I know it, but you don't need to always be ready with it's, us. It's a problem. Like, you've got a problem. I think it's the opposite of a problem because I'm always ready. No. I think we're sitting here in a room. I Actually, mean, the, there's glass at that time, us. it's not a problem. But but most, the vast majority of the time, you're always apt of horniness is a problem. Well, yeah, I'm talking about all of it wrapped into one. Uh, I think it's the, a blessing. The totality of it all. Like yeah, I mean, you got a problem, man. I mean, you, you. I mean, we can't even do. We can't even. It do doesn't a last more than four hours. Uh, well, hell, we can't do one show for. Well, we can't do a four-hour show one day without you being a pervert multiple times throughout. Not being a pervert. He, said, he hit Robert Flores in my ear with a "That's what she said." Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was raining through. I mean, it just never. He doesn't miss a beat, man. He does not miss it. Anything. Sl- <laughs> okay. Let's try it again. I want you guys to get, you got a chance to make a little gas. Big game tonight. The Rockets got to have this have this game tonight in Minneapolis. They're playing the Timberwolves. Give me the, give me the uh <laughs> give me the over under on Jalen Green tonight. Cuz I'm telling you I feel like Jalen Green like he's got 30 plus written all over. Him. They're playing the, the Timberwolves in a must win game for them. They got to have this game. He had 12 measly points in their last game. All right, the way he's been playing, you know, he's been scoring easily. Five for 15, one of his most inefficient games. Hell, you know he's going to get shots, and he's playing against, you said it earlier, Anthony Edwards. This is a young, big-time player, a player that people compare and hope him to be like. I think he will see him step it up like he has done it a lot. When he sees Steph, when he sees certain guys, Jalen Green picks it up. LeBron is in that. I think he'll be really amped to to atone for his last bad game. I would say 30, 30 plus in this game. What's the line for his Man, over under in points? Be, so before this may take the cake. So before I mean, ten days ago we were talking about this, or two weeks ago we were talking about this guy being <laughs> being shipped. I love that we're all bet now, now man. Shipped up here, I, but uh, but listen, this one, I'm just talking about he'll he's going. Oh, I like the thought. He's going to get thirty. So before the show started at two o'clock, it was at twenty four and a half for Jalen Green over under for his points tonight. It has dropped down a point to twenty three and a half. Oh, oh, yeah, that's I, it. Uh, I'm running that one hundred and sixty nine back, boys. Are you? Yep. Feel Man, good I about think it. I want in on this action. Let's go. Families bet together, but we'll I, stay I, together. I can't. Actually, I've, I've already lost thirty four to you. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I feel really good about. This. Really, really good. He he's get he's getting up twenty five shots. I put a hundred on it. 
Now, what's he win? That's right. What's he win if he, if can, he gets Can I parlay that with the Astros over? Can't parlay uh, player props with uh, my people. Can you parlay a bunch of player props? Or, or nope. you can't parlay them at all? Can't parlay any any player props. Man, you got to really get I mean, your guy's overcharged a few times, and, and yeah, now, no now, all of a sudden, now all of a sudden you can't. He, he's Overch- limiting the way you can bet. Man, I'm telling you. It's, I'm telling uh, it's you. You got to keep an eye on this guy, dude. man. No, it's it's my buddy. You keep an eye on your buddy now. He's an Aggie. He's a good dude. Well, like I said, Uh-oh. you've said nothing yet that makes me feel comfortable about it. That the Aggies don't lie, cheat, or steal, bro. That's a damn lie. Nope. I mean, I know too many to believe. I know that. Johnny Menzel is an Aggie. He doesn't lie, he, cheat, or steal. He's li- he's lied and he's cheated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you may have a point there. I don't know if he's stolen. I, I wouldn't put it past him. <laughs> but no, I'm, I'm telling you, Jalen, I would. Tw- it dropped down 23 and a half. 23 and a half. Oh, my God. So I got 169 for me. Clint, you want 100 on yes, this? Yes, I want what, 100 what's, on it, what's, Bob. what's the amount? What's he win? What's he win if he hits 100? It, you go, you, you, it's not, you, you're going to win even money. Oh, yeah, it'll be close to even money. The oh. problem is if you lose, you have to pay extra. That's how the bookie makes his money, Bob. I feel good about that, man. This is a big, big, big night for him. Big night for him. I don't know if they're going to win. They need to win. Uh, but yeah, you can see it. Twelve points. He's going to come out aggressive. I mean, I don't know if he's going to do what Devin Booker did yesterday. When I looked at, uh, when I looked up at it, it was uh, I think six minutes left in the third quarter, and Devin Booker had I think forty three points uh, <laughs> before they even got. Ooh, that'd be nice. He's got. He had 52 last night. Uh, second time he's done that to the Pelicans this year. But, no, nah, man, it, 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 it feels – I feel really good about this. I mean, you know, in your runs, I, I feel much better about that than you in this runs bet. Four and a half tonight, is that with the Astros? Yep, I'm on that one again as well. And I'm on the Framber over strikeouts. What was that? What's Ooh. the Framber strikeouts? If it's – if it's under five, if it's what, five and a half. Yeah, that's what I thought it was. Four and a half. <laughs> Let's win some money, baby. I just Let's win some money. But honest to God, that one's tantalizing because even if he lasts three innings, he's going to, if he does nothing, he'll strike out some people. I, I can't. There's no way I can survive a night but no Fromber and Jalen. I'm, I'm just going to ride with one. <laughs> I'm just going to ride. I'm just going to ride with one of them. So it said Jalen tonight at least 26, five and four. I'm telling you. How'd you land on the number 26? You like? I, know I don't know how this person did. I mean, 26? I don't know how this person did. Let's go, Rockets. Yeah. yeah. BS, Tyler. Jimbo stole millions. That's pretty good. That is good. Yeah, that's pretty Can't good. Can't even deny that. <laughs> that's well done, friend. That's pretty good. All right, last night, Ronnell had him a big night, but is it an overreaction to say that Ron L. Blanco pitched so well that he deserves a spot in this rotation no matter what the injury situation is. Is it an overreaction? We'll discuss that next. All right, the future of medicine is here, y'all, and it's at uh, it's called QC Kinetics, man.
If only there was a mountain range separating the Indian subcontinent from the Tibetan plateau where I could hide my Old Spice and keep my family from stealing it, my impossibly smooth skin will finally be safe. Live from the Twin Peaks studios, Sports Radio 610 presents The Drive with Sterner and Hughley. Ron El Blanco all over the place, including his six foot, one hundred and eighty pound frame, as we're seeing it all over the television set. Throwing that one eighty around. I, 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 I that's got to be the worst um, height, weight, lie measurement we've ever seen. That there is just nothing, nothing about that man that that is one hundred and eighty pounds. But last night. His performance was exceptional, and he was huge uh, for uh, for the Houston Astros and big. Because- well, I'll be honest with you. Let me interrupt you. Go ahead. But his performance was tremendous. His performance was tremendous. If he did it at a buck eighty, it's even more more tremendous. <laughs> Why is it more? Tremendous? I, I, I don't know. I mean, if that guy, because I mean, if he's one eighty, he's got to be about five three, five four, <laughs> max. That sucker got up there and threw a no hitter in his eighth MLB outing. Come on, man, that's unbelievable. Because if he's five three, then Diaz is <laughs> no four eleven, something like that. Again, once again, if you missed it, they have his height and weight same as Tyler's. Uh, Ron El Blanco weighs the same and is as tall as Tyler. And I, I believe it. His is just distributed it differently, right? Um, well, I got zero pounds in my ass, and that's that's yeah, where all and Ron L, Ron L, he got ass like Secretariat. And it's crazy, and he seems to have a lot in the the arms and the chest too. Yeah, yeah, and a few a inches on the ass. Ty- it's crazy, Tyler. He looks slightly thicker than you, Tyler, in the britches and the whoa. I bet his nipples are bigger than yours too. And Tyler, listen, and we know you have. Um, <laughs> Look at him sucking. His- we know hey, you, you hurt your rib cage in there, cuz. We be know careful. you have an unusually larger head than most, but that's not where all that weight is. That's not where you're making it up. There is some weight up there, though. But that's not where you're making it up. Um, but uh, <laughs> he was he was fantastic no matter how much he weighs, whether it is the lying 280 Great. or 180 or the 255, which seems to be accurate. Um this is what uh, his manager, who, by the way, got his first win in a no-hitter. How about oh, that? yeah. <laughs> Joe Espada's first Joe win. Joe got off the snot, too. Uh, here's his manager, Joe Espada, talking about last night's performance uh, from uh, Ron El Blanco. Impressive performance. Uh, we needed that. And and Blanco step up and, and give us a, an incredible start performance. Uh, his change-up, changing speed. It's a pretty good lineup over there. So what a week he has, he's had. And um, happy for him and his family. No, I mean, it was, it was happy for him. His family was there, and it was a great performance and a needed performance. And I want to get your thoughts. 713-572-4610. Those of you on YouTube and Twitch, you can jump in on this as well. He was fantastic last night. It was his eighth start. He had never gone past six innings, but last night he obviously went nine, 105 pitches, seven strikeouts, only two walks to George Springer in the first inning and in the ninth inning. Hey, and one one hundred and five pitches in the last two batters he faced was Springer and and, uh, Vladdy. and Vlad. I mean, Vlad Jr. Woo, that was one of them where I'm sitting there going, "Oh boy, it, it, this could get." Well, you I mean, knew that Vlad was his last hitter. Oh, you think? Oh yeah, I think so. Up ten? Yeah, I think I think Vlad was. If he lost Vlad, now we're now we're getting into one hundred and six pitches. And now we're getting potentially mm. north of one ten in the heart. Yeah, I, I think. I think that I think that may have been his last batter. Um, but his performance last night, even with the injuries, we know we know that Verlander is coming back soon, and obviously he's going to be in the rotation. We know Urquidy is coming back soon. Those are the two realistic ones. We'll see whatever happens with Lance, but those are the two realistic ones. With everyone healthy, do you think Ron El Blanco has earned a spot in this rotation? Or is it an overreaction? Seven one three five seven two four six ten. Those of you on YouTube and Twitch, his performance last night when Arkady comes back, 
Verlander comes back when they've got all the guys that can start and are healthy. Has he earned a spot to have one of those five those five spots in the rotation? This was tough for me, Ron. I'm, I'm struggling with this one because I, I think it's an overreaction if it's just a good outing. If it's a seven innings, you know, maybe the strikeout number's up or something and uh, you shut them out, um, I, I would say it's probably an overreaction. But when a guy goes out there in his eighth major league start, he goes out there and owns a lineup for nine innings, 105 pitches. The only two the only two uh, people that reached base was Springer twice, both of them on a walk. Ron, it's hard for me. It's hard for me to not say we got to have a serious conversation about it. That that fifth starter in this rotation, we've got to have a serious conversation about it. Whether whether he's bumped up against Luis Garcia and and Jose Urquidy, uh, Hunter Brown. I mean, at, at the end of the day, what he did last night. Those other guys we mentioned, JP France. Those guys have had many many opportunities and haven't done what he did last night. They have not owned a lineup the way that he did last night. And so the ceiling that we know and that we've seen is obviously higher, and we've seen him touch it. Um, the ability to throw 105 pitches in the fifth game of the damn season is is unbelievably impressive. In his first start, eighth Major League Baseball start, he's pitching for a team that – that middle relief is 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 a problem. So being able to go go deeper in games and and run your pitch count up is is something that's going to be much needed in this in this starting rotation. So I to, I would say I would say yes. Like he's earned it without even like you would have him in the rotation over Jose Urquidy right now. Yes, he's earned that. Yes. Here, mm. See it here from the he, he would line. be my he would be my fifth star. He'd be your, he's earned a start. Uh, I'm drinking the Blanco Kool Aid. Um, Who the texture was? Or you a texture here. White Kool Aid. Uh, uh, <laughs> give him another <laughs> start, or he or he doesn't get blown up and has another quality start. He stays. Uh, yeah, I think he's going to get another start. I don't think. Uh, at least we haven't been hearing that Arkady is close to being back. So I think he probably gets another start. I Listen, I think he is going to be a, a, a potential big part of this staff. And I think he could be the starter, right? If, if your bullpen was intact, I think, I think, hell, let's battle it out. Let's see between him and, and, and Arkady. But right now, you need them both. And... I think Urquidy plays as a starter. And I think Blanco stuff plays better if you just say, hey, man, cut it loose. That 94 I don't, I don't goes to 97. I don't disagree, I don't disagree I, with that one bit. And I think there's an argument, Clint, that that is, that is the major need right yeah. now if if Verlander and Urquidy are back is who can how, – how can you Bullpen get piece, yeah. to – and it's not just get to – uh, Presley, Abreu, and, and Hader. It is not just get there. Some of those days, those guys aren't going to be able to pitch every day. Right? you got to have somebody else. It may be one day Presley is unavailable and you need somebody to pick up the seventh. Or Abreu is unavailable. Or like last night, both of them are unavailable. Hader and, and, and Abreu. So, I like, for me, I, I think he plays better coming out of the bullpen right now. Unless he just is so good that he forces your hand, and now we're talking, well, hell, he's he's somebody I won't get in the ball before Hunter Brown. He's somebody I won't get in the ball before J.P. France. You know, and, unless he forces your hand, he comes back with, hell, this guy's our best starter right now. How can we put him in the bullpen? It's very similar to me when that happened with Christian Javier a few years yeah. ago, <clears throat> where he was so good when he had those starts and it was becoming a – this is four stars. This is five stars. Now, eventually, they sent him back in the bullpen. But for me right now, Urquidy stuff doesn't play as well coming into the coming out of the bullpen. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a different. That's for the, me, that's, that's a the, different. That's a different question. I mean, yes, I, I agree wholeheartedly with your point um, that that he he would play better out of just let's empty the tank for an inning or two. 
Um, or if he needed to go three or four and give you some longer relief, I think he plays better out of the bullpen. Um, and I'll be honest with you, I think Jose Arquiti probably brings you a little more, hey, I know what I'm going to get in the starting rotation um, than, than Blanco does. I, I, when, I, when I look at Blanco, though, it's, it's, if we're talking just starter or not, or starting opportunity or no opportunity, right? Like not, not where he fits better, but just the starting opportunity. Um, man, if he gets a couple more starts, Ron, yeah, and, if he, and if he, he forces and he goes your hands, I mean, he yeah. can he, look. If, and if he can, if he can get deeper into games than what we've seen from some of these guys, I, I don't, I don't know how you don't at least have him in the rotation right now. I, I would damn sure have him in the conversation with anybody below Hunter Brown. I, I'm, I'm bullish on Hunter Brown. I, I just, I mean, he's one of them that that runs a damn pitch count up. But, but him. Him, Fromber, Christian Javier, and JV obviously are, are your top four for me. But from any beyond that, whether it's Luis Garcia, Jose or Kitty, JP France, any of these, like, hey man, what that dude, he didn't just go out there last night and have a have a good outing. I mean, what he did last night was dominate and show the ability to to, to do what we've never seen those other guys do. I mean, that's that's um that's big time, man. I'm, I'm tr- doing my damnedest to not overreact, but but boy, when you think about 105 pitches, two walks, I mean, that that was close to a damn perfect game. Yeah, no, it it was. Yeah, some text line show it's run. This is uh, why you have to look at Blanco's next start. Yeah, he's going to get a next another start. That's why I said if he forces your hand, well, if he I comes mean, like if he comes out in the next game and he's all right, man, he bangs out another hell six in, six innings, seven innings, you know, another quality start. And well, look, you, we, we we can say that we can say that about any damn near every starting pitcher on the Astros right now. Like, we need to see their next star. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, obviously not the top guys, but I mean, before hell, yeah, before you know exactly where, like, because if we're trending in a way that if Fromber keeps doing what Fromber's doing and Javier looked great in his first outing, if he goes out there and looks great, there's a chance that that by the end of the year, by mid season. Javier could jump from her. I mean, there's there's some things. So everybody really is on a well. We need to see their next their next start. Hell, you can say that about JV with Father Time jumping on his back. Yeah, to me, like we'll see. Unless Blanco forces, because he is going to be a major piece, whether he is the back end of the rotation or that guy that is the fourth or fifth guy out of the bullpen that you will need to see a lot of. But to me, if you were to sit there and say, "All right, we're all healthy," and we got J.P. France, and we got Jose Arquiti, and we got Ronel Blanco. I, I would, to me, Blanco's would make the most sense to go in the bullpen, and I think he could be a huge weapon in the bullpen if we're looking at those three. But again, I said if that Joker comes through here and his next two starts are seven inning quality starts, and it's looking like this, and yeah. he's got that confidence now. Now, I mean. Hell, Hunter Brown, your ass better be pitching yeah. your ass off before he jumps you in yeah, the rotation. Yeah, four and a third, they going to get it, right? I mean, at, at yeah. the end of the day, man, like even Robert Flores said it earlier. It, it, I mean, he said they need a, they need help. He needs to help them in both areas. In both areas, right? Yeah, I mean, it's it's here's the deal, and I would be I would be curious to know what like Roger Clemens, who who comes on the show some, and I, I'd be interested to know what those guys think when a guy goes out there and in his eighth start comes out of nowhere and throws a no hitter. Is it an overreaction to think, damn, this guy should at least be in a rotation that's down two starters? Oh, right now, definitely. Most definitely down two starters right now. Yeah, he's in He's in that sucker. He's beating Brandon Belak. Yeah, he's in that Yeah, he's sucker. out of the Belak conversation. Yeah, no no offense, Brandon, yeah. but I mean he, he like he was he was a step above Belak, I think, and now now he's jumped smooth into the into the conversation yeah, he's, with, he's with your bottom with two starters. Ur- Urquidy, yeah. If Ryan if Ryan Stanek and Phil Maton was sitting out there in that bullpen. You, you you really got a conversation. Right now it's Taylor Scott and Seth Martinez. It's a bit of a struggle. struggle. They need some help out there. Struggle to get there, huh? To get to him. All right, coming up, uh, an update from Joe Espada on Verlander. Uh, hopefully good news with that. We'll let you hear that. And we got the numbers back, and it was just what we expected. We'll discuss that coming up next. In the loop. The Texans restructured Titus Howard's contract.
Omaha Steaks, America's original butcher. KILT, KILT FM HD2 Houston. Insider access, exclusive content. The Texans play here. Always live on the free Odyssey app. Sports Radio 610 presents The Drive with Sterner and Hughley. It's the 5 o'clock fire. Ah, it is 5 o'clock. Congratulations. Hopefully you're off work. Luckily for you, old dirty. The Dilf. The Big Dilf. And Psycho T have the latest. And the latest is 5 o'clock fire. Brought to you by Kirk Holmes. And with that... um. Big pitching performance last night for the Astros, as we've talked about throughout the day. Uh, but their ace is not ready to go yet. He is not here. He's starting on the IL. We heard good news in terms of him throwing 50-plus pitches in a uh, in a session, a, a live BP session. Here is the latest coming from Joe Espada, the manager, giving an update on Justin Verland. So he's going to throw a bullpen on Thursday, and then after that he should be in a position to go on his first major league rehab. Uh, either Sugarland or Corpus, we still haven't decided yet. Sugarland or Corpus, pretty pretty clear, cut and clear, clear right there. Another bullpen. If he goes to Sugarland, we got to go to that game. You can just wait and go to Minute Maid and watch him. Yeah, but Sugarland. There's something. It's there's different. something about going to Sugarland and watch. It's a really nice ballpark. It I really like. is. The Christmas lights they do are fantastic. Well, let's do it, boys. Tyler, maybe you can throw the first pitch. Now there's oh, an idea. We should. Oh. Now there's an idea. Yes. Tyler, Clint throws out the first pitch. Well, how do I get? No, I'm, Tyler's going to throw stop, out the first stop. pitch. Okay. Clint throws out the first pitch. No, you're right. Tyler throws out the. <laughs> no, Clint throws out the first pitch. I catch. Don't want you to get to get down that catcher stance with your Ooh, knee. Wouldn't be able to. Um. And then Tyler calls the balls and strikes. I like it. You going to squeeze me? That battery. You going you gonna to squeeze me? Outside, ball? I'm, throw, outside I'm, throwing, ball. I'm throwing in the dirt right at home plate, hopefully, and see if Ron will flip that glove oh, over I'm and get down and dirty. I'm getting down. I'm smothering it. Better wear a cup. <laughs> I'm getting on. I'm not wearing a cup. I'm getting on my Ooh, knees. Dangerous. I'm smothering it. Yeah, I guess you barely wear underwear, so I would wear a cup. Yeah. One for one, for one this week. Um no, uh, but no, that's a thought. That's a thought. Would you? Would, I'm getting all over that. I mean, you're him. Out. You're him. You'd rather go to Sugarland than Corpus, would you? I don't know, man. Just get in and out, man. Get right there. And, well, I mean, yeah. Know. I mean, the ease of just like I said, you can jump in the old Sprinter van and ease on down to Corpus. I would be Ease bad, on though. down to Sugarland. But I don't know, man. Corpus, ease on down there, man. So you think Kate would come to the Sugarland? All right, we we are going to this game. Because I did not even consider that possibility. I was already locked in. We're going. You don't know. You don't know. I wonder if KUV would be there. Yeah, she'd be there. She supports she's her man. Going, she's not going to Sugarland. Yes, yeah, she would. She's a woman There's of the people. No way she would. I mean, she she could make she could make Corpus sound like a little little mini vacay. Yeah, she really could. I mean, to be honest, good the beaches, the water, they're a little bit better. Yeah, they can have a good time. Have a good time. Well, that is that. Uh, <laughs> That is good news, though. Um, he'll have another B uh, bullpen session, and then I wonder if he'll make if he'll just is he going to be one make one start, one start, and then bam, he's back, he's back at the major league level. That that'll be interesting. We talked about it. You weren't here. Brandon said he said, man, being conservative, man, I I'd expect him maybe first part of May. So he thought he thought maybe he missed this entire potentially missed this month. Well, I mean, Verlander's going to need to he's going to need to work up to to the, the ability to at least throw eighty plus pitches. I mean, we he we, said I mean, eighty five. Yeah. Look, I lo- I love Verlander, and I can't wait to get him back on, on the bump for us. But but if he's going to roll out there and have about a forty to fifty pitch count outing on us, and then just force us to to Mashinsky and and uh, Taylor and a couple of those guys in a ball game, like I, I don't be like territory now. I, yeah, let, let's get, get one more get one more in Corpus or something, and get down here where so you, you think give two us. more. Because he's going to get a bullpen. As he threw 52 yesterday, his next bullpen, I wonder if he move it up some. And then Corpus maybe a, a few out. Or Didn't few he say eight. he'd like to bump that next one up to 80-something? He said I, I he'd like he to get it to 85 before he returns. That's still looking at that's still looking at Machinsky. Or Machinsky. Which what Justin is it? Verlander. Is it Mushinsky? Mushinsky. Let's just call it Mush, boys. Mushinsky. Mush, boys. Mm-hmm. It's Mush. So... That's the latest on Verlander. 
Um, again, as I've said, every time we get these updates, it seems like it is progressing forward and nothing uh, nothing like a setback. So good to go there as he is feeling good and, es- and uh, Espanada. Why do I do that? Espada. <laughs> I mean, you've done change. It was Estrada the other day. Yeah, now it it's Espanada. Well, Estrada had the Alabama guard on my mind. I liked it when you used to call him Espada. Espada. <laughs> uh, no, but Joe Espada said that Verlander, um, another, uh, another BP session and then – be ready, hopefully, to go out to either Corpus or Sugarland. So we'll keep you updated on that. Five o'clock fire. All right, you got to knock out the uh, the the no hitter. It's over. The Astros are still one and four. Still one and four. They got to start winning series. And I still think the catalyst to last night. Obviously, Blanco was big, but the catalyst to last night. What? How many runs they they scored in that first inning? Four. Three or four in that first inning. I know. Yeah, I know they. Uh, I thought it was two in the first. Was it two in the first? Yeah, I think the Tucker four. They had four pretty early, pretty yeah, quick. Yeah, the first couple sure, innings, sure. they had. They got up and and that offense got to a good lead, and and kind of kept tacking on runs throughout and pouring it on. I think again, this offense has got to kind of help this group. Framber, you hope for a really good start tonight, or at least an improved start. Uh, tonight, but to me, the offense, the catalyst, they can kind of get this thing going as they did last night to keep this thing up because you start putting together some series wins. Now that feels good. You lose tonight. Now you're, you're one and five and that, that is a, that is a potential rough look, even though it well, is early, it's look, still a rough look. I mean, oh, Ron L did everybody a favor, man. I mean, he, he got that old, that old sweet taste out of, out of the, all of Astro nations, right? Uh, mouth. I mean, I, it was awful. Uh, I don't care what anybody says. Even the settle down, it's early. It's only one game. It's only one series. Relax. No, I mean, that was awful to watch the Astros get swept in four straight games by by the, the Yankees. Now, Ronell rolls out there and goes a no-hitter and gives you a little hope and gives you a little something to celebrate. And I mean, what do, what do you do? Do you buzz kill this thing right back down to, to, to one and five? Or do you build off of that momentum that, that you got cranking? Because Ronell, obviously, as you mentioned, wasn't the only – the only bright spot right there. I mean, hell, ten runs and, and some of your some of your big sticks were swinging, man. We're we're we're, we're on point. So, um, yeah, it's it build off that momentum last night. Lineup tonight: Altuve uh, leading off, Alvarez in that you hear two this, spot. Tyler? You hear this? He's just reading the lineup. Just reading oh, the lineup. he's he's going to give us a lineup the last segment of the show. We got to we got to get another dub here. I don't have to do anything. Well, you know I didn't. Right? I don't command you to do things. Sounds but like I you're would, trying to. I would like you to do the lineup because you did it so good yesterday, and then we won the game. Lineup: Altuve leading off. Jordan Alvarez batting second. He's playing in left field tonight. I'm going to have faith you're going to do this. Uh, Kyle Tucker in right field. Bregman, who's hitting 158. Uh, him, him, he's hitting 158. Alvarez hitting a cool 100. Um, they are uh, in the lineup. He's batting fourth. Yiner Diaz is the DH uh, tonight, and Abreu at first. McCormick is in center field, as Clint said, a third center fielder in uh, six games, six ball games. Third, th- we've had three different starting center fielders in six ball games. Now Jake has the had the majority of those starts. Pena is at shortstop, and uh, Caratini is catching tonight. Oh, Vic, Vic is catching tonight uh, as uh, as he goes to the D.A. spot. The two things that jump out to me in the lineup is, as you said, McCormick's in center field again. Um, as they said, he would play some center and left this year. But this, I wonder, is this going to be a trend? Now, obviously, he's, going to have, he's probably going to get some full days off. But this is two times, the two times that Vic has caught. Yiner Diaz has moved to the D.H. spot yep. and, not, and not a day off. They've kept him in the lineup. I, I'll be honest with you. I, I think that is that is the move because what what is the move if he isn't the DH? If he's not the DH, like if if if, if he's if he's I mean, not you gotta, catching, you got a DH Dubon or, or White Boy Chaz, whichever one's not in the lineup. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. And then, and they want to keep him. Obviously, with Dubon, you want to you want to keep him in the utility role to be able to to replace. Or, or or to to put anybody because it ain't gonna be John Singleton. He, you never he's, know, not, man. he's not the DH. He's not at the DH spot. Yeah, I wouldn't think so. We'll see. We'll see. But uh, but I but I do like that, and especially right now he's hot. He's hitting four forty four right now. Him and uh, Pena are leading the the team in average, and and he's been hit for power 
So I, I, I like the thought of keeping him in uh, the lineup. And as I said before the season started, I, I think early uh, his bat's going to be really, really strong. It's fresh. The more fresh that Yiner Diaz is, we'll see as the season moves on. And he's got more wear and tear and him catching a lot. But uh, but right now his bat is going. And and if you can keep him in the lineup at the DH spot, that is, uh, that is important to do. So uh, that is the lineup. That is the latest tonight. Framber's on the mound. The Astros going to try to get two in a row and uh, and win another game at home. Five o'clock fire. All right. Last night uh, was a big night in college uh, basketball, especially on the women's side. Well, really only on the women's side. I don't even know if the NIT is still being played. Uh, but uh, Caitlin Clark had a big, big game. And she, uh, she leads Iowa over their win over LSU, who they lost to in the title game. Uh, yeah, last year. Angel Reese played really well as well in this game. Uh, I think she had 17 and 20 rebounds, multiple blocks and steals. But Caitlin Clark, 41 points, 12 assists, 7 rebounds uh, in this game. A little disappointed. She didn't really give it to Angel Reese, but Angel Reese had fouled out of the game, so it was kind of hard to get to her. Um, but they shook up in the handshake line. But another thing, the numbers are back, Clint. It was the most watched uh, women's NCAA basketball game in history, and last year's game against LSU was just a shade under 10 million. They had 12.3 million viewers. Would you say more than uh, more than the average audience during the 2023 NBA Finals? So more than last year's NBA Finals. Uh, this is huge, huge numbers they're doing for ESPN and ABC. I, I, I bet you. I bet you the UConn. <clears throat> I bet you the UConn Iowa matchup does bigger numbers now. I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't have said. I don't know. I oh, you think bigger, it, bigger numbers than the LSU game are bigger numbers than it did than you than it originally maybe thought it was. Well, I, I definitely think it's going to do bigger numbers than I thought it would, but I think it's going to do bigger numbers in the LSU Iowa game because you, you still have obviously Caitlin Clark, and and now last night watching the Becker girl, Paige Becker. I yeah. mean, and, and those two are going to be head to head. Those program, are gonna be, the, 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 the little bit of a buzz kill for me with LSU is like, yeah, there's the 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 uh, you know the, the I guess the little controversy if you want to call it a little drama whatever you want to call it back and forth between Angel Reese and, and and Caitlin Clark after the whistle and all that kind of jive, but they never cover each other. Like Becker oh, and yeah. Becker and Caitlin Clark are gonna cover each other, and and that to I mean that's. And it's it's obviously UConn with Geno as the head coach. No I mean, program, yeah. Yes, yeah. Like I like I think there's a chance that that after last night, because Becker took that game over last night for UConn as well. The last two or three minutes of that ball game, she she took it. She said, "Look, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna take these shots. I'm gonna knock these shots down, and we're gonna extend this lead and, and put SC to bed." And and she did it. That to me, that's gonna be a. I like that matchup more because those two are actually gonna be able to go head to head. Caitlin is going to. That, that, that this march with her is going to draw a big big audience. I don't know if they get there to the twelve point three, but South Carolina and Iowa in a championship game, I think does. South Carolina being undefeated in a championship game, yeah. and Don Staley that deal, and then Caitlin trying to finish it. Mm -hmm. Like I, I mean, right like right now, I'm not saying she's the biggest, but right now. I mean, there, there's not a lot of athletes at the moment that are more sought after or looked at right, sure. or popular right now yep. than Caitlin Clark. So I, I don't know. I think they'll, they'll do big numbers. Now, nobody, I don't know how many people are going to watch that South Carolina NC State one. But if NC State, I mean, if South Carolina undefeated and she has to go against the undefeated team, and remember, she beat them. They beat them in the Final Four last year. So there's a rematch. There too, they were undefeated, and the only team they've lost to is Iowa in the last two years, <laughs> South Carolina. So, uh, big big numbers for them. You, uh, you think anybody? Because I think a lot of people on the men's side feel like UConn is just the overwhelming favorite. You feel that way with South Carolina too? You think it's going to be? You think you think any of these other three teams can get them? I think Caitlin and, and Iowa is the only team that can. Yeah, man. Look, I, I, I think. South Carolina on the women's side is a, is is a, a bigger favorite than anything on the men's side. 
than, than, than UConn. Yeah. I mean, when you look at the matchup, I mean, that, that squad is ridiculous that, that Don Staley has in South Carolina. I just don't know. I don't know who's going to be able to handle that young lady in the middle. Nope, there ain't no doubt about it. <laughs> there ain't no doubt about it, man. That is, whoo, that's a, she's a problem. She's, and she's, and she's, the bad thing is, she got she got a gal. And, that, and they'll be pissed if they play Iowa. Well, yeah, they, they got a couple gals that play with her next to her that, that oh, yeah. they're not as good as her, but they're as long as her. They got a freshman who's really, really good yeah, as, man, as well. But, yeah, she, but she, the, she, the contrasting styles of, of okay, I'm going to tell you, if, if Caitlin Clark, you watch the first five minutes of that game, and and like I watched in that West Virginia game, and I was like, this, this is going to be a dog fight for, for Iowa. They're going to be in trouble because she wasn't knocking down shots at, at the beginning. If she's knocking down shots early and you can tell she's seeing and it and feeling were. it, it's going to be over. Yeah, uh, what Kim Mulkey had to say was, yeah, she's a player that you're not stopping her. Yeah. But when she's got two other her people supporting cash, getting yeah. 18 and 20, that, that's where it's hard. And, and man, they're, they're – they're out there running like your old Razorbacks. They were, I mean, they were run. I thought, I thought Nolan had got back there. They were running, <laughs> yeah. throwing it up every chance they got. So um, it, it's crazy what what this ride has been, and we'll see twelve point three viewers uh, for that last night. I mean, I mean, ESPN has got to be just mm. rolling through it. I don't. Whoo! They need her to win. They need her to keep with it. Is what they need. All right, coming up. Um, Clint said this guy might be his uh, his favorite player, and he may be yours if the Texans if the Texans give him the help he needs. We'll discuss that coming up next.
help you find your groove. Check them all out on the Odyssey app thanks to Planet Fitness. Get that big fitness energy. Sports Radio 610 presents The Drive with Sterner and Hughley. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just looked up at the screen and I'm not, I'm not, I guess I am pulling a Tyler and laughing at, uh, at injuries, but it, it begins. You remember that little bit we had where I told you I'll shave my head right here live on air? Uh-huh. If the oh, LA Clippers yeah. make it to the Western Conference Finals? If they do. If they do. Mm-hmm. Okay. I remember. Kawhi Leonard, uh, not playing tonight, sent back to L.A. with right knee soreness. And it begins. You'll be all right. <laughs> oh, <laughs> stop. Okay, I know you've said that a lot of times be about right. people. <laughs> but that, a little soreness. He'll be all right, man. Right knee soreness is not it. Man, he has survived, too. He tried to, man. He tried to. He tried to play a lot of these games. We'll see. I actually, I hope he's. I hope he's good. They, they, look, but they this can't, is they when can't, it gets start. This they can't keep started. him on the bench and not playing because everybody complains it's load management. Hey, just make it official. He's on back to the city. Get your knee looked had, at. Get your little rest. It probably started when he had a teammate uh, defending him. There uh, you have it. And playing defense on him while he's trying to to score. So <laughs> maybe that's it. <laughs> Well, let's see. I'm telling you, man, they they start to fall apart too. I'm not I'm not in the business of shaking my shaving my head. And I do want to I want to back up uh, uh, one of our teammates here uh, from the text line. I just heard a clip of someone saying the Astros are a 98 win team. Ha ha! Someone needs to tell them they need to try winning a game first. Ron Hewley. they they did win a game. Won a game yesterday. <laughs> yeah, they Extra. won one. Yeah. There was also a no hitter, friend. Go check it out. It was awesome. It's good. <laughs> Tell them to try winning the game first. There was five homers. And what? They did win a game. Go check out those highlights, my man. I mean, you, I mean you'll be shocked. Or what if I told you? <laughs> 30 for 30. What if I told you? What if I told you? And they won. Patrick, great. Yeah, 98 wins. Calm down. Doable still? You think they get there? One and four. One and four right now. That gets 98. Ain't a chance in hell. Ain't a chance in hell, boys. Ain't a chance in hell. Chance in hell. Zero. Seven f***ing times. You think they get to 95? Nope. Well, you're, hold just, op- you're just real optimistic. Okay, hold, on, hold on. I mean, if I'm that, they if I'm that sure at 98, what do you mean to turn and go? Yeah, I think they get to 95. You mean you give me a three game, three game window there? That's Uh-oh. fair. Oh, hold no, on. I, they got they won 90 last year. You think they get to 90? Clint, if you say no here, we're gonna we've got a different se- segment here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think 90 would be the number. Is there an over under right now on the Astros win total? Does that change? Does that change throughout the year? There was one before the year. I can't remember what it was. It was eighty something. I think it was eighty eight, maybe. I what before remember. the year? No. This is the first time in like three years I didn't bet on uh, the win total for the Strohs. I can't remember. I mean, I, I think was... 90, 90 would be the ninety would be the number for me right now. Can they get there? You, do you think they get? You think they're under ninety wins? It feels like you think it was win. ninety two and a half. Before opening day. Was it? Well, yeah, look, uh, 90 would be the number for me. Get to 90, boys. Hmm. Damn, no, nah, I mean, I, yeah. I, oh I mean, you miss it. I mean, Verlander's going to miss two rounds through the, at least, if not three, rounds through the the the, uh, the rotation. Yeah. I mean, Fromber clearly hasn't righted the ship. <laughs> um, I mean, hell. Yeah, man, you dropped it down. So you got to. 88, you feel good about 88 wins? I feel good about 90. Okay, all right, all right, good. All right, well, hey, we can. I feel all right about 90. We can... Big scab. <laughs> I was going to say. 90. <laughs> 90's the number, boy. I thought he was, I was about to say, hey, hey Tyler, what, 86? It was, yeah. I, you you try... weren't lying. We were about to have to change this segment. Because he was saying it so fa- He was saying it so quick, a matter of fact. Hell no, 98. 95? Nope. Nah, man. I mean, look, I know it's been a while, but this start, the injuries, the division is going to be better. or not? It's going to be. I, I think it is. 
you appear to be in a much rougher situation than you've been in the past out of the gate. Yeah, no, I, I think 90 is a good number. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, Christian Harris uh, was on last night. He was on with the guys, uh, Texans All Access. Make sure you stay tuned for that. You never know who's going to be there. You never know who you can catch. And they've had some great guests here the last couple of weeks. But Christian Harris, um, maybe uh, maybe Clint's favorite player potentially, said he's up there for him. He was on with Texans All Access. This is what he had to say in terms of when he uh, when he kind of realized potentially when things clicked for him last year in the middle of the season. I mean, I think like the whole time, like just I don't know, just my mindset. Every team that I've been on, like I approach the game and every game, no matter who we're playing, um, just with the same mindset. You know, I'm trying to kill. You know, I think you know we all just have that aggressive mindset. Um, D'Amico, 100%. You know, kind of you know drives that throughout the entire team. Uh, you know, we 100% understand his message going into game day. So, um, you know, like I said, we feed off of that, and um, that's something I can feed off of, and that drives me every day. So when I go out there, it's just like I said, I just approach it with that same mindset. Listen, Clint, I can understand why you are excited and anybody is excited because this cat has the skill set along with the defense and who is coaching him. And we've already seen those those strides already start to move forward in the middle of last year. I think there's a chance that you're looking at a guy that could be in the top five inside linebacker conversation in the next couple of years. And, hell, I think it, it – it, it could be it could be this year. He could be a, a difference making player this year. But Clint, they have got to get him somebody in front of him. Or at, at least these dudes better better surprise in a in a way that is better than what I think people project him as, and that's rotation piece defensive tackles. They got there is nothing, nothing that will ruin the potential or mess up the potential of this cat being able to reach that type of ceiling than guys in his lap. And if we watched it last year, that playoff game, there was not a lot of great uh, in that playoff game against the Ravens. Steve Sims scored. There was something there. Nico was, was all right. But it was clear the best player on the field for the Houston Texans was Christian Harris. And it was glaring how he was able to stay and tackle Lamar Jackson yeah. repeatedly and give him and cause him problems. And that was just kind of the, the carry on to what the second half of the season was about. Well, so I think they got to get cats in front of them to be able to really see what he can do. It, it's the, uh, again, the biggest concern of mine, Ron, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more because what happened in the second half of that ball game? Yep. Christian Harris became a non factor yep. because they were lining up. And they were able to to move the line of scrimmage and into to Christian him. Harris's lap, or to your point, they were able to, to immediately go up to the second level, get a body on him, not worry about the defensive line ultimately, and drive right down the field. So, I, look, I it, and this is one of those conversations, Ron, that you, like for me, like I can't be right about this defensive line situation because the truth of the matter is, this D line as is right now is going to be good against. 75% of the league. But we're we're talking about, again, we're not talking about being good, you know, 75% of the games you go play. We're talking about going from the second round of the Super Bowl. We're talking about going from, um, you know, going from winning 10 games to winning 12, 13 games. Um, and to me, that's like you, you got you to gotta ask yourself, do you have the dudes that can lean into the running game of San Francisco? Do you have dudes that can lean into the run game of Baltimore when they get moving downhill? Do you do you have guys that can lean into uh, the the run game of of Buffalo if they get moving downhill with Josh Allen and 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 him involved in the run game? Um, do you have those dudes? And maybe they got them in journey guy journeyman guys. Maybe they got maybe they got them in guys that. That other teams, you know, that, that just weren't interested in paying them a lot less than what they were making before. Um, maybe they got them. Maybe, maybe I just I, I I just was expecting for them to have some more for sure type of dudes that would take that and help take it next step. When you look at what some of the guys who've been really really good at that, Shaq Leonard, he's had dudes in front of him. 
big time dudes in both the dudes in San Francisco. I was going to say, then you get in San Francisco and Fred Warner, they've had dudes in front of them throughout. The guys that you Baltimore. look Baltimore. Baltimore. Yes, Roquan and them. They got dudes in front of them. You got like they've got to they've got to they've got to because we saw last year, man, when that dude was able to 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 identify what he needed to do and then he just went and what they get it just went, woo. It was nasty. It was nasty. And he's got he's got big time ability. So they've got to they have got to get make sure he gets the protection he needs. All right, coming up, um, we'll uh we'll get you ready for this game tonight, including what last night, what Framber needs to take away from last night in his start coming up tonight. We'll discuss that. We'll discuss that as we continue rolling here live on the drive. But before that, soda. Weight loss, 122 pounds, baby.
3138 or visit Prevnar20.com. Live from the Twin Peaks studios, Sports Radio 610 presents The Drive with Sterner and Hughley. Text line coming through. Ron, you're, uh, you're crazy. No way Christian Harris can be a top five linebacker this year. I think he's got the capability. He was playing at a major, major level last year towards the end of the season. In the second half of the season, he was, it was a clear, I don't know, he didn't really talk about the moment when the, the, the switch flipped, something flipped, and we saw him take his game to the, the next level. And I and you could see how comfortable he got in the defense and comfortable in what he's doing. As I said on the way out of the break, when that cat gets to a place where he's comfortable and he put his foot in the ground and he knows what decision he's going to make and he can use his speed and his ability to do everything, yep. that dude can go make plays. I'm telling you right now, I, I want, I, I'd like to get Lamar Jackson to, to give me another linebacker that did that to him this year. That was able that was able to keep him, tackle him, make plays. He did it multiple times in that game. So yeah, I, I think he's got a, a wouldn't real... shock me one bit. You, you I mean, D'Amico Ryan's as it's not like his his linebackers in the past haven't been absolutely tremendous and been put in position to have success and played at an extremely high level. Um, to your point, the, the the I mean, the proof is in the film, man. That, that dude got significantly better and was playing some of his best ball. Towards the end of the season and in the playoffs, um, the game is is designed in a way and, and and trending in a way and has been trending in a way that the the former safety, former defensive back that is now a linebacker, where he can cover and run with guys vertically and horizontally, it plays into their favor. Then you talk about that explosion and the athletic ability, the twitch. Um, not many have the ability to get Lamar Jackson on, on the ground and open field. And uh, and he he did it as recent as as last year or la- hell it was the playoffs. Um, so yeah, look, I, I'm not I'm not going to go out on a limb and bet on Christian Harris being a, a top five linebacker, but it wouldn't surprise me one bit. No, I, and, I, and I, if he's not, if he's not sooner rather than later, it'll be a disappointment. Yeah, no, I, I yeah, he's he is he showed me something. Late. I mean, you just couldn't you couldn't miss him. I mean, it was it was so. It was so obvious for him and, and how much he was making a play. And as I said, you got you got to have people in front of him at the very least that keep people off of him and don't make yep. it real easy to, Absolutely. Get, to get to him. Because that, that is a way we don't get to see his potential. His, uh, his potential. Well, he's going to be tremendous. And when they play 17 games, he's going to be absolutely tremendous in 12 or 13, regardless of what they put in front of him. You know, yep. it's 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 gonna be it's gonna be four or five where it's like, uh oh, now all of a sudden I got I got three hundred pounders in my lap. What do I do? I mean that's that's a different animal. Those are the ones, yeah. Um, but we'll see how they fare. Yeah. Coming up behind us, remember Texans all access. And then following that, um Area forty five, Bajani and Creighton, and after the final out, they'll have uh Astros post game with well, Area game with the Sh- I, yeah, I saw man. they did it last night. That's good stuff, man. Both of those guys know their know their strows and and uh It's a hell of a first post game. Right there. Yeah, so, it yeah, was, right? right? Good yeah. call. Yeah. I first. saw I, I gotta catch that the re- I wanna catch that was the they they have the video of the reaction, right? Of uh Yep. I wanna see that. I bet Patrick almost gave himself pulled a hip. I bet he did, man. He's Get been a little he's been a little down he's been a little down and out now. He better be careful. Don't don't uh don't strain anything, PC. Yeah, Probably. we don't want we don't want any injuries. Don't get to don't get to jumping out of that that, that high chair too quick now. I don't want now. I, I don't work too many nights. <laughs> I fell in for him. I, I I'd fill in for him. That PC needed he needed some time off. I'd, I'd fill in for him. <laughs> right. Well, I, uh, depending on what I got. <laughs> You're so full. Yeah, <laughs> which is something every night. <laughs> depending on what I got. I could hear uh, I could hear you hit court yeah. eight court. Uh, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go till ten tonight, man. I'll, I'll catch you in the morning. I catch you. Yeah, I catch you in the morning. Be back about ten, ten fifty. I'll be, I'll be there. All right. Um, all right. This, uh, this is this is a an important game. If you missed our our conversation with Robert Flores earlier today, he was on with us at two forty. You can listen to that. He didn't even allow me to get the question out about Framber Valdez. I said, "Is it too early 
uh, to be con- – yes or no. No, it's not. No, it's not. This is a big night. And, Clint, for me, watching Ronel Blanco, yes, he, he, he threw a no-hitter and he had a magical night. But Clint and Tyler, the thing that jumped out the most, and if you watched the game, it had to it had to be there for you as well, is he attacked. He attacked the strike zone. And and when when you watch Framber, it to me it, it it can be so frustrating, Clint. You'll watch him attack certain hitters. Mm-hmm. You'll watch him just I mean, I, I I watched him had to have it just go after Aaron Judge. And then he and then he hit Rizzo, you know. I mean, well, he went after Stanton right after that. And, yeah, went after Stanton, hit hit Rizzo. Watched him at different parts of the game where it's like, dude, you have amazing stuff. You got better stuff than than Blanco. Blanco, like, hit it, man. And yeah, he got away with with a couple. Uh, um, uh, Chaz, white boy Chaz, had to make a hell of a play uh, to to catch one Abreu, of those. A Bray, right you at the end. To, yes. Can I be honest about that? He laid on it. I watched that replay. My father-in-law stole it from me. He said it before I came up. He said, well, man, he made that look a lot more difficult than that actually was. <laughs> he smothered it. He, he smothered it. He said, what? He said, I thought that ball was yanked a little harder than yeah. it was. Yeah, the replay didn't do him no justice, man. <laughs> no, it did. But he attacked the zone. And what was he What was he throwing in there? Go watch, uh, go watch his out pitches especially. There was a lot of 84s, 85 change-ups. A change-up was nasty. Throwing 94, 95, 93, 94 fastball and attacking the zone with it. Attack. You got better stuff than he does. You got a better fastball. You got a better curveball. You got a better slider. You got a better everything. Attack the zone, Framber. And if they hit it at one point, just hit it. You hit it, hit it. But trust your stuff. That's my thing is, man. Attack the zone. Stop being so damn cute. This pitch is not... I, I, I hope it's. I, <laughs> I mean, if you want to be cute, do you? But I mean, I, I hope that's what it is. You mentioned having Row flowing a little earlier, and he and he mentioned the, the the he's got so much movement on every single pitch that he throws. Um, might he be might he be struggling with locating those pitches because there's so much movement there? Um, boy, I, I sure I sure would like that to be the case more so than than he just he just walks out there on opening day and sets a. A career high that in one, walks record. Yeah, that one's hard for me to buy. Clint, I agree because he, he's done I, it before. I agree, but you're but but what he's also done before is go out there and throw twenty five quality starts, and and now you're going. Yes. Why, what in the hell is going on? So I mean, I, I'm just I'm grasping at straws for something to give me a little bit of hope with Fromber that he hadn't just lost it. Yeah, because we we go twenty five quality starts, and then the first half he's an all star. Yeah, and then and then the second half where Shaky has the he has the as as Robert mentioned he has the the per, or the the no hitter and yep. then from there on every game loss of control base runners traffic everywhere walks hit by pitches he's having to pitch through jams repeatedly his team scores can you get a shutdown inning nope you know somebody's on base I just that that one's hard for me to buy like attack it man ah but you can throw a fastball straight if it, if he's got to throw throw your ninety five. And then your curveball. Let's see it. What do you think I could hit right now? 72. Ooh, 70s, huh? Well, that's – I appreciate the confidence, man. Tyler, Ooh, what do you what? think I could hit right now? Seven. Yeah. It, you, how many throws you get? You yeah, just let me, seven. Let me warm up. Yeah, let him warm up. I'd say let 70. Let me warm up and you give me – if you give me, me, give me a 72. Because I'd imagine I'd be so wild the gun may not pick a couple of them up. 70s? It depends. How are your ribs? <clears throat> You're all right. All right, I'll bump you up to 62. 60s, 60s is probably more like it. It's a lot harder to throw 72. Yeah, I believe in you. I don't know. I, I mean, the arm's still a little loose. Maybe a little Well, you gave blood today, so never mind. Let me bump him down. I, I'll, I give, did, you 60, I did. I, I'll I, give you 60. I'll give you I'm not feeling fatigued, though. I think I'm all right. I wouldn't. I wouldn't don't uh, pass out on the mound. I'm all right. Yeah, don't hey, pass hey, out. Hey, hey, we got Tyler back on, on video. Is that is that a camera in there? That's right. It's a I little less. I should have uh, known when you pulled your shirt up that you. Yeah. Were, it's a little less what. It, it's not quite uh, as good a quality as y'all's cameras, but nonetheless, I have a camera. Oh, is that is that right? I mean, you you don't. I'm not looking at the the streaming. Are are you are you a little little uh, cloudy? Yeah, it's a little, little cloudy. As, not quite as clear as me and Ron. Yeah. We're we're up here in HD. 
Yeah, they can see every little crevice and crack y'all got going on, and I'm kind of blurry. Probably safe. I know they got a crack. I've got a crack for them to be able to see. <laughs> well played. They, they wouldn't. They don't need HD to see that crack. No, uh, no. Yeah, it could be. You could do. How you looked at through Cinemax when you were growing Ooh, up. You could get one eye. Squinting. One eye, man. When Dad took a big strong puff off that cigarette and let the smoke fly, boy, I could open them damn near wide open because I knew he couldn't see me. That's, That's right. Steady. Texans All Access coming up behind us. Area forty five. Tyler. Yeah. Yeah. What is it? Give me my music. Yes. Yes, do it for the Strohs, baby. But, I mean, you didn't think I was going to leave you hanging, did you? All right, you know, you you got off you got off the snide, baby. You got your one win, and you didn't just get a one win. You put it all on the table. Blop. And you got you got you a nice little no-hitter. I see you right now. Well, here it is. Your one and four Houston Astros looking to get to two. Not a winning streak. But two in a row. And leading off for your Houston Astros playing second base. He might be 5'6". Apparently, he is only 15 pounds lighter than Ronel Blanco. But he may be 5'6", but he carries the big stick. Number 27, Jose Altuve. Really, really happy. And batting second. He's not the DH, although he should be. He is in left field. And please, stay healthy. But you know what? They love it when the ladies call him Big Papa. They said they love it when they call me Big Papa. He's still tipping on them fofos. The left fielder, Jordan Alvarez. He's big as hell. And batting third, the right fielder, who's a little, a little, a little out there, but he is a top five.